yes today we are going to start the marathon of cost and management audit and yes guys the exams are pretty close and we have to really really pull up our socks really we have we have to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, turn this entire two months or three months of the exam time because now only one and a half months is left for the exams we need to really turn it around well and we need to make sure that we are really bang on uh, uh, for the examination we are absolutely ready for the examination and yes we are giving a best shot for the examination that is what we have to seek in the upcoming one and a half months which is due for the examination good evening aarti jain akhil skaria okay suraj morey is also here welcome welcome surat sir surat sir is also here welcome surat sir niyati jatin all right welcome guys welcome and yes we are going to start the cost and management audit marathon series whereby i will be covering all the important chapters of cost audit from an exam standpoint whatever are the uh, important chapters they are uh, a part of this entire marathon series and yes guys i will also pick and choose certain topics which are very very critical important from an exam standpoint um, which have been coming repeatedly in the past examination and the expectation that they will come in the future examination is also quite high i'll be picking up all those um uh, topics i'll be picking up all those uh, important important uh, topics for all of you yes hi 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 good evening yes i can see a lot of good evenings yes all right so guys let's start the marathon of cost and management audit so first of all let us bifurcate these two words into two different words cost and audit okay cost you are already aware about what is costing costing means identification classification of cost and um, uh, you know when we identify classify measure assign prepare and present the costing statements that is the cost um, uh, for you and what is audit audit is verification or review examination appraisal checking of any record uh, on, on an independent basis the ultimate objective of audit is to express an opinion we need to express our opinion on the audited financial statements and that is why uh, that is the ultimate um, objective of cost audit so the ultimate objective of cost audit is to express an opinion and yes audit is done in an independent manner which means the auditor should be independent of the client that is a primary requirement of audit okay so two words which are there cost and audit you need to understand both these words what do you mean by audit and what do you mean by cost now moving on to um, uh, the definition of audit so guys if we see the definition of audit audit means it has been derived from a word called odier okay it has been derived from a latin word called odier audit has been derived from a latin word called odier that is the uh, word which is uh, you know audit now let me reduce the brightness of the screen a little bit so that you will be able to see it properly guys okay brightness i need to reduce a little bit okay now you will be able to see the screen properly yes yes <clears throat> all right so audit has been derived from a latin word which is odier odier means to listen so guys in earlier days in um uh, the medieval period the audit was a function of listening so you know the person the auditor used to listen to the facts and circumstances of the case and used to prepare an audit report so from there this concept of audit has uh, been taken over so audit has been derived from word odier in ancient days the person appointed to check accounts used to hear the explanations required from responsible officers and that's why the person who heard the explanations was called as the auditor so that is the basic genesis of audit where has the audit um, word come from it's a, it has come from odier then guys in this particular statement i've discussed certain um, uh, you know uh, scandals which have come up in past in the um a world like enron scandal has come up in the past arthur anderson and enron scandal that is what i discussed in this particular chart now very very important guys what is the difference be between statutory audit and non statutory audit there are two kinds of audits statutory audit and non statutory audit statutory audit means the audits which are relevant from an um, uh, from a law perspective they are recommended by law they are mandated by law they are mandatory audits which are uh, to be done as per law and the guidelines are also given in law and non statutory audit means the audit which are not as per the law they are voluntary audit which means if you want to do it then you can do it if you don't want to do it you um, don't do it they are voluntary audit okay so statutory audits are compulsory and non statutory audits are voluntary so these are the difference between statutory auditor and uh, uh, non statutory audit now relevant statute is there in case of statutory audit non statutory audit 
um, uh, employers or the partners who are going to get the audit done, they decide the scope. In case of statutory audit, the scope is decided by the law, the legal framework, the act which is under which the audit is uh, being done. That is the um, uh, you know perspective of audit. Yes, this these videos are um, you know applicable for old as well as new syllabus. Both the syllabus uh, are being taken care of in this particular um, uh, you know session. Is my video is my audio okay? Are you able to hear me? Please confirm in the chat box because I have got a message that your voice is low. Is my Am I audible to all of you? Am I perfectly audible to all of you? Is my voice all right? <clears throat> Please confirm in the chat box. Okay, so uh, statutory audit and non-statutory audit. Then the academic or professional qualifications are required in case of statutory audit. Uh, you know, the statutory auditor has to be qualified like in case of cost audit, cost auditor is required. In case of, um, uh, you know, financial audit, statutory auditor, start accountant is required. So professional qualifications are prescribed under statutory audit. In case of non-statutory audit, uh, uh, professional qualification, academic qualifications are not required. Um, uh, a non-statutory auditor can uh, easily be, um, you know, a, a graduate or a law graduate or a commerce graduate. Any graduate can be non-statutory auditor, but statutory auditor has to be the specific, um, uh, you know, the degree which uh, is required under law, which is cost audit for cost audit, it's cost auditor for financial auditors, chartered accountant. So that particular degree is very much required. Okay. So this is the difference between uh, statutory audit and non-statutory audit. And yes, statutory audit example is cost audit, non-statutory audit example is management audit and operation audit. So guys in cost audit it's itself, we have a, a module in which we'll be studying about management audit, operational audit. So these audits are non-statutory audit. Uh, if you want to get your audit done, then please do it. If you don't want to get your audit done, it's perfectly all right. No one is going to force you. So these are uh, management audit and operation audit, which are non-statutory audits. Now, what is the difference between audit and investigation? Very, very important, um, uh, you know, distinguishing factor. Audit means to check the prima facie, express an opinion on the prima facie, um, uh, you know, things which have been given to you. Investigation means it's an in-depth analysis to ascertain any fact. It's an in-depth analysis of certain thing. Okay. Now, in case of audit, it has a wide scope, which means it will cover everything which is there in the financial statements. However, in case of investigation, the scope is limited to the period of areas which are to be covered. So in a nutshell, I can tell you that, you know, audit is a uh, is a routine exercise. Okay, it's a compliance. It's a routine exercise. However, investigation is an exercise which is invited only when there is some fraud which has been unearthed. There is some, um, uh, you know, some uh, something, something grave which has been found out in the process of your financial statements working on anything of that sort, something has been found out. In that case, investigation happens. Audit happens in every case. Okay, it's a general routine process of audit. Okay, that is the difference between audit and investigation. Uh, from an exam standpoint, this is not very, very important, guys, because these distinguishing factors, we uh, are just, um, uh, you know, brushing up to update our knowledge on uh, the subject because audit that we are going to start you need to really understand the basics of it therefore these topics are important from an exam standpoint not very very important okay now what are the other differences between aud uh, audit and investigation so audit is done as per the generally accepted auditing principles so there are principles which are prescribed for doing audit in case of investigation they are only an extension to auditing procedure whatever auditing procedures have been applied um, uh, the the um, investigation is extension to those procedures auditor uh, uh, will gather persuasive evidence. Okay. Persuasive evidence means evidence which have more than 50% of uh, chances that they are correct. Okay. Persuasive evidence which they persuade you. Okay. They are not conclusive. They are not 100% um, uh, you know, uh, indicative of the fact that everything is fine. So, you know, the perspective of audit is to give a reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance means more than 50% uh, we are okay with everything. Okay. That is reasonable assurance. So, purpose of audit is to give a reasonable assurance. Purpose of investigation is to give an absolute assurance, which means 100% we need to certify that, yes, everything which is written in the financial statements or the cost statements are absolutely fine. That is 100% assurance which is given in investigation. In case of audit, there is only reasonable assurance which is given, which means more than 50% chance that everything is fine. That is a very important distinguishing factor between audit and uh, investigation. So yes, guys. Let us see how's the Josh in the house. Hi guys, how's the Josh? Yes, we have a uh, good 77 people in the room. How's the Josh guys? You know, the upcoming examinations are around the corner. How's the Josh with all of you? Let me check out in the uh, 
uh, message uh, in the chat section. How's the Josh in all of you? Please tell me in the chat box. And yes, please like the video. Uh, uh, do share the video with your friends so that you know maximum people get benefit out of it. Please like this video for sure. Let's let's see how many students are going to like this video. So please like the video for sure. And how's the Josh in the room? Let me check out in the uh, chat box. Please write in the chat box. Deepan says great. Yes, good. Superb, sir. Hi, sir. Hi, hi, hi. Perfect. Your Josh should actually be high, and that is the biggest, biggest. Uh, thing which is required as of now because the papers are just round the corner guys round the corners perfect super high full josh tejasvi she says <laughs> good tejasvi all right so yes persuasive evidence and conclusive evidence in case of investigation persuasive evidence in case of audit that is the evidence type of evidence which is um, uh, uh, required in both of the um, uh, cases auditor is skeptical not suspicious so in case of auditor he is skeptical skeptical means careful he is careful, but he is not suspective. He is not uh, suspecting anything. He is not saying that you know something is wrong in the company. He is not coming with that mindset that something is wrong in the company. However, investigator comes with that mindset that something is wrong in the company. Some suspicion is there. Some negative thought is there. He comes with a negative th thought in case of um, investigation. Auditing is a routine exercise, which means annually it is done. However, investigation is done, um, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, uh, not regularly. Okay, so these are difference between investigation and audit and window dressing of accounts is not a, uh, you know, not a very important topic to discuss. Yes, this is very, very important guys. Uh, you know, one marks question can be asked in the examination. It is there in the MTP as well. What is the history of genesis of cost audit in India? What was the reason why cost audit was invented in India? Why was it launched in India? Why was the, um, uh, you know, cost audit, um, uh, uh, you know, the cost audit um, the provisions were uh, uh, introduced in India. Why Companies Act introduced cost audit? Uh, when did it introduce it? And what changes did cost audit provisions get over a period of time? That is the point of discussion now. Very, very important point. Okay. So yes, genesis of cost audit in India. When did cost audit um, uh, come into play? This is the chart that can, uh, you know, that can be, I think you can see it. Yes, this is a chart that will give you a brief of what happened to the cost audit provisions over a period of time. It was introduced in 1965 under the Companies Act 1956 with two sections, maintenance of cost records and cost audit. Okay, 1965 was the year when the cost audit was first launched in the Companies Act um, 1956. Then 1965 to 2008, cost audit was applicable only on 44 industries. Cost records were applicable on 44 industries, only 44 industries in which cost records were applicable. And uh, cost audit was applied on specific, specific companies. So the cost audit earlier was company based, which means company were, um, uh, you know, specified that this company should get its cost audit done. Okay. It was not industry wise that this industry should get its cost audit done. It was company wise. So yes. You know, company like Tata Steel Limited or Reliance Industries Limited or Aditya Birla um, uh, Group. So companies were chosen for getting the cost audit done. So it was company specific earlier during 1965 to 2008. It was company specific in 2011. Company specific audit was replaced with industry specific audit. Then it was a wider scope in 2011. The company specific audit was replaced with um, industry specific audit. So now audit was applicable on entire industry, which say manufactured, um, uh, you know, um, uh, cement, entire industry, which manufactured cement, entire industry was applicable on cost audit provisions. Earlier, only specified companies were eligible for cost audit provisions like Ambuja Cements. Okay, not other cement companies, but afterwards in 2011, uh, the audit cost audit was specified on the basis of industry. Industry means some product which you are making on the basis of that cost audit was um, introduced, which means it was on a wider scope that the cost audit was launched subsequently. Old syllabus as well as new syllabus, both syllabus um, uh, are applicable. Are uh, this these videos will be applicable for? 2014 was a radical year in the history of. Uh, you know, records when the records were when the rules, uh, cost audit rules and cost audit report rules were absolutely revamped. They were absolutely changed uh, to meet the latest requirements of the industry. They were changed. So in 2014, uh, Companies Act 2013, there were new two, uh, there were uh, new sections which which were introduced. Section 148.1, Section 148.2, maintenance of cost records and cost audit. So these sections were introduced in Companies Act 2013 and. Companies cost records and audit rules 2014 were launched in 2014 and they were amended subsequently by 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19 rules.
So the rules which are applicable for all of you today are the 2014 rules and they have been launched in 2014 and companies at 2013 the relevant section is 148.1 and 148.2 148.1 refers to the maintenance of cost records 148.2 refers to the cost audit these are the two main sections which will be applicable to you for your examination and yes this is um, uh, where the cost audit and cost records provisions are um, uh, specified in under companies act 2013 that is how um, now we bifurcate the entire genesis of cost audit this is the genesis of cost audit the uh, you know uh, the advent of cost audit where did cost audit start from so guys you need not remember all these years okay you need not remember all these years minutely you should just remember the major years which is 1965 yes of course you need to remember this 1965 you need to remember 2011 and you need to remember 2014 these are the three years which you need to remember and what are the significant events that have happened in these three years they are most important from an exam standpoint okay this is not very useful this is okay yes now comes the major thing okay now comes the major thing okay now i want you to um, uh, answer in the chat box which part of your body is the most important part of your body without which you cannot stand without which you cannot sit without which you cannot do whatever you are doing without which your nervous system comes to a standstill without which your um, entire body will not function properly which is one part one most important part of your body without which everything will come um, to a standstill if that part is hampered or if that part is um, uh, you know somewhere uh, dilapidated or that part is hampered then guys your entire body will come to a standstill what is that one part for your um, body please tell me in the chat box in the comment section i want to know which is one part of your body yes 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 tejasvi it's the spine rekha chaudhri shayani energy perfect guys it is the spine spine is one such thing which if it is hurt in any way then your entire life will come to a standstill guys similarly in case of any audit, in case of any audit, if we talk about audit, any audit, be it internal audit, be it statutory audit, be it GST audit, be it income tax audit, be it management audit, be it any kind of audit, the spinal cord of audit is the thing which keeps audit going strong is the law which is backing that particular audit. The law which is backing that particular audit. If there is no law which is backing an audit, then audit becomes weak, audit becomes fragile audit becomes non-effective so or every audit needs to have a spinal cord needs to have a backing needs to have a strong support system i'll give you a simple example okay i come to your um, uh, suppose you guys are staying uh, in delhi okay i'm also in delhi suppose I, you guys are staying in delhi i come to your home and i tell you oh please show me i want to audit your room okay uh, show me all the elmiras all the cupboards and all the um, uh, you know all the things which are there in your uh, room please show me all of them I want to audit please answer in the chat box what will be your response I am coming tomorrow I am coming for your um, uh, audit of your room I am coming to your home wherever you are situated I am coming to your home and I will want to audit your room your room your Elmira's your drawers your everything I want to audit what will be your response will you allow me to um, uh, you know do audit of your room will you allow me to do audit of your room please tell me will you allow me to audit uh, uh, your room i want to come to your home and i want to audit your room ankita says i will allow you sir no problem but ankita murarka says no <laughs> aditya says no anandu says no rekha says who authorized you very good rekha very good question very good question no answer is no not at all sharan says not at all b channa keshafa says yes see there are there are uh, very sweet people also in the chat room they are not only rude people who are saying no sir we will not allow you we will not allow you we will not allow you. everyone is saying we will not allow you huh? they are so rude people but there are some good nice people also who are saying no sir we will allow you please come b channa keshava is one such nice person most welcome nikhil sir see pavan uh, Jagtap is saying, most welcome. Lakshmi Dhar says, who under whose permission? Ajna says, yes, you can. Mammi ko bhi allowed nahi hai. Sharan carry up. Mammi ko bhi allowed diye to aapko allow kaise kar dege? 
<laughs> so yes guys point of the matter is that you need um uh, to uh, you know ask a person who's getting your audit done who authorized you to come into my personal space and touch my personal things who allowed you to do that i'm not going to give you any such permission because you need authority to uh, visit anyone's personal premises you need some kind of um, you know um, uh, some kind of authority some kind of permission to do any kind of audit because it's your personal thing similarly guys when you come to a business then business cost statements business cost sheet is their personal asset is their personal thing why would they allow you to touch your personal thing it is a personal thing it is their personal thing why would they allow you to touch it they will not allow you to touch it they will say we don't need any audit don't touch our um, uh, books of accounts no you are not allowed to touch our books of accounts they will say like this but then we will show them the relevant sections under the companies act 2013 which they have to mandatorily follow and the relevant section soon as they will read the relevant sections they will definitely allow you to audit their form like i am going to tell you you know um, uh, most uh, you know i'll i'll, I'll tell you that your father is giving you a call and he is telling you allow nikhil sir to come to your room and get your room audited then will you permit me answer is yes now the law under which you are governed the law under which you are governed that law is requiring you to get the audit done so you cannot deny no you cannot deny then so every audit needs a backbone and backbone means the law under which audit is to be performed if audit is not performed under any law then it becomes futile it becomes useless so audit has to be performed under some law and that law under which audit is to be performed is the spinal cord of that particular audit that is the most important part of that particular audit so which is the spinal cord of our audit which is cost audit which is the spinal cord of cost audit guys the spinal cord of cost audit is section 148 please highlight and highlight and highlight this section this is the section because of which cmas are monopolized to do cost audit and yes we have a monopoly in cost audit and yes we can proudly say that only and only cost and management accountant can enter into a company and ask for the cost records of a company no other professional in the world can force the company to give their cost records to them because cost records are very 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 private documents very very personal and very very confidential for every company but yes cost auditors cmas cost and management accountants are authorized to um, get hold of the Uh, you know cost uh, records and check the cost records and if any lacunas are there if any problems are there then that is going to be highlighted by the cost audit so sections which are applicable for companies act which are relevant for um, uh, you know cost auditors as well are sections 139 to section 148 148 being the prime section and all these sections are also relevant to the cost auditor uh, along with the any other auditor so these sections are also very very relevant section 139 to 140 and yes under law you must have already uh, read these sections these sections are equally important under cost audit as well yes sir so yes guys cost audit after engagement letter audit will be done yes after engagement letter audit will be done perfect so this is the law which is requiring every company to get their cost audit done and because of this law cost audit is mandatory uh, provision okay so you know sections 139 to 140 guys let us let me tell you uh, a quick A revision strategy or quick way to learn this section. You want to learn this section, okay? One thirty nine. Ao. Ao means come, okay? Come, come means appointment of the cost auditor. One thirty nine. Come appointment of the cost auditor, including rotation. Ao. Removal means jao, okay? Go. Jana is removal. Ao, jao. Ao is section one thirty nine. Jao is section one forty. Ao, jao. eligibility jaancho jaancho you you always test something you know whether it is good or not eligibility whether you are eligible for get uh, doing cost audit or not eligibility qualifications disqualification of the order jaancho jaancho means whether you are eligible or not testing so jaancho means testing you have to test test um, uh, the eligibility of the cost order whether he is eligible or not so jaancho is testing then parkho parkho means you have to evaluate whether it is worth or not whether it is worth or not parkho parkho means what is the value that is payable for this particular person what is the remuneration that can be given to the auditor parkho what is the remuneration that is given to the auditor so that is parkho so ao jao jaancho parkho ao jao jaancho parkho 139 140 141 142 okay 
जाचो परखो दीज आर न्यूमोनिक्स फॉर दीज फोर सेक्शन ओके सो इंपॉर्टेंट सेक्शन फ्रॉम एन एग्जाम स्टैंड पॉइंट ओके विल बी स्टार्टिंग अबाउट दीज सेक्शन बट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट अस यू नो स्टार्ट आर डिस्कशन ऑन सेक्शन वन फोर्टी एट गाइज सेक्शन वन फोर्टी एट इज द मेजर सेक्शन द मोनोपली सेक्शन विच विल हेल्प अस टू यू नो गेट द कॉस्ट ऑडिट डन एंड इट विल गिव अस पावर्स इट विल गिव अस मोनोपली टू do cost audit of any company okay are you able to see the chart well yes you are able to see the chart well all right all right so now we come on to section 148 which is the uh, basic section of cost audit and very very important uh, question of uh, cost audit okay uh, so what is the uh, uh, what is this chart telling you about cost audit now cost audit is divided into cost audit section is divided into three sections sub section 1 sub section 2 sub section 3 section is 148 okay please remember the section this is the mother section this is the mother section or you can also say that say it as god section ye apunich bhagwan hai ye section apne aap ko dekh ke bolta hoga apunich cma walon ka bhagwan hai yes yahi hamare cma walon ka bhagwan hai mother section or the god section backbone of cma profession is this particular section which is section 148 we have to carefully scrutinize the entire section 148 i need to understand sub section 1 2 3 what are the subsections of this um section we need to carefully scrutinize them and we need to carefully look at these sections okay okay so section 149 divided into two parts 1 2 and 3 sub section 1 sub section 1 relates to cost records guys unless and until you mandate a company to prepare cost records you cannot ask the company to get the cost audit done because cost audit can be done only when a company prepares cost records so the first essential element is to instruct the companies to make it mandatory on the companies to prepare cost records that is the first and foremost requirement um, which law has to impose so law has to mandatorily impose requirement of cost records preparation of cost records on each and every person on each and every company um, uh, who is eligible to prepare its cost records so subsection 1 relates to cost records what are the companies which are Uh, required to prepare the cost records that is sub section 1 then sub section 2 cost audit now out of the companies which are required to prepare cost records not all are required to get their cost audit done out of them only few are required to get their cost audit done so first essential element is you need to have a mandatory requirement of preparing your cost records and after that the second essential element is for those cost records cost audit is required to be performed by you and yes third is who can be the cost auditor who can be the cost auditor who can um uh, you know perform uh, the activity of cost audit that is the relevant person uh, who is the relevant person that is the third sub section so sub section 1 cost record sub section 2 cost audit sub section 3 cost auditor these are the three sub sections which we need to in depth delve into in depth understand the context of these three sub sections okay first of all let's start cost records uh, who are the com which are the companies who are required to prepare their cost records that is the question under consideration so cost records are required to be prepared by specified companies which means not all companies are required to prepare their cost records guys only specified companies are required to um, uh, you know uh, cover the cover the cost records <coughs> okay so specified companies are required to prepare their cost records and who are those specified uh, companies guys there are some turnover and net worth criteria based on which um, the companies are chosen not all companies are required to prepare their cost records first of all the question which should uh, which should arise in your mind is sir what are cost records guys cost records are nothing but utilization of material utilization of labor and utilization of other item co of cost which is nothing but your cost sheet the cost sheet which you prepare for your products that is the cost records for you and the underlying documents or the underlying uh, ledgers they are the cost records for you so cost records are nothing but utilization of material utilization of labor and uh, utilization of other items of cost that is cost records for you so cost records are the 
रिकॉर्ड्स विच आर कंपनीज रिक्वायर्ड टू बी पेड ओनली स्पेसिफाइड कंपनीज आर रिक्वायर्ड टू प्रिपेयर दीज रिकॉर्ड स्पेसिफाइड कंपनीज एंड स्पेसिफाइड कंपनीज आर डिटरमाइंड ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ टर्न ओवर एंड नेटवर्थ क्राइटेरिया एज पर द रूल्स प्लस दे इज वन मोर रिक्वायरमेंट दैट दोज कंपनीज शुड मेक स्पेसिफाइड गुड्स और सर्विसेज so there are certain goods and services only if you make those goods and services you will be required to prepare your cost records so every company is not required to get its cost records prepared and audited no a clear distinction with statutory audit guys statutory audit is applicable on all the companies whether they are pre uh, preparing a product b product c product whatever product they are preparing cost records are uh, statutory audit is applicable on all companies but cost audit is applicable only on specified companies because cost records are applicable only on specified companies that is one point of differentiation between statutory audit and cost audit which we need to understand our statutory auditor statutory audit is applicable on all companies however the cost audit is applicable only on specified companies and what are those specified companies who are those specified companies guys this we'll be discussing in our next chapter which is the rules chapter over here we are not going to discuss what are those companies okay but cost records are required to be prepared by specified companies who are fulfilling the specified criteria with respect to turnover and net worth and they are preparing specified goods the goods are listed in two tables table a and table b of the rules the goods are listed that these are the list of goods if you prepare these list of goods then you are required to get your cost records prepared now once once you uh, are required to get your cost records prepared out of these companies guys we will pick up certain companies for cost audit again cost audit is not applicable on all the companies cost audit is applicable only on certain companies and those certain companies will be chosen out of these companies who are required to prepare their cost records out of these companies certain companies are to be chosen and cost audit is required to be done of those certain companies so what are those companies where cost audit is required to be done companies covered under subsection 1 so yes first requirement is that you know the company should be covered under the cost records cost records must be applicable on those companies who are um now you know eligible for cost audit so first requirement is that companies must be covered under subsection 1 which is cost records then the company must be meeting the net worth and threshold criteria so there is a threshold in subsection 2 also there is a threshold in subsection 1 also so first of all subsection 1 your threshold should be met then subsection 2 your threshold should be met again threshold is um uh, you know applicable for the subsection 2 also so cost audit is also subject to certain thresholds then subsection 3 which is the cost auditor cost auditor has to be a cost accountant in practice and he should be appointed by the board of directors uh, uh, specified under subsection 2 so two requirements of becoming a cost auditor number 1 he should be a cma cost accountant and that too in practice which means he should hold a cop cop should be available with that particular person cost accountant in practice and second requirement he should be appointed by the board of directors of the company as a cost auditor if these two requirements are cumulatively satisfied then that particular person becomes the cost auditor of that particular company so this is how cost order is uh, uh, you know def defined in the law so let's quickly read the section also okay 148 subsection 1 not withstanding anything contained in this chapter this is a non obstained clause non obstained clause which means it overrides all other clauses which are given in the law so not withstanding anything contained in the chapter the central government may by an order so there is a specific requirement of central government to give an order this is not an automatic section which will activate automatically no government will tell what uh, companies are required to prepare their cost records not all companies are required to prepare their cost records only specified companies are required to prepare their cost records so government by an order in respect of such class of companies engaged in production of such goods or providing such services so government will tell what goods and services are um, you know covered under cost audit and only if you are preparing those goods and services you will be covered under cost audit so specified goods specified services if you prepare then you need to prepare utilization of material utilization of labor and other item of cost which is cost sheet if you fulfill the criteria which is given by the government then you need to prepare your cost records and cost records means cost sheet with supporting documents should be included in the books of accounts kept by that class of companies now what is subsection 2 subsection 2 is if central government is of an opinion and the company is covered under subsection 1 so if there is there is an opinion of central government and the opinion is given by the net worth and turnover criteria so if two conditions are cumulatively fulfilled that the company should fall under subsection 1 the first condition is that company should fall under subsection 1 if your company is falling under subsection 1 subsection 1 is cost records if your company is falling under subsection 1 plus you are meeting the net worth and turnover criteria your net worth is above the required threshold 
if those these two conditions are cumulatively satisfied then you are eligible to get your cost audit done under subsection 2 now we are testing the eligibility of cost audit for companies okay so if the company is covered under subsection 1 secondly the company's net worth and turnover is above the prescribed limit both the condition of cumulative will be satisfied then the company is um, uh, you know eligible for cost audit under subsection 2 these are the two conditions which are to be required to be fulfilled then subsection 3 which is the cost auditor who can be the cost auditor guys any cost accountant in practice any person who is in practice who is a cost accountant cma and he is in practice that is the first requirement and he should be appointed by the board as a cost auditor both the conditions are satisfied he can become a cost auditor so guys there are in 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 a, in a particular section no even while you are doing a law okay you are studying law there are certain elements which stand out as compared to the other provisions of the law so law is all about accumulating all the conditions putting it together and drafting an equation that is law and this is how i bifurcate law whenever i teach law this is how i bifurcate it i pick up the important elements of the section and put it as plus 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 equal to this this is how you should study law also in your uh, group 3 okay so how many of you are afraid of studying law just write in the chat box me me how many of you are afraid of studying law of group 3 write in the chat box me 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 m e let's see how many of you are afraid of studying law how many of you are afraid of studying law please write in the chat box me 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 sharan says me <laughs> okay no one else is afraid of studying law finance crew says me raju kumar says not at all sir all the provisions of law are on my fingertips i read it so fluently sir priyanka says me rekha says me ankita says me aarti jain says me all the girls are afraid of studying law huh manisha says me boys are not afraid of studying law anjima says me yogesh sharma says me yes there's one boy also who's saying that yes it's difficult in law i understand everything but remember nothing yes remembrance is a big thing in law yes remembrance is a big thing so guys if you uh, bifurcate your law also this way you will be, you will be able to remember law very very easily just write your law in this way the way i have written law you write this law and you will be able to really you know do well in your law paper also okay sir got it so yes these were the provisions of section 148 i'm not taking these subsections guys these subsections are very very easy all right so in a nutshell what is the cost audit definition what do you mean by cost audit cost audit is an independent examination is an independent examination of cost books cost accounts cost statements and subsidiary prime documents with a view to satisfying the auditor that these represents true and fair view of the cost of production so your cost of production is perfect your cost of production is up to the mark your cost of production is uh, absolutely correctly uh, computed uh, when you audit all these things like your cost accounts cost books cost statements subsidiary and prime documents when you audit examine all these things and ascertain the cost of production and ascertain that yes our cost of production is absolutely perfect guys that is known as cost audit and you give a true and fair view on the cost statement that is cost audit uh, definition okay the verification of correctness of cost accounts and adherence to cost accounting plan whenever you are um, uh, you know verifying the correctness of cost accounts we specifically see the cost accounts whether cost accountants are cost accounting is done properly or not and yes guys in this revision series we'll be dealing with the cost accounting standards yes the big thing the 24 cost accounting standards which is there in our syllabus we'll be dealing with this in this revision series and those cost accounting standards will tell us how cost accounts are required to be maintained how cost sheet is required to be made those cost accounting standards are going to tell us about the cost sheet and the cost statements and the cost accounting records so yes we will be dealing with cost accounting standards also yes sir section 141 disqualification exam mein aata hai kya? it might come i mean rarely it, it doesn't come quite often but it might come section 141 which is the disqualification okay it might come okay guys so this was the definition of cost audit for all of you relevance of cost audit what are the benefits of cost audit guys price control the first relevance is price control um, all the things which are there in market which are available in public domain if you want to control the price of all those things then cost audit is very much required and even for reporting purposes we need to know what is the cost of a particular product what is the profit margin of that particular product all these things will be um, uh, you know adhered to only when cost audit is perfectly done for that particular company so cost audit the first benefit of cost audit is that um, it, it um, uh, regulates the market it regulates the price that is the first benefit of cost audit market regulation is the first benefit of cost audit then 
it provides accurate and authentic information to the board of directors about the cost and structure of cost so it will tell you what is the cost of a particular product and what is the um, you know bifurcation of cost i mean what material cost is employed what labor uh, cost is employed what other expenses are employed all these things will be uh, given the structure of cost will also be given in the cost sheet so that is the information which is provided to the board of directors uh, using the cost sheet that is the benefit of cost sheet okay then to assess the performance of the company in terms of shareholders value stakeholders value whether uh, you know the company's performance has increased over a period of time whether it has um, upgraded over a period of time or whether it has declined over a period of time that is the uh, objective of cost audit then good practice in cost in costing should support a range of both regular and non regular decision making so whenever decision making is required to be done then costing forms the basis of every decision the management is going to take because guys costing and cost sheet gives a very valuable information about the product about the profitability of the product about how the company is doing as a whole all these things are um, uh, detailed uh, discussed in detail in cost sheet so all these gives a hint or clue as to what is the um uh, you know performance of the company so to assess the performance of the company cost sheet is required helps protect interest of indian companies from allegation of dumping now dumping is um, uh, something which is absolutely uh, against law dumping is when uh, a foreign company uh, sends or sells its goods to uh, some other company at a throwaway price at a very very minimal price even below the cost of production okay so whenever someone tells me that okay you are selling the product even below cost of production you are incurring a loss in effective um, um, terms so i will say that no no please see my cost sheet my cost sheet will tell you that this is the cost of this particular product and it is fine so you know to uh, to if you want to shield against the allegation of dumping if you want someone to say that uh, you know um, uh, someone to not to say that uh, you are dumping your goods into another country then cost sheet will form a very important basis of saying that no 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 i am not dumping i am not dumping my goods in another company i am not just putting my goods at a price which is even low below than cost of production no no i am not doing that so allegation of dumping can be um, protected if cost sheet is prepared to become effective against the anti competition activity so whenever you are um, you know competing against your peers in the market then guys uh, sometimes there are some competition laws which restrict you okay there are competition laws which restrict you so there is competition commission of india cci okay that cci will restrict you if you are entering into any unhealthy trade practices like i'll tell you an example when two companies merge with each other then they try to increase price of their product because they are monopolizing the market okay in that case cci will restrict them that no 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 you cannot increase price of the product because uh, monopoly will not uh, should not hamper the uh, welfare of the uh, people so if you want to be very very uh, you know effective against those allegations that you are increasing your price unnecessarily or you are um, uh, selling your goods at a very very high profit margin if you have these kind of allegation unhealthy uh, competition practices you are uh, falling if you have this kind of allegation cost sheet will come as a rescue cost data will come as a rescue you can show the cost data and tell the people no 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 i am not i'm definitely not um, uh, entering into any unhealthy practice i am going to um you know uh, give my products at a reasonable rate and this is my cost sheet which will tell you that this is the um uh, you know uh, rate at which the uh, cost sheet is done and the cost is uh, this is the cost and this is the rate at which profit margins are um, uh, given to you so my entire um uh, you know cost data will be uh, evident of the fact that i'm not doing any unhealthy trade practice i'm not doing any unhealthy tra trade practice my entire um cost data will be a, a, a proof arms length price to determine the arms length price of a transaction and yes arms length price is a very very important determination as far as um, you know when uh, your inter department transfers are concerned or when you are transferring goods from one country to another country at that point in time your transfer pricing regulations or arms length price regulation is very very important because you know uh, customs even excise sometimes uh, deals with arms length and of course we have section 92 of the income tax act will deals with arms length and to gain accurate cost information regarding arms length price what will be the cost of this particular product what is the profit margin and what will be the actual selling price of this particular product to analyze all the um, you know arms length price of a particular product cost sheet or the relevant cost data becomes a, a standard benchmark becomes a a uh, basic thing sine qua non it becomes an essential thing to ascertain the uh, arms length price so for ascertaining the arms length price we need good costing data like inter unit transfers are there we need costing data we need cost sheet to ascertain the price 
ascertaining actual productivity and wastage so whenever you want to ascertain whether your goods are being uh, produced at a um, uh, at, are they are you wasting your goods a lot or are you um, wasting your raw material a lot if you want to know that if you want to know the productivity then guys cost sheet will be a very very good source of information objectives of course cost sheet objectives of cost or audit is that you know first of all verification of cost records you need to verify your cost records what are your cost records uh, whether they are prepared well or not whether they are prepared correctly or not that is the first objective of your cost audit then to detect errors and frauds if any error and fraud has crept in in the financial statements you need to detect that that then determination of inventory valuation inventory valuation can be done using various methods okay various different methods can be employed while doing the inventory valuation so to determine whether inventory valuation is done uh, right or not you need cost audit cost audit will assist you in um, uh, you know um, your inter inventory valuation process also then reconciliation of costing or records with accounting records if you want to uh, reconcile your costing profits with accounting profits accounting profits are different costing profits are different and you may prepare a reconciliation statement and guys mind you very very important a mandatory question from reconciliation statement practical will definitely come in your examination so reconciliation of financial and costing profit you must do in your uh, preparation please do all the questions of um uh, you know reconciliation statement they, that is very very important topic from an exam standpoint okay then it helps government in setting up price of regulated goods uh, there are certain goods which are regulated goods like pharma uh, some some pharmaceutical goods some medicines are regulated goods so whatever are the regulated goods to set prices of those goods cost sheet cost data will be used by government of india then detection of abnormal loss of material and time if there is an abnormal loss of material time we will detect it using the cost audit and there are several other guys benefits which are there for cost audit okay again guys social objectives are also very similar i'm not going to uh, go deep down into it you can actually read it through some important definitions like de definition of books of accounts what are books of accounts mode of maintenance of accounts how the books of accounts should be maintained guys very simple simple um, uh, provisions but yes a very important provision which we are going to uh, study now company is required to maintain cost records and audit done so companies which are required to uh, maintain the cost audit and record section 148 uh, so you know what are the defaulting provisions if you default in preparing your cost records if you default in getting your cost audit done then what are the repercussions that you can face so you can you know if there's a one time default if you have a one time default then every officer and the company who is in default shall be punishable which of with a fine which is extendable to 5000 rupees this is default number 1 for continuing default which means um, uh, you have not got your cost audit done for several years then the fine will be rupees 500 per day till the default continues so till the default continues your fine will be 500 per day Multi uh, you know so many days as the default continues multiply by rupees 500 per day that is your uh, defaulting uh, you know penalty okay okay sir sir that's why anti duting dumping was introduced Yes, Sharan is absolutely right. To damage the economy of the importing country, anti-dumping duty was introduced. Perfect, perfect. So, cost audit will serve as a shield if you are claiming that you have not done anti-dumping, and if other governments, uh, other government, other countries' government is claiming that you have done uh, anti, you have done, you have done dumping, which means you have sold your goods at a very very low price than cost of production. If the other country's government is saying this thing and if you are saying no no i am not done anti dumping then you need to prove it okay and for proving you need to prepare your cost sheet and give it to government of that country and tell them look my cost is less it's not that i am selling it below cost of production my cost is less therefore my profit is less and therefore i am selling it at a less price i have technology which which produces this good at a very very uh, effective price so cost sheet will form a basis of your um uh, you know Uh, your your argument in front of a court if you are faced with the um uh, with the uh, allegation of dumping that is the dumping anti dumping duty for you okay so for a one time default 5000 rupees punishment for a continuing default 500 rupees per day punishment is levied on you then section 1485 okay qualifications and disqualifications of the order rights and duties of the order very very important section guys okay so what are the qualifications of the auditor what are the qualifications of the auditor qualifications of the auditor number 1 the auditor should be a cost accountant the auditor should be a cost accountant within the meaning of cost and works accountants 1959 so the uh, uh, auditor should be a cost accountant which means he should be a cma he should have qualified his examination and also got the membership number from the institute 
if you don't have the membership number you cannot call yourself as a cost accountant so first is that he should be a cost accountant second is he should have a cop so there are two options which are given to you once you become a cma either you can have your cop or you can um, you know uh, work somewhere in in a job okay if you have cop only then will you be permitted to do your cost audit you can be a cost auditor only when you have a cop certificate of practice he shall be individual or firm of cost accountants with at least two partners so you can be an individual or a firm of cost accountant either of the um, two is permitted where firm including llp is appointed as a cost auditor then the partner who are cost accountant shall be authorized to act on behalf of the firm so wherever the limited liability partnership uh, is appointed as the cost auditor or the partnership firm is appointed as the cost auditor then the partners of those firms who are cost accountants are do any activity like cost audit on behalf of the firm obviously guys firm is a um uh, unnatural entity entity it is it is not a natural person that it can perform something so only the cost accountants who are authorized to act on behalf of the firm they will be eligible to perform the cost audit then restrictions on number of cost audit so how many cost audits can you do section 141 3g uh, there there is a restriction on cost audit number of cost audit that you can do there's a restriction on it let us see what is the restriction so guys this pdf material i will upload on the google drive and i will uh, you know uh, give that google drive link on the description below so don't worry about pdf right now you are not focusing on what i am teaching you are focusing on pdf focus on whatever i am teaching and you might not even need the pdf okay so um, restriction of number of cost audits so 141 3g uh, section restricts number of cost audit it restricts uh, what is the um, uh, you know uh, cost audit uh, how many cost audit are required to be done by a particular person it restricts it section 141 3g uh, restricts the uh the number of cost auditor number of cost audit which one cost auditor can do now what is that restriction restriction is in a case for a firm appointed by the cost appoint as a cost auditor of the company it shall not hold more than 20 audits so any partnership firm cannot hold more than 20 audits per partner this limit is per partner which means if there are three partnership firms in a come in a firm then three three multiply by 20 which means that firm can do 60 audits okay three partners 20 audit per partner that means that firm can do 60 audits so 20 audit per partner is the limit uh, which is prescribed under the, under the law and yes this limit does not include one person companies dormant companies small companies and most importantly private companies having paid up share capital of less than 100 crores so if you have private companies which have less than 100 crores share capital you can do unlimited companies audit of such companies okay unlimited audit can be performed but in case you have a public company you have a company where the uh bed of share capital is more than 100 crores in case of a, um, a private company also then guys the limit is only 20 companies you can do cost audit of only of 20 companies not more than 20 companies that is the restriction on number of audits then disqualifications of order very very important topic guys from an exam standpoint also uh yes uh direct question might not come but still uh, an indirect question can come from this particular uh, aspect so disqualifications of cost order section 141 first of all he shall not be a body corporate any body corporate is not um, uh, you know eligible to do cost audit can anyone tell me the reason in the chat box let's see who all have prepared this particular section well please tell me why a body corporate body corporate means any company or any other organization established under the statutory provisions of any act like banking regulation uh, has banking companies insurance companies all these are included under body corporate body corporate is a broader word and corporate company is a narrower word company means only those companies which are registered under companies act 2013 and body corporate means those companies which are registered under 2013 plus any company which is formed under any statutory provisions of law which means you know banking companies insurance companies finance companies nbfcs uh, any kind of companies which are statutory uh, prepared okay yes ghoshal dake very good ghoshal dake very good answer so why body corporate is not allowed um, uh, to do cost audit because it has a separate legal entity it is a separate legal entity there's a corporate wheel between uh, body corporate a company and its shareholders or the owners so owners cannot be held responsible for the errors done by the company and that is the reason why body corporates are not allowed to do um you know audits of any company be it statutory audit or cost audit 
अदर देन एल एल पी और पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म सो एल एल पी एंड पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म इज अलाउड टू डू द ऑडिट नाउ गाइज लिमिटेड लाइबिलिटी इज स्टिल लिमिटेड पार्टनरशिप इज ऑल्सो लिमिटेड लाइबिलिटी ओके देर पार्टनर ऑल्सो नॉट एलिजिबल फॉर अनलिमिटेड लाइबिलिटी देन वाई दे हैव बिन परमिटेड टू डू ऑडिट बिकॉज गाइज दे ऑलवेज हैव वन पार्टनर हुज अनलिमिटेड लाइबिलिटी विच इज द डेजिग्नेटेड पार्टनर designated partner always have unlimited liability and that is why um, uh, you know even when limited liability partnership has got word limited in it even then um, uh, this company this particular uh, firm is eligible to get its uh, to do its audit okay so llbs are okay llb uh, audit can be done by an llb body corporate cannot held trust position individually neha bhere very good neha bhere very good he shall not be an officer or employee of the company now the second requirement is that auditor cannot be an officer or employee of the company because if auditor is an officer or an employee of the company then guys that person holds office of profit he is an officer or employee of the company then he will be biased towards the company so he cannot be an officer or employee of the company next is he shall not be in partnership or in employment of an officer or uh, employee of the company so neither the officer and employee of the company is eligible nor the partner of officer or employee of officer can be um, uh, you know uh, auditor of the company so officers and their employees and partners are also restricted from doing the cost audit again guys independence right we don't want any um, a person who is closely linked with the company who has office of profit in the company to audit our company okay he including his relatives shall not be indebted to the company so a person who is not indebted to the company um or its associates company or its associates associates means the group companies okay for an amount exceeding 5 lakh rupees so indebtedness should not be there if you want to be an auditor okay then he shall not be holding any security or any interest in the company um however his relative may hold security up to face value of rupees 1 lakh so auditor himself cannot hold shares even worth 1 rupee but auditor's relatives auditor's wife auditor's mother auditor's children auditor's uncle auditor's brother they can hold securities worth rupees maximum face value of 1 lakh rupees face value is important over here face value should be maximum 1 lakh rupees he shall not he shall have not given any guarantee or provided any security in connection with indebtedness of the third person to the company so that person should not have given any security or guarantee on behalf of the company okay that is also very very important uh, neither the person should be indebted to the company nor had had he given any uh, guarantee to the debt of the company so for example you know uh, there is a company who is taking a loan mr a gives guarantee on behalf of the company that if company doesn't pay then mr a will pay so mr a here becomes linked to the company so mr a cannot be the auditor of the company mr a cannot be the auditor of the company very very important provision he shall not have business relationship with the company any kind of uh, activities which are prohibited we will see what is this uh, activities which are prohibited under um, uh, the at the rate sign he shall not have any business relationship with the company he should not be uh, providing any restricted or prohibited services to the company if he wants to be the cost auditor he shall not be relative of director or employee of the director or key management personnel so you know key management personnel or the uh, top management of the company he shall not be any relative of the director or employee of the director okay so relative is also prohibited in case of director and employee of the director is also prohibited um, from auditing the same company he shall not be in full time employment elsewhere so he should not be in employment elsewhere he should not work anywhere else okay because then there will be a um, uh, threat there will be a threat between the two companies so he should not be a in full time employment anywhere he shall not exceed the ceiling on number of audits so number of audits which is 20 he shall not exceed that ceiling he shall neither be internal auditor of the company non current current auditor so internal auditor he cannot be an internal auditor he cannot even be a concurrent auditor concurrent auditor means auditor which is um, uh, required to Uh, get uh, audit of banks done concurrent means on a regular basis the auditor is going okay because guys both of these situation will lead to a threat which is self review threat self review threat means if an internal auditor would uh, uh, do the internal audit and come back as a cost auditor again then there is a self review threat he is reviewing his own work he has already performed internal audit of that particular company and now he is reviewing his own work so that is that will lead to self review threat so the internal auditor or concurrent auditor cannot be the cost auditor of the companies that is the requirement self review threat is there in case of um, these two things he shall not be engaged whether directly or indirectly as on date of appointment in consulting specialized services as provided under section 144 
So 144 is a limiting section, guys, which limits the kind of services which auditor can perform along with doing cost audit. When auditor is doing cost audit, he cannot do certain things which are listed under section 144. So 144 is a limiting section. He shall not be convicted by court for any offense involving fraud and a period of 10 years has not, not elapsed from date of such conviction. He shall not uh, be convicted by a court for any kind of fraud. If he is convicted by a court for any kind of fraud, then he has to give a cooling off period of 10 years. So next 10 years, he will not be able to do cost audit of any, um, uh, you know, company. Sir, we can't be in employment of X Limited and order of Y Limited, which are completely unrelated parties. Very good. We cannot be. Very good. Neha Bere, Neha Bere. Yes, you are absolutely right. If we are employment in employment of X Limited, we cannot be an order of Y Limited. We cannot be because if you are in employment, then that means that you are not holding COP, Certificate of Practice. And if you are not holding Certificate of Practice, then how can you do audit? You cannot do audit. Yes. Body corporate cannot be held trust position individually. Very good. Separate legal entity, so lack of responsibility. Perfect. Perfect, guys. Good. Aarti Jain says, Kitne hours chalega? Jitne hours chala paayenge, utne sa hours chalega. Aaj to bas aaj jane ki zid na karo. Yun hi YouTube pe bethe raho. Aaj jane ki zid na karo. Bhai, ab to samay sa start ho gaya hai. Humara ek dam peak season start ho gaya hai exam se pehle. To ab aapko ghante gin ke to padhai karni hi nahi chahi. The students who ask me, sir, how many hours should we study? Don't ask this question from me, from me. Don't ask this question from any person in the world. Ask this question from yourself. How many hours do you study? What do you uh, are you required to study when you are in CMA final? When you are at the last step of CMA final, and then the less, next step is that you are going to get a professional degree that is going to benefit you immensely. You ask yourself, how many hours can you put in a particular day? A particular day has 24 hours. Whatever best you can do, do that. Never ask um, this question at this critical stage from anyone. How many hours should we study? No, there's no demarcation. There's no counting of how many hours should you study at this point in time. Guys, study as much as possible. Give your heart and soul to it. Because you are going to get amazing, amazing benefits out of it. So give your heart and soul to it. Yes. Yes, guys. <clears throat> Okay, so he shall not be engaged anywhere in the specialized services. 144, he should not be given and he should not be um, uh, convicted by court for any fraud. Okay, so there are certain business relationships which are, um, uh, you know, prohibited. For example, there cannot be any commercial transactions between the auditor and the company. There cannot be commercial transactions. So if I'm the auditor of the company, um, I cannot supply cement to the company as well. Okay, I have, if I'm auditor of the company, I'm the only the auditor of the company. Okay, associates means the group companies. Then there are 144 special services, 144 services. You should be aware about these services. Just read this list. If you are providing these services to the company, you cannot be a cost auditor of that particular company. This is the list. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, let's finish this particular part. Okay, this you are, you are going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You are going to do this. Okay. DIY, you need to answer these questions. Mr. A, practicing cost accountant is holding securities of XYZ Limited having face value of 900 rupees. Whether may Mr. A is qualified for appointment as cost auditor or not? Yes or no? Yes or no? Supreet Saluja says, your motivation is all we need. Yes, I am here for the motivation as well as the teaching. Sir, you singing bhi achhi kar lete ho. Okay, thank you, Neha Bhere. Okay, first question, please answer, guys. A practicing cost accountant is holding securities of XYZ Limited of only 900 rupees. Huh? Hardly matters. Huh? <clears throat> is he qualified? Can he be appointed as the cost auditor? So the limit is 1 lakh, no? 900 hardly matters. It's it's like peanuts. So small. 900. Is he qualified for appointing as a cost auditor? Please write a yes or no in the chat box. Is he qualified? Answer is no. He is not qualified. Because as a cost auditor, even if he's holding one share, that is prohibited. No, he is not qualified. Answer is no. Okay, B. Answer it please, guys. B. Mr. P is a practicing cost accountant and Q, the relative of P, is holding securities of ABC Limited for the face value of 90,000 rupees. Whether Mr. P is qualified from being appointed as the order of ABC Limited? For relative, it is 1 lakh. Very good. 
So now in this case, guys, relative of order is holding securities worth face value of ninety thousand. Whether he is eligible or not, yes or no, please write in the chat box. B part, yes or no? Perfect, perfect. Ghoshal Dake has got has got the correct answer. Yes, he is qualified because for relatives the limit is one lakh rupees. For relatives the limit is not. um uh, you know uh, zero but the limit is 1 lakh rupees so relative can hold securities worth 1 lakh rupees and this relative is holding securities only worth 90000 rupees so yes he is eligible yes he is eligible perfect answer c c mr rm and company is an audit firm having partners cma r cma m okay Have offered the appointment as an auditor of E N N Limited for financial year sixteen seventeen. Mister B, the relative of C M A R, okay, is holding five thousand uh, shares of rupees ten each, having market value of one lakh fifty thousand. Oh, market value is one lakh fifty thousand. Although he is a relative, although he is a relative, but he is holding shares worth one lakh fifty thousand. Whether Mister R M Company is disqualified to be appointed as the auditor? Please tell me yes or no. <clears throat> whether they are disqualified from being the auditor yes or no i'll expand expand the uh, uh, document a little bit so that you can see it properly okay see it properly guys whether he is disqualified from being appointed as the auditor please write yes or no in the chat box yes or no answer is no 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 yes face value is considered market value is not considered very good answer by goshal dake yes perfect answer guys so no he is not disqualified no <clears throat> no not disqualified why not disqualified because face value is seen market value is not seen and face value is 50000 the limit is 1 lakh it is much below 1 lakh face value is 50000 face value is seen market value is not seen market value is 1 lakh 50000 okay market value is irrelevant perfect 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 guys very good answer by all of you very good answer okay now let's see what are the powers of auditor what are the powers of cost auditor so as powers of cost auditor number one is right to access books and vouchers at all times uh, whether kept at head office of the company or elsewhere so cost auditor has the power to um, uh, access books of accounts and the relevant documents at all times guys in the chat box is it does it mean that auditor can knock the doors of cfo's home at 12 midnight and ask him to uh, give the books of accounts to the uh, auditor does it give this power to the auditor as well right to access books of accounts and vouchers at all times is written at all times so can he knock the doors of the cfo's home and tell him to give the cost records and cost sheets at 12 midnight is it possible or no answer is no it is not rekha choudhary is right answer is no no correct because it's specifically written books are kept at head office you cannot go to cfo's home to get the uh, books they are kept at head office and yes at all times means there's a reasonable interpretation to it at all times means during working hours of that particular company during working hours of that particular company yes during business hours perfect to inquire obtain any information from the officer as he considered necessary so whatever information is required to be gathered that information um, uh, is to be gathered by the auditor within reasonable times to gain access to the information and data required for cost audit uh, or cost audit such a cost accounting rules so to gain any information access any information um, uh, like cost accounting record statement and excerpts pro forma all these things can be done by the cost auditor so these are the powers of the cost auditor the cost auditor can obtain all such things uh, you know from the company to do its cost audit okay then guys what are the penalties for not compliance with section 141 143 144 what are the penalties very very important guys section 147 penalties for non compliance okay penalties are in case of cost order if default is done by a cost order then the penalty is for unknowing default rupees 25000 to 5 lakhs for knowing or willful default rupees 1 lakh to 25 lakhs now this you have to prove that was the default knowing or unknowing okay because the penalties are different for knowing and un unknowing defaults where cost order is convicted he or she shall also be required to refund the remuneration received by him uh, to the company and pay damages if any damages are required to be paid and the remuneration is required to be refunded then if the default is on part of the company then company has to pay a fine of 25000 to 5 lakh rupees and if the default is on part of any officer of the company 
any officer of the company means the CFO, the cost director, the cost manager, uh, the costing in charge. All these are the officers of the company, the relevant people who handle the cost records and cost audit. They are the relevant people. Okay. So the timetable of uh, revision classes every day, the class will be held from 9 p.m. onwards till the time we complete that particular chapter. Okay. So that is the timetable. There's no specific timetable. Sir, if business conductor at night, then can order inspect such uh, in night at registered office. Yes, Neha Bhere. If the business hours are, uh, night hours are also there, uh, you know, if the com company works in night only, okay, and the finance department comes in night only, then uh, your books of accounts shall be accessible at night as well. You can do it. In case the default is done by any officer of the company, which means the CFO, the costing director, the costing manager, the default is done in that way. Imprisonment. For zero to two, uh, one years and fine of 10,000 rupees to 1 lakh rupees fine is there uh, for this kind of a default. Now, duties of the cost order, of course, guys, if there are, you know, um, powers which are given to cost order, then there are duties also which are, um, uh, which the order should uh, take care of. There are duties also which the order should take care of. Number one, to ensure that proper books of accounts are maintained by the company. Auditor must make sure. Auditor must make sure that proper books of accounts are maintained by the company as per the rules and cost accounting standards. As per the rules and the cost accounting standard, proper books of accounts should be maintained by the company. That is the first thing that the auditor should ensure. Number two, he is duty bound to verify the returns of those branches which are not visited by him. So any branch is there. Uh, the auditor has not visited that branch. Even then, guys, the cost records, the cost accounting uh, sheet, the cost uh, accounting records, the uh, uh, annexures, the documents, everything should be reviewed by the order. Order cannot say that, oh, that was a small branch, that's why I didn't visit it. If the fraud has been unearthed from that branch, I'm not responsible. No, order is responsible for that branch also, which he did not visit. To ensure that cost audit report and detailed cost statements are um, in the form prescribed uh, in the rules. So rules are uh, giving you certain um, formats in which the cost accounting records and cost accounting data should be uh, fed in. So auditor should ensure that all the cost records are in that format itself to ensure reasonableness of assumptions and basis of allocation absorption of indirect expenses are done as per the established standards. The established standards are cost accounting standards. So the auditor should ensure that whatever absorption costing has been taken into place, whatever indirect expenses have been absorbed in the cost sheet that are as per the cost accounting standards, which are prescribed uh, by the institute. And yes, in our revision class, we will take up all the 24 standards in great detail guys great details we are going to get into it to qualify the report in case there is any need so qualification means the report should be um, uh, you know uh, dented with a statement that the, these are the problems in the financial statements or cost statements of the company so qualification should be uh, given in the cost audit report if any um, uh, thing is uh, required to be mentioned over there then sending cost audit report to the company within one eight days from the end of the financial year so as soon as the financial year ends uh, within 180 days of the end of the financial year, cost audit report should be submitted to the company, not later than 180 days from the end of the financial year. Appointment of order is done uh, within 180 days of the commencement of the financial year and cost audit report should be done uh, within 180 days of end of the financial year. That is the very important requirement. Okay, sir. And the next topic is audit risk. Yes. What do you mean by audit risk? Guys, audit risk means, audit risk means the risk that the uh, uh, expression which is given by the order is incorrect. Okay. If the order is saying that, yes, everything is correct and the, order, uh, the thing is not correct, that is audit risk. So what is audit risk? So you'll, uh, you'll uh, understand it by, uh, by taking one example. Okay. What do you mean by risk? What do you mean by risk? Risk means that whatever you don't want, that thing happens. That is risk. What do you mean by risk? Risk means whatever you don't want, that thing happens. And what is audit risk? Audit risk is that whatever you don't want an audit, that happens. And what do you don't want an audit? I don't want to give a incorrect view in audit. And by chance, you give only incorrect view in the audit. That is audit risk. You're not able to um, uh, catch hold of fraud. You're not able to catch hold of error. You're not able to catch hold of miscompliances in the cost statements. That is the risk in audit. So audit risk means the risk that cost auditor expresses an inappropriate audit opinion. Cost order gives a wrong audit opinion. That is the audit risk uh, towards the cost statement. That is the audit risk. An incorrect audit opinion is given by the cost order. That is the audit risk. In other words, audit risk is the risk that cost statements are materially incorrect. Cost statements are incorrect in a major way. Materially means in a major way that hampers the decision making of the uh, company. Though the audit opinion states that financial reports are free from material misstatement. So audit report is saying financial statements are fine. They are all good. 
However, there is some material misstatement in the financial statement. That is the audit risk, which means the auditor has missed out on some point. Auditor has not done the scrutiny well. Auditor has not done the checking well. That is known as audit risk. Okay. Probabilities of uncertainties to happen. Supreet Salucha, Saluja, very good answer. Very good answer. Uncertainty. Ankita, very good answer. Perfect, guys. Perfect. So, audit risk are of two types, guys, or three types. Audit risk are of two, three types. Please learn this well. This is an important um, element of our syllabus, guys. Audit risk is of three types. Number one, inherent risk. Number two, control risk. Number three, detection risk. These are three types of audit risk. Once you add on all these audit risks, then it will give you the complete audit risk. And these two audit risks, which are inherent risk and control risk, these two combined together uh, will give you risk of material misstatement. This is also known as ROMM. ROMM. Risk of material misstatement. So risk of material misstatement arises from these two risks. And if you combine all three risks, then it will give you audit risk. Now let us see what are these three risks which are there in audit. Okay. Let us see what are three risks which are there in audit. So yes, guys, how's the Josh now in the room? We are still more than half a century um, uh, strong people in the room. How's the Josh, guys? Please write in the chat box. And yes, do like the video if you are liking this session. And if you want me to continue this session because your love, your appreciation, your support, your um, uh, wholehearted um, affection will motivate me to get these tests uh, get these series of marathon up and running guys up and running full sir hi sir ankita says ajna says great sir neha says hi puja says hi wonderful so there are almost more than uh, you know 60 people in the room and i am getting answers only from six what are the rest people doing huh if business is conducted tonight, then we can. Okay, okay, got it. Yes, yes, very interesting. Hi, Pawan K Jagdab says hi. Okay, all right. So, guys, there are three kind of audit risk: inherent risk, control risk, detection risk. First is inherent risk. What do you mean by inherent risk? Inherent risk means these risks are um, now forming the core of our uh, financial statements or the accounts which we are auditing. This is the inherent in the. Um, uh, accounting code itself it is inevitable it we cannot do anything about it because these risks are there in the account head itself these are there in the financial statements itself we cannot do anything about these inherent risk and what are these inherent risk inherent risk are whenever we are preparing a provision and making an estimate of the expense guys while preparing that provision and making an es estimate of that particular expense we can do an error in calculation calculation can go wrong in estimate it is just an estimate Whenever you are making a provision for expenses, it is just an estimate. You can go wrong there. Provision for bad debt, you can go wrong there. So there's an inherent risk in such accounts uh, which can make them wrong, which can make them incorrect. And we cannot do anything about it because it's just an estimate. It can go wrong any point in time. We have very little control on these inherent risk. So yes, company is saying we have a provision for bad debt of 2 crores. But you know, you never know. Actual bad debts uh, come out to 4 crores or 6 crores or they come out to 50 lakhs or 5 lakhs. You never know. So these are such accounts where the risk is inherent. It, it is present inside the account itself. We cannot do anything about it. That is inherent risk. Risk of expressing inappropriate uh, uh, opinion due to certain inherent features present in the accounts of financial statements. Like complexity of clients, nature of business or transaction. The complex, the transaction are very complex. Calculation complex calculations are there which can be misstated okay transaction involving high level of human judgment where we are judging something okay so when we are valuing you know complex derivative instrument then you know judgment is required estimate is required when we are estimating anything we can go wrong guys we can go wrong undoubtedly we can go wrong so that is inherent risk number two control risk what is control risk control risk is um you know what are controls internal controls so inherent risk is systematic risk okay goshal says okay yeah, where internet risk cannot be avoided. However, we can reduce it. Yes, we can reduce it. It cannot be fully avoided. Goshal says timing of marathon is perfect for working folks. Thanks a lot. Yes, it has been decided as per the working force. This session will be recorded. YouTube. Okay. Okay. So control risk. What do you mean by control risk? Control risk means that, you know, inappropriate audit opinion will be expressed despite of the fact that controls have been installed in the company. Controls are there in the company despite of that fact. You know, um, uh, the audit can go wrong. 
So you know, auditors rely on controls a lot. What do you mean by controls? Controls are the checks and balances which company puts inside the organization uh, to test that transactions are working well. They are known as controls. And if the controls are working fine, then auditor will um, employ less auditing procedures on those financial statements or those account statements. If the controls are working fine, so auditor will evaluate the controls which are there in a particular transaction and will uh, employ lesser amount of auditing uh, procedures in those accounts where the controls are strong. Now, suppose auditor concludes that the controls are strong, but they're not that strong. What are controls? Controls are um, ways of checking a particular transaction. For example, if expense worth 5 lakh or uh, above will be done by the company, it will be signed only by the MD managing director. This is a control to check that uh, no hangy manky stuff goes on in the business and no money is um, you know uh, ripped off from the business this is a control uh, 5 lakh rupees above expense shall be um, signed only by the md now what if the md himself breaks this uh, rule or policy he tells his general manager oh you please sign the check i am not uh, available you sign the check that's okay what if this happens this is a lapse of control and if there's a lapse of control then order has to be extra vigile order has to be extra cautious so what is control risk? Control risk is that, you know, we uh, we express an in, uh, appropriate audit opinion, which will not be prevented or detected or corrected by entities, internal operational management controls. So even when controls were there, then also the fraud is not detecting. Why? Because the um, uh, internal controls are overridden by management. The controls, the worst part about controls is that uh, internal controls are overridden by the management. Management can easily say that, oh, no, we are not following the controls. So that is the control risk that, you know, uh, uh, weak oh, internal controls are established, which are very weak. Secondly, management is overriding the internal controls. Management is um, covering the internal controls. Because of these two factors, controls become weak. And this leads to uh, auditor being confused about the control effectiveness and being taking the wrong decision. That is control risk. Okay. Both of these risks combined together is known as risk of material misstatement. Last is the detection risk. Detection risk is entirely auditor's responsibility, guys. Okay. Auditor has failed to employ good audit procedures. The audit procedures which auditor has employed are incorrect, are not good. He has failed to employ good auditing procedures. That is the detection risk. Auditor has not been able to um, employ good auditing procedures. He has employed auditing procedures which are not correct according to the nature of the company, according to the transaction of the company, the auditing procedures are not correct. That is known as detection risk. Auditor has not been able to, um, uh, you know, um, put appropriate auditing checks and balances. It is problem of the order. So there are three things which are very, very important guys. Nature, timing and extent of audit procedures, NTE. This is known as NTE. So whatever audit procedure order is appointing, that order procedure should be appropriate according to the nature of the transaction. Timing should be perfect and extent. Extent means what is the uh, sample size that we are going to take. <clears throat> order has to make sure that the uh, ordering procedure is perfect. So I'll give you an example. Inventory valuation is always done at the end of the year, which is 31st March 2023 or 24, whatever it is. Okay. Audit count, audit inventory count should be done on 31st March itself. Now it is auditors mistake if he does the audit uh, if he does the stock count on 30th april it is mistake of the auditor auditor has done wrong he will never be able to um, accurately compute the value of inventory if he has done the stock take on 30th april because inventory is to be reported on 31st march only or beginning of the year and end of the year so if you do stock count at the end of 30th april not effective not good you are doing wrong so when auditor himself does some wrong procedure he himself does some incorrect activity which makes his opinion incorrect that is known as detection risk that is known as detection risk so detection risk is the risk that audit procedures followed by the auditor will not detect a material misstatement audit procedures are incorrect it will not detect a material misstatement it will not um, uh, you know uh, catch hold of a material misstatement that is known as detection risk detection risk cannot be reduced to zero so detection, detection risk uh, cannot be reduced to zero because the auditor usually does not examine all of the cost heads and disclosures. Detection risk relates to the nature, timing and extent of auditor's procedures that are determined by the auditor to reduce the audit risk to an acceptably low level. We can reduce the audit risk, but we cannot make it zero. Okay. That is known as audit risk. Okay. So these are the three elements of audit risk and the ultimate, um, uh, you know, result of audit risk is that you will give a wrong opinion. 
that is the inherent risk control risk detection risk and if you do not um, uh, you know uh, take care of these risk then your audit opinion can actually um, uh, be a, uh, absolutely uh, wrong audit opinion can be wrong this is known as audit risk okay guys so this was the chapter of basics on audit from all for all of you and yes i'll be uploading this pdf um, uh, in the google drive i'll be sharing the link on the description okay i'll be sharing the entire list link on the description so yes this was the chapter on basics of cost audit for all of you and yes um this marathon series will continue for the entire syllabus in very short span of time i'll be revising all the important topics of your entire cost and management audit paper and yes theoretical as well as practical both the aspects i'm going to deal with in this particular session guys so uh, please be with me for uh, a couple of next few days and we'll be finishing the entire cost and management audit at a very very uh, uh, high speed and a very very short span of time we'll be covering all the aspects of um, the important aspects of cost and management audit in this test series in this marathon series which will continue for a few days now timing will be constant 9 pm daily okay monday to friday Saturday, Sunday, uh, the uh, marathon will not be there. Monday to Friday, all days marathon will be there. If there is any emergency whereby I will not be able to take the marathon, I will put it in the communities tab. So please uh, keep a tab of communities tab. I'll be put. I'll be putting over there that today, uh, you know, due to some reason, marathon class will not be there. But otherwise, the timing is fixed. Monday to Friday, nine o'clock in the evening, we'll be meeting for the marathon class of cost and management order. And yes, this particular subject is going to give you marks that will benefit. To uh, benefit you in the entire group or the entire CMA final because ben ben benefit of set off will be given by this particular subject. Cost audit and BVM SPM, these are two subjects, guys, which will give you benefit of set off. Benefit of set off will be given to you by these two subjects. If you like this uh, marathon series and if you want me to continue with this marathon series, guys, please hit the like button, okay? Like button, please hit um, uh, before you go. And yes, we'll be meeting in our subsequent session. So, yes, um, uh, let's first of all, before we uh, call off the uh, session please hit a like button and let's see how many of you have liked this particular video the next speech we have got <clears throat> are even less than 200 not fair at all guys not fair at all like should be actually actually more now we should target a little more uh likes and yes you can do it you can definitely do it guys all right guys so this was today's session and we'll be meeting in our subsequent sessions with more cost right provisions and yes we'll complete it in our marathon series so yes we'll be meeting tomorrow all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you in the next session we are going to start the second chapter and yes the most important chapter of your syllabus guys very very important from a practical standpoint as well as from theoretical standpoint the most important chapter of your syllabus chapter number two that is what we are going to start today so quickly quickly guys please write in the chat box How's the Josh for the upcoming examination? Are we all set to rock CMA final group four examination and have those three alphabets before our name C M A? Are we all set? How's the Josh guys? Please comment in the comment section. Yes. Shreya Ghate, Yogesh, Vishal, Manisha, Tejasvi. Yes, we all have amazing 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 josh and full high we are full on energy guys because yes quick time check uh, uh for the examination guys time is very very less now you know approximately um uh, uh one one even less than one and a half months to go for your examination so yes we need to gear up we cannot afford now to leave even one hour wasted even one hour we cannot afford to um uh, you know waste in our preparation tree so yes an amazing 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 time to put in our heart and soul okay put in a hundred percent to this goal called cma and yes we'll be able to achieve this goal very 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 easily so yes let's start today's session guys and today's session is dedicated to com companies cost records and audit rules 2014 the most important rules of your syllabus and yes from this particular chapter you can easily expect questions worth 15 marks in your examination 10 to 15 marks dedicated to this particular chapter and um uh, why what 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 kind of questions can be asked theoretical as well as practical both kind of questions can be asked theoretical as well as practical questions uh, both can be asked Sir, office ke baad energy low rehti hai, lekin chalega meko because hume vanna hai CMA. Yes, bilkul chalega energy ko low rehte hue bhi padhai karna hai, humko achche marks lana hai, aur exam mein qualify karna hai. So let's start. Companies, cost records and audit rules 2014. Guys, yesterday, while studying section 148, now let me ask you, okay, 
what is section 14814 please comment in the comment section let me uh, see how many of you have seen yesterday's marathon section 148 subsection 1 is for what what is the purpose of the section section 148 subsection 1 let me see in the comment section what is your answer to this question all i still have group 3 to clear later i always dream of seeing myself with that title every day yes abhishek amazing amazing <clears throat> okay guys yesterday we started one section 1481 please comment in the chat box what is the subject matter of that subsection subsection 1 of section 148 perfect <clears throat> tanisha jain is wrong tanish jain is wrong perfect rest everyone is uh, absolutely fine joshika alagu ajnaz arti lavanya cost records very good guys very very good so cost records uh, who should prepare cost records that is section 1481 and yes arti has answered my next question my next question was what is section 148 sub section 2 arti has already answered it it's cost audit perfect guys so guys these are the rules which are related to two things cost records and cost audit who shall prepare the cost audit who shall get the cost audit done who shall prepare the cost records everything will be clarified under these rules and these rules are amended up till 2019 which are there in your syllabus so these are 2014 rules but amended till 2019 so you can actually um, uh, you know uh, you have to actually do all the amendments which have come by in these rules up to 2019 so let us start this session by giving you a brief history of cost records and cost audit rules which were existing uh, prior to these rules guys earlier cost audit was ordered on a company basis which means that individual companies were selected and those companies were instructed to get their cost audit done so this company based cost records and cost audit scenario was changed to industry based cost records and cost audit scenario which means now a product will be identified and everyone who's making that particular product will be asked to prepare its cost records of course subject to certain monetary threshold limit so in earlier scenario only a few companies were selected for uh, cost audit purposes and they were named in an order that these are the names of the companies uh, whose cost audit is required to be done now no such order comes uh, from the ministry uh, you have been given monetary thresholds if your turnover is above those monetary thresholds you will be required to get your cost records prepared and get your cost audit done okay so this is a brief history of these cost records all right let's start the cost records rules uh, cost records and audit rules and yes rule number 1 is the title title is companies cost records and audit rules 2014 that is the title of this um, uh, rules rule 2 are certain definitions and these are very straight forward definitions guys so you know uh, you can do it yourself ah now we come on to the most important rule rule 3 and guys rule 3 corresponds to section 148 sub section 1 which is cost records now you must be wondering since yesterday who what are those companies who are uh, required to get their cost records prepared what are those companies of in 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 whom in whose case cost records are required to be prepared all your answers will be answered today in rule number 3 so in rule number 3 we are going to see what are the companies what are the situation what are the scenarios in which cost records are mandatorily required to be made so what are cost records cost records are comprise of three things utilization of material utilization of labor and other item of cost which cumulatively directs you to cost sheet So you need to prepare cost sheet and the supporting annexures, supporting ledger um, accounts, some more supporting uh, details of the balances. You have to prepare all these things that will be termed as your cost records. So cost records, applicability of cost records. Rule three is the rule where application of cost records are required to be analyzed and required to be um, seen by you. So cost records. Now any company. including a foreign company please note each and every word each and every word of this rule is very very important very very important okay any company including a foreign company engaged in production of goods or providing services so any company which means the section is wide open it it is applicable to um, any company including a foreign company which is engaged in production of goods or providing services so two mandatory things which are required to be fulfilled are you should be producing certain goods you should be providing certain services which are specified under the tables below no no not every goods and services but only those goods and services which are specified in the tables below shall be required to prepare cost records for such products or services in their books of accounts it is mandatory that for these products the products which are listed over there for these products you need to mandatorily prepare cost records in your books of accounts now what are these uh, products so guys these products are divided into two parts category a and category b category a is the regulated sector which means that this sector is bound by some law this sector is bound by some legal provisions by some ministry or they are regulated by government of india directly 
so there are two uh, tables table 1 category a products which are regulated sector these sectors are regulated or these are um, uh, you know uh, these are uh, led with compliances by the government of india what are these uh, sectors telecommunication sectors including transmission reception of signs signals writing images sounds or intelligence of any nature or broadcasting services so guys this is a very a uh, wide uh, um, uh, you know category where even if you are broadcasting pictures which means instagram okay or snapchat or any kind of social media platform where you are exchanging images sound or intelligence of any nature broadcasting services is uh, categorized under this particular section so even your whatsapp will be categorized under this particular uh, section so everything which is related to broadcasting of signs signals uh, sounds image movie anything that is covered under this uh, uh, this provision telecommunication uh, telecom regulatory authority of india which is try is the responsible act next is generation transmission distribution and supply of electricity very 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 important regulated sector guys if you are into generation transmission distribution or supply there are four things which are included in the section if you are doing any one of the four activities with respect to supply of electricity be it generation be it transmission be it distribution or supply you are eligible to prepare your cost records the next is petroleum products again eligible to prepare your cost records drugs and pharmaceuticals fertilizers sugar and industrial alcohol these are the regulated sector so if you are um, uh, you know producing any one of these category of products then subject to the monetary threshold you are required to prepare your cost records and what are cost records cost records are um, uh, cost records are um, the records which are uh, required to be maintained as per the cost sheet as per the cost sheet okay and <clears throat> one very amazing shortcut tri trick told to us by by arti jain t's pdf t's pdf okay so shortcut is t's pdf t e a s p d f this is a shortcut trick um, by which you can remember these uh, uh, these all these provisions guys so this is uh, telecommunication generation transmission distribution of electricity petroleum products drugs pharmaceuticals fertilizer sugar and industrial alcohol okay and yes guys from this particular aspect uh, examiner is not going to ask the entire uh, section the entire uh, list of services or goods but is going to ask um you know specific questions from this particular type okay now comes the second category of goods category b which is the unregulated sector which means that this sector is free from any regulation from government of india and this particular sector has um uh, no regulations which are which they are bound uh, within their production capacity so you know their production capacity is not bound their selling capacity is not bound their marketing is not bound they are not bound by anything so these are unregulated sector and there are 33 industries which are specified under this unregulated sector so what are these 33 industries these 33 industries are machinery mechanical appliances used in defense space atomic energy okay um now even the companies which are engaged in any item or supplied exclusively for use under this clause shall be deemed to be covered under this rules now very very important inclusion guys so all the companies which are um producing producing something which is exclusively used in uh defense space atomic energy etc then guys those companies are also covered under this particular category so there's a company which is preparing defense equipments there's another company who's supplying some goods to defense equipment exclusively then that other company will also be falling under this category that is the um uh, uh, rule so turbo jets turbo propellers arms ammunition explosives propellant powder prepared explosive other than powder safety fuses deno detonating fuses percussion or detonating caps so guys you do not need to remember or uh, you know mug up each and every word you just have to read these entire list thrice and you will be able to identify in the examination if uh, the examiner asks you however however examiner just generally doesn't ask these names of these products but if it asks you it will click you so do not try to mug up this entire uh, list of uh, products it is virtually impossible to um, uh, you know mug up this entire list of um, uh, products okay okay sir <clears throat> so next is radar appar apparatus radar apparatus port services of uh, steven doring pilot pilotage etc etc all these are covered under the category of uh, unregulated goods iron and steel roads and other infrastructure projects rubber allied products coffee 
inorganic chemical etc etc so you can you know um, uh, you can cover this entire list properly and yes you need to read this entire list one very amazing section guys health services health services namely functioning running of hospitals diagnostic centers um, uh, clinical centers test laboratory etc exclusions are companies running hospitals exclusively for its own employees are um, uh, you know excluded from this category so if you run a hospital but only for your employees you are excluded from this category second one companies engaged in running of beauty parlors and beauty treatment so very very good news for all the girls out here for all the girls um, beauty parlor and beauty treatment is exempt from cost um, uh, records so naturally they'll be exempt from cost audit also so beauty parlors beauty treatment is not covered under this category education services are ca covered under this particular category okay milk powder insecticide so you can read this entire list this list is very very important from an exam standpoint okay one very important thing which you need note which you need to note at this point in time guys please note the category 33rd please note the category 33rd okay please note this category 33 so guys generally the cost records are applicable only where you produce a particular product they are not applicable where you are just trading in a particular product however in clause 33 production import supply or trading trading this is the only category out of the 33 categories which includes trading as well so in this particular category guys even when you are not manufacturing these medical equipments even when you are not um, producing these medical equipments but even if you are just trading in these uh, uh, medical equipments you will be eligible for cost records one very very important thing to be noted in clause number 33 please underline it please um, uh, wherever is your um, you know notebook or wherever is your book whichever book you are referring to please underline this particular part exclusions the rule is not applicable which means cost records are not applicable cost records are not applicable to foreign companies having only liaison office in india liaison office means the office which does only marketing function in india so a foreign company which is having only liaison office in india with respect to product category 33 above this category guys so if you have a foreign uh, company which is having a license office in india with respect to product 33 it is exempt from cost records even if it is um, you know uh, producing any of these things it is trading in any of these things second is micro enterprise or small enterprise as per the msmed act so msmed act is an act which safeguards the interest of small small enterprises and uh, mini enterprises um, that act permits uh, you know the companies to uh, pay on time it, it uh, requires commitment from the companies to pay on time to these msmeds to these uh, small and medium enterprises so guys in this particular act whatever is the definition of micro and small enterprise they are exempt from um, uh, you know preparing the cost records the exemption has been granted to them there's a definition of msmed what is micro what is medium given under this particular table okay now what is the monetary threshold for rule three this is a very very important point guys very very important and i need to uh, read each and every word of this particular line very very carefully so monetary threshold for applicability of rule 3 table a as well as table b products is that the overall turnover of the company please underline this word this word is very very important the overall turnover of the company from all the products and services during immediately preceding financial year is 35 crores or more now very very important point turnover from all the uh, products of this particular company it is not only those products which are specified under table a and b but is all the products which are covered under um, uh, which are produced by the company to turnover total turnover um, shall not exceed if, if if it exceeds 35 crores then cost records is applicable to them okay 35 crores or more then cost records is applicable to them overall turnover of the company should be 35 crore or more okay now let me give you some examples and you need to um, actually tell me in the comment section whether cost records are required to be prepared in this case or not okay i'll give you certain examples and you tell me whether cost records are required to be prepared or not there is a company company x okay it produces product x product y product z okay product x is table a product product x is table a product product a is um, uh, you know purchased and uh, it is sold worth rupees 25 lakhs 
प्रोडक्ट वाई इज बींग सोल्ड एट एज 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 फिफ्टीन करोर्स प्रोडक्ट जेड बींग सोल्ड एट ट्वेंटी करोर्स वेदर कॉस्ट रिकॉर्ड विल बी एप्लीकेबल इन दिस केस और नॉट वेदर कॉस्ट रिकॉर्ड विल बी एप्लीकेबल इन दिस केस और नॉट आई प्रोडक्ट एक्स टेबल ए टेबल ए प्रोडक्ट प्रोडक्ट वाई नो टेबल प्रोडक्ट जेड नो टेबल 25 फाइव लैक्स इज प्रोडक्ट एक्स प्रोडक्ट वाइज फिफ्टीन करोड प्रोडक्ट जेड इज ट्वेंटी करोड वेदर कॉस्ट रिकॉर्ड विल बी एप्लीकेबल इन दिस केस और नॉट येस और नो येस और नो वेरी गुड आंसर येस परफेक्ट येस परफेक्ट सो गाइज वी विल सी द टोटल टर्न ओवर ऑफ द कंपनी एंड टोटल टर्न ओवर ऑफ द कंपनी इज थर्टी फाइव पॉइंट ट्वेंटी फाइव करोड थर्टी फाइव पॉइंट ट्वेंटी फाइव करोड इज द total turnover of the company so it is exceeding 35 crores of course yes cost records are required to be prepared in this particular case cost records are required to be prepared in this particular case now my next question to you is please listen to my next question very very carefully please listen to my next question very very carefully cost records are required to be prepared for which of these products product x product y product z or all of them Yes, you are right. Cost records are required to be prepared. Cost records is applicable. My next question is, which of the product uh, should I prepare the cost records? Should it be product X, product Y, product Z? What will it be? Only product X or all the products? That is the question. Please answer my question. All the products or only product X? And guys, a very very deep question. So please, um, uh, you know, answer it. after thinking and looking at the section once if you can look at the section once then perfect so some some people are saying all the products some are saying table a uh, all of the product ashutesh say, says all of the product nivya says all of the product amitesh x ajnaz x tejasvi x surender all joshika all okay okay so guys the correct answer is the correct answer is only product x only product x cost records are required to be prepared only for product x so why are you saying this let's read the language of the section let's read the language of the section and you'll be able to understand why i'm saying this let's read the language of the question okay okay let's read it together any company engaged in production of goods or providing services specified in table below shall be required to prepare cost records for such product not for all the products for such products or services in their books of accounts so please read the section and please interpret the section well i know there will be some difficulties which will be faced by you because it's it's not a straight forward uh, you know section it's a difficult section it's a uh, twisted section but for which product the cost records are required to be prepared only product x for only product x the cost records are required to be prepared okay okay sir now let me change my example let me change my example okay product x we are producing to the extent of zero product y 40 crores product x product z 15 crores total turnover 55 crores so guys unfortunately in this year we have not produced product x we have not sold product x okay if turnover includes excluded products then excluded products are also included in the turnover guys so product y and z are excluded products only product y and z are excluded so they will be included in the turnover while calculating the total turnover they will be included my question to you is uh product x we did not purchase and sell product x at all so it's zero product y 40 z 15 whether cost records is applicable or not and if yes on which product cost records will be applicable or not goshal says not applicable twinkle says applicable hoga aarti says applicable hoga sir if turnover excluded product i have already answered nivya says no who else guys please write your answers quickly please write your answers quickly i want to see how many of you are giving the mansi says no amitesh says x which means amitesh says that uh, you know cost records are required to be prepared it is applicable to a 
in earlier year cost records were applicable then in all subsequent year it will be applicable no no vishek it is not about earlier year or current year it is a fresh company fresh case don't link with earlier example don't link with earlier example joshika says no cost records will not reco be required to be prepared harshit verma says x surender says n so guys the correct answer is cost records are not required to be prepared because one of the prime conditions is that you should have some turnover from the specified goods you should have some turnover from the specified goods the specified goods like table a goods table b goods you should have some turnover with respect to the specified goods that is the bottom line that is the benchmark if you have no um, uh, production or no sales and no turnover from the specified goods then even if your turnover is over 35 crores you are not required to prepare your cost records so cost records are not required to be prepared in this particular case cost records are not required to be prepared okay got it yes sir got it okay i'll change my example okay i'll give one more uh, example and this time the example will be little complicated yes so are you ready for the example are you ready for the next example write yes in the chat box write yes in the chat box next example will be little complicated okay product x which is covered its turnover is 15 lakhs product y again it is being manufactured not covered under table a or table b okay it is manufactured uh, the turnover is say 2 crores product z we are not manufacturing product z we are only trading in product z now third example is very very critical guys we are not manufacturing product z we are only trading in product z okay and the turnover is 40 crores total turnover is 42 point 15 crores 42.15 crores <clears throat> now you need to tell me whether cost records is applicable or not please note product z is only trading no manufacture product by manufacture product x manufacture table a 15 lakh 15 lakh manufacture 2 crores trading 40 crores whether cost records will be applicable or not please note product z is trading it's not production it's not production and it is not uh, 33 clause uh, product it is not 33 product uh, 33 clause clause product is it uh, we are talking about cost records please don't talk about cost audit ajnas don't talk about cost audit we are not talking about audit we are talking about records as of now it's only records please tell me whether cost records are required to be prepared or not yes or no arti jain says no Joshika says applicable. Lakshmi Dhar says applicable. Milan says applicable. Yes, Ashutosh says applicable. Guys, all of you should you know give the answer so that your concepts will also um, uh, you know be strong. And guys, definitely do hit the like button, guys. Before we move ahead, please do hit the like button. That is one thing which will give me energy to you know continue with these marathons. Yes, answer is yes. Cost records are applicable. irrespective of whether you are trading in any goods or manufacturing in any goods irrespective of that you are definitely uh, covered under cost records and which uh, uh, product cost records will be required to be prepared only product x not all the products only product x chalo okay yes it will be applicable no no z will not be applicable no no z we will not prepare cost records for z chalo next example next example and this time i'll give you a even more critical example all right please note my next example product x product y product z turnover of product x 5 lakhs product y product y twenty crores okay product z <coughs> product z Thirty-four crores, no, not thirty-four, but fourteen crores. Okay, let this be fifty lakhs. Okay, so this is the bifurcation. I am adding one more thing: scrap sale. Scrap sale is 
70 lakhs scrap sale is 70 lakhs now you need to tell me whether cost records are applicable or not in this particular case different example and yes guys you, you can write these examples in your register very very useful for understanding purposes now please tell me scrap sale 70 lakh rupees of scrap sale very very interesting and i'm really excited to listen to your answers very very interesting case which i have created whether cost records will be applicable or not if you exclude scrap sales then it is coming out to be less than 35 crores if you include scrap sales then it will be more than 35 crores what will be your answer i'm really really excited to listen to your answer yes very good that's like my future cmas all of you are future cmas very good answer by all of you i'm very very happy goshal says scrap sale is excluded so no oh applicable 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 yes 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 guys you are very very right you are very very right guys yes it is applicable so while you are calculating the total turnover of the company scrap sale is also included as a part of total turnover of the company and therefore in this case since the total turnover is exceeding 35 crores product s will be subject to cost records cost records will be applicable in case of product x so this time i want all of you to uh, clap for yourself clap for yourself yes even if you are at your home clap for yourself even if your parents feel that you have gone crazy clap for yourself because you've given an amazing answer amazing answer it was pretty tricky guys because these tricks are um, uh, uh, really you know they can um, uh, cost you your marks but you are very confident about your answers and i'm really liking this fact that you are really confident about your answers so yes this was the limit of 35 crores which has been specified and we have done various cases in which this 35 crores can you know vary and uh, what are the possible probabilities that can come in your examination all right now please remember this form very very important form cra1 uh, uh, which is the format of cost records form cra1 which is the format of cost records okay all right guys so yes you have completed your discussion on cost records yes we have completed our discussion on cost records okay let's do some uh, easy easy exercises guys i hope you are able to see the exercises well okay let's do some easy exercises okay diy do it yourself so please give me the answer of this question maharaja private limited purchases a raw material steel coil and then do some cutting or drawing work on it either by self or through a job worker and then it sells in market cfo of the company considers it as trading sale cfo is saying it is not manufactured it is trading okay uh, uh, accord your opinion on whether cost records or audit is applicable on this sale if the turnover exceeds the prescribed limits you need to tell whether you know cutting raw material cutting there are steel coils what are steel coils steel coils are uh, you know rolled like this there are uh, long long length wires which are there like this what is the role of this particular maharaja private limit? it just cuts steel uh, coil into small small pieces whether this cutting will qualify as manufacture or not whether this cutting of steel coil will qualify as manufacture or not that is the um, uh, you know a question goshal says cutting or drawing op is manufacturing hence opinion of the cfo is incorrect brilliant brilliant answer Arti's answer is incorrect. Cutting to basic new thing. So yes, applicable. Very good. Superb, superb. Yes, guys. This is manufacture. Even if you are cutting something into small, small pieces, it tend amounts to manufacture because you are changing the um, uh, the uh, the entire over uh, use of that particular uh, wire. Because you know, if it is a long wire, then you will not purchase it. If you are a retail customer, you will not purchase that long wire. If you are having only long wire, so very, very good answer. Brilliant. So DIY two. Please read carefully. Sanjeev Nibuti, City Hospital, specializes in test tube baby technology. Are these services covered under Rule 3? Presume that they fulfill the turnover criteria. Test tubes, test tubes, test tubes. Form change hogi thodi. Twinkle, form change ho gai. Form change ho gai. Yes. Why form change ho gai? Because, um, uh, you know, the people who want smaller um, uh, parts they will only buy smaller parts they will not take the entire um, uh, entire length of the wire so manufacture is there okay test tubes are they covered yes they are covered very good answer by goshal twinkle lakshmi dhar amitesh very good answer yes yes very, very good answer superb guys so yes it is covered under rule 3 very much covered under rule 3 
Okay, Messrs. Mahakal Enterprises Private Limited manufactures and sell wooden furniture. Okay, they are into selling of wooden furniture. Total turnover of the company during financial eighteen nineteen was fifty crores. Fifty crores is the total turnover, guys. More than thirty five crores. Whether the company is required to prepare cost records under Rule three or not. Whether cost records are required to be prepared or not. हाँ, twinkle समझ में आ गई बात. ठीक है. Okay. You please tell me, guys, whether cost records will be applicable or not. The turnover is fifty crores. Turnover is fifty crores. Whether cost records is applicable or not. Part C. Please comment in the <coughs> comment section. Manisha says required. Ankita says no. Joshika says no. Nidhi says required. Harshit says no. Mansi says no. Please give the reasons also, guys. What is the reason? If you are saying no, cost records are not required. Then what is the reason? Please give the reason also. What is the reason? Abhishek says yes. Yogesh says yes. Sachin says yes. Sachin Bangar says above thirty-five crores. Okay, okay. Milan says no. <laughs> I'm really loving it. I'm liking it because um, you know you are really, really performing well, guys. <clears throat> okay. The correct answer is no. Cost records are not applicable. Why? Because Furniture, wooden furniture, is not covered under Table A or Table B. Wooden furniture is not covered under Table B or Table A or Table B. Even if the turnover is more than thirty-five crores, cost records will not be applicable in this particular case. So, not applicable. Furniture is not applicable. Very good, guys. So, yes, guys, question can trick you in any manner. In any manner, okay. Okay. Next, next, next. In the above example, company suffered a sudden reduction in the demand of wooden furniture. Okay. So uh, the company has suffered a uh, sudden reduction in demand of wooden furniture in FY 2019-20, and its turnover dropped to 37 crores. Okay, so earlier the turnover was 50 crores, now it is 37 crore. Hence the hence the company introduced a new range of product made out of jute. Financially, in 1920, company was able to sell jute products worth rupees two lakhs. Two lakhs jute products were sold. Comment whether the company is required to prepare cost records under Rule three or not. If yes. For which product? Now, guys, I want your answer. Okay, I want your answer in the chat box. There are two questions which are imposed. Number one, whether company is apply, uh, whether company is covered under cost records or not. Secondly, for which product will the cost records be prepared? That is the question before you. Yes, come on, come on, come on, guys, come on. Let's see who will prepare the, who will uh, who will get the right answer. A very good answer. Superb, superb. Yes, yes, it is applicable. Record for very good. Mansi Sonavane, very good answer. Yes, Jute Pack का record बनेगा. Twinkle Rustagi, very good answer. Yes, cost records are required. Very good, very good. Superb. So yes, guys, cost records are required, but only for Jute products, not for wooden furniture, as only jute products are specified under Table A or B category. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, interesting one. Interesting. Please read this question. Interesting one. Again, a tricky one. Let me expand it as much as I can so that you can, uh, you know, view it clearly. Okay. Twinkle Private Limited. L look, Twinkle Rustagi, who's in our chat box. She has a company also. No, it's Trilok. It's not Twinkle. It's Trilok. Okay, Trilok Private Limited has given details of the products manufactured, manufactured, uh, uh, or traded by it during financial year 1920. You are required to assess which products of the company is required to prepare cost records. Which products are required to prepare cost records? It's manufacturing cement, insecticides, garments, hosiery. It's trading in laptops, allied accessories, calculators, electrical appliances. Job work income is 90 lakhs. And the total turnover is thirty-four point nine crores. Please see the total turnover, thirty-four point nine crores. Okay, total turnover is thirty-four point nine crores. Apart from the above, company sold scrap from garment and hosiery division, twelve lakhs. What a question! What a question! First question: Whether cost records are required to be prepared or not? Answer: Yes or no in the chat box. Guys, answer should be in yes or no in the chat box. Yes or no? Cost records. ये सुपर
Hmm. Perfect. Yes, cost records is applicable because including the scrap scale, the turnover is above thirty-five. Perfect answer. Perfect. Perfect answer. Question number two. For which products cost records will be prepared? For which product cost records will be prepared? For which product cost records will be prepared? Now let's see who is going to give the right answer. I am eagerly waiting. For which products the cost records are required to be prepared? Product name. Table A, table B. Yes, I want the names. Cement and insecticide. Very good answer. Very very good answer. Cement and insecticide. Perfect. Perfect guys. You are prodigies already. I think you are really doing well. And yes, I have a CMA brigade who's ready to rock the corporate world. You are my CMA brigade. You are no less than a brigade. You are no less than warriors. You are no no le no less than you know fighters. So amazing, amazing. Cement and insecticide. Very good. Cement and in, uh, insecticide. Perfect, perfect. All right. Next question. Dhara Oils Private Limited, leading manufacturer of edible olive oil in India. During financial in 1920, its turnover of sale of edible oil is 58 crores. Company is registered under MSMED as small enterprise. However, there is a lacuna. You know, 58 crore turnover cannot be small, but it's okay. Assume that 58 tur turnover is small. Okay, it is registered. As a small enterprise, analyze the applicability of Rule Three. Whether Rule Three will be applicable or not, it is an MSMED. It is registered as a small enterprise. Okay, not micro and medium, but small enterprise. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Very good answer. No, not applicable. Not applicable. Very good answer. Not applicable. Perfect. Not applicable, guys. Because if you are registered under the MSMED Act as medium. As a micro and small enterprise, so guys, there's medium also. If you are registered as a medium enterprise, then cost records will be applicable on you. Exemption is only given to micro and small. It is not given to medium. Okay, please note this point very, very carefully. All right, sir. Next, Gartner Limited provides facility management services (FMS) at the commercial and residential premises. These include housekeeping, security, fire safety, uh, facility management, pest control, landscaping. Facade cleaning, etc., etc., etc. The entire operational revenue of the company, rupees sixty crore, is from faculty management services. Will the activities of company be covered under construction activity as per Rule Three? Whether facility management services is covered under the construction um, activity under Rule Three? Please answer in the chat box. Please answer in the chat box. Whether this will be covered under faculty management services will be covered under Rule Three of construction activities. Construction activities. Let's see who are so. This is uh, you know quite quite tricky. Okay, this is not easy. Ajna says no. Mansi says yes. Jyoshika says yes. Ankita says yes. Wow, wow, wow. Goshal Dake, Goshal Dake has even given the explanation correctly, guys. Brilliant, Goshal Dake. Goshal Dake, Dake. From which state are you there? From which state? And all of you guys, please mention your states. From which states are you there? I want your states. From which state are you there? Perfect answer, guys. Perfect answer. Yes, it is applicable. It is very much applicable, guys. Even if you are doing facility management services, that facility management services included in um, Rule Three construction activities because construction activity has a specific ex specific exclusion which says that even the development or maintenance of a facility is covered under construction activity. So yes, this activity will be covered under uh, the category of. Cost records. Andhra Pradesh, Twinkle, Haryana, Rewadi, Pune, Maharashtra is uh, you know Goshal. Very good. Chandigarh, Maharashtra, Mansi, Maharashtra, Manisha, Odisha. Perfect. Kerala, Ajnaz, Guwahati, Assam, Abhishek Kumar Sharma, Guwahati. Beautiful, beautiful state. Guwahati, Kolkata. Brilliant. And guys, I want to know one more thing, guys. Whether are you giving only group four in the upcoming attempt or both the groups? So those who are giving only group four, write four. And those who are giving both the groups, write both. Let's see who is giving which group. Okay, Raipur, Chhattisgarh, Jamshedpur, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Pune. Okay, Nidhi Shar, Nidhi Suman is from Pune. Very good, Amchi Pune. Both Manisha Bhairera, both Vishaka Patnam, Surendra, both Nidhi fourth, only fourth, Joshika fourth, Alagu both, Shreya group four, Amitesh four. Very good, very very nice guys. Durgapur. West Bengal, very good guys. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. It is amazing to interact with all of you, all of you. Now let us start the 
important section guys most important rule of your syllabus rule 4 rule 4 is related to um, cost audit and cost audit was given in section 1482 so now i'm referring to section 1482 which is cost audit and what are the provisions which are applicable on cost audit that is what we are going to study now so i'll directly take you to this table please see this table okay now rule 2 is little bit complicated uh, rule 4 is little bit complicated it is not as easy as rule 3 because rule 4 contains twin conditions which are required to be satisfied if you want cost audit to be performed for your company cost record had only one condition which is 35 crores overall turn of the company and the condition was same for table a and table b condition was absolutely same for table a and table b however in case of cost audit the condition is not same for table a and table b condition is different for table a and table b uh, so the conditions are these are the conditions of table a and table b um, which are there which are there in case of cost audit so let's read these conditions very very important guys please read them very very carefully and yes you need to learn them you need to learn them so if you are uh, thinking about cost audit of uh, uh, category a goods then overall turnover of the company should at least be 50 crores aggregate turnover of individual products for which cost records are prescribed is 25 crores 50 crores 25 crores so when you are analyzing cost audit requirement of the regulated goods goods which are categorized under product uh, uh, other under, under the table a then you have to see these thresholds 50 crores total turnover of the company 25 crores for individual products which are covered under cost records okay now let us not move forward let me give you a practical question for this part okay let me give you a practical question for this part. Yes, very good, very good. Wow, sabko yaad hai, bhai ye to. Sabko yaad hai. Perfect, perfect. Okay, let me give you a practical question. Okay, let us get back to our original. Okay, so product X is table A product, okay? 50 crore overall turnover individual turnover should be at least 25 crores okay so overall turnover of the company is 51 crores and product a turnover out of this is 26 crores please tell me in the chat box please tell me in the chat box cost audit applicable or not cost audit applicable or not you know, these can be anyone, these can be anything, you know, just mine reduce 51 and 26. This can be anything. So I'm not fuzzy about product Y and product Z. I'm fuzzy about product X. Please tell me cost audit applicable or not. Audit hoga ya nahi hoga? Yes, audit hoga. Perfect, perfect. Audit hoga. Audit hoga. Example number two. This is 16 crores. But audit hoga ya nahi hoga? Product X, 16 crores. Audit applicable or not? Product X 16 crores. Product X 16 crores. Audit applicable or not? Audit applicable or not? Product X 16 crores. Answer is no. Very good answer, guys. Very good answer. Answer is no. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Now I'll change this question a little bit. Assume that product Y is table B product. Assume that product Y is table B product. And the table B product turnover is 11 crores. Product table B uh, turnover is 11 crores. Okay. Now you need to tell me, please listen to the question. Don't give the answer. Don't give the answer. Please listen to the question. You need to tell me whether product X will be subject to audit or not. You need to tell me whether product X will be subject to audit or not. Only product X, not product Y whether product x will be subject to audit or not product x is having turnover of 16 crores overall turnover of the company is 51 crores whether product x which is table a we have only studied the limit of table a we have not studied the limit of table b guys as of now so i'm asking question related to table a only i'm not asking question related to table b please tell me whether audit cost audit will be um, uh, done for table a product which is product x or not whether cost audit is required to be done or not vishal says yes Tejasvi says no. Ankita, what is your answer? Ankita Murarka is telling the limits. I don't want the limits. I want the answer. Mansi says yes, applicable. Twinkle says yes, applicable. Ankit Murarka. No, no. Please tell me the answer, Arti Jain. What is your answer? Yes or no? Whether table A 
product X will be subject to cost audit or not? Yes or no should be the answer. Ankita says no. Goshal Dake says yes. Aarti Jain says no. Pooja Shinde says product X will not be subject to cost audit. Now guys, let me give you the answer. Okay, very, very critical point guys. Superbly critical point. And most of the students falter on this particular point. Answer is yes. Table A product, which is product X, will be subject to cost audit. Table A product, which is product X, will be subject to cost audit. Pinkle is also giving the reason. Don't bifurcate mean table entity for threshold include both. Very good, Goshal Dake. Goshal Dake has studied cost audit beautifully. Very good, Goshal Dake. Goshal Dake has studied cost audit beautifully. Very good. Yes, yes. So guys, now, now please understand what is the concept, okay? Now this is the point where I would definitely want to spend 2-3 minutes. Overall turnover of the company should be more than 50 crores. Fulfilling the condition. And the second condition is aggregate turnover of the products which are covered under rules uh, uh, of cost, cost record rules. Aggregate turnover is to be considered. It should be more than 25 crores. The aggregate turnover is more than 25 crores. It is in fact 27 crores. So when it is 27 crores and when we are analyzing table A product, table A product X will be subject to cost audit. So most students make this mistake. They take only 16 crores as the threshold and they say no, cost records are not, uh, cost audit is not applicable. Absolutely incorrect. Please read the section once again. It says aggregate turnover of the individual products, services for which cost records are prescribed. It nowhere says where cost records are prescribed only for table A. No. For all the products for which cost records are prescribed, which is table A and table B. So we always take the aggregate. We always take the aggregate. Okay. That is very, very important point. So that is why these limits are very tricky and these limits are very, very important. Similarly, guys, uh, table B product, overall turnover should be 100 crores and aggregate turnover of individual products should be 35 crores. That is the um, uh, limit for table B products, which are non-regulated, 100 crores and 35 crores. So similar, um, you know, interpretation is applicable on this particular product as well. Now, exclusions are there. Okay, certain exclusions are there. Uh, the companies which are not subject to cost audit. What are the exclusions? Let's see. Now clear, sir. Tejashvi Shripada says, now clear. Yes, guys, absolutely clear. Okay. So, so what are the exclusions to cost audit? Number one, a, a, a company whose revenue from exports of product covered under table A and table B exceeds 75% of the total revenue. When the revenue from exports, which is in foreign exchange, when these revenues exceed the uh, 75% of total revenue benchmark, then which means you are primarily an exporter. Okay. If you are primarily an exporter, then cost records are not applicable to you, even when your turnover is above the threshold limit. Okay, sir. Then company which is operating from special economic zone, cost audit is not required to be the, um, uh, you know, prepared for these particular companies. Now, guys, I have a question for you. Whether a company who's uh, situated in special economic zone and if its turnover is above for 35 crores, and it is producing a good which is covered in a table A and table B. Will cost records be applicable for that company? Answer in the chat box. Will cost records be applicable for that company? Answer in the chat box. So if a company is there who's, uh, you know, into special economic zone, who's working from special economic zone, uh, you know, that company is working from special economic zone and it has a turnover of more than 35 crores for the specified goods. Whether cost records are applicable for that company or not. Cost audit is not required, that is for sure, but whether cost records are required or not. Answer is yes, cost records are very much required. Yes, cost record to hoga bhai, cost audit nahi hoga. Cost record to hoga, cost audit nahi hoga. Very, very, very important point guys, very important point. Okay. So that is the concept. Okay. And last one is which is engaged in generation of electricity for captive consumption. If some company is generating electricity only for captively consuming it, which means they produce it and internally they uh, consume it, then they are not applicable for cost audit uh, in this particular case. Okay, sir. Got it. So yes, these were the um, uh, you know concepts which are related to table A and table B. Very, very important concepts, guys. And one notorious provision. Okay. Once you are inside the purview of cost records or cost audit, once you are there, there's no way out. There's no way out. You have to permanently be there with cost records and cost audit. Ajeev zabardasti hai. Haan jiyan zabardasti hai. 
chipku chipku section hai chipku section which is what which is if a company meets the eligibility criteria in one year and if in the subsequent year the turnover drops below the specified limits rule shall be applicable for all the subsequent years notorious criteria but yes this is a fact that once you cover once you are into this net of cost audit and cost records you will be there forever forever no looking back no looking back <laughs> so yes a notorious section so this is guys maintenance of cost records and yes you definitely need to remember these four forms guys these four forms you definitely need to remember cra1 cra2 cra3 cra4 what is the use of these uh, uh, forms okay ek bar fas gaye to lagega hi yes twinkle cra1 cra2 cra3 cra4 cra4 is an xbrl format cra2 is an xbrl format because they are to be submitted to the ministry CRA one and three are not an XBRL format because they are not to be submitted to the Ministry or Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Okay, so CRA one, CRA two, CRA one, CRA two, CRA three, CRA four. These are the forms which you should remember very, very profoundly. CRA one is for particulars of cost to be included. CRA two is for appointment of cost auditor. CRA three is for cost audit report. CRA four is for submission of cost audit report to central government. Yes, sir. Perfect, perfect, guys. Very, very. Very good. Okay. Uh, yes, these are generic things, guys. These are the penalties. And yes, now we come on to the next rule, rule number six. Again, an important rule because from an exam standpoint, guys, a question can come from this particular rule in a theoretical way. Okay. Even a case study can come from this particular rule. Rule number six: um, uh, cost audit. What are the um uh, you know requirements of cost audit uh, what are, how are cost auditors appointed okay appointment of cost auditor okay so rule 6 appointment of cost auditor how would the cost auditor be appointed the company satisfying threshold limits under rule 4 must appoint a cost auditor within 180 days please remember within 180 days of the commencement of the financial year within 180 days of commencement of the financial year so guys within 180 days of commencement of the financial year you must appoint your cost auditor so that is the threshold limit um uh, uh, appoint a cost auditor you need to appoint a cost auditor okay cost auditor should give his written uh, written consent and certificates in the following manner okay so these are the certificates which auditor is required to be submit uh, required to submit to the company that is not disqualified it is not disqualified for appointment as an auditor it satisfied criteria provided under 141 uh, which are disqualification which is studied in the last class proposed appointment is within the limits laid down in the companies act list of pending proceedings are also given by the auditor so these are the requirements which the auditor will give to the um, uh, to the company then company must inform cost auditor about his appointment and file a notice of appointment with the central government the cost auditor um uh, the cost audit or auditor appointment the company must inform to the central government within 30 days of the board meeting or 180 days of the commencement of the financial year whichever is earlier very very important threshold guys the uh, intimation is required to be given to the ministry within 30 days of the board meeting or 180 days of the commencement of the financial year whichever is earlier so it means that you know if your board meeting happens on 15th of may then you have time only till 14th of june to send an intimation to government of um, to send an intimation to government central government okay but if you are appointing your auditor only say at fag end of 15th of september then you don't have entire one month because one day is from the end of the financial year is the ultimate threshold then you can only file the uh, uh, form by 28th september which is one day's threshold okay 28th 27th september okay sir got it sub rule 3 Up auditor shall continue to um, um, be in this capacity up to one hundred eighty days of the closure of the financial year. So up till closure of the financial year, beyond that one hundred days, the tenure is of the cost auditor. Okay. Then any casual vacancy with the office of cost auditor shall be filled by board of directors within thirty days of occurrence of such vacancy. You are aware about casual vacancy. Casual vacancy means in the event of death of the uh, uh, of the auditor or when he resigns. Or any other inadvertent situation, and whenever there is a casual vacancy, then the appointment is to be done within 30 days, and the board of director would need to make this appointment. And yes, rest of the provisions are pretty straightforward and very, very important, guys. Very, very important. Okay, a question can come from this particular 
part which is sub rule 7 provisions of sub section 12 of section 143 which is related to fraud of the act and the relevant rules made there under shall apply mutus mutandis means in the same manner they'll apply to the cost order as they apply to the statutory order so fraud provisions fraud reporting requirements are applicable to cost orders as well that is the most important thing okay love from kerala all right <laughs> thank you so much yes harshit i will try to take some sessions on spm bvm also i understand that you guys require that also definitely i will try to do that okay okay one diy let's see who's able to solve this diy yes, please solve this diy rajvik auto automobiles has uh, to get the cost audit conducted for FY 2019-20 for a four-set audit. The company proposes to appoint Messrs. RK Associates. The company about due date of the appointment of the cost auditor. What is the due date of appointment of the cost auditor for the relevant under the following two situations? Board meeting held on 17th April 2019. Board meeting held on 17th September 2019. Please <clears throat> write the answer in the chat box. मेरे सवालों का जवाब दो दो ना तो आपको बताना है what is the threshold of appointing the cost auditor in case one and case two what is the threshold of appointing the cost auditor yes thirty days you will count 30 days. 17th May will be the 30th day. Perfect. 17th May will be the 30th day. First, first case. Second case, 17th September is the date when board meeting is held. 17th of September. Second case, what will be the uh, due date? Case 2. Case 2. 27 September. Actually, 27 September is the last date, not 20 years. 27 September. Perfect, perfect. Within one it is. Perfect, guys. Very, very good answer. Okay, these are very generic sections, guys. Okay, most important, guys. Most important. Very, very important. Very, very, very important. Waste multiplier. A practical question from this particular um, uh, you know, concept will come. Not mandatorily, but yes, most likely it comes in every session. So very, very important concept of waste multiplier concept of waste multiplier what is the concept of waste multiplier what is the um, uh, you know per unit production from first unit from the first process that will give one unit production in the last process that is the concept of waste multiplier very very important concept okay waste multiplier is that quantity of output from any process which will be needed to get one uh, quantity of final output that is the waste multiplier please mark very very important against this particular question so guys uh, you know you will be given various processes like blow room carding draw frames rowing ring frame reeling you will be given various processes you will be given input and outputs of these various processes and you need to find the waste multiplier you need to find the waste multiplier <clears throat> very 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 important um, from an exam standpoint how to calculate this waste multiplier so as the first step in calculating the waste multiplier is that you need to calculate the loss you need to calculate the loss and I will not do the entire question because it will take a lot of time. I'll just do one, two parts and then I'll be um, asking you to replicate those parts in other parts as well. Okay. First of all, you need to um, now calculate the loss. Okay. So 46, 70 to 560 has been introduced minus 42, 58, 270 has been produced. So the loss is 40, uh, 4,14,290. We divide this by the um, uh, cotton which is processed which is four six seven two five six zero we'll get the percentage uh, loss which has uh, been incurred the percentage loss which has been incurred is eight point eight seven percent eight point eight seven percent is the loss which has been incurred okay we'll compute the uh, output what is the output in percentage forms what is the output in percentage form? Both of these are computed according to percentages. Okay. So if you assume 100, which is the input minus 8.87, it gives me an output of 91.13 percentage. Output is 91.13 percentage. Output is 91.93. Oh, wow. You guys have already computed the waste multiplier also. Brilliant. 
<laughs> good so output is 91.13 okay so in the second part guys 42 74 360 42 74 360 minus 39 76 400 divided by 42 74 360 42 74 360 this, this gives a figure of 6.97%. Now be careful. Okay, now be careful of the next uh, output which I'm going to produce. Okay, next output is if 91% has been introduced, then the, uh, the the percentage loss is 61, 60.97. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, 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 you know, compute the output using 91.13 as the input. So 91.13 minus 6.97 percent this gives me a figure of 84.78 percent you need to understand this point only this is the specific point which is very very important this is a specific point which is very very critical so while reducing 6.97 you don't have to reduce it exactly from 91.13 but what you have to do is you have to first of all multiply 91.13 into 6.9 percent 97 percent and then reduce it okay so 91.13 minus 6.97 percent that is the um, that will give you 84.78 so so on and so forth you will compute all the output percentages and then whatever is the last percentage you will keep it in denominator and you will keep this in numerator and you will be computing the waste multiplier simple as it is okay but this is very 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 important why is it very important because um you know a mandatory question uh, is coming in from this particular concept in every attempt almost in every attempt a mandatory question is coming from this particular concept so waste multiplier very 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 important okay sir got it then next important part of your practical from this particular chapter capital employed what is the capital employed in any business so capital employed will cover three things net fixed assets non-current investments and net current assets these three things will club together to form capital employed of any business. Net fixed assets, non-current investments, investments which are non-current. Non-current means long-term investments. Long-term investments. Okay. These are to be included while calculating capital employed and net current assets. So obviously, guys, everything which is being added over here has got some logic. Why is it being added? I'm not discussing the logic over here because it will take a lot of time to uh, uh, make you understand the logic. So I'm quickly making you just revise the formula. So capital employed includes all these three things, non-current investment, net current investment and net fixed assets. Capital employed excludes, capital employed will not have capital work in progress, revaluation, current investment, investment in other companies, investment in buildings, not used for business, preliminary expense, debit of profit loss account. These are not included in capital employed. That is the formula of capital employed. Okay. Pretty much a straightforward and a simple uh, concept guys. The next concept is net worth. Net worth, again, a very, very important concept. Net worth means what is the book value of shareholders equity in your business? That is the net worth. Okay. Net worth means paid up share capital plus all reserves created out of profits plus security premium account plus forfeited shares and plus surplus. So whatever belongs to the equity shareholders, that is my net worth. Whatever belongs to the equity shareholders, that is my net worth. Okay. Everything which is belonging to the equity shareholders, that is my net worth. Net worth is the book value of equity shareholders okay then okay yes these things are very very important guys value addition what is value addition value addition is revenues which have been earned during the year minus the revenue from operations uh, revenue from operations minus any kind of cost of bought out inputs and cost of bought out material cost of bought out inputs and cost of bought out uh, material so uh, revenue minus cost of bought out inputs that is the formula for value addition again it includes material cost of material process material consumption of stores spares utility others etc this will give you the figure of value addition value addition is um, one of the most important ratios which are required to be calculated in this particular um, uh, section okay sir and distribution to different claimants rate so guys uh, we're just revising the formula your responsibility is to actually do the practical questions also because that is a very important thing all right some miscellaneous ratios which are uh, uh, you know required to be made which are uh, computed while calculating the 
uh, while preparing the cost uh, audit report yes yes i will be sharing the pdf as well no worries in that okay so what is the different ratios which are uh, you know uh, required to be inserted in the nxr to cost audit report profitability ratio which is return on capital employed please remember the ratio return on capital employed is ebit earning before interest and after tax divided by average capital employed that is the formula for return on capital employed return on equity formula is profit after tax divided by net worth or the shareholders fund that is return on net worth profitability ratios which is gross profit ratio operating profit ratio and net profit ratio it gives you the profitability um, uh, percentages of different uh, kinds gross profit operating profit and net profit solvency ratio whether you are solvent or not whether you can meet your short term liabilities if they arise whether you, you are able to meet them or not so current ratio current assets divided by current liability solvency ratio debt equity ratio long term debt divided by shareholders funds proprietary ratio shareholders funds divided by total assets that is proprietary ratio turnover ratio like asset turnover net sales divided by total fixed assets stock turnover ratio net sales divided by average stock or inventory debtors turnover ratio average receivables into number of days in the year divided by credit sales so these are various ratios which are required to be uh, computed and put in the nxs to cost audit report why are they put so that meaningful analysis can be done where are the wastages why profit is not increasing all this analysis can be done only when these ratios are put inside the um uh, audit report okay sir got it so these are certain questions which are very very important okay now comes the most important part of your uh, chapter guys which is a reconciliation statement okay now reconciliation of profit as per financial and costing records this is a question which will mandatory come in mandatorily come in your examination reconciliation please mark it as very 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 important mark it as very 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 important this question is definitely going to come in your examination guys there is hardly an attempt which has um, you know gone by where uh, this question has not been asked in your examination the reconciliation statement between financial profit and costing profit so guys you should preferably you should um, uh, you know use the format which is given in the rules format is that you need to start with costing profit you first of all need to start with costing profit costing profit is the um now starting point of your profit reconciliation statement profit according to costing cost accounts that is the starting point okay so profit which is according to the co uh, cost accounts they are to be adjusted uh, uh, and they are to be matched to the financial accounts i'll give you a very simple way of doing it okay you have two hands okay you have two hands i'm drawing these two hands over here suppose these are two hands these are your hands okay you write costing profit in one hand which is your right hand right hand you write costing profit and left hand you write financial profit so this is costing profit this is financial profit if you are starting with costing profit then you can only change the position of costing profit hand and if you are starting with financial profit then you can only change the um, uh, you know financial profit hand so if you are starting with costing profit then you know if your profits are in this situation whereby financial profits are more costing profits are less then you will add in costing profit to make it equal to financial profit if your costing profit is high and your financial profit is less then you will reduce from costing profit to make it equal to the financial profit this is how you can actually play with your hands during examination at the cost of the examiner thinking that you have uh, you have done uh, out of your mind and you don't understand what is happening even at that risk you will you can do this so that your reconciliation can be done easily so it's like bank reconciliation very good twinkle it's actually like bank reconciliation statement so yes indeed a very 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 important topic from an exam standpoint for all of you profit reconciliation statement okay sir so yes performance analysis some some ratios are there for performance analysis that's okay guys not very very important all right so yes guys these are the ratios which are uh, required for performance analysis economic value added okay yes now this is an important thing so what do you mean by economic value added what do you mean by economic value added economic value added means that what is the increase in shareholders wealth that you have created what is the increase in shareholders wealth that you have created that is economic value added 
what is the addition that you have made in shareholders wealth that has uh, you know benefited the shareholders that is the concept of economic value added economic value added to the formula is capital employed multiplied by rate of return minus the cost of capital so net net whatever shareholders have in their hands whatever shareholders have in their hands after reducing the cost of capital what is cost of capital cost is cost of capital is like dividends whatever dif dividend dividends are there um uh, you know uh, they are cost of capital from the point of view of the company because company is paying dividends to the shareholders okay so cost of capital rate of return whatever rate of return you have earned on the equity shareholders or the capital employed rate of return minus cost of capital will give you percentage of the net profit or the net value addition which has been uh, in, uh, earned by you and that will give you the figure of economic value added and if you multiply it by capital employed then it will give you the figure in absolute form which is in rupee form they will give you the it will give you the figure all right so yes this was the economic value added for all of you and this is a small question on economic value added which is very very simple okay okay so these are certain very simple ratios which are definitely there in your syllabus but not very important from an exam standpoint so yes guys this was your chapter on cost accounting record rules 2014 of course this is not the entire chapter so this is just a revision of the entire chapter and i have marked the important areas of the chapter i have highlighted the areas which will um, you know the chances of these areas coming in the examination is more than other areas so i have highlighted those areas for you and i have tried to quickly um, uh, you know uh, 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 revise the entire chapter and especially the cost audit thresholds cost records thresholds they are the most important thing in the entire chapter because a question from those are um uh, you know uh, it is tentative that they will come in the examination sir eva formula is different from spmbv we can't use the same formula it is the absolutely the same formula guys it is absolutely the same formula it is absolutely the same formula spmbv formula of economic value added and cost audit formula of economic value added absolutely the same it's absolutely the same so yes guys that's all for today's session and yes uh, this was chapter 2 for all of you which is companies cost records and audit rules 2000 Fourteen will be coming up with um, uh, uh, more such chapters and more such concepts of cost and management audit in our subsequent sessions. And yes, PDF will be shared of yesterday's session and today's session in the chat box in in the uh, description box. I'll share a link by tomorrow. I will share the link where these PDFs can be found by you. So yes, that's all for today's uh, session, guys. It was an amazing session. Please hit a like button if you're not done so, and please subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed to the channel as yet. And yes. for the very last time today how is the josh please write in the chat box how is the josh guys what is the level of your josh what are what what uh, how is the josh <clears throat> dipon says it's very helpful if notes are provided yes as notes will be provided that's okay you take the session for idt and cfr also wow i don't know whether i can take idt and cfr also but i'm very sure that whatever i can do cost right and bms we am that i will surely do yes hi sir very 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 hi superb superb guys so yes guys very few days left okay and yes these days will be very tough for you also because you will be uh, studying day and night and you will be studying on weekends you will be studying on every day and you know you will be sacrificing a lot of things but don't worry all these sacrifices which you are doing today for the sake of your studies they will reap multiple benefits to you because tomorrow when you become a cma and reap a big package in uh, a campus placement then you will realize that all these sacrifices which you are doing today all these restrictions which you have imposed on yourself all the discipline which you have imposed on yourself all this will bear fruit once you become a qualified cma so don't worry keep on sacrificing your pleasures keep on sacrificing social media keep on sac sacrificing your friends family everyone um uh, don't meet your friends don't attend birthday parties don't attend weddings because i'm very sure that when you become cma then you are going to get these privileges back multifolds multifolds don't worry i can give it to you in writing so don't worry if you are feeling very uh, uh, you know very uh, low uh, with respect to your pleasures that's really okay guys because now the pleasure in our life is getting those three alphabets which is c m a and that is the end game that is the lakshya that is the goal of our life today so yes all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you in the next session today we are going to start one 
again an important chapter of your syllabus which is the professional ethics and responsibilities okay i'll give you a brief history about this particular subject uh, this particular chapter guys uh, the chapter is that um, now this particular chapter was introduced in 2008 syllabus of course it was there in 2008 syllabus and it was omitted from 2012 syllabus when 2012 syllabus came and i saw cost and management audit book of study mat this chapter was omitted from it and only one or two paragraphs one two pages was there inserted in some other chapter okay this chapter was absolutely omitted but i was adamant to the fact that if you are willing to become a cost auditor if you tomorrow see yourself as an auditor if you see yourself as a professional tomorrow this chapter is definitely to be done by you even if institute has erased this chapter from 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 uh, syllabus 2012 this chapter should be studied by each and every cma i was of a firm believer of this particular fact and to my surprise in the examination guys question came from this particular chapter that is the importance of this chapter and yes in 2016 syllabus this chapter was very much there and 2022 syllabus of course this chapter is there uh, you can actually expect and you know you can expect a mandatory question from this particular chapter 4 to 5 marks 5 Uh, maximum six marks okay four to five marks theoretical case study based question you can expect from this particular chapter and yes this particular chapter is um, definitely an important chapter so abhishek kumar sharma says the main reason behind is that you are teaching those subjects <laughs> wow what a good comment okay kavishek thank you so much for this appreciation so if i teach all the subjects say so you know tomorrow i start teaching all the subject of cma final then will all your subjects be your favorite subjects what logic so gopika is saying sir but i'm sure i have attended all the questions in previous exam it was direct question but i got 20 at least one word will get approximately 17 i too demotivated gopika don't be demotivated okay sometimes uh, you know your expectations um, and examiner's expectations are very different in under this situation i would recommend you to pull out your uh, copy and see what is the error that you are um, uh, you know doing all right so guys let's start today's session of professional ethics and responsibilities so um, as a professional you know i'll ask you a simple question please uh, uh, you know write in the chat box whether it's a yes or no okay Now, we have seen a lot of advertisements on tv right we see uh, actors like ranbir kapoor ranveer singh deepika padukone uh, pariniti chopra priyanka chopra all these actresses and actors come on the television and they publicize a lot of products okay so you know uh, vimal supari being addressed by sharukh khan akshay kumar uh, ajay devgan big big actors come on television and advertise about products of uh, these big big companies and there's huge budget which is allocated for marketing um, uh, for these particular companies for these particular products now my question to all of you is um, uh, that guys do you think advertisement is also required by cost auditors so once you become a cost auditor Uh, you know do you need advertisement uh, do you need to advertise your services do you think you also need advertisement because in today's world we don't see advertisements of cost auditor i mean we don't see a situation where aishwarya rai bachchan is coming on the screen and saying that okay if you want to get your cost audit done then only get it done by abc cost accountants we have never seen that scenario or we have never seen banners being put um, you know of of cost accountants publicizing about their Uh, uh, achievements about their services about their cost audit about their uh, expertise in income tax or audit or gst or any other matter we have never seen any professionals advertisement on television or billboard why what is the reason do you think they don't need advertisement do you think professionals don't need advertisement do you think so everyone is saying no everyone is saying no any particular reason why are you saying no Sankari is saying no. Arti Jain is saying no. Nidhi Suman is saying no. Abhishek Kumar is saying no. Ankita Murarka. Any particular reason? Cost auditor should not advertise. Why? Why cost auditor should not as advertise? That is my question. They just be saying cost auditor should not advertise. Why? So guys, very frankly, every person or every product or every service in this world needs advertisement. advertisement is required by everyone whether it's a service whether it's a product advertisement is definitely required by each one of us but unfortunately or fortunately all the professionals are bound by certain guidelines given to them by their respective institutes for example doctors are bound by 
the guidelines which are given to doctors by the indian medical association engineers are also bound by the guidelines which are given by their uh, own institute similarly cost accountants are bound by the uh, guidelines which are given by cma institute so once you qualify cma and you give your um, both the groups and you qualify and you apply for um, uh, you know uh, your membership you will be taken in writing that you know you will not advertisement you will not advertise your services you will not undertake advertisement of your services you, it, this will be taken in writing from you but sir why such a um, harsh imposition on professionals guys the reason is that profession is a very very noble thing and if we allow professionals to advertise their services if we allow professionals to go out all out in market and uh, tell about their services and uh, you know hire big film stars or actors and uh, tell about their services then somewhere the integrity of the profession will be compromised ek hindi ka word mujhe yaad aa raha hai garima garima of the profession will be compromised the 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 respect which profession has that will be compromised and that is the reason why doctors engineers you know architects um, cmas chartered accountants company secretaries are not permitted to advertise because somewhere if we permit advertisements of any of the professionals then guys our integrity will be compromised and we don't want any um a dark spot on our goodwill our goodwill will be compromised so once you become member of any professional body once you become member of any professional institute and i am aware because i am member of three professional bodies um if you become member of any professional institute or body then guys your behavior is also governed by that body how do you behave how do you talk how do you walk what is how does your visiting card look like all these things will be governed by the professional body um, uh, whose membership you have taken so the behavioral control see one is work related control work related controls means if you are doing audit you don't have to do fraud if you are doing audit then you have to follow these guidelines these principles cost accounting standards rules you have to follow this is profession related guidelines guys this is professional related um, uh, things that are imposed on you but what i am talking about is that you need to behaviorally also adhere to the requirements given to you by the cm main institute your behavior your conduct what kind of social media profile are you creating what kind of um, uh, you know image are you creating about the profession in the world and why is uh, uh, you know the these professionals so particular about their image because guys whenever something goes wrong then the headlines do not read as mr ram mr mohan did this wrong no the headlines with will read as leading doctor of delhi commits this offense so the profession is at stake goodwill of profession is at stake that's why we are saying we will govern your behavior also we will not allow you to do certain unethical things we will not allow you to uh, do certain things which, which will put a dark spot on the profession because tomorrow if anything goes wrong then the headlines will read as cost accountant in practice does this wrong thing and that is the reason you are the brand ambassadors of profession the members of the institute the members of the professional body are the brand ambassadors of the profession and that is the reason why strict guidelines strict professional ethics are laid down and before you are given membership of any professional body you have to sign these um uh, you know uh, uh, these guidelines you have to uh, you do your signature on these guidelines that you will follow these guidelines very very carefully guys very important um, guidelines are given under these professional ethics and responsibilities and yes these govern your behavior these don't govern your work these govern your behavior so people advertise through websites and their services provided are enlisted there so website um, uh, is permitted website if you um, create a website and enumerate your uh, services it is permitted it is not um, uh, considered as advertisement because everyone Uh, prepares their website so website is okay okay i am a doctor yes fiduciary duty is very good goshal dake fiduciary duty and fiduciary position and trust is there definitely definitely okay so guys you must have seen um, uh, you know visiting cards of cmas visiting cards of cas are there only in black and white color apart from the logo logo can be in color but apart from the logo everything else should be in black and white two colors are permitted 
guys we don't want a situation where cma is giving you card and his card is so flashy that you are seeing multiple colors rainbow colors in that card we won't have that situation if a cma if a cost accountant is coming to your office he should not wear t-shirt and jeans he should always wear formal clothes uh, tell me one thing guys as a teacher on my entire channel you always see me in formals have you ever seen me in casuals answer is no what stops me what stops me as a teacher i am not bound by any um uh, you know professional guideline that i have to follow this mandatorily i am not bound by any guideline still i make it a point that i, I always wear formals whenever i am in front of all of you the reason is i want to imbibe this subtle habit this subtle mannerism in you that tomorrow when you are um going to some client's place or having some public dealing guys do not wear t-shirts and jeans you should be in formals that is the reason always whenever i'm going to my class also my face to face batch or my um live batch i'm always in formals i do not wear um t-shirts or jeans uh, you know as a matter of practice the reason is very simple i can easily wear t-shirts and jeans but i want to imbibe this this um, mannerism in in hearts and soul of my students that students you are a professional you are going to be a professional if you are going to be a professional then you have to the first step is you have to look like a professional you have to look like a professional that is the first step in becoming a professional sir so much of harsh provisions on us so much of harsh restrictions on us yes guys because with great powers come great responsibilities you are given the power of signing cost audit report on the basis of your cost audit report ministry of corporate affairs will make its decision for the entire country and you are telling me that you want to advertise your services using some actors and actresses on television no guys not acceptable sorry i won't permit this institute of cost accountants of india will not permit this <clears throat> so yes today the the uh, subject matter under consideration is that you know there are some behavioral guide guidelines behavior related um, uh, you know restrictions which are imposed and these behavior related instructions are known as professional ethics which every cost auditor is expected to obey is expected to uh, fulfill because uh, these are very very core of any profession okay now what is the objective of this code why is this code um, there sir just dial some firms are registered it is also comes under professional ethics no no just dial is okay just dial is not a problem see advertisement means public advertisement uh, television radio uh, banners hoardings that is not permitted just dial is okay just dial is just like a directory okay directory where you are informing that yes if you want a cost auditor cost auditor is here so that is just a directory okay okay so objective of this code what is the objective of this code why is this code there in our profession what is the objective of this code let's study <clears throat> so the objective of this code i have i have integrity competence the objective of this code is to imbibe certain virtues in you is to imbibe certain um, good things in you yes cpo pi arti is giving a shortcut trick very good arti arti where did you learn these shortcut tricks from <laughs> very good superb so yes, i'll also give you a shortcut trip trick of this uh, part okay so objectives of this code is to imbibe is to give you certain virtues certain good things for your benefit what are those they are integrity competence confidentiality objectivity and professional behavior i have abbreviated as ic cop so guys these professional ethics are just like cop they are policemen but they are behavioral policemen they are guiding or they are regulating your behavior so ic cop cop is policeman okay so you can use this abbreviation ic cop ic cop that abbreviation you can use okay so um integrity you should be straightforward and honest first and foremost thing which is expected from an auditor is that he should be honest if there's something hanky panky um going on in the financial statements or cost statements you should be honestly telling it about it to the shareholders so first thing is he should be honest and straightforward competence he should be knowledgeable he should be skillful and he should be diligent so three elements are added in competence competence means whether you are able 
um uh, to uh, perform as a as as the role of the cost writer or not that is ability okay so in case of ability you have three things your skill should be there your knowledge should be there and diligence diligence means you should be careful while doing your work you should not be careless you should be careful while doing your work so competence has three elements to it confidentiality very very imp important guys you should not disclose any information in case of any engagement to anyone okay do not um uh, share any confidential information because guys as an author you will be privy to some very very sensitive price sensitive information so you should not you should not um uh, you know uh, disclose confidential information to anyone confidentiality is a very very important virtue that these um uh, professional ethics will imbibe in you now i'll tell you my personal example of confidentiality okay and how sometimes uh, doing some loose talks are you aware about what is loose talks loose talks or small talks small talks means gossips how gossips or small talks lead to uh, breach of confidentiality i'll give you an example okay so guys i was auditing a very big uh, um, a garment manufacturing company um, a cloth basically um, cloth manufacturing company i was auditing that company and uh, during the course of audit i came to know that this company is going to shake hands in a, in case of a joint venture with a japanese company they they both will join hand in near future for that they have also purchased a land whereby they'll be establishing a factory and that japanese company and this company will uh, join hands and establish a company in that particular area okay i came privy to this information why did i come privy to this information because i was an auditor i had to check all the documents and all the happenings which are happening in the company so i checked all the uh, things okay now this was a confidential information this company was listed company and this information was not out in market as yet i wasn't aware about this fact so once the audit was over i came back to office and once i came back to office uh, i was having just a normal chit chat small chat over coffee with one of my friends who was in office and he asked me uh, nikhil where were you in audit for so many days i told him i was in this particular company and this company is planning a, a joint venture with a very big company of japan this is name of the company in japan and i came to know this 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 i i you know in flow in 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 uh, in advertence um, in flow i uh, uh, talked about all these things to that particular friend and that friend was a stock market um uh, you know investor he immediately purchased some shares of that particular company and he got profit because once this information was public at that point in time uh, the share price rose so this information became public share price rose so this is how small talks small talks means gossips can lead to be breach of confidentiality right you guys you should make sure that you should not do small talks or gossips about your client in your office or with your parents also some people have a habit of you know coming back home and saying everything to their mom which is a good habit which is a good habit whatever happened during the day you will tell you to your mom which is a very good habit but guys even to your mom any confidential information related to client must not be disclosed confidentiality is a very 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 important um, uh, virtue so confidentiality is a virtue which is um, you know there in professional ethics then objectivity objectivity means you should be fair uh, you should not be prejudiced or biased you should um, uh, be uh, able to say what is milk you should be able to distinguish distinguish between milk and water okay that ability should be there objectivity should be there in you and professional behavior this is the most important thing your act your mannerism uh, your mannerism should be absolutely professional i mean professionals do not raise their voice when they are angry professional in fact keep mum when they are angry they are uh, they become silent when they are angry so you need to demonstrate professional behavior just like i told you at client's place you cannot wear a jeans and a t-shirt no you cannot do that so these are the virtues which we want to instill in you and that is why this professional ethics is always uh, given to the professionals who uh, you know pass out a professional examination so that they can adhere to the rules and regulations which are given in these professional ethics now let's come on to the rules and regulations rachan rahana kk says love from kerala thank you so much rahana love to you also to all the keralites all right so now the contents of schedule of cw act are briefly discussed and now we come to the main content of this particular chapter what are the activities which if you do you it will be said that you are breaching professional ethics what are those activities uh, now we'll be discussing all those activities which come under category of breach of professional ethics we'll start with the first schedule so we in total we have four schedules we'll start with the first schedule okay first schedule part 1 
so first schedule part one is related to professional misconduct in relation to cost accountant in practice a cost accountant who has a cop okay who's a cost accountant in practice a cost accountant in practice is a cost accountant who has a cop certificate of practice guys yesterday i told you that once you become a qualified cma then you will be given an option either you can become a practicing cost accountant or you can choose to uh, do your job so in relation to cost accountant in practice these uh, professional ethics are applicable these are not applicable in case of people who are in employment for people who are in employment for cmas who are in employment we have a separate schedule this is for people who are in practice professional uh, misconduct in relation to cost accountant in practice for example a practicing cost accountant should not so what are the what are the things that a practicing cost accountant should not do he should not allow any person to practice in his name other than his cma partners so professional uh, cma cost accountant should not allow anyone else to uh, practice on his name so guys sometimes what happens is and this is a very common practice you know people give their name people retire and they give their name just for name sake you know sometimes in empanelment um, uh, of auditors it helps if you have more partners in your cma firm okay so some people just give their name they don't actually come to office they don't actually come to uh, work uh, which is not good okay although if you give your name to cma partners that's okay but if you are allowing any other person to practice in your name so for example if there's a lawyer and he needs a valuation services and you tell the lawyer okay you use my name you uh, perform the valuation services you use my name for performing the valuation services absolutely wrong absolutely wrong not permitted at all okay yes sir कुछ लोग सी एस भी ऑडिट कर देते हैं साइन सी एस एक् करवा लेते हैं वाह 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 ट्विंकल रुस्तगी ने तो बड़ा कमाल की बात बोली है यस इनसाइडर ट्रेडिंग नॉट ट्रेनिंग शुभम भारद्वाज इनसाइडर ट्रेडिंग ट्रेनिंग नहीं इस लिखा है ट्रेनिंग ओके नेक्स्ट पे एनी शेयर और कमीशन ऑफ ब्रोकरेज डायरेक्टली और इनडायरेक्टली इन फीस और प्रॉफिट ऑफ इस प्रोफेशनल वर्क टू एनी अदर पर्सन अदर देन हिज पार्टनर नाउ अ Uh, cost accountant cannot share his fees with any other person i'll give you a simple example okay i am a cost accountant client came to me client said i want um uh, complete services with respect to return filing with respect to valuation with respect to gst i want complete services i told the client that i can provide a gst and return filing services to you income tax and gst i can provide but i don't know valuation i am not aware about valuation so i will hire a valuer you pay me the fees i will pay the valuer's fees to him this is not permissible on behalf of client you cannot pay fees to someone else you cannot share your fees with some other professional yes you can introduce the client to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the valuer but you cannot pay valuer's fees yourself so you cannot pay any share commission or brokerage in the fees or profit of his uh, professional work to any other person other than the partner you can share your profits with your partner but not with any other person so you know if a lawyer is required suppose a lawyer is required by the client i cannot say that i will hire a lawyer you pay me the fees i will pay the lawyer no you cannot say this you have to receive the fees which you deserve and the fees which lawyer deserve client will pay directly to the lawyer client will not pay to you client will pay directly to the lawyer that is the principle okay third accepts or agrees to accept any part of profit or professional work of any other person same guys same goes vice versa also is true so if a lawyer um, uh, is giving cost services to his client and the lawyer asks you that you give services to lawyer and lawyer will give services to the client and lawyer will share his fees with you you should say a no you can't receive the money you can't pay the money both ways the doors are closed neither can you receive the money nor can you pay the money to some other professional okay we cannot do that no enters into partnership with any person other than cost accountant in practice this is a very very important point so any kind of uh, partnership is not permitted with any other person apart from cost accountant so suppose if i want to uh, open a partnership firm with a chartered accountant can i do it answer is no i cannot do it if i want to open a partnership firm with a lawyer can i do it answer is no it is not permissible although the partnership act or the companies act permits multidisciplinary partnerships and to an extent guys institute of cost accountants of india has also accepted this fact of multidisciplinary partnership but still there are still some open ended points which are still becoming lacunas in this particular subject matter okay so that is the point 
okay let's see what is the next misconduct let me check your questions ट्विंकल सिंह पैसे के लिए कुछ भी कर देंगे सर अभिषेक से सर कैन प्रोफेशनल फ्रॉम ऑल थ्री इंस्टीट्यूट ज्वाइन टूगेदर टू ओपन अ पार्टनरशिप फॉर्म सो गाइज देर इज अज आई टोल्ड यू देर इज अ कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ मल्टी डिसिप्लिन पार्टनरशिप बट इट इज नॉट एज प्रेवलेंट एज ऑफ नाउ बिकॉज देर आर सम रिस्ट्रिक्शन फ्रॉम सम इंस्टीट्यूट एंड येस इट इज एप्लीकेबल फॉर सिल्बर टू थाउंड ट्वेंटी टू ऑल्सो येस येस यस योर जीएसटी लेक्चर आर सुपर थैंक यू रहाना के के थैंक यू सो मच जीएसटी लेक्चर्स ओके ओके नेक्स्ट इज सिक्योर प्रोफेशनल बिजनेस फ्रॉम एनी पर्सन अदर देन हिज पार्टनर एम्प्लॉय और फ्रॉम एनी सोर्स व्हिच इज नॉट ओपन टू कॉस्ट अकाउंटेंट्स वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट गाइस इन इन अन इन अ यू नो इन अ इन अ सटल वे दे आर आल्सो रिस्ट्रिक्टिंग एडवर्टाइजमेंट यू कैन नॉट स्कोर एनी सिक्योर एनी प्रोफेशनल बिजनेस फ्रॉम एनी पर्सन अदर देन योर पार्टनर और एम्प्लॉय or from any source which is not open to cost accountants you cannot secure business from any other source you cannot advertise you cannot ask a lawyer that you know dear mr lawyer please um, while you are uh, giving services to your client please tell about me also you cannot score secure professional business from anywhere next solicit client solicit means invite invite clients or professional work by circular advertisement personal communication interview or by any other means so you cannot invite client by advertisement prohibited personal communication you cannot call the clients and tell them i am a cost accountant can you can i do your cost audit no you cannot do that you cannot do that yes you can meet the client you can tell your credentials to the client but you cannot actively you know uh, just like you get calls of insurance do you want to take insurance do you want to take credit card you cannot uh, you know call people and say that do you want to get your cost audit done do you want to file your income tax return do you want to file your gst return no you cannot do that it's against professional ethics advertises professional attainments or services or uses any designation or expression other than cost accountant on professional document so you should not advertise your professional attainments you know that i do cost audit of reliance industries limited i do cost audit of tata communication limited you cannot do that you cannot do that and you also cannot use any expression other than cost accountant on your visiting cards so on your visiting cards you cannot write i am a tax advisor on visiting card you cannot write that i am a uh, expert in transfer pricing you cannot do that you have to write that you are a cost accountant when you are a member of a professional body you have to write that i am a cost accountant that is the requirement okay all partner cma matlab where have you seen this uh, all partner cma prajakta says when we register in just dial we have to call the customer no no not necessarily just dial means that you will receive calls from your customers and you will be connected to them just dial won't call anyone suomoto okay so this was guys first schedule part 1 now we move on to first schedule part 2 first schedule part 2 professional in relation to members of institute in service this is related to people who are doing job not practice this is related to people who are doing job so member um, uh, in service service means a job so first schedule second part is dedicated to people who are doing job what all they cannot do that is the ask okay pay to any person any share and emolument of employment undertaken by him so they cannot pay their salary to any other person they cannot pay their salary to any other person so i'll give you an example okay suppose i am a cost accountant and i am doing job in tata communication services and i am i'm their co chief cost accountant okay i hire a cost accountant to see firm and tell them that i don't want to prepare cost accounts of this year you please prepare the cost account and whatever salary i will get i will pay 50% to you because this year i don't want to um, uh, work i don't want to go to the office therefore you uh, do the work on my behalf and i will pay 50% of my salary to you not permissible not permissible you cannot share your salary with anyone then it says accept any part of fees profits and gains from a lawyer cost accountant or broker engaged by such company firm or person agent or customer of such company or firm or person by way of commission or gratification now guys what happens is sometimes you know um, uh, there is a, a dire misconduct which is suppose i am cfo of a very big company every decision is in my hands who shall be the cost charter this also in my hands i am the cfo i am a cma and i am also a cfo of the company and who will be the cost charter this is in my hands 
there are four firms who have applied as the cost auditor in my company and i tell them whichever firm is going to give me 5 lakh rupees i will appoint you as the cost auditor this is impermissible this is corruption this is corruption guys this is fraud impermissible so you cannot accept any part of fees profit and gains of lawyer cost accountant or broker engaged by such company firm or person or agent or customer of such company firm or person by way of commission or gratification you cannot accept any money from any such people okay next first schedule part 3 first schedule part 3 is related to professional misconduct in relation to members of institute in general which means that this part is applicable for both people who are doing job plus people who are doing practice this part is applicable for both so part 1 only to people who are in practice part 2 only to people who are in job part 3 to people who are in job as well as in practice both yes sir both so what are these act as a fellow of the institute if he is not the fellow of the institute so guys uh, there are two levels of membership that you will get first you will get associate membership acm mein and then you will get fellow membership fellow membership you will get only after doing practice uh, or a couple of um, years after you do practice over a couple of years then you are um uh, you know eligible for get your fellowship okay fellow you are a fellow suppose you are not a fellow fellow represent that you are very um uh, experienced fellowship means that you are experienced suppose you are not a fellow and you are um uh, telling people that you are a fellow this is misconduct you are a, and you are telling people that you are a fellow this is a misconduct you cannot do that if you are not a fellow you cannot claim yourself to be a fellow so a person who acts as a fellow of the institute if he is not a fellow of the institute fellow means this is a level of uh, a membership guys associate membership and fellow membership these are two kinds of memberships which are there and you cannot tell yourself as a fellow if you are not a fellow okay so gaurav is asking which schedule is important for this exam so i think first schedule not for this exam but generally guys first schedule is the most important schedule first schedule is the most important schedule okay then he should not act, act as a fellow he should refrain from supplying information called for um uh, by the institute council or any of its committee so he should not uh, refrain from uh, giving any information to the institute if instead of ask, asking for information about the company he should be open and free in giving that information to the institute then he should not supply gives information knowing it to be false while soliciting work from other uh, cost accountants responding to tenders or bid so he should not supply any misleading information any wrong information to anyone that is again a professional misconduct if you are supplying misleading information or wrong information to anyone then again you are um, under professional misconduct then first part schedule 4 guys for first part schedule 4 relates to other misconduct so there are two types of misconduct professional misconduct which means while you are performing your professional duties then you are doing something wrong and other is other misconduct which means even when you are not doing your profession so you know uh, in the evening you are absolutely free you are roaming about in the streets and you know you beat someone you beat someone will institute take an action against you yes police will take an action against you for sure but will institute take an action against you yes it will take action against you under schedule 4 which relates to other misconduct this is not a professional misconduct this is other misconduct so schedule four relates to other misconduct of in relation to members of the institute in general which means it's applicable for both people who are doing job plus people who are doing practice it's applicable for both practice and job but this relates to other misconduct which means that which clearly means that institute is not only regulating your professional life but also regulating your personal life there is nothing called personal life when you become a professional if you are professional there is nothing called personal life your every conduct your every behavior should be under some ethical standards there is nothing called professional life a personal life so if you say sir till 6 o'clock i am very very decent man and i have do whatever is required by me what is whatever is ethical i do all those things but after 6 o'clock i become absolutely unethical i become rustic villager i drink and i smash public property not permissible from the institute side also cannot do that cannot do that so first schedule part 4 leads to other misconduct what are these other misconduct um 
he should not be held guilty by any civil or criminal court for any offense which is punishable with imprisonment for a term exceeding 6 months so that person should not be held guilty of any uh, criminal offense uh, for which he should be punishable for imprisonment exceeding 6 months if he spends a time in jail uh, exceeding 6 months then guys uh, this is a professional misconduct he has Uh, you know done some professional misconduct so if you are charged against the um allegation of eve teasing institute has all the rights to cancel your membership your membership will be cancelled you might say sir but that is not no business of institute why is institute uh, you know in intruding in my personal life that's my personal life whatever do i do in my personal life that's my personal thing no guys i've told you the golden formula after you become a cma there is nothing called personal life no you cannot do anything wrong unethical in your personal life also मार्केट पॉइंट सर बट इंस्टीट्यूट को क्या ये तो पर्सनल है ना हमारा इसमें क्यों आएगा ट्विंकल इज आस्किंग द सेम क्वेश्चन व्हिच आई हैव जस्ट रिप्लाइड कि पर्सनल लाइफ की वजह से प्रोफेशनल लाइफ में इफेक्ट पड़ता है वेरी गुड आंसर गौरव अग्रवाल क्योंकि पर्सनल लाइफ की वजह से प्रोफेशनल में इफेक्ट पड़ता है भाई टेल मी व्हाट विल बी द इंस्टीट्यूट्स व्हाट विल बी द न्यूज़पेपर हेडलाइन नेक्स्ट डे इट विल बी सीएम में ट्विंकल रुस्तगी वाज फाउंड स्मैशिंग पब्लिक प्रॉपर्टी दिस इज द हेडलाइन CMA will definitely be there. Cost accountant will definitely be there because to sensitize the newspaper, to sensitize any news, institute uses um, uh, you know some some uh, professional body's name for sure. That is the reason. Yes, so he should should not be held guilty by any civil or uh, uh, criminal court where he is uh, allowed. Where he is subject to imprisonment of more than six months. Then, whatever brings disrespect to the profession, if you do anything which brings disrespect to the profession or the institute as a result of his action, whether or not related to professional work or not, whether it is related to professional work or not, if you do anything that will bring disrespect to the institute, that will tarnish the goodwill of the institute. Anything, open-ended, anything. If you do anything which tarnishes the image of the institute, then. it will come under the category of professional misconduct and institute has all the rights to cancel your membership under the fourth part under the fourth part of first schedule now we come on to the second schedule so guys just like there was there is first schedule there is second schedule also now let me tell you a brief difference between first schedule and second schedule what is the difference between first schedule and second schedule i'll um, now tell you the difference okay institute kehta hai izzat se raho professional ho tabhi to cm mein prefix de rahe hain aapko पूरे इंस्टीट्यूट का नाम खराब होता है ट्विंकल को बात समझ में आ गई देर से समझ में आई लेकिन दुरुस्त समझ में आई वेरी गुड ट्विंकल ओके सेकंड शेड्यूल पार्ट वन नाउ आई वाज टेलिंग यू द डिफरेंस बिटवीन फर्स्ट शेड्यूल एंड सेकंड शेड्यूल ओके सो गाइस, द डिफरेंस बिटवीन फर्स्ट शेड्यूल एंड सेकेंड शेड्यूल इज दैट फर्स्ट शेड्यूल कवर्स ऑफेंसेज विच आर लिटिल लेस अग्रेसिव इन नेचर विच आर पनिशेबल टू अर एक्सटेंट which are a little less harmful and the second schedule covers those offenses which are very very aggressive which are very very harmful which are of a very high cadre which are of a very high level so schedule 2 are offenses which are very very strong offenses which are very very um, a tough of offenses and schedule 1 includes those offenses which are relatively uh, less heavier relatively less um, uh, you know punishable that is the difference so schedule 2 part 1 again part 1 relates to professional misconduct in uh, in uh, relation to cost accountant in practice so this is applicable to cost accountant in practice not on the cost accountant on job okay he should not disclose confidential information acquired in the course of his professional en engagement we have already discussed this confidentiality should be maintained by the cost accountant certify a report of examination of cost accounting unless the examination has been made by him or his partner so a person cannot certify a report without examining the statements some people you know just blindly sign the uh, audit report without even seeing the financial statements just in um, a greed of money should not do that should not do that certify report of examination of cost accounting unless examination is done by him or his partner permit use of his name in connection with an estimate of cost or earning which is contingent upon a future event so guys very very important as a as a cost accountant you cannot vouch for or you cannot certify or you cannot sign on a report which uh, tells about some estimate of future projections you are a cost accountant you are not a um, oracle the the you know the divine god you are not the divine god that you will estimate the future 
so professionals are restricted from estimating the future you cannot estimate future cash flows like we do in our uh, valuation you cannot do that you cannot estimate that and you cannot sign it you can estimate it but don't sign it don't say that i nikhil gupta the cost auditor with membership number so and so certify that these future projections are perfect you cannot do that you can prepare it but cannot sign it so he should not permit use of his name in connection with any estimate of cost or earnings which is contingent upon future events because you know in future whether it will happen or not you are not sure about that so that is not permissible express his opinion on cost or pricing statement of any business in which he his firm partner or his firm has substantial interest so again restriction with respect to the qualification of the auditor similar restriction is there that you know if you have uh, interest in the company then you cannot be a cost auditor of that particular company you should not have you should not have any financial interest in the company if you want to be the cost auditor of that company we are not celebrities to give autograph on any document very good very well said sharan very well said ट्विंकल सेज यस सर बाजीगर मूवी वहां खेल हो जाए अगर ऐसे ही करते रहे तो नहीं समझ आए डू हैव टू लर्न शेड्यूल फ्रॉम थ्योरी और इट्स ओनली रेलिवेंट फॉर केस स्टडीज नो नो शिव शुभम इवन इफ इट्स फॉर केस स्टडीज एंड यू हैव टू लर्न दीज शेड्यूल्स नो यू शुड बी अवेयर अबाउट इन विच शेड्यूल इज वॉट ऑफेंस कमिंग इन फाइनली Tarun Jain is asking practical question ka weightage kya hota kitna hota hai cost and management audit practical questions will come of about 35 to 40 marks out of 100 marks okay this is the first schedule of second uh, second schedule of first part okay then fail to report a material misstatement known to him to appear in the cost accountant so if knowingly okay the word is knowingly if knowingly he fails to report any material misstatement the most important word is which is known to him which is known to him knowingly if he fails to um, disclose any uh, material misstatement in the cost account then he is subject to a professional misconduct does not exercise due diligence he is not careful in his work or demonstrate gross, gross negligence in the conduct of personal duty so while you are conducting the personal professional duty you should not be careless okay if you show carelessness then guys um now you will be subject to these uh, rules second schedule part 2 again professional misconduct in relation to member of institute generally which means it is related to job plus practice people who are there in job plus people who are there in practice what is does say contravene any provision of this act or regulation made there under so whatever is written in this act in this particular uh, professional ethics code if you don't follow it then you get covered under second schedule part 2 which is the professional conduct part okay for members uh, who are in practice as well as members who are in um, a job for both of them okay sir how much marks this chapter carry 5 to 6 marks no 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 Shubham, you don't have to address the schedule by schedule number or part number. You need not remember schedule number or part number. That is not not a required thing. Okay. Okay. So he discloses confidential information acquired in the course of professional engagement. Again, not permissible. Permissible uh, if confidential information is stored. Furnish incorrect information to the institute, council, or any other committee. So you should not furnish any incorrect information to the institute or council or committee. Defalcate or embezzle money is received in his personal capacity. So he should not. um uh, you know um, embezzle the money which is received to him in his professional capacity he should not make you know any illicit gains from the professional attainments so i'll tell you a very interesting story okay please don't publicize this story okay i used to do my articleship in one of the small firms okay i did this training finance training so whenever my boss used to um, prepare income tax returns and suppose the income tax which is calculated is calculated at rupees say 30000 okay he would always tell the client that you know the your income tax is 50000 rupees give me 50000 rupees and i'll file your return client is to trust him and give him 50000 rupees 20000 rupees he used to put in his pocket apart from the professional fees which he is receiving from the client and 30000 rupees he used to deposit on behalf of the client so this is what is prohibited over here he cannot defalcate or embezzle money received in his professional capacity so these small small problems are there but guys i'll tell you out of my experience please do not fall for such small greeds these are small small greeds don't fall for such small greeds otherwise you will not grow in profession if you 
uh, you know don't um, show your trust in profession then you will not grow in the profession that is my request to all of you don't do that सर जैसे टीचर होते हैं वो लोग प्रैक्टिस भी करते हैं और पढ़ाते भी हैं तो सर ये इसमें आएगा क्या किस में किसकी बात कर रहे हो किसकी बात कर रहे हो कहां लिखा है कि आप पढ़ा नहीं सकते जब आप प्रैक्टिस कर रहे हो तो ये कहा लिखा है तो भाई पढ़ाने का क्या रूल होता है मैं आपको बता देता हूं कि इफ यू आर प्रैक्टिसिंग मेंबर ऑफ एनी ऑफ द इंस्टीट्यूट एंड इफ यू वॉन्ट टू टीच यू नो अलॉन्ग विद योर प्रैक्टिस देन यू जस्ट हैव टू इंटीमेट द इंस्टीट्यूट दैट अलॉन्ग विद माई प्रैक्टिस आई ऑल्सो वॉन्ट टू टीच यू गेट अ परमिशन फ्रॉम द इंस्टीट्यूट That is not prohibited. It is, uh, it is allowed. Today I am pushing myself and focusing, sir. Today my CS final exam went bad, sir. Open book, but entire paper was out of syllabus. Even after that much effort, paper was like that. Tejasvi, don't worry about this, okay? Professional uh, examination is like that only. This is the heart and soul of professional examination. Don't worry. Prepare for the next examination. जॉब और प्रैक्टिस सर पढ़ाना भी अगर किसी कोचिंग में जॉब और प्रैक्टिस यू कैन नॉट डू टुगेदर नो 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 ओके परफेक्ट लेट्स मूव ऑन टू पार्ट थ्री सेकंड शेड्यूल पार्ट थ्री सेकंड शेड्यूल पार्ट थ्री इज अदर मिसकंडक्ट अपार्ट फ्रॉम प्रोफेशनल मिसकंडक्ट ऑफ मेंबर ऑफ इंस्टीट्यूट इन जर्नल विच मीन इट इज एप्लीकेबल टू पीपल हुआ डूइंग जॉब एज वेल एज पीपल हुआ डूइंग प्रैक्टिस इट इज एप्लीकेबल फॉर बोथ ऑफ द पीपल वेदर यू आर डूइंग जॉब और प्रैक्टिस सेकंड शेड्यूल पार्ट थ्री इज एप्लीकेबल टू यू A member of institute, whether in practice or not, shall be deemed guilty of other misconduct if he is held guilty by any civil or criminal court for an offence which is punishable exceeding six months. So again, guys, this default is um, uh, featuring in first schedule as well as second schedule. Both the schedules are featuring this particular um, clause. Why? Because if there are very grave offences which a person has done. then he'll be uh, covered in a second schedule if there there are very small offenses with the person has done then they will covered be covered in the first schedule okay so what is the escalation matrix once any um, you know default in these schedules are found who is to be um, who's the uh, adjudicating authority who will tell what is the punishment in case of schedule 1 complaint is referred to board of discipline which is an internal committee which is formed in the institute schedule 2 big offenses okay big miscompliances complaint refer to disciplinary committee this is a very very strong committee okay following actions may be taken reprimand the member scold the member remove name of the member for 3 months fine up to maximum of 1 lakh in case of schedule 2 offenses reprimand the member remove the name of the member permanently please underline the word permanently you can be devoid of your uh, degree permanently and fine up to maximum of 5 lakh rupees that is the offense Okay, so here I've tried to tell you the seriousness of disciplinary committee, guys. Okay, so board of discipline, a person with experience in law, having knowledge of disciplinary matters, two council members, and one director discipline. Okay, member of disciplinary committee should be the council shall constitute disciplinary committee consisting of president or vice president of council as presiding officer. So who is the presiding officer? President or vice president of the council, very senior person. Two members to be elected amongst member of council. Two members to be nominated from central government. Look at this. How serious second schedule offences are? Central government person will be there. Person of eminence, having experience in field of law, economics, business, finance, or accountancy. That is the gravity of the second schedule. Second schedule is very very grave, guys. Very very grave. Okay. So these are common sections, guys. Uh, what are the penalties on first conviction? What is the penalty? Subsequent con conviction? What is the penalty? These are common sections. These I don't need to uh, you know run past them. Okay, now let us do some practical questions and let's see if you are able to solve these case studies or not by yourself. Okay, you need to solve these case studies by yourself. Okay, one by one we'll be seeing these case studies and let's see who um, uh, uh, gives me answer first. A part. Okay, let's start with A part. A part says. A cost accountant practice takes voluntary retirement from from his employer and starts his practice. He continues his association with the previous employer as an advisor on a monthly retainer basis, whether it uh, it is categorized as professional misconduct or not. Whether it is professional misconduct or not, guys, he is in employment. Okay. 
and while being in employment he is also doing his practice whether this is a misconduct or not a part i want the answer Pooja Shinde says some faculties who teach in our institute they also practice as a CMA. That's not a problem. It's just that the institute is to be made aware of this fact. It's a misconduct or not? Everyone is saying it's a misconduct. Amitesh is saying it's not a misconduct. Prajakta is saying misconduct. Padma says no misconduct. Arti says no misconduct. Suman says misconduct. Lakshmi Dhar says no misconduct. So the answer is it is not a misconduct. Why? Because he has broken all relationships. with respect to his employment and after that he is associated with the previous employer as an advisor not as an employee not as an employee so it is not a misconduct this is perfectly fine it is perfectly fine it's not a misconduct guys it is not a misconduct okay part b a practicing lawyer specializing in anti dumping cases comes to an informal understanding with the independent practicing cost accountant to assist him in preparing accounting statement to support his cases and agrees to share his fees on a percentage basis so a lawyer comes to you and agrees to um, uh, share his fees on a percentage basis with you whether it is a professional misconduct or not whether this is a professional misconduct or not yes twinkle very right answer whether it is a misconduct or supreet says it's the misconduct who else yes misconduct prajakta says misconduct abhishek says misconduct yes guys very right it's a misconduct you cannot share your um, fees with any other professional and you cannot even receive fees from any other professional it is absolutely a misconduct yes very good goshal has given an extended answer and i would like to display goshal's answer on the screen this tant amounts to informal partnership and it is prohibited it's a professional misconduct this is the perfect answer goshal has given very good goshal very very good okay next c cost accountant gives a certificate of cost for product manufactured by ssi unit owned entirely by his son so cost accountant is giving um, uh, you know uh, some cost certificate to a firm which is owned by his own son whether professional misconduct or not please think through properly let's see everyone is saying it's a misconduct <laughs> everyone is saying it's a misconduct abhishek saying misconduct gaurav is saying misconduct parash prajakta saying not very good So, guys, this case. So, this case, guys, this is not a misconduct. This is not a misconduct. Why? Because if you have any substantial interest in that business, only then are you prohibited to audit that particular firm. But if your son has substantial interest in the business, then there is not a problem according to the uh, professional misconduct schedule. It might be a problem according to Companies Act. it's not a problem for this particular schedule because the schedule says that you cannot audit a firm in which you have substantial interest so not a misconduct kc cost accountant gives certificate of cost of production for attaching with a tender for a cost plus contract he comes to know after signing the certificate that his client has won a case with supplier on account of which the client is entitled to get a refund of substantial portion of purchase price of raw material the certificate is not corrected So you know you gave a certificate to a, to one of your clients regarding the purchases or whatever. Subsequently, you came to know after you gave the certificate, you came to know that um, uh, the the cost that has been approved by you is going to get refunded from the supplier. It is going to get refunded. Okay, so your in in a nutshell, your um, uh, your uh, certificate is incorrect, whether it's a professional misconduct or not. Whether it's a professional misconduct or not, D part.
पार्ट सी सो गाइज इन पार्ट सी वी आर सेइंग दैट सन इज ओनिंग द SSI unit. So son has substantial interest in the SSI unit, but father doesn't have any uh, substantial interest in the SSI unit. Father doesn't have any interest. So father can issue a cost uh, certificate to the SSI unit. That is what. Yes, very very good guys. So you know the cost accountant was not aware about this particular development when he was signing the certificate. So this is not a misconduct. But as a good practice, he should now issue an addendum to his certificate. telling about this particular event which has happened x is a shareholder in pq limited and holding 100 shares company is paid up capital is 500 crores x accepts certificate work from the company so x is a shareholder who is holding 100 shares in the company okay the company is paid up share capital is 500 crores x x accepts certificate work from the company x is doing certification work for the company where he is also a shareholder so please tell me whether this is misconduct or not whether this is misconduct or not he is a shareholder of 100 shares whether this is a misconduct or not absolutely no this is not a misconduct no it is not a misconduct why because to qualify it as misconduct you have to have substantial interest in the company you have to have substantial interest in the company and x only has 100 shares in pq limited out of 5 crore share capital 50 lakh shares he has only 100 shares but sir we had read somewhere that you know even holding one share is um problematic guys that is in case of companies act in case of companies act holding even one share by the cost order is problematic for the cost order yes yes perfect practicing cost accountant brings disrepute to the profession as a result of his action action in his professional work of course yes if he is bringing disrepute to the profession of course this is professional misconduct practicing cost accountant for its personal advantage share certain confidential information acquired from costing or cost auditing professional cost accountant has acquired some professional information and he is supplying this perf professional um uh, information he is using the professional information absolutely a misconduct form of cost accountant and take cost out of a company the audit work is conducted by one of the partners and two assistants a report is however signed by another partner a report is signed by another partner permissible or non permissible h so work is done by one partner report is signed by another partner so permissible or not permissible guys permissible if the report is signed by his own partner who is a cost accountant permissible if the report is signed by some other person who is not a cost accountant not permissible so this is permissible i practicing cost accountant accept assignment previously held by another cost accountant practice after duly communication with him so before accepting any assignment of cost uh, statements cost audit the uh, new cost auditor must communicate with the old cost auditor to ascertain why did the old cost auditor um lose the business okay that is a courtesy letter which is required to be issued so no professional misconduct a practicing member firm maintains branch office in india each under separate charge of member of ici no misconduct so having a branch in many uh, cities not a misconduct personal discussion or correspondence with prospective client relating to achievement and capabilities of practicing cost accountant so you are doing a personal chit chat you are doing a personal discussion with your prospective client with your future client regarding your achievements you are telling your achievements so guys a personal discussion is not a problem a personal discussion is not a problem issuing a memorandum or issuing a certificate or issuing your advertisement is a problem if personally i am discussing my achievements with a client not a problem so it is not a misconduct it is not a misconduct next press publicity not an advertisement regarding appointment as an auditor you are doing press publicity which means you have invited press and you have uh, told them that i have become the cost auditor of reliance industries limited wow not permissible not permissible whether it's an advertisement or through any other means you cannot publicize your professional achievements not permissible an advertisement notifying change in address or partnership advertising where change in partnership or change in address is denoted absolutely no misconduct guys because this is a usual thing 
Mr. Jain, a practicing cost accountant, takes up job as full time lecturer in XBL Management Institute in Jamshedpur, affiliated to Raj, Ra Ranchi University. Same case as we had discussed, guys. A person who is into practice, he has obtained a lecturership in a college. Will it tantamount to professional misconduct or not? What is your answer? I'm at part N. What is your answer? Answer is very simple, guys. It's only that the practicing cost accountant should obtain permission from the institute for acting as a teacher. That is the requirement. If he has obtained permission from the institute, no problem. If he has not obtained permission from the institute, problem. He has to convey to the institute or take permission from him. Perfect, perfect answer. Um, uh, Inkle. Okay, next. Mr. Pidhar, a cost accountant, uses visiting card in which he designates himself besides cost accountant as tax consultant. Not permissible, not permissible. Mr. P. Nandkarni, a cost account practice in India, entered into partnership with RD Homes, CMA USA. CMA India having partnership with CMA USA. Not permissible. Not permissible. A certificate of practice is not required to be taken in case of CMA US. Then CMA Anusuya, a cost account in practice, published a book, gave her personal introduction as an author. Details also mentioned her personal professional experiences and her association as partner with PKR and associates firms of cost accountant. So a person has issued uh, a book that is an authorship of a book. And that person has also um, you know, told about his uh, her association with the um, uh, partnership firm, which is PKR and associates, whether professional misconduct or not. Please tell me. Yes, it is a professional misconduct. Very good. Because she shouldn't have mentioned that she's a partner with CMA firm. He shouldn't have mentioned that. Because this is tantamounting to, tantamount to advertisement. This is tantamounting to advertisement. This is advertisement, guys. This is a misconduct. Very good. I think first of all, no, before we go ahead, you should, guys, clap for yourself. Clap for yourself. Put that clapping emoji in the chat box. Clap for yourself because you guys are really doing it well. It seems that you are absolutely prepared for your cost audit uh, examination. And yes, you are going to get 80 plus marks in your cost audit for sure. So just uh, give me a clapping emoji on the chat box. Next, Mrs. RK Bhartia and Associates, a form of cost accountant in practice, develops a website, Bhartia.com. The color chosen for website is very bright yellow. Where names of the partners of the firm along with their various professional attainments and major clients were to be displays, displayed on the website. So it has opened a website, but very bright yellow color is there on the website. Very bright yellow color is there on the website, which is very, very um, uh, eye catchy. And on the website, all the partners' names and their attainments are written. So, guys. So guys, what, what, what should be your answer? Please tell me. Is it a misconduct or not? Abhishek says not permissible. Twinkle says no misconduct. No color is defined for website. Shubham, very good answer. Shubham Bhardwaj, very good answer. First of all, guys, no color is uh, you know, decided for website. Institute cannot tell us what color should we use for our website. So website color is our choice and it's okay. No professional misconduct in that respect. But, 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 but. Guys, he has... Um, uh, you know, uh, he has publicized his professional attainments on the website. That is prohibited. You cannot say that, you know, I have audited this, this, this client. You cannot say that. You cannot name the client. That is professional misconduct. So on the website, you cannot say that your professional atten attainments are the, that is impermissible. Then DR Radhakrishnan, a cost account practice, takes up appointment as managing director of Anukriti, a public limited company. Can a cost accountant take... Um, uh, an employment in any company can a, can a practicing cost accountant take employment in any company answer is no answer is no so is Radha Krishnan under uh, professional misconduct yes he is under professional misconduct okay so guys if you take up employment now in some cases the institute permits it because it is a matter of prestige so suppose you are 
um, uh, you know, hired by say one of the Navratnas as their um, uh, as their uh, nominee director. Okay, in that case, it's a pride and privilege for the institute also. So you have to approach the institute, tell them that you know I'm getting employed over here because of this this reason. Employ uh, the institute will give you permission. Apart from that, it is a misconduct. If you don't do that, it's a misconduct. B Hori and Company, firm of cost accountant, was appointed by company to evaluate the cost of other of various products manufactured by it for information. One of the partners of the firm were non-executive director of the company. Problem. One of the partner of the partnership firm was a director of the company. Professional misconduct or not? This is a very very tricky one. Tricky one. Yes, it is a professional misconduct. Perfect answer, guys. Substantial interest. Very good answer. Very good answer. Yes, it is a professional misconduct. Mr. Arun CMA is working manager cost accounts for PQR. He accepts ten percent of profit from his friend, Mr. Raju, a lawyer. He is doing job on retainership basis. Can a member in job uh, accept any emoluments? Accept any part of profit? Yes or no? Answer is no. Is this a misconduct? Yes, this is a misconduct. Then S, a CM in practice, certifies a cost and pricing statement of manufacturing of uh, uh, pipes for the supply relating to contract. The statement is prepared by Mr. T, who is not a CMA or an employee of S. So Mr. S, practicing uh, a cost accountant, is certifying some cost, and that analysis is done by a third party who is not even a cost accountant. Permitted or not permitted? Not permitted. It's a misconduct. Yes, sir, it's a misconduct. Arun Maya, the practicing cost accountant, engaged two trainees undergoing training under his guidance for audit job. Since the job was voluminous, he agreed to pay them in addition to stipend 10% of audit fees. 10% of audit fees is paid by that particular person to the audit assistants. Wow, we should also get such principals who pay us, uh, you know, apart from our stipend, they pay us audit fees percentage. Such a generous, um, uh, you know, cost accountant is he. <laughs> so, is it a professional misconduct or not? Please answer in the chat box. Yes, this is a misconduct. Very good answer. This is a misconduct. Any practicing cost accountant cannot share his professional fees with anyone other than his own partner. This person, the article assistant, is not a partner. Therefore, this is a professional misconduct. Yes, this is a professional misconduct. Very good answer, guys. Very, very good answer. Perfect. So, yes, you have done all the questions very, very well. Okay. So, yes, there are certain similar. These questions are very easy, guys. These questions are very easy. Certain similar questions are there from your past year's examination also. If you do these question then it will be done so guys um, yes very 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 important chapter from an exam standpoint four marks five marks six marks and trust me nothing apart from whatever is given in your study mat of the institute will come from this particular chapter so very very straightforward and easy chapter if you do all these case studies well yourself you'll be able to absolutely clear uh, your examination with flying colors with respect to this particular chapter so you need not do anything else apart from whatever is written in your study mat that's it it's such an easy chapter Yes, these PDFs will be shared with me in the link in the description box. I think my team has not put the link as yet, but I think tomorrow this link will be up and running. You will get your PDF of first, second and third, all the three chapters in the link, which is given in the description box below. So yes, link will be there and PDF will be sent to you very, very, very soon. Okay, guys. So yes, that's all for this particular chapter. We'll be meeting in our uh, next se uh, session, guys. We'll be meeting in our next session. Yes, that's all for this particular session, guys. We have covered one of the most important chapters of your syllabus, which is professional misconduct. So we'll be meeting in our next session uh, with more such chapters. And yes, probably in the next session, we'll be starting with cost accounting standards. Yes, one of the most important chapters of your syllabus from both theoretical and practical perspective. So yes, next class will be dedicated to, and next few classes, two, three classes will be dedicated to cost accounting standards. So get geared up for the cost accounting standards. We'll be starting cost accounting standards in our next class. 
so that's all for this particular session we'll be meeting in our subsequent sessions till that time all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you in the next session and today we are going to start this amazing topic which is cost accounting standards let us start cost accounting okay there was an echo you could have heard an echo okay yes all set guys all set for this particular um uh, chapter this is a very very important chapter from an exam standpoint cost accounting standards and uh, before starting this uh, chapter let me ask you a question what do you mean by standards okay forget about cost accounting standards okay forget about accounting standards forget about icds which are the income computation disclosure standards you have studied so many standards in your um, entire course forget about all those standards now please tell me guys what do you mean by standards what do you mean by standard i am just wanting to ask you one question what do you mean by standard what is the meaning of this word standard please confirm me in the chat box what do you mean by standard what is the meaning of the word standard wah wow, wah wow. dialogue dialogue coming from abhishek, abhishek kumar sarmaha sir aapki smile ne mere travel ke kam karan hui thakan ko mita diya wah wow, wah wow. aur ek baat batau jab cma ban jaoge na to sari thakan ye jo thakan efforts ki struggles ki thakan hai na ye sab mit jayegi ek second mein yes very good answer by mahendra reddy guidelines standard means generally accepted way of doing something very good neha vivek lambate says rules and processes mn king says uniformity keep uniform in all industries very good set of rules and regulations very good certain principles or rules which need to be followed to maintain uniformity very very good standard means principle to be followed perfect level of basic or minimum quality to adhere very very good answer to work according to that rules and regulations very good attainment as per expectations very good answer by all of you standards means something what you have written in the chat box standard means the expected the most expected way of doing a thing so there can be two three ways of doing everything okay the most expected way of doing that particular thing the most obvious way of doing that particular thing is known as standard i'll give you a simple example please comment in the chat box what is c plus o2 one element of carbon multiplied by two elements of oxygen what is c plus o2 please write in the chat box what is c plus o2 what is the meaning of word <clears throat> what is the uh, resultant uh, you know uh, resultant part of this equation c plus o2 yes abhishek the basic parameter to measure or limit something carbon dioxide co2 perfect 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 now now here my next question i want to do c plus o2 in not in delhi currently i was doing it in delhi i want to do it in maharashtra in maharashtra what is c plus o2 c plus o2 in maharashtra not in delhi currently i was doing it in delhi okay in maharashtra what is c plus o2 ashutosh mitra says water wah wah chemistry kahan se padh ke aaye ho ashutosh mishra ashutosh mishra keh raha hai c plus o2 is equal to water wah wah zabardast so in mumbai maharashtra what will be the result everyone is saying the same okay now i change the city what will be the change what will be the result if i do the same experiment in chennai chennai this time okay down south chennai also same perfect also same perfect all right forget about india i am going abroad i am going to united kingdom i am going to london and i do c plus o2 what is the resultant figure in london what will be the result in london c plus o2 what is the result in london please comment in the chat box c plus o2 in london what is the result net result no change occur absolutely so all of you agree that c plus o2 done anywhere in the world will remain as c plus o2 these are universal principles of science which do not change these are universal principles which do not depend on anything they would be constant around the world around the clock 
at any hour of the given day if you do um, uh, these experiments they will remain the same they will always be the same and they won't change ever for anything they will always always be the same that is the um, uh, you know that is the conclusion that we draw out of our discussion perfect sir yes that is the conclusion which we draw perfect now my question number 2 is i opened a grocery store in delhi and it's a big 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 hit it it is earning me several uh, you know crores of crores of profits and it's a amazing hit i have i've opened to open a store i've also opened an online store i've done several things around that store and it's a big hit now i want an answer from you if the same store is opened in chennai mumbai or anywhere in the world would it give me the same profits or the profits might vary please answer in the chat box please answer in the chat box would it vary from city to city or country to country or will it remain same uh, around the world please answer in the chat box i have opened a grocery store an amazingly profitable grocery store will it vary will it remain the same yukta says profit will vary dugi ready says it will vary the profit might vary it will not be the same no change ajaz ajna says no change kushwan says it will vary joshika says it will vary now i ask you why will it vary why can't the result be same just like c plus o2 is equal to co2 why can't the result of a grocery store which is a commercial transaction be the same in the entire world why can't it happen the reason of why it won't vary why it why it will vary why it won't remain the same what is the reason why will it vary from country to country why will it vary from city to city what is the reason that's what i want to ask you in the chat box please comment in the chat box absolutely very good answer based on the market conditions based on the economy of that particular country based on the environment where that grocery store has been opened based on the per capita income of the people who are staying around that place based on the utility the, how how useful is that particular grocery store to that particular area or that particular country or that particular state depending upon all these several 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 factors guys we will actually find that our commercial transactions vary from state to state individual to individual country to country however scientific principles do not change ever they will remain the constant they will yield the same result so science doesn't need standards because there's only one way of doing things in science there is no need of standards because there is only one way of doing things but in case of commerce we need standards because we have multiple ways of doing things the output might vary according to the inputs that we are putting in so everything might change in 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 commercial world however in scientific world things don't change so in case of commerce depreciation is also uh, you know um, uh, 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 liable on straight line method or wdv method in commercial world inventory valuation can also be done during using three methods um weighted average leaf four fee four another method new method is specific identification method so in commercial world there is no one best way of doing things there are several ways of doing things and outcome might outcome might vary from um uh, thing to thing from person to person from individual to individual outcome might vary um uh, along all these transactions under such and such, such a situation guys there is a dire need there is an urgent need for standards because we do not want want everyone to be doing some different thing someone valuing their inventory using fifo method someone valuing their inventory using lifo method someone uh, calculating depreciation according to slm method someone call, uh, calculating depreciation according to wdv method we don't want variability in treatment of a particular thing in the commercial world and that is exactly the reason why we need standards we need standards to choose one most acceptable way of doing thing so that everyone can do that thing commonly and everyone can follow that standard and our financial statements are identical and they can be compared because if financial statements are made using varied policies using different policies they are not comparable 
and the um, most important analysis which we want to do in our financial statements is that we want to compare two financial statements um, uh, from company to company to company, from year to year, from industry to industry. We want to compare the financial statements. That is what we want to do, and that is the reason why financial statements are actually prepared. And guys, for maintaining uniformity, for maintaining consistency in the way commercial transactions are executed, the way commercial transactions are done, we need standards. And that is why you see standards in case of accounting. Accounting also has standards because there are various ways of doing accounting. Similarly, you see um, uh, standards in cost accounting also because in cost accounting also there are various ways of, you know, uh, like for example, um, uh, absorbing overheads, absorption of overheads. There are various ways of absorbing overheads. There are various parameters which you can use. There are various keys, keys which you can use to absorb your overheads, to charge your overheads in the cost cost sheet. There are various ways to it, and that is the reason why um, uh, you know we need standards. We need principles to set our um, uh, things right, to set our calculations right, to set our um, uh, methods of doing things right, and that is why standards are required. Standard will tell us that, you know, if there are multiple ways of doing a particular thing, which one do you choose? Now, let me tell you a very important thing. Just because standard has chosen that method doesn't mean it's the best method. It just means that it is the most popular method of doing that particular thing. That's it. It doesn't mean that that is the best method and other methods are worse or other methods are not good. No. So standard picks up certain uh, ways of doing things based upon the industry practice. Whatever practice is there in the industry, whatever practice is there in the um, uh, you know economy, according to those practices, standards pick up certain things and they execute th those things and they tell you that, yes, you need to follow this thing. So which means that, can I choose a different thing from standard? Whatever standard is saying, can I say, though, no, 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 I'm not uh, you know following standard. I will choose a different thing. Can I do that? Please answer in the chat box. Can I do something um, which is different from what a uh, standard is uh, telling me to do? Can I do that? If I can do that under what circumstances can I do that? Please answer in the chat box. Can standards, um, you know, uh, can I overcome standards or can I override standards and say, no, I do not do this thing. I want to uh, do something else. Can I do that? So guys, these are normal FIKs for your knowledge, which are not very, very uh, important from an exam standpoint. So I am skipping it. I'm directly going to CAS 1. Yes, sir. All right, can we do? Everyone is saying no, 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 no. Tejasi says no. Rasmi Nijan says no. Lakshmidhar says no. Ankita says no. MN King says no. Jatshika says no. Mahindra Reddy says no. Bikash Monti says no. Oh, wow. Ankita has now given the right answer. Very good, Ankita. Very good, Ankita. Ankita has given the right answer. All right, guys. We can choose a different path from what standards are telling us. Because I've told you, there's no best part. There's no right or wrong. Okay. Standards have chosen something which industry is practicing currently. If you feel that your particular company is different from industry, if you feel that your particular company needs a different standard or needs a different way of doing that particular thing, you are open to refute a uh, standard, but you have to prove that. Why are you saying so? Would doing that thing in your industry makes a lot of sense or uh, will it will it you know make cost statements better in terms of their accuracy in terms of your, their correctness will they make uh, cost accounting statements better you have to prove this fact if you prove this fact to government of india to the mca or to and to the cost auditors you can choose a different uh, way of doing things apart from cost accounting standards so each and every cost accounting standards has a um, a clause which says that um, you know if we uh, if 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 uh, a different standard if a change in policy is there of a different policy is being followed apart from the policy which is given in the accounting standards then it may be justified uh, using any of the following methods that uh, you know it, it is the change is required as per law or a cost accounting standard has in, in itself has suggested some change or the change will lead to a better presentation of cost statements if you prove that it is so in your case then guys, you can easily change your uh, accounting policy as compared to cost accounting standards. But in generic terms, cost accounting standard policies are mandatory. 
you cannot change it unless until there's dire need for it there's urgent need for it only then it can be changed otherwise the uh, application of cost accounting standards is mandatory but yes the application is subject to your uh, you know uh, uh, fulfilling the condition that there is no other best way of doing this thing in your company okay in your kind of a transaction there is no best way of doing uh, something you have to prove that particular fact and if you prove that particular fact then yes you are free to choose whatever you want to choose as a method of accounting as a method of cost accounting all right so let's start our first um, uh, cost accounting standard which is the cost accounting standard on case of classification of cost and yes fondly i call this cost accounting standard as mother cost accounting standard this is known as mother cost accounting standard why do i call it as mother cost accounting standard because guys this is the basic cost accounting standard this will teach you every aspect of costing from the basics so but we already know uh, the the aspects of costing uh, from basics because in intermediate and final we have had 100 marks paper of costing and they are really humongous we already know them yes guys you know them practically but do you know from which law are they coming do you know the exact wordings of uh, what what law says about those things um, where is it written do you know that answer is no so cost accounting standard 1 will tell you what do you mean by abnormal cost a simple thing abnormal cost and what do you mean by cost cost accounting standard will uh, one will tell you what do you mean by absorption of cost cost accounting standard one will tell you so but we already know this thing no no knowing practically is different from reading it from theory where it is originating from everyone says we know companies act well but you need to read company well uh, companies act before understanding its critical provisions you have to read it similarly guys you have to read cost accounting standards to understand what are the provisions of cost accounting standards and what are the um uh, you know exact words of cost accounting standard only then can you practically apply those cost accounting and those words in your cost account so this is the mother cost accounting standard which is the basic cost accounting standard and it will teach us some basic stuff um about cost accounting some basic stuff like what do you mean by abnormal cost what is abnormal cost so yes these definitions are very very important from an exam standpoint also guys abnormal cost is an unusual or atypical cost atypical means it doesn't typically happen it sometimes happen sometimes it doesn't happen so it is a unusual cost it is not usual that this cost is uh, being incurred and it's an atypical cost it is not a typical cost uh, it is an atypical cost which occurs in an irregular and unexpected and un un abnormal situation so the key words over here is that is an unusual cost atypical cost which occurs irregularly it doesn't happen regularly it occurs irregularly or unexpectedly it happens you don't expect it and suddenly it happens and it uh, occurs in an abnormal situation that is known as the abnormal cost next administrative overheads very very important definition from an exam standpoint also and please underline whatever i'm asking you to underline so very very important definition guys what is abnormal cost okay abnormal cost we already studied now coming on to administrative overheads what do you mean by administrative overheads okay so administrative overheads cost of all the activities so administrative overheads cost of all the activities relating to general management and administration of an entity now please underline these words general management and administration of an industry please underline these words general management and administration okay administrative overhead shall exclude production overhead um a marketing overhead and interest and finance charges so admin overhead doesn't include production overhead marketing overhead and interest and finance charges administrative overheads do not include administration cost relating to production factory works or manufacturing so whatever administration is happening in a factory that is not administrative overhead so if there is a reception at the factory and receptionist is sitting there that is not an administrative overhead it's a production overhead that is what is uh, meant from this particular line okay that is known as administrative overhead okay and yes to um to make you learn these things there are certain charts which are there 
which of course you can draw on your register also so that you're able to remember things well guys so what i've done is um entire cost accounting standards has been put in in a chart you can also take a screenshot on your phone please don't ask me to send these charts to you okay <laughs> because i don't have it in pdf form as of now but i'll send it to you that's not a problem but yes if you make these charts from cost accounting standards you'll be able to remember them because the key important point is remembrance you have to remember these um cost accounting standards well so to remember them well these charts will be very very useful to all of you okay so cost accounting standard 1 i've covered the entire cost accounting standard in this particular chart you can take a screenshot and you can draw this chart on your register and you'll be you know one day before the examination will actually be um you know through with this particular chart if you read this chart you'll be absolutely through okay so what are the parts that we are going to study in cost accounting standard 1 definitions we are going to study principles of classification of cost we are going to study basis of classification we are going to study what is the basis of classification then we are going to study presentation and disclosure what will be the presentation and disclosure in this particular cost accounting standards so all these we are going to study in um, cost accounting standard 1 and yes these cost accounting standards will definitely um, come in examination theoretically or practically both aspects are important theoretically as well as practically now have you noted this point guys administrative overhead it does not include the administration part in production um, uh, factory works manufacturing wherever if any administration part is there which means a reception reception is there at our factory that is not administration that is not administration that is production overheads okay then classification of cost what are the types of cost what are the classifications of cost classification of cost is arrangement of items in logical groups having regard to their nature so whatever is the nature of a particular um uh, you know product uh, our particular um uh, cost according to the nature if we classify the cost that is known as classification of cost so uh, uh, bonus to manufacturing staff if you provide bonus to manufacturing staff it's an employee cost and it will go to cost of production because it's of manufacturing staff okay it's an employee cost which will go to cost of production bonus relating to selling staff it's an employee cost but it will go to selling cost that is the difference all that is an employee cost but it will go to selling cost bonus to quality control staff it's an employee cost but will go to cost of quality control activities so this is how we classify our cost according to their nature according to their purpose we are going to classify our cost okay what do you mean by conversion cost conversion cost means the production cost when we convert our raw material into finished goods um uh, what are the costs that are incurred cost amount of resources that are used in manufacturing of a goods or producing services guys i know you know these basic things very well i know you really understand these basic things very well and these are on your tips okay and you need not you know study them uh, to to really understand them but think from a legal standpoint we need everything which is there in our practical life as a theoretical part we need everything where someone can refer to it where someone can read what do you mean by abnormal cost oh yes by logic we all know everything but not by logic by law what is law regarding abnormal loss uh, cost what is law regarding administrative overhead and that is why we need these standards whereby it's written what is abnormal cost okay okay sir himanshu jain welcome 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 for such beautiful comments all right so cost cost centers cost centers are the um, uh, you know entities or uh, the areas where all the cost is accumulated all the cost is collected so accumulating of all the cost in a particular unit or in a particular um, uh, way is known as cost center cost center can be of two types personal and impersonal cost centers operating and supportive cost centers these are um, uh, ways in which cost centers can be classified what is personal cost center any cost center which is directing towards a particular person okay that is known as personal cost center the personal cost center is consists of person group of people basically human resource of an organized like imagine um, uh, you know i have um, uh, i have various 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 uh, classes and those classes are divided into um, uh, teachers okay so nikhil sir teaches these this subject okay mr a teaches this is subject mr b teaches so if we have cost centers according to the teachers then that is personal cost center because they refer to some person and what is impersonal impersonal means if we classify our cost according to the levels so foundation uh, students cost is this intermediate students cost is this final students cost is if you divide according to the um, uh, according to their class or something else then they are impersonal cost centers 
So personal cost centers, impersonal cost centers. So what is the reason of uh, creating a cost center? It is to accumulate the cost because the cost is to be classified according to the cost center and nature of the cost center. Okay. Then operating and supporting cost accounting centers. I hope this uh, you must be aware of. Um, you know, some cost center centers are there where uh, actual production is happening, actual manufacture is happening, actual provision of services is happening. That is known as operating cost center. And the cost centers which are supporting those main manufacturing cost centers like human resource HR. HR is a supportive cost center. Finance is a supportive cost center. So any cost center which is supporting the main cost center is known as supporting cost center. So operating cost center and supporting cost center. This is a diagram of operating and supporting cost center. Cost object is easy. Cost of production is cost unit. Cost unit. Now please be aware about cost unit. What do you mean by cost unit? Cost unit means the unit in, in which you measure a particular thing like milk you measure in kgs um uh, this this uh, ruler you measure in inches or yards gallon okay ounce pound tablespoon this is all cost units the unit in which you are actually um uh, measuring that particular thing there are certain examples also and guys these examples are directly lifted from the cost accounting standards so cost accounting standards giving you standards of cost units. What should be the cost unit? In case of automobile, the cost unit should be number. Cable, rope, road, construction, wire should be meter or kilometer, etc. So these are the unit numbers, the unit um, uh, which can be, you know, said that, okay, this particular product should be measured in this unit. These are the units. Next is prime cost. Prime cost is an aggregate of that material cost, employee cost and direct expense. You already are aware about it. Still, we are studying it because it is, in, it is in black and white over here. Okay, production overhead, very, very important. Any indirect cost involved in production of a product or rendering services. Um, uh, very important line, please underline this line. Production overhead includes administration costs related to production, factory or works and manufacturing. In administrative overhead definition, I had uh, uh, shown you that any production, uh, uh, any production place where admin stuff is ha being handled, it is not administrative uh, overhead. Because if it's a production place and if administration is ha ha happening over there, it is not administrative, um, uh, you know, overhead. What is it? It is production overhead. So if you have a reception at the factory, if you have the admin room, administration room at the factory, that will not be classified as admin overhead. It will be classified as production overhead. Okay. Then what are semi-variable overheads? Over overheads which are constant till a particular point and uh, variable beyond that. What are variable overheads? We all know that. Standard costing. Standard costing. Okay. Now comes the broad classification of cost. How can cost be classified according to um, uh, the measurement rules which are given in the cost accounting standard? Classification of cost. That is what we are going to start today. Yes, milk on liters, correct. <clears throat> what is the difference between cost center and cost object? Very, very good question by Ajnaz. What is the difference between cost center and cost object? Okay. Now, cost center means a particular position, a particular area where cost is accumulated. For example, I have uh, uh, the departments according to the levels of CMA, CMA Inter, CMA Final, CMA um, uh, Foundation. These are the three cost centers where I'll be accumulating all cost and I'll be saying that yes, my uh, CMA Final uh, teachers or the classes or the classrooms or the infrastructure which is being used is costing me this much. This is cost center. Okay. Next is cost object. Cost object means the subject for which the cost is being incurred. For example, if I am incurring some expenses on, say, infrastructure, I'm buying AC, I'm buying um, a fan, or I'm buying um, uh, any kind of uh, utilities inside that particular cost center, then those things are cost objects for which the cost is being incurred. Like students who are sitting here, they are consuming the cost. They are the cost object. So within cost centers, there are cost objects. That is the difference between cost subject, cost object, and cost center. Okay. And this is the next word, guys. Cost unit. Do you understand this word also? Cost unit means the unit uh, which is which is related to production. How many pro uh, goods are you being are you producing, and how how are you allocating cost? Uh, what is the unit you are using for allocating the cost? That is cost unit. 
so these are three words cost center cost object and cost unit okay now comes a very very important classification guys so cost accounting standards ha has given you um uh, cost uh, uh, the the um the basis on which you can actually classify your cost your cost can be classified according to these bases which are given by cost accounting standards so cost can broadly be classified in the following bases nature of expense what is the nature of your expense that is the first way in which cost can be classified material employee and overheads is the um uh, ways in which the uh, cost can be classified so nature of expense is one way in which your cost can be classified okay now why are we doing this why are we um uh, you know uh, classifying our cost what is the need of classifying our cost guys the need of classifying our cost is that we want to prepare a cost sheet where we want to um segregate our cost according to some commonalities according to some uh, bulk according to some bunch we want to segregate our cost according to some common points we want to segregate our cost we don't want to um, uh, you know flood our uh, cost sheet by writing all the costs together we want to club certain costs which are of similar nature and that is the reason why we are classifying the cost so we will classify all our cost according to material employee and overheads all the costs which are there they'll be clubbed according to this nature the the uh, material employee and expenses all three will be clubbed together according to their nature so first way to classify the cost is nature of expense now you are free to choose any of these ways okay any of these these ways can be chosen by you cost object could be a specific activity customer project as opposed to cost very good very very good yes cost object can also be a specific activity some specific customer some specific uh, project that can also be a cost object so object is means that the the uh, place or the purpose for which cost is being incurred that is the cost object perfect okay the nature of traceability to cost object now according to the nature of traceability to the cost object whether we are able to trace our cost according to um, uh, our our uh, cost center or not so direct expenses and indirect expenses direct expenses are those expenses which are directly attributable to a particular cost center indirect expenses are those uh, expenses which are not directly attributable to a cost center they are indirectly attributable to a cost center that is known as indirect expense so direct expense directly attributable to a cost center indirect expense not directly attributable to a cost center by functions what functions are you performing according to that uh, we can classify our cost for example if you are performing production function then all the costs which are related to production are clubbed in this head if you are performing administration function then all the administration function which you are um, uh, you know uh, performing they'll be classified under this head so these heads are according to function if these heads are according to function then um, uh, our cost will also be according to these functions yes sir then by behavior behavior means fixed variable semi variable there are three kinds of cost which are by behavior by nature of production process what kind of pro production process do you have batch costing process costing operation costing contract costing joint costing now this is very very important guys because this is a little tricky this is a little different kind of a um, uh, you know classification okay batch cost batch cost means wherever the production is happening on the basis of batch which typically happens in uh, products like eatables okay like bread bread which we um, uh, you know consume uh, that bread which we consume that bread uh, is produced in batches they are not produced in um uh, you know according to uh, where they supplied north india south india uh, west india they are not uh, uh, you know um, uh, really co costed according to that way they are costed on the basis of a batches from which they are produced okay so batch 120 batch 130 batch 140 so a all accumulate together all the raw material accumulated together will be produced at one go and that one go production will be um, uh, actually named as the particular batch and where is it relevant now i'll tell you where is it relevant okay so guys long long back there were only one kind of cell phones which are available in market which were nokia okay and because of some manufacturing defect nokia some model and a part of that particular model because of some defect those nokia phone batteries were bursting you put the nokia phone uh, inside the socket for charging they will burst okay because that lot because that bulk because that bunch which is being produced um uh, you know uh, by nokia that was faulty there was some fault in it there was some error in it and that is why that entire batch was withdrawn from market immediately by um, uh, you know asking the customers for their batch numbers that is what happened in nokia so nokia was facilitated was um, you know it was easy for nokia to call back the defaulty uh, production because they knew that this production happened in this month 
according to this batch so entire batch was withdrawn from the market so this is the benefit of batch costing that even if you want to withdraw anything so if bad is uh, the bread is faulty the bread doesn't have uh, proper uh, flour in it so if that kind of thing happens then entire batch can be recalled and that's why these industries like fmcg industries work purely on batch costing which means they will um, uh, you know accumulate all the cost relating to a particular batch at once that is batch costing process costing process means um, you know according to the process you can uh, actually uh, club your cost for example a particular engineering product for example laptop you know laptop is being produced using 10 processes so for every process you can have a cost center for every process you can classify your cost separately that is known as process costing next one is operation costing guys operation costing means that you know processes are further subdivided into sub processes and those sub processes are known as operations small 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 operations so for highly technical industries like laptop industry like camera industry like mobile phone industry we want to drill down to the lowest level to the narrowest level where is the problem coming from and in that goal in that achieving that objective operation costing is very very important we can uh, you know easily calculate or we can easily compute um, now what are the errors what are the um, uh, lacunas which are there in each of the process or each of the uh, operation and we can club it out so operation costing is very very important in case of highly technical goods which are very very technical and they go through several rounds of operations in production etc they are known as uh, operation costing contract costing typically used in real estate sector where the costing is done according to a particular contract according to a particular project so known as contract costing joint cost joint cost means wherever you are producing two goods from one raw material and it looks something like an inverted y look at this inverted y so from a common raw material you are producing two finished goods in this case the common cost which is there that is to be allocated to the two goods and that is the reason why we use joint costing in this particular case so whatever we produce whatever we produce is from a common uh, raw material and we have some common cost which is required to be um, uh, you know used in that particular uh, finished goods so if you use this cost in the finished goods then they will, these costs will be actually used um, and will actually be utilized so this is known as joint cost so guys depending upon upon your purpose depending upon your product what's your, what is your product depending on all these things you choose the relevant cost which is suitable to you okay okay sir got it so yes these were the kind of costs which are there okay and i've discussed them all with you not in detail but in very very small um, uh, measurement but yes it will be very very helpful to you all right all right so now our discussion on the joint cost our discuss discussion on the joint cost so guys this is a joint input which is crude oil it is processed and three things are made from it oil gasoline chemicals now the common process which is having common cost common process which is having common cost is required to be analyzed and the common cost is to be distributed amongst the three products which are being produced that is the objective that is the ask and to split this particular cost into three different um, cost centers we need some allocation key and this allocation key is given by the cost accounting standard itself they say that the joint cost incurred up to the split of point split of point means this is the split where three products are being uh, split um, uh, separately so joint cost which is incurred should be allocated to the three um, uh, products to the three uh, common products joint products in the proportion of their price at the split off point so at this split off point whatever is their price according to that price so if, you know if these uh, uh, things were sold immediately when they are split off then that price or that cost is representative of joint cost so sales value the revenue and the split of point will be the value in which the cost is to be split into, into three parts that is the uh, most important thing okay okay sir so these are the joint cost okay presentation disclosure guys presentation disclosure largely say remains same in all the 24 casts you learn one copy paste all in in all the casts but barring some you know apl application of mind okay because there are some words which are different there are some things which are different small small things otherwise broadly you can apply 
the uh, the uh, disclosures and presentation all across all across broadly when classified okay so yes presentation classification should be done on the basis of relevant classifications so what is the classification you need to uh, present and you need to disclose it to the users of the cost statement classification of cost items should be followed consistently from period to period it should not change every period it should be changed only once in a while so country to country it should be constant period to period it should be, should be constant disclosure or change in classification should be made only if it is required by law or for compliance with the cost accounting standard or change would result in more appropriate presentation of the cost of an enterprise now you have to prove that i have changed this particular policy and look my presentation has become much better my disclosure has become much better of my revenues etc etc because i now i'm splitting um, uh, or falling the uh, falling a particular thing apart from the cost accounting standard so yes you can refute to um, uh, you know choose the standards which are given in cost accounting standards but you have to prove that why are you doing so if you prove perfect if you prove then perfect okay okay sir got it so yes guys there are certain practical questions also which are related to this particular chapter specifically from this chapter na calculation of abnormal cost is a practical part which can come in your examination so abnormal cost calculation abnormal cost calculation this is an important topic which can come in your examination uh, uh, the calculation of abnormal cost so you need to really um, be up, up front in calculating these abnormal cost okay so guys one question let's do one question of calculation of abnormal cost and then probably you can do the rest yourself okay let's do one question of abnormal cost so it says that illustration number 1 we are starting okay there was a strike from 13 september 2007 to 16 november 2007 so there was a strike in our factory in a company of which you were the cost auditor for the year ended 31st march 2008 so the financial year is ending in 2008 so the year started from 1st april 2007 to 31st march 2008 that is the year although the company began working from 17th november 2007 so company started working on 17th november but production could effectively begin only from 5th december 2007 the expenses incurred during the year ended 31st march 2008 were Salaries direct, salaries indirect, power variable, depreciation, other fixed expenses. So see, these are the expenses which have been incurred during this period, during the entire year, entire year. Okay. Detailed examination of records reveal that out that of the above, the following related to period from thirty thirteen September to two thousand seven to sixteen December November. Okay. So out of all these expenses, there are certain expenses which are incurred exclusively in this period. These are those expenses: salaries and wages, depreciation. other fixed expenses calculate the amount which in your opinion should be treated as abnormal for exclusion from production cost now what is the ask ask is that we need to compute the abnormal cost according to your um, uh, you know your uh, uh, best judgment what will be the abnormal cost that is what we need to compute over here okay sir got it so let's compute the abnormal cost okay so you know putting a heading putting the exam putting the question number very very essential but yes since uh, we are doing it quickly so i might lose uh, certain formatting um, uh, mandates okay i might lose them i might not draw them or i might not write them but you should write them for sure computation of abnormal cost you need to compute the abnormal cost okay now guys wherever a question from abnormal cost comes in your examination the first thing you need to do is you need to prepare a timeline do prepare a timeline okay and plot all the events which have happened during this period particular period so i'm drawing a timeline and what will i do with this timeline i will put some critical events in on this timeline whatever are the critical events i will put all those critical events on this timeline okay okay so first of all the year start date 1st april 2007 then the year end date 31st march 2008 okay we'll write it yeah let us first of all Uh, uh, do a 
time stamp chart time stamping is very very important in these questions okay so guys on 13 september 2007 the strike started okay then on 16 november strike ended but on 5th december the work resumed and the rest was the normal period okay so this is the normal period and this is the normal period i will call it as period a i will call it as period d this is period b and this is period c i have named all these periods because in my question i'll be using them okay so this period period b is the strike period and also the abnormal period and this period c is the non strike period there is no strike in this period but this is a abnormal period also because work couldn't start although it is the non strike period but it is abnormal it is not normal it is abnormal although strike ended it is a non strike period but it is abnormal it's still abnormal it's not normal please understand the difference because in the question i'm going to ask you and uh, ask you to apply different uh, methods of computing cost according to the nature of these period so if you have been able to understand this time time chart well please write yes in the chat box <laughs> Okay, so these are the timestamp. Now, guys, I'll tell you what do we need to compute. We need to compute the cost which has been incurred in period B. We need to compute the cost which has been incurred in period C. We will total these two ads and our abnormal cost will be in our hands. Simple as that. That's the object. Okay, sir, got it. So let's now compute the abnormal cost. Okay. So what is the abnormal cost? We are going to compute that now. Okay, sir. Let's compute the abnormal cost. So, what is the abnormal cost? Let's compute it over there. Okay. Now, guys, first of all, the cost which has been specifically incurred during the abnormal period. That, of course, will be the abnormal cost. There's no doubt about it. Okay. So, what is the cost which we have incurred only in the abnormal period? What is that cost? I'll tell you what is that cost. Let's read the question once again. Okay, so please observe this cost. This is the cost which has been specifically incurred during the abnormal period only, which is 13 September to 16 November. This is the abnormal cost which has incurred during the abnormal period only. So this is obviously the abnormal cost. There's no doubt about it. So we are going to first of all write the total of this cost because this cost is of course the abnormal cost. Yes, sir. What is the total of this cost? Total is 220. Cost incurred in period A and B only. So the cost which has been incurred in period A and B only, that is the abnormal cost. This is the particulars and the amount. Okay. Total is 220 lakhs. So this is but obviously the abnormal cost. Okay. There's no doubt about it. Since there's no doubt about it, so we are going to um, uh, add it. So why depreciation not inc included in cost? Depreciation is not included. Where is depreciation not included in cost? Of course, depreciation is included in the cost. Where is it not included? Okay. So now, sir, now we need to calculate the other cost. The cost, now this is the specific cost, okay? This is the specific cost. Now, guys, what are we going to do? Now we are going to calculate the cost which has been incurred during this entire period. We will divide it by the total number of days. We will multiply it by the number of days which are abnormal. And we will compute the generic abnormal cost also. So in this question, the abnormal cost is total of two costs. Specific cost plus general cost given together. Now let's see how will we compute the generic cost. Yes, guys, in the chat box, you can actually throw your questions and I'll 
be um, uh, you know able to answer them after seeing the question okay so let's make a working note to compute the generic cost okay second is cost incurred in period a and b okay general cost it is the general cost okay sir got it So we'll prepare a working note for it. Working note. Competition of generic abnormal cost. Okay, so first I'm going to take the total expenditure, which has been incurred during the year. The total expenditure which has been incurred during the year, I'll start with that figure, and that will then I will keep on reducing the irrelevant cost. Okay, I'll tell you how. First of all, tell me what is the total expenditure which has been incurred during the entire year, guys? It is a sum total of these numbers. Please let me know sum total of these numbers. Please let me know the sum total of these numbers. Please let me know the sum total of the total cost. Okay. The sum total of total cost is 300 plus 200 plus 120 plus 180 plus 240. The sum total of total cost is 1040. 1040 is the sum total of cost which has been incurred during the entire year. Okay. During the entire year, this total has come. Okay. Okay. Now, guys, please see, you know, we have already considered 220 lakh, 220 lakh is the expense which has been incurred during our strike period. This is the expense which has been incurred during our strike period. Since it has been incurred during our strike period, which is period B, we have already taken it completely. So we need not take it again as a generic expenditure. So I'm reducing the less expense incurred during strike period i'm reducing the first thing that i'm reducing is expense which is incurred during strike period let's reduce reduce the expense which is incurred during strike period because that has already been taken into consideration so i'm reducing 220 lakhs from this particular amount 1040 okay sir perfect all right now now guys look at these cost look at these cost we need to really find out what are the cost out of these costs, out of these costs, what are the cost which have specifically been incurred during abnormal period? Because there are certain costs which happen uh, evenly throughout the period. So that would obviously um, uh, you know, take place in abnormal period also. So we want to see what are the costs which have been incurred in abnormal period. To understand that, we need to understand the nature of each of the cost. Now I'll explain one by one. Okay. Let's start with salaries, direct salaries, direct salaries, direct salaries means salaries related to labor, salaries related to labor who are doing our production. Okay. Now I'll ask you a very simple question, guys. Very, very simple question. During the strike period, will direct salary uh, be incurred in our organization or not? Will direct salary be incurred in our organization or not? In During strike period, 
which is period B in our case, will labor cost, direct labor cost be incurred or not? Please um, uh, write in the chat box. Salaries and wages direct. Okay. Will it be incurred or not? Yes or no? Oh, wow. Goshal Dake has already written the answer also. <laughs> so please tell me whether 300 will be incurred during the strike period or not. Whether it will be incurred or not. Answer is no. During strike period, it will not be incurred. Because during strike period, when laborers are on strike by their own um, uh, you know, sweet will, they will not be paid the direct wages. So this expenditure will not have incurred in strike period. And therefore, this expenditure is not there in the strike period list. Perfect. Question number two. Whether salaries and wages indirect, will it uh, take place during strike period and non-strike period? That is during period B or period C. Will it take place or not? Will it take place or not? Will it take place or not? During strike period and non-strike period? Answer is, sir, it will definitely take place. Yes. Because these are indirect. Indirect means they are never on strike. They are indirect uh, staff, which means they are on finance, uh, payroll, HR. All these things are indirect. They will not stop. They will continue working. Okay. So direct, they will um, uh, not be there during strike period. But my next question is, please tell about direct. Once again, I'm coming back to direct. Will direct expenditure be there, be there in non-strike period? Will direct expenditure be there in non-strike period? When the strike has ended, but the production has not effectively started during that period, will direct um, uh, wages, direct salaries be there or not? Yes, they will definitely be there. During non-strike period, the direct salaries will be there. But during non-strike period, indirect salaries will uh, definitely be there. During strike and non-strike period, indirect salaries will definitely be there. So both of these things will be there during non-strike period. Okay. And guys, please see, out of this indirect expenses, 70 is already taken as salaries or wages over here. It's already included. Okay, next. Power variable. So please tell me, power variable, whether it will take place during strike period or not. And during non-strike period, whether this uh, power variable will take place or not. Answer is no. Why, sir? But fan, AC, tube lights, all these will be running. Guys, Power variable doesn't mean that they are referring to the fans, ACs, and lights, which uh, you know, which are illuminating our room, which are um, uh, providing uh, uh, air to us. They don't mean about. They don't. Um, uh, they are not referring to that. They are referring to our machines. Whatever power is being consumed in production, whatever power is being con consumed uh, by our machines, that is the power variable. These all these electricity expenses like tube light, um, you know, fan, AC, these are not the real power expenditure which is there in our uh, business. These are very minuscule element of power, minuscule element of power. What are the major elements of our machinery which is running? Okay. So now my question is whether power variable, whether this expenditure will be there during strike and non-strike period? Answer in a yes or a no um, in the chat box, whether power variable. Whether power variable will be incurred in our strike period or non-strike period? Answer is no. It will not be incurred during strike period. Neither it will be incurred on, during non-strike period. Why? Because during strike period and non-strike period, machinery has not uh, effectively started. Production did not begin during non-strike period, which is the abnormal period. Production has not started. So power variable expense will not be there in both the cases. No in both the cases. Okay. So guys, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to compute the uh, common cost and then I'm going to do the pro, pro rata. So next thing I'm going to reduce from here because it has not been incurred at all is power variable. Because why should I prorate power variable um, uh, in period B and C? Period B and C. Why should I um, uh, allocate? Because this has not been incurred. When this has not been incurred, then I should not allocate also. So power variable should not be. Uh, allocated. So I'm reducing it from the total cost. What is the amount of power variable? What is the amount of power variable? It is 120. Yes, 120. 
I'm not going to allocate power variable to strike or non-strike period because power variable has not started during strike or non-strike period. Okay, I will not be allocating it. I have reduced it. Okay, okay, sir. Next, machinery chali ni. Bilkul twinkle rustagi se machinery chali ni. Good. Okay, next, next expenditure. Now please tell me depreciation. Whether depreciation was incurred during um, uh, strike or non-strike period, whether depreciation was incurred or not. Sir, what if machinery was closed? No, sir, machinery was closed, sir. How can depreciation happen? Wear and tear happens only when machinery was running. When machinery was closed, you said power variable was not there. Of course, depreciation was also not there. Please offer your comments in the chat box. Please offer your comments in the chat box whether depreciation would have been incurred during strike and non-strike period or not. So Mahindra Mahindra Reddy says there was no wear and tear, so depreciation has not incurred. Twinkles says depreciation to lagega. Sandeep Mishra says yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Any other answer? Interesting. Very very interesting. Any other answer, guys? Yukta says no. Pail says no. Nikhil Gaikwad says depreciation incurred. Chand Shekha says no. Guys, depreciation definitely will be incurred. Whether during the strike period, this is the strike period, or during the non-strike period, depreciation would definitely have been incurred. So yes, depreciation will definitely be allocated to the non-strike period, abnormal period also. Next, other fixed expenses. Please tell me whether other fixed expenses would have been incurred. Yes, fixed expenses like rent will be incurred in, even if you are on a strike. If you, even if your company is on a strike, um, uh, the uh, rentals will definitely be charged. Twinkle says, Are sir, depreciation tabhi lagna chalu ho jata hai jab put to use ho aur wo pehle hi ho gaya hoga. Twinkle says, very, very good gyan. Okay, Goshal, depreciation has been charged from the time you put the asset for use. You can't stop it arbitrarily. Very good answer. Angita has incurred. It's not matter whether machine is put to use or not. Very good. So depreciation is annual amortized. So it should be there. Very good, guys. Very good answer. So yes, depreciation would have been incurred. So I want an allocation of depreciation to my non-strike period also. Other fixed expenses, yes, it would have been incurred. So I want the allocation on my, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the non-fixed uh, period also. So these are the expenses which have been allocated to the strike period. And now this is the sum total which I have uh, uh, concluded that out of this total, I'll be finding out the expense which have been incurred during period C. Okay. Abnormal cost, generic abnormal cost. This is during period C. So what is the total number of, uh, total uh, amount which is to be allocated? 1, 0, minus 2, 2, 0, minus 1, 2, 0. So the total cost, 2, 2, 0, minus 1, 2, 0. So the total cost which is to be, to be allocated is 700. As this is the cost which has been incurred for the entire year. Now we need to compute the cost which has been incurred during period C. Period C. So why only period C? Why not period B? Because guys, period B expense we have already calculated over here. 220. That is period B abnormal expense. Now using this method, we'll be computing the period C abnormal expense. Okay. Okay, sir. So now I need to know what are the number of days. in the year excluding strike period B. Sir, why are we excluding strike period B? Because strike period B is also already considered in 220. So I'm excluding the total number of days. Uh, 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 I'm uh, reducing strike period from the total number of days. Okay, 700 is the total number. Okay. Let us see. Okay. Now we need to find the total number of days, which means this means A plus C plus D. A plus C plus D. So the entire year, entire year. Guys, entire year has got 366 days. We will reduce the days which are there in period B. Okay. What is period B? 
पीरियड बी इज थर्टीन सेप्टेम्बर टू थाउजेंड सेवन टू सिक्सटीन नवंबर टू थाउजेंड सेवन दिस इज पीरियड बी ओके सो यू कैलकुलेट द नंबर ऑफ डेज ओके फॉर सेप्टेम्बर फॉर अक्टोबर फॉर नवंबर ओके सो फॉर सेप्टेम्बर देर शुड बी थर्टी माइनस थर्टीन प्लस वन देर शुड बी एटीन डेज फॉर सेप्टेम्बर ओके फॉर अक्टोबर देर आर थर्टी वन डेज फॉर अक्टोबर ओके एटीन डेज फॉर सेप्टेम्बर थर्टी वन डेज फॉर अक्टोबर and finally for november what are the number of days for november 16 days for november 16 is included so 16 plus 31 plus 18 comes to 65 so 366 minus 65 this becomes 301 these are the number of days in the entire year the number of days during period b number of days during period c so what are the number of days during period c that is what we need to compute now okay period c number of days during period c uh period c is <coughs> Starting from seventeenth of November, okay. Starting from seventeenth of November, so fourteen days of November and four days of December, because from fifth production started. Okay, so fourteen days of November, four days of uh, uh, December comes to eighteen days. So days during period C is eighteen days. Okay, now. expense for period c what is the expense for period c it's 700 divided by 301 multiplied by 18 that is a pro rate divided by 301 multiplied by 18 comes to a figure of 41.86 comes to a figure of 41.86 so we'll write 41.86 lakhs over here we'll just aggregate these two numbers and here we have got the abnormal cost the total abnormal cost is computed by us the total abnormal cost which is being computed over here is 261.86 lakhs 261.86 lakhs there is a very very easy question okay it will fetch you say about 6 marks 6 to 8 marks it can fetch you and definitely an important one it can come in the examination for sure yes there might be slight variations to this question when it comes in the examination but largely it will be this kind of a question so you need to practice this kind of question from cas 1 so from cas 1 definitions can come for sure practical question like this can come for for sure these are the two ex most expected things from cas 1 okay again these are the various uh, questions of Uh, the the calculation of abnormal cost which have been given in your study mat and what i have done is i have accumulated all the past examination questions also of abnormal cost in my study mat so that you can revise as many questions as possible because you know um, practicing these questions is the key in the examination if you don't practice them then you will be at a loss for sure all right so let's start our next cas before we start our next cas How's the Josh in the room, guys? Please tell me how's the Josh. Yes, Josh is high. So, sixteen strike ended, but when did work start? Work started on seventeenth, Abhishek. How's the Josh? Very, very high. Very, very interesting. Very nice. Super. Guys, it's really important to do these standards well because these standards are definitely going to um, be of use to all of you. They'll be of use, and they will, you know, fetch you good marks in the examination. Excellent. Full stuff. Very good. बताओ किसको पीटना है? हाँ, ये पिटाई की बात कहाँ से आ गई? नालायक. अच्छा जोश की वजह से पीटना नहीं नहीं पीटना नहीं है 
जोश से इतनी पढ़ाई करनी है इतनी पढ़ाई करनी है कि सबकी रैंक आ जाए और कॉस्ट ऑडिट में 90 प्लस मार्क्स आ जाए ऐसा जोश होना चाहिए हमें फिजिकल वॉयलेंस नहीं करनी हमें मेंटल वॉयलेंस करनी है इतना माइंड को स्ट्रॉन्ग कर लो इतनी मेंटल स्ट्रेंथ बना लो इतना मेंटल जुनून अपने अंदर ले आओ कि लाओ क्या क्वेश्चन लाते हो दुनिया वालों हम नहीं डरते किसी मुश्किल से मुश्किल क्वेश्चन से हम नहीं डरते मुश्किल से मुश्किल थियोरिटिकल पार्ट से लाओ ले आओ जो क्वेश्चन लाना है हम विजयी होकर ही दिखाएंगे वो जोश चाहिए भाई फोड़ने फाड़ने वाला जोश नहीं चाहिए हाँ ओके लेट्स स्टार्ट द नेक्स्ट कॉस्ट अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड कॉस्ट अकाउंटिंग स्टैंड टू विच इज कैपेसिटी डिटर्मिनेशन अगेन अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कॉस्ट अकाउंटिंग स्टैंड फ्रॉम एन एग्जाम स्टैंड पॉइंट both theoretical and practical questions come from this particular exam uh, this particular cost accounting standard question is why do we called it as a father cost accounting standard guys the reason why we call it as a father cost accounting standard because the entire costing is based out of this one element which is capacity determination capacity means kshamta capacity means your capability of producing something if a if a um, uh, organization's capability is not good enough of producing something then is bound to go into losses to avoid any organization uh, from going to losses we make sure that the uh, the uh, capacity of that particular organization is full enough the capacity of that organization is good enough and the capacity is up to the standard which is required of the production and if capacity is there up to the standard which is required for production then we are going to uh, achieve our fullest profit suppose if capacity is too high and the demand is too low then also it's a waste for us because maintaining that particular facility is very expensive so our profits will be eaten up in maintaining of the, that infrastructure so capacity should not be very high should not be very ho low should be medium it should be average that is how capacity works okay so let's start cost accounting standard number 2 capacity determination okay okay so so guys these are the various kinds of capacities so we first need to understand what are the various kinds of capacities and for making you understand various kinds of capacities i am going to delve into this chart which we have prepared so this is the summary chart of the entire cost accounting standard okay this is a summary chart now we are going to see the chart which is made in the book yes this is the chart very very important chart and there's an old cost accounting standard also which we are not going to refer to because it has changed completely guys in the class of on a safer side i also teach old cost accounting standard because you know on a safer side i want you to study it but frankly speaking it's not required now revised cost accounting standard is what you need to understand okay okay let's start let's start cost accounting standard 2 So, what is cost accounting standard two? Cost accounting standard two relates to uh, capacity determination. So, there are primarily three kinds of capacities which are there in cost accounting standard two. It says installed capacity, normal capacity, actual capacity. These are the three kinds of capacities which are there in our um, cost accounting standard two. Okay. What do you mean by installed capacity, guys? Installed capacity means the capacity um, uh, which our machinery has if it is run twenty four by seven, non stop. Yes, it is not practically possible to run our factory twenty-four by seven, but still we compute this installed capacity. Assuming that our factory, our plant will run twenty-four by seven, seven days a week without even a single off, and twenty-four hours per day. Suppose if our plant runs twenty-four by seven, what is the capacity that it is going to achieve? It is not practically possible. Only very few industries are there where where it is practically possible. Which uh, you know industries which work on shifts, three shift basis. and works on 24 hours basis so sometimes it definitely happens that um, uh, you know the the uh, cost the capacity runs in that way but practically it is not generally possible okay now the thing is that installed capacity is manufacturer specification i'll tell you what is manufacturer specification guys manufacturer specification which is given on the manual of the machinery any machinery is manual it is given okay so for example you know when i bought this um uh, laptop or uh, mic or camera it said that this camera can work for say 8 hours without battery without changing battery it can work for 8 hours that is the maximum capacity which can be achieved <clears throat> it is a manufacturer's capacity which can be achieved but you know when i um uh, make use of this camera for 8 hours sometimes it gets heated up yes it gets heated up so installed is not practical installed is if 
on a hypothetical basis, on an assumption basis, we uh, make use of this plant machinery 24 by 7, then what will be the capacity? And generally, usually, it is not achievable. It is not practical, usually. Sometimes it can be. So that is the first capacity which we need to compute. <clears throat> Second capacity is the normal capacity. <clears throat> normal capacity means, now you need to ascertain what are the practicalities. Obviously, guys, you will not work on Sundays. Obviously, you will not work in lunch hours. You will have to give some tea uh, time. Sometimes you will not work around the clock. There will be some inefficiencies. So what is the normal capacity? So forget about installed capacity. It's a distant dream. Installed capacity is a dream capacity. Normal capacity is the achievable capacity, the practical capacity which can be achieved. That is normal capacity. The practical capacity which can be achieved, that is the normal capacity. So what should be our target? Should our target be installed capacity utilization or normal capacity utilization? It should be normal capacity utilization. That is the capacity which, which, which we can attain, which we can actually, um, uh, you know, think that we can achieve. Okay. Last one is actual capacity. So, you know, usually things don't work the way we want them to work or the way we think, uh, you know, those things will work. Uh, things don't work that ways. So, whenever we have normal capacity, the actual capacity might be a little different because of inefficiencies. There might be inefficiencies which might reduce our normal capacity to actual capacity. So normal capacity minus the abnormal inefficiencies that will lead to the actual cost, uh, capacity. So to say, if we reduce the normal um, uh, reductions in capacity from installed, it will give us normal capacity. Normal reductions means Sunday has to be off. One hour lunch hour has to be given. Planned maintenance will definitely happen. These are normal losses. So when we reduce from installed capacity, the normal uh, losses, it will give us normal capacity. And when we reduce all other losses like abnormal losses, we will get actual capacity. Sir, how is actual capacity determined? Guys, the actual capacity is determined according to the number of units which that plant machinery can make. So for example, if I tell you that, you know, um, there's a very big factory of producing calculators. They are machines, they are plants where calculators are produced. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the capacity of that particular plant is to produce 1 lakh calculators per month. This is the capacity. 1 lakh calculators per month. This is the capacity. So that is the definition of the word capacity. And installed capacity, normal capacity, actual capacity. Okay. Now what is the significance of these arrows? Guys, these arrows A, B and C will give us what is the lacking in capacity? What is the um, uh, downsizing of capacity where we have not been able to achieve capacity? What is that? What is the differential between installed capacity and actual capacity? Um, uh, that is what is denoted by these arrows. Okay. So arrow number one is the idle capacity. Till what time have been uh, wasted idle capacity? Okay. So arrow number one is the idle capacity. Installed capacity minus actual capacity. That is the idle capacity, the time during which our machinery has stopped working and has not worked efficiently. That is normal. Uh, that is idle capacity. Now, we know that out of this idle capacity, some capacity is normal idle capacity, which is this capacity. This had to happen. We had no control over it. This is normal capacity. And what is abnormal capacity? C is abnormal capacity. Normal capacity minus actual capacity is abnormal capacity. C is abnormal capa capacity. B is um, uh, the uh, normal idle capacity. C is the abnormal idle capacity. So normal idle capacity, abnormal idle capacity. Now, which one should we try to control? C, abnormal idle capacity. Which one we can't control? B, B we can't control. It is the um, uh, normal idle capacity. B, we can't control. C, we can control. So where should be our focus? Our focus should be on C, abnormal idle capacity. So that is how capacity, idle capacity is bifurcated into normal idle capacity and abnormal idle capacity. Normal capacity is past reduction for maintenance, planned, holidays, change over batches. Very good. Goshal has learned the, uh, the examples also. Idle time maintenance less from installed. Very good. Actual capacity is the actual volume production vis a vis installed capacity. Very good. Very good. So, guys, I hope you understood this particular part well. 
in the exam you will be given data to calculate the installed capacity to calculate the normal capacity and to calculate the actual capacity by reducing these respective capacities you will be able to find the idle capacities also and according to the idle capacities you will be able to find the normal capacity utilization etc etc so i'll discuss those also in brief detail so idle capacity is installed capacity minus actual capacity that is idle capacity installed capacity minus actual capacity is idle capacity normal idle capacity is installed capacity minus normal capacity is normal idle capacity abnormal idle capacity is normal capacity minus actual capacity that is abnormal idle capacity actual capacity utilization what is the utilization in percentage forms actual capacity divided by installed capacity is the actual capacity utilization idle capacity utilization idle capacity divided by installed capacity normal and abnormal respectively so denominator will remain the same installed capacity and whichever capacity you write in the numerator it will become that capacity utilization so these are the important formulas which will definitely come in your examination you need to learn the formulas well and need to learn the definitions of the capacity as well that is the ask that is the very very important thing okay sir got it so yeah these examples i'm not going to discuss because these are just plus minus guys plus minus these are not very um you know useful now one very important thing guys in your cost accounting standard as well as in your study mat there are some commonly used units for capacity determination so what are the units which are used for determining the capacity so in case of a spinning wheel mill spindles the round 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 uh, xylos kind of thing they are used as the capacity measurement hospitals number of beds is the capacity measurement in case of hospitals airports capacity of passengers during the peak time that is airports capacity port now uh, facilities available for maintaining that particular port etc etc so these are the um, uh, various capacity um uh, measurements which can be used in various industries so these are capacity measurement okay now presentation and disclosures how do you present um or disclose certain things you need to present installed capacity normal capacity actual capacity actual capacity utilization you need to present basis of arriving at the capacity you can you need to present changes in installed capacity and normal capacity you need to present in some machines are taken on lease then the additional capacity that you have leased taken on lease that is to be presented so these are the things which you need to present during calculation of capacity determination these are things which you need to present before in the cost audit report these are the things okay and in the practice question i have given you the past examination questions which have come and certain other questions also which have come in your um, um study material okay sir got it so yes guys this was cost accounting standard 2 for all of you cost accounting standard 2 for all of you okay Now let's move on to the next cost accounting standard. Very very interesting cost accounting standard. Amazing cost accounting standard. The ghost cost accounting standard or the bhut cost accounting standard. <laughs> so guys, I have given these names just to make you remember the numbers and the the context of the cost accounting standard. Okay, these weird names have been given to um, uh, just tell you the context. Okay, this is the ghost cost accounting standard or the bhut cost accounting standard. Okay. Okay, so now what are overheads? Okay, what are overheads? What is the definition of overheads? Can you please tell me in the chat box what is the definition of overheads? <clears throat> please tell in the chat box what is the definition of overheads. Please tell in the chat box what is the definition of overheads. Definition of overheads I want in the chat box. What is the definition of overheads? Vivek Labate has directly written the most important words in the definition. Wrong answer by Mahendra Reddy. Manufacturing cost. Wrong answer. Ajna says total of indirect expense. Overheads means indirect expense only. But what is the definition of overheads? What do you mean by overheads? That is what I want to ask. No one. No one. no answer guys no answer so overhead means wrong answer by ankita murarka guys you guys are cma finalist cma is our expert in costing and if i ask you what are overheads you are not able to tell me what are overheads 
So guys, the overheads means any expenditure which is not directly allocable to a particular cost center. And it relates to multiple cost centers. Overheads are the indirect expenses that are not directly allocable to a particular cost center. And they are, uh, you know, they will be um, uh, indicated indicative of multiple cost centers. So cost, cost which has been incurred for multiple cost centers is known as overheads or indirect expense. Now, guys, overheads which are attributable to multiple cost centers, those overheads, when we say this definition that who are which are not able to we which we are not able to um, allocate to different cost centers, we are not uh, defining it well because we need to write that overheads are those indirect expenses which are not allocable to a particular cost center in an economically feasible manner. These words are very very important because I'll tell you what there's nothing called overhead in the overhead in this world. Every expenditure can be allocated in a um, uh, in, in 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 the cost centers. Even if, if it is used for multiple cost centers, I'll give you the example. I have admin staff in my academy who works for CMA Foundation, CMA Inter, CMA Final. All three of them, they uh, their 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 cost is usually treated as overheads because they are working for all three cost centers. Now, the ask is that the cost should not be directly allocable to a particular cost center. But guys. I can ask that per person to uh, you know allocate his cost according to the time which he spends in CMA Foundation, CMA Inter, and CMA Final. I have a receptionist who spends time all three of them. I will give a gadget to that receptionist. Receptionist will start working on CMA Foundation. She will feed in the time that this is the time which I have spent on CMA Foundation on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Then whenever some inquiry comes for CMA Inter, she will quickly feed in the time, feed in the time that 15 minutes I have spent on um, uh, on on uh, answering this query. Then I will uh, ask her to, um, you know, feed her time according to the hourly basis in this particular tracker. I will be able to allocate this overhead into the cost centers. I have three cost centers. I'll be able to allocate. So principally, there is no overhead. There is nothing called overhead. It is booth. It is ghost. It is not there. It is only the fact that you know what is the cost that I will be incurring on allocating that particular cost center to cost objects. It will be humongous cost of that software and gadget. Will it justify my costing procedure? Suppose the salary of the receptionist is 200, uh, 220,000 rupees and that gadget will cost me 30,000 rupees. Is it practically um, uh, you know, useful to allocate that allocate that indirect, indirect cost into direct cost? Answer is no, it is not practically um, uh, you know, uh, useful and practically relevant. So we will leave it. There is nothing called overhead. It is just because the cost benefit analysis is not realized. That is why some expenses become overheads. And that is why the most important thing in this, in this particular cost accounting standard is the definition of overheads. Overheads means the indirect material, indirect labor and indirect expenses which are not identifiable or allocable to a cost subject in an economically feasible way. If you do not write these words, then your definition is incomplete. Because every expenditure can be allocated to the cost centers. There's no expenditure which cannot be allocated to a cost center. Every cost can be allocated to a cost center. That is the fact. Yes, Goshal Dake has given very beautiful definition. So I'll display it on the chat on the screen as well. Basically, any cost can be allocated, but cost of allocation should not exceed the cost of actual expense. Hence, some costs are treated as overheads, cost and benefit analysis. Very good definition by Goshal Dake. Yes. And guys, so whenever you define indirect cost, always write these, write these three words in an economically feasible way. So indirect costs are <clears throat> not allocable in an economically feasible way. But indirect cost can be allocated if we want to allocate them. They can be allocated. Yes, it is not impossible to allocate indirect cost. Okay. Now, overhead costs are of three types, which we all know already. Okay. Production overheads, absorption of production overheads, we've already discussed. Yes, this is the part. Okay, now principles of measurement. How do we recognize or how do we calculate the amount of indirect expense? How the amount of indirect expense can be calculated? How the amount of indirect expense can be calculated? How the amount of overhead can be calculated? Number one, production or operation overheads represented procurement of resources from outside the organization. If we are purchasing the indirect expense from outside the organization, if we are purchasing the overheads from outside the organization, if we are doing that, then what will be the um, uh, total of cost that will be um, incurred? It will be the invoice or the agreed price, including the duties and taxes and other expenditure directly attributable due to net of discount. 
So whatever total invoice or agreed price we have paid for this particular um, expense for incurring this particular expense, we'll add on all those expenses and we'll reduce any discount uh, other than cash discount. Cash discount will not be reduced because it is in the nature of finance fin finance um, uh, income. Tax and duties refundable or to be credited should be reduced. That is how our entire overhead will be calculated. Okay. Now, if the overhead production or operation overhead representing utilization of resources within the organization, which means we have in-house a uh, way in, in which we can incur these expenses. These overheads are being incurred within the organization. For example, we have a different repair and maintenance department. Uh, we have it within the organization, which is doing repair and maintenance of all the machineries which are there in the plant. All the machineries which are there in the plant, all the cost centers which are there, repair and maintenance is being done by our repair and maintenance uh, cost center. Then what will happen uh, to the cost? We will include cost incurred in connection therewith. Whatever cost is incurred for repairing, uh, for maintaining that particular cost center, that um, uh, you know cost will be accumulated for example machinery spare fabricated internally or repair job carried out internally includes cost incurred on material employees and expenses so whatever cost has been incurred internally on uh, these overheads that will be accumulated okay so these are the overheads representing utilization of resources within the organization okay then guys these are very very important um, uh, you know principles and these principles will be repeated in the next few cost accounting standards all the 24 cost accounting standards these principles will be common so if you remember one principle then you will not be uh, required to um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, you required to remember other principles so just remember the principles which are said over here and you will automatically be able to remember the other principles the principles which are given in other cost accounting standards Oh, good evening. Mr. Pediwal is here. Nikhil SH. These costs are economically not traceable. Very good answer, Nikhil SH. Mr. Pediwal has joined the live session a little late today. Good evening, Mr. Pediwal. All right. <clears throat> Any abnormal cost where it is material or quantifiable shall not form part of production overheads. So we only uh, uh, recognize production overheads when it is material and quantifiable. Okay. So abnormal cost where it is material and quantifiable shall not form part of overhead. Abnormal cost always go to, goes in costing PL account. We never add it in our cost sheet. So that is very, very important that abnormal cost goes in that cost sheet and not in the production overheads. Production or operation overhead shall not include imputed cost. Imputed cost means notional cost. Notional cost means, um, you know, suppose I have an organization and my um, uh, production manager resigned. My brother knows some technicalities of production. So I appoint him as my production manager without any salary because he's my brother for six months. Then he leaves after six months. Okay. Now he did not take any salary, but in my cost sheet, I am adding this amount of salary, not permitted. This is notional or imputed cost. This is imputed cost. So not possible. This is absolutely not possible. So imputed cost shall not be included. Production overhead variances attributable to normal reasons. So there can be some variances. If you are using standard costing, then there can be some variances. Variances attributable to normal reasons shall be treated as part of production overhead. So normal variances should be treated part of normal production overhead. Overhead variances attributable to abnormal reason. When you attribute the overheads due to abnormal reason, then it shall be excluded from production overheads. Okay. Any subsidy grant incentive which is received from government shall be reduced. Received from government or anyone. Okay. Fines, penalties, damages should never be included in your cost. And we will follow these principles in all the cost accounting standards, guys. In all the cost accounting standards, we will follow these principles. Credits or recoveries, if you are making some credit or recoveries uh, from these costs, uh, cost, then we will reduce it. Any change in cost accounting, very, very important, guys. Very, very important principle. If you want to change your cost accounting standard, yes, you can do it. Only if three conditions are satisfied. Number one, it is required by law. Number two, it is required for compliance with cost accounting standard. Number three, the change will result in an appropriate presentation or representation of cost statements. If any of these three conditions are satisfied and you are able to satisfy your cost auditor, that yes, a change in cost accounting principle is required. Only then this change can be done. That is the bottom line. Okay, sir. Got it. Assignment of production overheads. Now, how do you assign production overheads? Okay. Assign means you need to actually um, club the entire overheads and you need to allocate them according to the cost centers. That is known as assignment of overheads into various cost centers. Okay. So what is the principle that you will derive um, uh, during assignment? Cause and effect relationship. So, you know, what is the reason, which is the process operation or activities that has led to incurrence of this cost? That is the first principle. So suppose if, you know, oil has come in our factory, 
Now oil has been consumed. Five kgs oil has come. Three kgs have been consumed by um, uh, production cost center A. One kg by B. One kg by C. So the cost will be incurred according to the incurrence of cost. Whatever consumption has happened, whatever consumption has happened according to the consumption um, uh, incurrence of cost, the uh, cost shall be allocated. So whosoever has uh, consumed more, he shall be, um, uh, you know, uh, he shall be given the credit of that particular cost. So cost means for which cost center are we incurring this expense? For which cost center has this uh, cost cost be incurred? That is the prime principle. Principle number two. What are the benefits received by the individual cost centers? So, according to the benefits, cause and effect, and benefits, there are two principles in which assignment is need to be need to be done. What are the benefits which each and every um, uh, you know uh, each and every uh, cost center has derived from uh, consuming this particular product? So, what are the benefits which are received? So, benefits received. And cause and effect. These are two ways in which our cost accounting standard, our, our cost can be allocated to various um, uh, cost centers. That is how the assignment is done. This is the assignment of production overheads. Assignment is done in these two ways. Okay. Then, in case of facility created standby, cost shall be assigned on the basis of expected benefits. That is perfectly fine. Absorption. Okay. Then, guys, these these are that's it. Okay. So yes, that's it, guys. Cost accounting standard three again, again an important cost accounting standard. Cost center ko assign karenge ya cost object ko. Arey bhai, jo hoga usko assign karenge. Agar to cost centers hain, cost centers means jo aapke fixed cost centers hain, jaise hamari case mein kya hai? Hamari case mein hai um, uh, foundation, inter, final. Okay, three cost centers hain. We will allocate according to the cost centers. Okay. Now, now we have four subjects in the cost center of foundation. Okay, four cost subjects, cost objects are there. Four cost objects in um, the cost center. Okay. Now, if we are making our cost sheet according to the cost center, which is foundation, intermediate, final, then I will allocate according to the cost center. But if I say that no, I want to make my cost sheet according to the cost object as well, then I will further allocate my expenses according to the teachers who are teaching these four subjects: economics, maths, law, accounts. So, cost object means. Within a cost center, what is the particular area in which cost is allocated? Or cost object sometimes also means the different projects which are there. So I have multiple projects going on uh, as a real estate person. I have different projects which are going on at various places. They are my cost objects. So it depends on what kind of industry are you. Okay. So yes, guys, this was cost accounting standard three for you. So uh, you know I've. Quickly revise cost accounting standard three because it's very very important to um, uh, you know revise it at the last moment so that you remember it during your examination. And when you remember it during your examination, guys, there's there's a high possibility that um, uh, you know things click. Okay, so revise these as many times as possible because these marathon videos are purposed in that way that you need revision of these. Um, uh, you know, every time you are um, studying for it, so revise as much as possible, and yes, you'll be able to see the results in your um, favor very, very soon. So yes, that's all for today's session, guys. Cost accounting stand one, two, and three we are able to discuss. In the next session, we'll be continuing with our rest of the cost accounting standards, which are cost accounting standard four, five, six, as many as I can do in one session. I'll try to finish and cover um, as many cost accounting standards as I can in one session. And yes, our exams are quite near, so we'll be ready for our examination as well. On that positive note, all the very best and happy studying. Bye bye. See you in the next live session. Bye. Uh, one of the most important topics of your syllabus. What is the topic? Topic is cost accounting standards. Again, from a theoretical standpoint as well as a practical standpoint, both the standpoints, this cost accounting standard, these cost accounting standards are very, very, very important. So yes, we need to do them in depth. We need to do them absolutely, uh, uh, you know, threadbare. And we should be aware about all the provisions which are there in cost accounting standards. And the cost accounting standard which we are going to start today is cost accounting standard four. Yes. Amresh, good evening. Good evening, everyone. And for these notes, guys, check out the description box or check out the comment, the pinned comment. The pinned comment would have the notes in the PDF format. All right. So let's start cost accounting standard four. Now, let me give you a brief background of cost accounting standard four before I start. Cost accounting standard four. 
um, uh, was earlier named uh, differently, worded differently. Why is this cost accounting standard changing so frequently? What is the history behind this cost accounting standard? And why is this cost accounting standard so important? So guys, one of the most important cost accounting standards for you, uh, you know, from an exam standpoint, as well as from a practical standpoint, why? Because this cost accounting standard would affect the revenue of government of India directly. Yes, this cost accounting standard has been referred in the GST Act. And therefore, whatever is the GST collection of the country that will be impacted by this cost accounting standard. And yes, the earlier cost accounting standard, which, uh, which was there prior to this particular cost accounting standard, that was also relevant from a sales tax standpoint. In sales tax, there was a reference to uh, this particular cost accounting standard. And that is why sales tax collection of the country was dependent on this cost accounting standard. And that is why I have named this cost accounting standard as the Demon cost accounting standard or the Rakshas cost accounting standard. Why? Because this cost accounting standard can suck your blood. So what is blood for a business? Just like we have blood in our body, what is blood for business? It is finance. It is funds. It is incomes and expenses which are there in a business. That is the blood uh, of any business undertaking. And that blood is extracted out of, the, out of the business using this cost accounting standard. Yes, this cost accounting standard, if you apply it wrongly, then you will have to pay additional GST. Uh, even penalties and interest would also levy on you. So yes, this cost accounting standard would impact your, impact your GST um, uh, collections directly. Yes, very good. As per rule 30, Supreet Saluja says, Shubham Bhardwaj says rule 30 of valuation. Very good. Sudarshan says rule 30 of valuation. Neera Chopra says 110% of cost. Perfectly um, uh, pointed out, guys. The uh, uh, rule 30 of the cost uh, CGST Act refers to this particular standard and says that if uh, through other means of computation of value, uh, you would fail to compute the value of a particular product, then you need to value it using cost accounting standard 4 and then add 10% of statutory profit margin in it to compute the value of that good, which is eligible for GST. So because of its reference in GST Act, because of its prevalence in GST Act, this um, the cost accounting standards becomes pain in the neck of any CFO of the country, any finance manager of the country would definitely want to follow this particular cost accounting standard very, very, very carefully, which is, um, uh, which is uh, the reason why this particular cost accounting standard is so very important. So let's start. What is cost accounting standard four, which is revised? It is cost of production, acquisition, or supply of goods or provision of services. How to compute the cost of production, acquisition, or supply of goods or production of services? How to compute it? We are going to, um, uh, you know, uh, test the, that thing in this particular cost accounting standard. Yes, and we refer to rule 30 of the CGST rules. It says that value of supply of goods and services of both based on cost, where value of a supply of goods and services of both is not determined by any of the preceding rules of this chapter, the value shall be 110% of cost of production or manufacture or cost of acquisition of such goods or cost of provision of such services. So owing to this particular clause, we say that this particular cost accounting standard directly affects, directly affects the GST collection. So if GST collection is to be monitored by the GST officers, then guys, this cost accounting standard is mandatory to be followed. Um, you know, although this is a residuary method, which means that if all other methods fail, then this method comes to play. This is a residuary method, but still it's a very, very, very important method of determination of cost of production. Okay. So guys, very generic uh, definitions, which are given in the cost accounting standard. What is cost of purchase or acquisition? It is the purchase price, import duties, um, uh, and other taxes, transport, handling, storage cost, other costs, which is attributable to goods and services. Similarly, what is cost of production? Cost of production is material, consumed, direct wages, direct expenses, direct uh, works overhead, quality control cost, research and development cost, packing cost, administrative overhead relating to production. Guys, um, we prepare cost sheet. Okay. This is nothing but a performer of cost sheet. The items which are there in cost sheet is given over here. Cost of provision of services. Similarly, uh, you know, we prepare cost of provision of services. Then cost of production or acquisition of goods or provision of services shall be measured for each type of goods and services separately. Now, this is a clear mandate from the cost accounting standard that uh, each a service and product should have a separate um, uh, measurement of the cost. Cost should be separately measured by each and every um, uh, goods and services. The material cost of normal scrap or defectives shall be included in the material cost of goods produced or services produced. So if there's a normal loss, okay, 
normal scrap what do you mean by normal scrap normal scrap means which is um, which arises due to normal reasons okay so any scrap which arises due to normal reasons we will include them in computation of um, uh, the uh, cost itself we will so normal loss is to be loaded in the remaining cost okay that is the principle normal loss is to be loaded in the remaining material remaining um, uh, products okay okay so next is the material the the realized or unrealized value of scrap shall be deducted from determination of cost of production so if there's any uh, scrap which is produced during production that is to be deducted while calculating the cost of acquisition of goods or provision of services material cost of abnormal scrap or defective should not be included in material cost but treated as loss after deducting the realizable value of uh, scrap or defectives any kind of material uh, material cost which is uh, um, uh, attributed to abnormal scrap so you uh, you know produce something and it became scrap due to abnormal reasons then that material cost shall not be included in the material cost material cost shall not be included in that particular cost uh, because guys in any which ways abnormal loss also we um, uh, you know separate out from the cost so any material cost which is attributed to abnormal cost that is also to be separated out if goods are transferred or dispatched or supplied duly packed cost of such packing shall be included in cost of dispatch or transfer okay so cost of packing is to be included over here high value spare very very important please mark very very important a question is going to come from this particular concept it it has been repeating uh, for many many times so please mark uh, this very very important part high value spare shall be recognized as property plant equipment when they meet the definition of ppe and depreciated accordingly very very important um, now provision of cost accounting standard please mark it underline it and i'll explain you okay 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 so i'll reduce the brightness brightness is little high in the screen i guess so i'll reduce the brightness a little bit screen is already okay okay now a little better now is it better okay so high value spares guys there are certain spare parts in every machinery okay uh, those spare parts may be categorized into two parts one is high value spare second is low value spare the high value spare means which are you know costly uh, spares so you know a machinery which is costing worth rupees 1 crore rupees there can be some spares which might be of 20 lakh or 30 lakh rupees okay those are known as high value spares and guys high value spares are definitely to be included in the cost of machinery itself they are not to be included as inventory they are not to be included as uh, you know any other thing it has to be included as cost of machinery and they have to be depreciated along with the machinery so yes uh, they should qualify the definition of ppe ppe is a term which is uh, you know um, extracted from ifrs property plant and equipment i hope that you have um, studied this concept of ppe so first these high value spares are to be analyze whether they qualify for ppe or not if they qualify for ppe then you need to capitalize these um uh, high value spares and have to be depreciated accordingly now this is a very important mandate because many companies were actually putting these high value spares as inventory no not permitted high value spares cannot be put as inventory they are not your inventory guys okay so this is the principle very very important principle please underline otherwise such items are classified as inventory and recognized in the cost so if they are low value spare or they are not um, recognizing the concept of plant, property plant and equipment then you can actually value them as um, uh, you know inventory and can write off according so this is an important principle please uh, underline it because this has come in examination many a times depreciation of an assets begins with um, when it is available for use whenever the um now my asset is available for use that is when it is in the location and condition necessary for it to be capable of operating in the manner intended by the management please underline this word intended by the management whatever is the management's intention if the asset is available for use according to that intention then depreciation is eligible now i'll ask you a question and then you will tell me whether intention intended use uh, the the good is ready for intended use or not okay so i bought five acs for my coaching academy until the year the acs were inside my coaching academy but till the year end the acs were not installed in my coaching and academy can i claim depreciation uh, is this definition of uh, depreciation 
fulfilled that the uh, the asset should be available for use and that it should be in a location condition necessary for capable of operating in the manner intended by the management the most important words are intended by the management okay so acs are not installed can i capitalize them yes or no in the chat box they are ready to use yes yes they are ready to use they are in the boxes obviously acs are always ready to use man um you know they are bought and they are kept in on the floor they are not installed as, as yet i will just install them and uh, work work for them okay they are not installed but i have purchased them before the year end before 31st march i have purchased them they are not installed they are installed on 5th of april can i claim depreciation on 31st of march on these acs yes or no yes or no everyone is saying no but yukta rupalia is saying yes so guys they are not in a condition to use by the management in the intended manner they are not why because those acs which are kept on floor in the cartons i cannot switch on the ac and they will start throwing um, uh, cool air on me no they will not unless until they are installed how can you say that they are um, uh, available for use in the condition which are capable of operating in the manner intended by the management they are not they are not so very very important that the ac or the plant or the equipment or the asset should be ready to use which means it should be installed it should be you know um, um, uh, all everything should be done which requires um, a working of that particular ac or that particular machine so everything should be done in an appropriate manner only then can we say that it is ready to use the very very important definition please mark important over here okay ac is not installed and not ready to use very good sundareshan supreet so, saluja they are not in a condition to use very good till they don't use depreciation can't be charged very good uh, uh, ankita murarka very good super perfect guys so yes this is the correct answer <clears throat> okay now the point is i've seen a practical applicability applicability of this particular clause in a very very big telecom sector okay i was um, in kpmg and i was working in statutory audit do you want me to share a practical insight on this particular line which has been drawn for accounting standard 10 do you want me to share a practical insight on this particular concept if you want me then write a yes with multiple s if you want me to uh, disclose a practical insight on this intended use principle which has been exactly written in accounting standard 10 it has been exactly exactly extracted from accounting standard 10 and has been put in cost accounting standard 4 as well as the cost accounting standard on depreciation and amortization yes yes everyone saying yes okay perfect so guys a very very big telecommunication company a telecommunication giant and all of you know about it so i will not name it, the telecommunication giant 10 years back it's a story of 10 years back when i was working for kpmg in the statutory audit division they had tv towers they had um, uh, sorry telecommunication towers which were installed those towers are very very expensive towers guys okay those towers were installed in various parts of delhi and um, uh, you know those were absolutely in a ready to use condition they were installed the machinery was installed engineers has given us the completion certificate everything was done it was just a button to be pressed and those telecommunication towers would have emitted uh, signals and they would have started working they were in an absolute absolute put to use condition they were in a perfect condition which is available for use capable of operating in the manner intended by the management okay there was only one lacuna there was only one drawback what was that dra drawback the drawback is the drawback is license from telecommunication regulatory authority was not received by the company as yet the license was received after 2 months license from telecommunication regulatory authority because to run a telecommunication tower you need a license okay license was not there in place license was not there in place now the question is whether those telecommunication towers were available for use and could the uh, cfo of that company claim depreciation on it yes or no yes or no please tell me in the chat box the towers are absolutely ready they are absolutely in a condition where only button is to be pressed and they'll be started working okay they'll start working okay please tell me whether a depreciation can be claimed or not <laughs> yes a practical insight
वृक्ष मेरा जीवन हु इज द स्टूडेंट वृक्ष मेरा जीवन प्लीज टेल योर नेम ऑल्सो हाँ थैंक यू सो मच सर वॉट यू आर डूइंग फॉर स्टूडेंट हु आर इन सी एम एफ इज रियली कमेंडेबल थैंक सो मच वी ऑल आर वेटिंग फॉर रिविजन लेक्चर बाई यू आर सी एस सी एस सी एम एन निखिल सर यस आई एम हेयर विद द रिविजन लेक्चर सो ट्विंकल से इज यस सुप्रीत सलूजा से इज यस एवरी वन एज एल से इज नो एंड दो से नो प्लीज टेल मी वाई आर यू सेंग नो बिकॉज द टावर इज एप्सोल्यूटली न अवेलेबल टू यूज कंडीशन पुट टू यूज कंडीशन it is absolutely ready it is installed all the technology is fit in it's absolutely ready to use why are other students saying that sir it should not be eligible for depreciation why is a no there in your answer please tell me location and condition are satisfied umang umang pipalwa umang pipalwa location it is in the right location it is uh, you know installed in a place where it should have been located and it is also in a good condition you know it is in a condition whereby it's all installed engineering work has been done just a button press and it will start working why are you saying no why are you saying no why shouldn't it be uh, capitalized and depreciation should be claimed on these tv towers uh, you know how expensive these towers are depreciation of these towers are huge they are in several several crore rupees how expensive they are not put to use by management no no put to use is not the condition condition is available for use now sandeep mishra is trying to digress the matter sandeep mishra is trying to digress the matter don't digress the matter the condition is not put to use the condition is available for use if it is ready for use i will claim depreciation whether it is put to use or not that is the condition okay harshit verma it is not put to use but the question is not of put to use without license it cannot be used and hence not capable of being operated as intended by the management nice 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 business not started amitesh this that is irrelevant whether business started or not license not there so license not there okay perfect answer given by sundreshan nagaranjan Sundreshan Nagaranjan. I have displayed the answer on the computer screen. Without license, it cannot be used, and hence not capable of being operated as intended by the management. What is the intention of the management? Intention of the management is not to uh, dry their wet clothes uh, over that tower. They have not uh, installed that tower to um, dry their wet clothes. They will not hang their wet clothes over there and um, uh, allow them to dry. No. The reason of installation of the stars is telecommunication services. and can telecommunication services be provided unless and until the license is received by the management answer is no so the um, uh, asset is definitely available for use asset is definitely available for use but it is not available for use it is not capable of being operated in the manner intended by the management first condition satisfied available to use second condition not satisfied capable of operating in the manner intended by the management and that is why we gave an opinion to the very famous telecommunication giant of the country that dear sir dear cfo you will not be able to claim depreciation on this particular tv tower uh, telecommunication towers although they are erect although they are installed although they are perfectly in a running condition but still they are not capable of being operated in the manner intended by the management therefore not possible perfect answer by sundreshan nagaranjan very very good Shubham says depreciation is allowed as it is available to use at location. No, Shubham, wrong answer. Ankita Murarka also gave it right. Twinkle says, ऐसे तो हमने गर्मी में गीजर लग लगवाया. चलेगा तो सर्दी में ही ना सर. ये गलत है. No, no, it's not wrong, guys. So, अगर आपने गर्मी में गीजर लगाया लेकिन गीजर को ऑन अगर आपको गर्मी में भी करना हो तो आप कर तो सकते हो ना ऐसा तो नहीं कि आपको किसी की परमिशन लेनी पड़ेगी गीजर को ऑन करने में गर्मी में मैं 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 कई बार गर्मी में गर्म पानी चाहिए होता है मेरी मदर को चाहिए होता है जो मेड आती है वो बर्तन धोती है गर्म पानी से तो हम गर्मियों में भी कई बार गीजर चलाते हैं है ना तो ऐसा नहीं है कि गीजर चलाना ना चलाना इज रेलिवेंट ये देखना है कि क्या आप चला सकते हो क्या गीजर आप गर्मी में चला सकते हो आंसर इज यस यू कैन रन गीजर इन समर्स आल्सो तो अगर आप चला सकते हो परफेक्ट क्लेम डेप्रिसिएशन यहां तो चला ही नहीं सकते लाइसेंस ही नहीं मिला था भाई चलाओगे कहां से लाइसेंस ही नहीं मिला था 
लेकिन ये जो घरेलू एग्जाम्पल दिया ना ट्विंकल ने बड़ा जबरदस्त है गीजर का घरेलू एग्जाम्पल होता है ना बच्चे घरेलू एग्जाम्पल देते हैं मस्त एकदम वेरी वेरी गुड परफेक्ट ओके ओके गाइस दिस आर स्मॉल स्मॉल एग्जांपल्स व्हिच कैन यू कैन डू योरसेल्फ सो आई एम नॉट गोइंग इनटू दिस स्मॉल स्मॉल एग्जांपल्स बिकॉज़ इट विल टेक अ लॉट ऑफ टाइम इफ आई टच बेस ईच एंड एवरी एग्जांपल इट विल टेक अ लॉट ऑफ टाइम ओके ओके कॉस्ट इनकर्ड फॉर प्रोडक्शन और एक्विजिशन और सप्लाई ऑफ गुड्स एंड सर्विसेज आफ्टर स्प्लिट ऑफ पॉइंट शैल बी मेजर्ड फॉर ईच टाइप ऑफ जॉइंट ऑफ बाय प्रोडक्ट फॉर रिसोर्सेज कंज्यूम्ड सो व्हेर एवर देयर आर जॉइंट ऑफ बाय प्रोडक्ट्स व्हिच आर बीइंग प्रोड्यूस्ड द कॉस्ट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन व्हिच इज after which is incurred after the split of point that is to be taken into account for joint and by products okay royalty technical know how all these shall be included in the cost of production royalty then quality control cost incurred for in house for the production or acquisition or supply of provision of services shall be aggregate of cost of resources used in quality control activities so whatever quality control cost has been incurred by you all should be taken into consideration while calculating the cost of production then production or operation overhead represents procurement of resources shall be determined on the basis of invoice or agreed value so how will you take what are the cost of um, the resources which have been consumed the invoice value whatever invoice you have raised that can that should be taken into account then industry specific operating expenses if there are some industry specific operating expenses which means certain industry needs a certain expenses to be incurred separately those should be <clears throat> uh, you know clubbed as a separate accounting head as a separate costing head any abnormal cost where material quantifiable shall not form part of cost of production so guys there are certain common principles which we will study in every cost accounting standard one of them is any abnormal cost should be excluded in calculation of cost interest finance charges shall be excluded from cost impairment loss of asset shall not form part of cost now this is very very important impairment loss of an asset um, shall not form part of cost of production what do you mean by impairment loss guys impairment loss is when we analyze <coughs> the two things okay the book value of the asset versus whatever is recoverable from that asset the book value of the asset versus whatever is recoverable from the asset this is an accounting concept accounting standard deals with this concept of impairment and it always always compares the book value of the asset and whatever is recoverable from that asset in the form of sales proceed or um, uh, the the goods that that particular uh, asset can sell in market okay if you think that <clears throat> the amount of recoveries which the asset can do is lesser than the book value then you have to write off the book value this is the impairment loss okay and impairment loss is not included in the um uh, in the cost always always impairment loss is not included in the cost so sandeep mishra is asking if geezer mcb off <laughs> you are still stuck on the geezer um, uh, you know concept okay so if geezer mcb is off then guys you can on it any at any point of point of time you need not take government's permission um, that government government mr narendra modi please instruct if i can uh, switch on my geezer you will not take government's permission to switch on your geezer okay so guys it is available for use it is available for use geezer mcb switch on switch off doesn't matter okay okay sir then again guys some common points common points you can remember once they are applicable for all the cost accounting standards do not repeat them again and again and over here also you can cut 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 the common points common points are absolutely um, not to be done each time again and again and again okay now cost of production shall include cost of inputs received free of cost or a concessional value so if the cost uh, of inputs are received free of cost then also the cost shall be included um, in the cost of production cost of production shall also include cost of rework reconditioning retrofitment any kind of job work that is required to be done that is also included in the cost of production subsidy or grant should be reduced from cost of production any grant as deferred income in the financial statement shall also be reduced from the relevant element of cost of production so you know if you are um, uh, you know receiving a grant in a deferred manner which means which means you will uh, receive a grant at a later point in time that should also be reduced from the cost of production cost of production or acquisition or supply of goods or services shall be determined based on normal capacity or actual capacity whichever is higher very very important please mark a tick over here very very important always the cost of production or acquisition shall be determined on the basis of when you are absorbing this cost okay then it is to be absorbed on the basis of normal capacity or actual capacity whichever is higher and the unabsorbed cost shall be treated as abnormal cost okay so very very important fines penalties 
डैमेज डेमरेज शेल नॉट बी फॉर्म पार्टिंग ऑफ पार्ट ऑफ कॉस्ट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन ओके फॉर एक्स फॉर एक्स कॉम्पोनेट वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट गाइज इफ देर इज एनी इंपोर्टेड मटीरियल विच हैज बिन बॉट इफ देर इज एनी इंपोर्टेड यू नो इनपुट दैट हैज बिन बॉट देन दैट इम्पोर्ट दैन इम्पोर्टेड मटेरियल कैन ऑल्सो यू नो हैव सम फॉर एक्स एलिमेंट इन इट विच मीन्स दैट you purchased the uh, imported material when the forex rate was 48 but um, you know you made the payment when the forex rate was 52 so difference between 48 and 52 is the forex loss which you have incurred um, uh, for this particular product okay for this particular cost okay now the question is whether that 48 to 52 cost should also be absorbed in the cost sheet shall also be taken into the cost of production that is the question which we need to answer now so for a some component of imported material and other material of cost shall be converted at the rate on the date of transaction the date when the transaction has entered into place that date the uh, cost should be recognized in my case it is 48 any subsequent change in exchange rate till payment or otherwise shall not form part of cost of production any change at a later point in time any change at a uh, later uh, given point in time shall not form part of cost of production or cost of acquisition or provision of services so which means net net which means that the difference between the rate which was there when the transaction was entered into versus the rate which was there when payment was done difference between these two dates the amount is um uh, shall not be included in cost of production or cost of services amount shall not be included okay so this is the fundamental Okay, then again, credits and recoveries. If there are any credit and recovery, they should be reduced from the cost of production. Work in progress stock shall be measured on the cost computed at different stages of completion of stage basis. Now, very very important. If there is any work in progress, okay, work in progress means sixty uh, percent work is done, fifty percent work is done on the raw material. It is not complete. A, a part of it is still left. Okay, again, the work in progress is to be uh, the cost should be included as per the. stage of completion whatever is the stage of completion of that particular work in progress according to that stage the um, uh, cost should be included opening and closing stock of work in progress shall be adjusted for computation of cost of production whatever is the opening and closing stock that should be adjusted in the cost of production scrap of waste please mark very very important on this particular part you know four marks um, a question can be asked from this particular part what is the treatment of um, uh, scrap or waste okay okay if in case the scrap has ready market and realizable value can be determined so if the scrap has ready market and realizable value can be determined for that particular scrap which means that scrap can be sold in market and you know some amount can be fetched from that particular scrap then realized or realizable value of scrap shall be reduced from the cost of production even if it is not realized then also realizable value shall be reduced from the cost of production in case scrap does not have any ready market and it is used for reprocessing so sometimes what happens is scrap is Uh, reprocessed in our any other process also uh, uh, so for example if you know sugar cane is uh, sugar is been made and sugar cane is being crushed and bagasse has been generated then bagasse can be used as fuel right we need not sell bagasse bagasse can be used as fuel also in that case when bagasse can be used as fuel in that case um, uh, you know value of input cost at the stage at which it is recycled so value of the input cost the input cost value at the stage when it is recycled is to be taken as the value of scrap very very important concept very very important concept so you know whatever fuel is replaced by bagasse whatever is the cost of that fuel which has been replaced by bagasse the cost of bagasse or the realizable value of bagasse should be the same as the input which it, it has replaced which is fuel which is coal which can be coal which can be diesel which can be anything so the value of input cost on the stage at which it is recycled is to be taken as value of scrap value of scrap will always be the value um, uh, of input cost the scrap value of scrap produced during the period calculated at the rate as explained above may be deducted from the cost of production so very very important principle guys now guys the point is that you know i um, in this particular revision video i cannot go into the each and every line and each every, every um, you know nitty gritties of this particular concept but please mark this concept as very very important and yes um, uh, whatever practical questions you have done on this concept of whatever analysis you have done on this concept you should be thorough with it should be thorough with it okay sir then assignment of cost it is very very simple guys how to assign the cost um, uh, you know how to assign cost over uh, various cost centers this is straightforward method assignment has two principles which we have discussed in our earlier cost accounting standard cost and effect and benefits received according to these two principles the cost can be assigned so these are simple presentation and disclosure 
again what disclosures are required to be made uh, how to present this statement in the cost statement that is the uh, point under consideration okay disclosures and um, uh, uh, presentation okay guys very very important okay don't ignore presentations and dis disclosure sometimes uh, you know a question may be asked that you know what are the four areas of presentation which is needed to be taken care in case of say material cost or in case of say labor cost or whatever it is okay so very 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 important okay sir got it so yes guys this was your cost accounting standard 4 <clears throat> yes this is the practical question which comes in the examination also sometimes guys a very easy and straightforward one so i'm not dealing with it with over here but you in your register in your practical part please solve this question okay a very easy straightforward one Achha, one more thing illustration number three these kind of questions are very very frequent in the examination from this particular chapter whereby all your cost will be given you just have to add that cost and you have to compute the cost of production cost of production is required to be computed or you have to compute the valuation for the purpose of cgst which means that cost of production plus 10 percent should be the value so these kind of questions are very very common in the examination please do them and these are certain practice questions okay sir got it so yes a six marks question seven marks question can be there in the examination from this particular chapter important guys important from a practical standpoint as well as theoretical standpoint both the standpoints this cost accounting standard is important okay now cost accounting standard five not a very important cost accounting standard but yes uh, uh, sometimes a question might be asked okay not a very very important cost accounting standard. market is not very important okay and please answer me guys how's the josh in the house are we all set to rock our group four cma final and are we all set to affix those three exclusive alphabets before our name which are c m a How's the Josh in the house? Please comment in the comment section. Yes. <laughs> hi, sir. Yes, sir. Hi. Yes. Very high. Good. Project Prajakta Vivek Lambate. Good. Nice. Okay. Now let us start determination of average equalized cost of transportation. Okay. Uh, now transportation can be of many types. Um, you know, even one product can be transported using two or three mediums, which means that through rail, it can be brought from one city to another city. And then through um, bullock cart or through some, some truck or some trolley, it can be brought from the city's railway station to the factory of the, um, uh, the supplier, the manufacturer. So this can easily happen. In this particular case, guys, when um, uh, the okay when the um uh, when more than one kind of uh, transportation is used then what we do we average out all the transportation cost and uh, load it in the cost of production so that is why the name of the uh, cost accounting standard is determination of average or equalized cost of transportation this is the average or equalized cost of transportation that is the uh, name of this particular cost accounting standard so transportation cost is an important element of cost transportation cost is an important element of cost of procurement of material of production for distribution of product for sale when we distribute our product for sale then cost of transportation becomes an important element okay inward cost and outward cost both the costs are there uh, you know the inward cost is to be added in procurement of material it is treated as procurement of material cost and the outward cost is uh, treated as the uh, cost of sales of finished goods okay that is inward and outward cost okay okay sir so these are generic things yes this is the most important thing what all should be included in cost of transportation it is cost of freight cartage transit insurance cost of operating fleet and other incidental charges um, which are paid to internal or uh, outside agencies so any kind of transportation cost any kind of cost which is incurred um, uh, including the insurance cost or the cartage or the operating fleet operating fleet means when you have your own trucks you have all your your own trolleys to um, uh, you know uh, transfer the goods then you uh, have cost of operating fleet so transportation cost includes all of these now two things are not included in transportation cost which is the demerit charges and the detention charges now demerit charges and detention charges have been demonstrated by me in um, uh, you know in this diagram when you fail to uh, unload your full container and uh, the container is um, uh, situated in the on the port and you fail to unload it within the stipulated time then you pay demerit charges 
and when you are fully uh, unloaded container which is the empty container you fail to remit it back to the authorities to the port, port authorities then you pay detention charges both the charges are not uh, to be added in cost of transportation that is the important thing okay inward outward cost of transportation we have already studied freight cartage these are definitions which are um, uh, you know simple definitions now this is a very very important uh, table guys so guys uh, in my book in my book okay in my book whatever i have given in form of a table whatever i have given in form of a table that is a very very important element of that particular cost accounting standard especially after cost accounting standard 10 uh, where i have given only the un uncommon points in the tabular format rest everything will be in running font and this tabular form means this is something unique in this particular cost accounting standard so the examiner when it gives questions from cas 10 to cas 24 then it gives um, uh, you know irregular information or uncommon information so that uncommon information is given to you by me in in form of these tables so tables high priority in all the cost accounting standards now what are the de details to be disclosed um, uh, in case of transportation cost and what are the details which is to, which are to be maintained by each and every uh, businessman so businessman has to maintain these details and has to maintain uh, a bureau of these details and what are what are what are those details in case of own transport fleet if the businessman has his own trucks has his own um, uh, trolleys has his own mode of transportation in that case guys the uh, records which are to be maintained is salaries and wages of the driver, cleaner, cost of fuel, license fee, permit fee, insurance of the vehicle, lubricant, grease fees, amortization, cost of tires, battery over its useful life, repair maintenance, depreciation. All these things are required to be maintained because if you have your own vehicle, if you have your own transportation fleet, then of course, guys, you will have to incur expenses on that vehicle, on that transportation fleet, and you have to, um, uh, uh, you know, provide um, uh, the the all the expenses are to be total to compute the transportation cost but if you have hired transportation which means that it's not your own transportation it's hired by outside agency so this is hired and this is own transportation okay in case of higher transportation which means you don't have your own trucks you hire a transport agency and they provide you transport services in that case charges incurred for dispatch of goods date of dispatch of goods type of transport used description of goods what are the goods which have been transferred okay then destination name of consignee chalan number etc etc so these certain details are required to be um, uh, you know populated by you when you have your hired transportation and not your own transportation okay so all these things are required to be uh, documented and maintained by you because these are to be seen by the tax officer the cost accounting officers okay then treatment of cost very very important inward transportation cost inward transportation cost to be treated as cost of raw material to be treated as cost of material okay procurement of material and outward transportation cost to be treated as cost of sales very very important distinguishing point when you have inward cost of transportation to be treated as cost of material when you have outward cost of transportation to be treated as cost of sales okay sir so volume basis may be used for in order of priority for apportionment of outward transportation oh, that is that is very generic thing okay yes this was our very small very very small cost accounting standard which is cost accounting standard 5 which is equalized transportation cost and yes I've, as i've already told you not a very very important cost accounting standard because in the past examination also it were it has uh, you know seldom come in the examination okay now next cost accounting standard a very very important sixth and seventh okay material cost and labor cost i fondly call them as brother sister cast why do i call them as brother sister cast because guys brother of the family is usually um uh, you know uh, busy in gathering material for the family material means the basic infrastructural facilities food for eating food water and shelter and the the uh, sister of the family is usually um, uh, engaged in uh, labor labor means she would uh, maintain the house well she would cook food for everyone in the house so not not a stereotypical um, uh, stereotyping that i'm trying to do over here but yes just to make you remember which one is six which one is seven six is material cost which is brother cost okay seven is uh, sister cost which is labor cost so material cost and labor cost two cost uh, both are brothers and sisters uh, they both go hand in hand and wherever you see material cost obviously uh, the uh, labor cost will definitely be there and wherever you see labor cost material cost will always be there so both these costs go hand in hand 
cas 6 and cas 7 deals with these two cost uh, cost um, uh, these two costs and very 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 important from an exam standpoint both the cost accounting standards please write in your notebook very 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 important cost accounting standards all right okay first of all let's understand the difference between certain definition certain words which are given in the cost accounting standard now what are reworks reworks are defectives which can be brought up to the standard by putting in additional resources reworks are some things which are damaged some material which are damaged some um, uh, raw material or some uh, finished goods which are damaged but if we want to um, uh, you know rectify them then we just have to employ some additional resources we just have to do something some steps in the uh, in those material and they will be revamped they will be rectified they are known as reworks okay these are also known as defectives which can be reworked then what are rejects rejects are defectives which cannot be reworked which uh, uh, you know have been damaged to an extent that they will never meet quality standards even if I, even if i put in additional resources even if i do something additional then also they will not be meeting the standards so they are known as defectives what are intermediate products intermediate products are products that are uh, that require further processing before it's saleable so these are somewhat known as um, uh, you know the products which are uh, you know work in progress kind of products okay so these products need further processing they are half baked half produced these need further processing before they can be further used scrap is discarded material having no or insignificant value these uh, material have no value or insignificant value that is scrap waste is material lost during production or storage due to various factors such as evaporation we always face this problem of wastage waste means you know some some uh, product gets gets normally lost normally lost means due to evaporation due to leakage or something like that it normally gets lost that is weightage spoilage spoilage doesn't mean the dimensional quality standards in a way that it cannot be rectified economically in an economic manner it cannot be rectified that is spoilage property plant and equipment what is property plant and equipment it is derived from India's guys. The tangible assets which are held for use uh, for production, supply of services, rental to others, administrative and selling distribution purposes are expected to be used during more than one accounting period. So they are for a long term with you. They are known as property, plant and equipment. Okay. Then type of materials are, um, uh, you know, of course, you should read them, but not very, very important. I'm not going to cover them in the marathon because uh, not very important from an exam standpoint. Okay. So an important principle, which is CAS 6 does not deal with packing material cost. Now, very, very important principle. CAS 6 does not deal with packing material cost. Packing material cost is dealt with in cost accounting standard 9. Although cost accounting standard 6 also deals with material, but not packing material. Okay. Packing material is not to be included in cost accounting standard 6. It is to be included in cost accounting standard 9. So if uh, a material is acquired in exchange of another material at cost of material, acquired plus other applicable costs like uh, freight okay so when you acquire some material in exchange for another material so whatever material you acquire like fish is being acquired okay cost of fish plus any other cost like cost of freight or movement of goods from one place to another place that kind of cost is to be added in the uh, you know cost of um, uh, fish and that is the cost of this particular piece okay so exchange of other material value at cost of material cost of material which is acquired cost of material which is acquired that is the first cost and then any other cost like freight etc both should be added to compute the material cost of barter system or exchange of goods system okay then valuation of material receipt whatever material is received by you whatever material has been um, purchased by you how to value it the purchase price including duties and taxes okay very very important whatever uh, price at which you have purchased them including any kind of duties taxes gst any kind of taxes which have you have paid that has to be added freight in words insurance other expenditure other expenditure directly attributable to procurement okay very very important freight inwards is included freight outwards is not included obviously freight outwards is cost of sales freight inwards is cost of material so freight outwards is not included Okay, then self-manufactured material, if you have any self-manufactured material, then guys, cost of direct material, employee cost, expenses, factory overhead, administrative overhead, all these things are to be included in the self-manufactured material cost. Okay, sir, got it. <clears throat> and then types of spares is, is easy, not very difficult. Okay. Then guys, those common principles, which I've already told you that you should remember once and should not repeat them again and again. Common principles, normal loss is to be absorbed in the balanced material. Loss due to shrinkage, evaporation, 
uh, they are normal they should be absorbed then demerit charges or detention charges shall not form part of cost of material they should not be included in cost of material subsidy incentive grant shall be reduced from the cost any kind of subsidy uh, any kind of grant shall be reduced from the uh, material cost okay then finance cost is to be excluded shall not form part of material cost this is a common uh, you know statement some miscellaneous points to, to remember for principles of valuation of uh, inward cost very very important please mark it as very very important okay cost of material is determined as per invoice whatever is the invoice value of the material that is the cost of material okay whatever is the invoice value if supply of material is x works of purchaser there will be no freight cartage charges in the invoice in case inward freight is incurred it shall form part of cost of material preparatory cost very very important guys i'll highlight i'll make you highlight certain important parts preparatory cost if you are preparing your raw material so for example when you prepare wine then before preparing wine the grapes are to be fermented they are to be stored somewhere that is known as preparatory cost cost okay so the cost incurred for bringing the raw material to the place of manufacture and to um, uh, you know get it ready for manufacture that is known as preparatory cost and it is to be included in cost of um, material then handling cost up to works or factory gate whatever is the loading unloading charges any kind of um, uh, charges which are uh, used to bring the uh, material till the factory gate that is to be included incoming inspection is to be included insurance car cost then cost of container if it is um a chargeable then it is to be included cost of container so all these things are to be included normal loss is to be absorbed over the other uh, products abnormal loss is to be excluded it does not form part of cost of material okay these are important material and these are pretty fine okay now guys how to value your material which is issued the material which is issued to the uh, factory line how to value it three methods are there lifo fifo and weighted average okay now lifo is not permitted as per the cost accounting standard as per the accounting standard itself both lifo is not to be used only fifo or weighted average can be used and most of the companies are using weighted average um, uh, as on today okay sir got it valuation of material this is done okay assignment of cost again two bases of assignment of cost it should be done on an economically feasible basis that is uh, one of the most important principles then it should be allocated on the basis of uh, benefits received and cause and effect relationship okay then presentation and disclosure is very very common thing presentation and disclosure okay okay so guys again from a practical standpoint as well as theoretical standpoint an important cost accounting standard practical as well as theory both of them are important cost accounting standard from both perspective they are important okay practice questions okay sir so guys since the practical questions of these cost accounting standards are very straightforward they are only plus minus plus minus plus minus therefore i am not uh, you know dwelling into it in great detail wherever I, i would feel that yes this practical part i need to do in the class that i will definitely do as i have done in my last um, uh, uh, you know classes also cost accounting re report rules and record rules but where i i feel that it's an easy it's just plus minus plus minus then i'll not uh, do those practical questions okay employee cost again the sister cost okay sister cost is the employee cost and uh, whatever employee cost is there that is to be accumulated and it should it should be absorbed to the different cost centers in an economically feasible way okay so agreement employer employee employee in case of contract employee agreement should be employer employee in case of contractors employee employer contractor has the agreement and contractor and employee has the agreement payroll employees on company's payroll contract employees on company's pay payroll contract employee is on contractor's payroll okay number of employees one the company number of employers okay contract employee there are multiple companies so there are multiple employers because one contractor can work for more than one company as well in case of contractors employees there is only one employer which is the contractor relationship with the company permanent relationship is there with the company contract employee temporary relationship and contractors employee term term temporary relationship with the company so this is the distinguishing factor between employee contract employee and contractors employee so primarily you need to understand the two differences contract employee and contractors employee okay contract employee is the employee which you have hired on your roles on the basis of a short term contract and contractors employee who is not hired on your roles but he has been hired on someone else's role and he has been given to you for working that is known as contractors employee 
okay sir got it so these are type of employees which are covered so all the employees are covered under the employee cost cash now the most important part again i've told you guys wherever you see a table please pause and learn or understand that particular part carefully wherever you see a table so classification of employee cost what shall be the classification of employee cost it can be current employee cost or future employee cost it can be current employee cost or future employee cost okay now current employee cost includes salaries wages allowances dns allowance bonus all kind of benefits which are given to the employee currently which are paid to or payable currently and future benefit are the post retirement cost which you will pay to the employee once he retires after his retirement so it is not paid or payable now it is paid and payable at a later point in time okay on the basis of relationship with the cost center direct and indirect employee cost okay then principles of measurement again guys pretty straightforward and repetitive repetitive you need not learn all of them again and again repetitive employee cost would include components of labor as an stated in cas 1 employee cost should be ascertained taking into account gross pay including everything okay in case company to which india supplies remeasurement of cost recognized in other comprehensive income shall not form part of employee cost so guys oci is a concept oci which you will study in your cfr so if any cost is related to oci then that cost is not to be included in employee cost remuneration payable to non executive director shall not form part of employee cost okay if any uh, non executive director are there non executive directors directors which do not perform anything in the company they don't do anything in the company they are non executive directors so those non executive directors are um now the directors which are uh, whose salary is not form part of employee cost employee cost shall not include compensation paid to employees for past period on account of any dispute or court order so if any past um, uh, compensation is given to the employee in the current year then cost shall not include that past compensation provisions of prior period made up in the current period shall not form part of employee cost in the current period so whatever provision are there in the prior period um, uh, which are made in the current period they shall not form part of employee cost so any Uh, prior period expenses shall not form part of employee cost does not include workers hired through contractor does not include imputed cost cost of idle time if it is normal idle time then it is the normal cost added to the cost if it is abnormal idle time then it is charged to costing pnl account and not um, uh, debited to the material cost okay okay so any subsidy grant excluded penalties uh, uh, charges excluded cost of any um, uh, you know perquisite shall be added to the cost of cost of labor then assignment of cost how to assign the cost so the employee cost are not directly traceable to the cost object these may be assigned on a suitable basis a uh, kind of if if the um, uh, you know the employee cost is direct cost then it is directly to be assignable okay if it is not a direct cost if it is not related to a particular kind of cost center then you allocate it on a suitable basis now there are certain costs which are to be um uh, seen specifically okay certain costs which are to be seen specifically recruitment cost or training cost it is treated as overhead it is not added in labor cost okay Tra recruitment and training cost dealt with accordingly so it is treated as overhead which means it is to be treated as indirect expenditure not to be added in direct labor cost this is recruitment training it is to be treated as overheads overtime premium it is treated as uh, labor cost but the cost center due to which overtime has been done it is to be added to that cost center okay so if over over overhead has to has been done in case of um uh, say a product one then the overtime cost shall be added to product one that is the case overtime premium then idle time cost whatever is the idle time cost where you have not done anything uh, and you know there can be some normal idle time also like lunch breaks holidays public holidays so all those are to be included in cost depending upon whether they are normal or abnormal if they are normal then they are to be added to the um uh, to the cost if they are abnormal they are not to be added to the cost then separation cost which means voluntary retirement okay so voluntary retirement means uh, you know the employees either uh, leaving the job or he has been forced to leave the job asked to leave the job or he is leaving the job in case of separation cost separation cost related to voluntary retirement retrenchment termination shall be amortized over the period benefiting from such cost very very important point it is to be amortized over the period benefiting su such cost so whatever time period is this cost uh, being benefited then that is to be amortized over that period now guys in question you might be given this fact that it is benefiting benefiting say next 4 years or 5 years it can be um, said like that so you just divide the entire cost by 4 or 5 and you can amortize over the period of 4 and 5 years that is um, uh, you know the way to uh, 
um, uh, really write this particular answer. If the question is silent about the number of years in which it is to be amortized, then you simply do not add it to the cost. You simply do not add it to the cost. That is very, very important. Okay. Abnormal idle time is charged to costing PNL. Yes, it is to be charged to costing PNL. Okay. Then separation cost. Separation cost. Separation cost again means the uh, due to discontinued operation. Okay, this time the separation cost is to due due to discontinued operation, which means that some part of your organization has been uh, discontinued. What will happen to the separation cost related to that part? Employee cost should be charged to PNL account, so it has to be directly treated to PNL account because that particular part of that particular um, uh, section has been uh, stopped from working, so it will not form part of your cost. Presentation and disclosure again, guys. Presentation and disclosure. Are Similar things which um, uh, you can do yourself. I'm not repeating over here. Okay. Plethora of practical questions which you need to actually do because practical as well as theory, both aspects can come in the examination from this particular chapter. All right. Next cost of utility. So, brother sister CAS is over, brother sister cost accounting standard is over. Now, cost of utility. Okay. What is cost of utility? Cost of utility is just like mango pickle. It can go with anything and everything. It, it, it is comfortable with uh, everything. It can be added on to uh, the main course. It goes with every form of food and shared with relatives, friends, neighbors extensively. These are known as utilities. So what are utilities, guys? Utilities are common things which are used by every cost accounting standard, uh, which are used by every cost center. Okay. So for example, I have HR, I have product A, I have product B, I have product C, multiple departments are there. So every department will use the utilities. Okay. Utilities means water. Or, you know, if you uh, the plant is using some kind of a, uh, oxygen or carbon dioxide, then that oxygen or carbon dioxide for running the plant. Okay. So any kind of thing which is used by everyone for every process, like even, you know, fuel, a thing as simple as fuel, like coal, like um, uh, sort of steam, any kind of fuel, any kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, utility that is to be um, used in any kind of business that is included in cost of utility mango or pickle cost accounting standard just to make you remember this okay so do you remember it and especially the way to remember it is see this is forming an eight this is forming an eight this pickle bottle so this is cost accounting standard eight just a lame way of remembering things guys that's it <laughs> so yes cost of utilities are to be included in the cost of production principle of measurement now, this is uh, the most important thing. Guys, I've told you, table means important. Table means distinguishing factor and important. Table means that there's something different. Power, yes, power is also cost of utility. Yes. So, it says that cost of utility, which is purchased, if you have purchased cost of utility, if you have not uh, generated it yourself, you have purchased it, which means I have purchased electricity. Then cost of purchase, duty is taxable, transportation cost, insurance cost, other expenditure directly attributable to procurement. These are the cost of utility. If it is self-generated, if I have produced my electricity myself, I have produced my steam myself, I produce my water myself, if it's self-generated, then direct material cost, direct employee cost, direct expenses and factory overheads. This is to be added. Now, suppose if utilities are generated and they're distributed within the organization, within different units, inter-unit transfer, inter-unit transfer, then you add all those things which were written over there in the above, uh, you know, uh, column, and you add one more thing, which is distribution cost. Apart from all these things, which are common things, you also add distribution cost. If it is an inter-unit transfer, which means if the uh, material is being transferred from one unit to another unit, if this is an inter-unit transfer, then apart from all these uh, uh, other things, you also add distribution cost to it. Then cost of utility generated for inter-company transfer. If there's an inter-company transfer, which means the uh, the uh, transfer of utility has happened from one group company to another group company. It is all within the same group. Okay. It is all within the same group, but within, uh, from one company to another company, the utilities have been transferred. Then guys, all the above things, which are above additional is distribution cost is to be added. Another thing is share of administrative overheads is also to be added. So two extra things to be added. One share of distribution cost. Number two, share of administrative cost. And if cost of utility, if the utility is generated and sold to an outside party, third party, if it is sold to a third party, outside party, then guys, three things to be added. Distribution cost, share of admin overheads and marketing overheads, plus the margin, apart from these common cost. 
So how to ascertain cost of a particular utility to add it in the costing PL? This is what we have discussed now. And yes, every uh, every aspect has some logic to it. That's why it is being added. Every aspect has some logic to it. Okay, sir, got it. <clears throat> so this was utilities. Principle of measurement largely remains the same, guys. Subset of utility, not required assignment of cost. Assignment cough again, economic physiology is the guiding principle. Presentation disclosure, common points, common points alarm, common points alarm. These are common points, yes. Some practical question and uh, from this particular chapter, practical questions can also come in the examination. But yes, guys, again, straightforward add, 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 add all the expenses. That is the kind of uh, practical questions which come in the examination. Okay, let's move on to our next cost accounting standard. Before we move on to our cost accounting standard, next cost accounting standard, write in the comment section, how's the energy in the house? How's the josh and how's the energy in the house? Are we tired? Are we feeling sleepy? Are we saying no? We need to conquer the upcoming examination of CMA funds. That's why we cannot afford to be sleepy. <clears throat> yes hi sir hi no not feeling sleepy yes good hi sir very hi superb guys superb supreet saluja says hi ajnaz hi good nice okay so next cost accounting standard is cost accounting standard 9, which is packing material cost. Again, not very, very important cost accounting standard, a reasonably um, important cost accounting standard from an exam standpoint. Theoretical part comes in the examination more often. Practical uh, part doesn't come from this particular cost accounting standard because there is no practical uh, part in this cost accounting standard. Okay, packing material cost, as you can see that, you know, these are the uh, normal material which we use for our packing. Packing is an important aspect of our, um, uh, you know, entire process production process so packaging can be of two types primary packaging and secondary packaging primary packaging is the first level of packaging which is done like in case of these blister strips this is pa primary packaging which happens okay this is the primary packaging uh, which is uh, essential to hold the product please underline it is essential to hold the product and bring it to the condition in which it can be used or sold to the customer it keeps contents of the goods fresh and sterile that is the objective of primary packaging cost that it is um, uh, necessary to hold the good and to bring it to the condition which can be used by the customer. Second, uh, in case of primary packaging only there are reusable pack packaging also like these bottles are there which are reused okay. These are reusable bottles okay. Then what are secondary packaging? Secondary packaging are packaging which are uh, there to facilitate loading, unloading, transportation and storage of the goods loading unloading transportation and storage of the goods that is facilitated by secondary packaging like pharmaceutical industry cartons are used to hold the strips of tablets these kind of cartons okay the the purpose of secondary packaging is transportation the purpose of secondary packaging is um uh, is um uh, to make the goods secured and to make it sent to the relevant person in an absolute safe manner i mean we don't uh, want our goods to be uh, leaked. We don't want our goods to be um, punctured or broken in any manner. Just to ensure safety, just to ensure transportation properly. That is the purpose of secondary packaging. Okay. So secondary packaging in case of pharmaceutical industry, textile industry, confectionery industry is um, uh, very, very important. Okay. Now, most important question guys, primary packaging under which cost is it is to be included? It is included in cost, um, the direct material cost. Okay. The direct cost, the cost of production uh, will have this uh, primary packaging and secondary packaging is cost of transportation or cost of sales. It will not be included in cost of production because, you know, in case of primary packaging, production is not possible without primary packaging. However, secondary packaging, it facilitates transportation. Therefore, transportation um, uh, cost, it will be included in cost of transportation is um, the secondary packaging and cost of material or cost of production is primary packaging. That is the differentiating factor. According, accordingly, the uh, the item of cost is also, also being also to be included accordingly. Okay. Okay, sir. Got it. Classification of packing material cost. 
on the basis of source of supply self manufactured or purchased some people manufacture their own packing material some get it supplied from outside agency on the basis of use primary or secondary packaging this is difference between primary and secondary packaging then principles of measurement packaging material again guys box box means unique thing so packaging material cost which is purchased shall include purchase price including duties taxes freight inward insurance other expenditure directly attributable thereto self manufactured if you have manufactured your own packing material then whatever direct material you have used direct employee cost direct expenses or in the cost which is directly attributable to making that uh, packaging cost that is uh, the self manufactured packing cost finance cost directly uh, incurred in connection with the acquisition of packing material again guys common point finance cost not to be included in packaging material cost normal loss to be absorbed in other material loss cost damage or detention charges not to be included in uh, uh, packaging cost subsidy grant to be reduced transportation to be uh, added stand cost normal loss to be absorbed abnormal cost loss to be excluded credit and recoveries to be excluded imported this is <clears throat> not very very important guys uh, these are the imported material cost cost which is related to imported material not very very important assignment in the same manner okay now guys these are common points i mean just understand you know you need just need to learn you know first eight cost accounting standards learn each part of it each hook and corner of it each line of it should be learned first eight cost accounting standards cost accounting standards from nine onwards don't learn it entirely because 70% is the same only 30% is different so don't um, uh, learn it entirely okay best revision classes thank you mr pediwal आरती जैन लिंक में कैश वाली पीडीएफ अरे एवरीथिंग विल बी देयर डोंट वरी डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन कॉस्ट सेलिंग डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन कॉस्ट प्राइमरी पैकेजिंग कॉस्ट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन सेकेंडरी पैकेजिंग कॉस्ट ऑफ सेल्स यस ध्रुव रुस्तगी वेरी गुड आंसर परफेक्ट प्रेजेंटेशन एंड डिस्क्लोजर इज द सेम यस वाह माय फेवरेट मठी मठरी दिस इज द डायरेक्ट एक्सपेंसिस कॉस्ट अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड टेन and direct expenses cost accounting standard 10 is represented by mathri if we all eat mathri okay we enjoy mathri with aam ka char pickle pickle was utilities so you know utilities and direct expenses go hand in hand utilities and direct expenses go hand in hand and that is why i have connected both of them so direct expenses deep fried salted cookies maybe sumptuous alternative to go with pickle <laughs> so guys I have linked all these cost accounting standards in a way that you will be able to remember all of them at one go. That is how I have linked them. Okay, so mnemonics have been developed so that you remember them according to the cash numbers also because it's important to learn the cash numbers also. It's important to learn the exact name of the cost accounting standard also. And with that objective, I have linked all the cost accounting standards. Okay, sir, this is the direct expenses and guys, direct expenses means expenses which is directly relatable to production. Which can be said that okay, this expenses, this direct expenses attributable to this particular product or this particular cost center. That is direct expenses. That is the uh, objective. Okay, principle of measurement, identification of direct expenses. So, direct expenses can be identified on the basis of traceability in an economically feasible manner. Which means that in which um, uh, you know cost costing cent cost center the Direct expenses is to be attributable. That is to be traced in an economically feasible manner. We need to know where is it directly attributable. That is the um, uh, traceability. Okay. Now, direct expenses incurred for the use of bought out, bought out resources. When direct expenses in is incurred, uh, you know, from bought out resources, which means we have purchased the direct expenses. Then whatever cost has been incurred, that is the cost of direct expenses. Wherever we have cost of um, uh, in house direct expenses. Which we have developed in house, then cost determined on the basis of amount incurred in connection therewith. Whatever amount we have incurred for those cost, uh, those direct expenses, that is to be added. Okay, R and D expense, direct expenses, royalty, finance charges to be excluded, direct expenses, uh, abnormal, normal, subsidy, grant, incentive, penalty, damages. I see, seventy percent of the cost accounting standard is the same. Seventy percent, seventy percent. Please see and appreciate and understand. how less do you need to work you need to work really less okay you need to you need not work a lot you need to work really less <laughs> you need to work really less okay let's jump on to our next cost accounting standard which is administrative overhead 
and the abbreviation is police cost accounting standard it protects you administrative overhead protects you police cost accounting standard or the police cost accounting standard uh, this is our policemen and administration held the fort as first line of defense and war against corona so during corona time our administrative warriors people who uh, were standing tall were policemen and that is the uh, linkage which i have done in this particular cost accounting standard administrative overhead so now i am starting the corona uh, cost accounting standards <laughs> yes these are known as corona cost accounting standards okay first one is administrative which is related to uh, you know administration expenses what is administration what is administration first of all we need to really understand the definition two words very very important which i have also bold and underlined over here general management and administration so word which is important is general management if there is general management of any organization if there is any general management which is there in the organization then general management is related to administrative overhead and administration is administrative overhead it should ex exclude production overhead marketing overhead finance cost etc etc so general management is the administrative overhead now very very important if the administrative uh, expenses are performed in house if they are performed in house then aggregate of cost of resources consumed in the activities relating to general management administrative organization it usually represents cost of shared services cost of infrastructure general management cost administrative overhead comprise items like employee cost utilities etc then administrative services procured from outside if it is procured from outside then whatever cost has been incurred for procuring these uh, administrative overhead their invoice value is the cost of administrative overhead straightforward principle guys okay treatment of software software treatment is okay not very very important treatment of leases now guys there are small small points you know which you should uh, read not very very important okay from an exam standpoint uh, treatment of lease treatment of software etc etc then leases are of two types again credit recoveries fine penalties credit recovery is to be reduced any change in cost accounting principle is to be done only when it is required by law then assignment of cost it is to be traced in a economically feasible manner again cause and effect relationship is important and benefits received is important benefits received is important these are two guiding principles for assignment of cost assignment means we are allocating the cost to the relevant cost centers to the relevant um, uh, you know cost objects that is the assignment of cost presentation and disclosure is there over here okay so yes again not a very very um, uh, you know uh, important cost accounting standard cost accounting standard 11 not many questions have been asked from cost accounting standard 11 in past um, uh, papers okay so yes guys that's all for today's session because this particular cost accounting standard is very very important so i don't want to start it now when your energies are little low you are little tired so Yes, that's all. CAS eleven till CAS eleven, we have finished today. Tomorrow we are going to finish all the cost accounting standard from twelve to twenty four, and then we'll be moving ahead in our marathon lectures. Okay. So yes, that's all for today's session, guys. Um, please comment in the comment section if you liked this particular session, and if you want some details of the session, if you want, um, uh, you know, to to know anything about uh, these particular video lectures or the notes which are there or anything you can just feel free to ping on the numbers which are given in the um, uh, ticker below you can uh, log on to the website cscmnikhilgupta.com that is also um, uh, you know that can also be done so yes that's all for today's session guys quickly i have uh, made you revise certain cost accounting standards and i have highlighted i have made you highlight those important parts of the cost accounting standards which are important from an exam standpoint so yes That's all for today's session. We'll be meeting in our subsequent session. Till that time, all the very best and happy studying. Bye bye. See you in the next session. Today we are going to start um, an important um, uh, cost accounting standard, which is cost accounting standard on repairs and maintenance. Cost accounting standard twelve is on repairs and maintenance. And yes, repairs and maintenance um, uh, means any um, uh, any kind of uh, wear and tear which happens in the machinery. if that wear and tear is actually uh, rectified is actually amended that is known as repair and maintenance whenever a uh, wear and tear the the uh, you know the asset is rectified or it is um, uh, you know repaired which means it is mended then repair and maintenance expenditure occurs so before even i start this particular topic guys i want to ask you a question i'll give you a practical uh, scenario and i'll ask you about Whether it's repair maintenance or not, okay. 
So I'll give you an example. I've not even taught repair maintenance cost accounting standard as yet. Before even teaching cost accounting standard, I am going to ask you certain question. Let's see who's going to answer this question. Yes, sir. All right, let's see. So guys, I have a machinery. I have a machinery worth rupees one crore. Okay. What I did was I incurred certain expenses on that machinery. I incurred expenses on two occasions. I incurred certain expenses on two occasions. Okay. Obviously to re repair, maintain the machinery to, um, uh, you know, to just um, uh, mend it. Now on one occasion, I spent about 10 lakh rupees to repair that machinery. And on second occasion, I only spent 50,000 rupees to uh, you know, repair that machinery to amend that machinery to um, do certain necessary wear and tear um, rectification of that machinery. Okay. Now you need to tell me out of these two expenditure, let us call this expenditure as A, this one as B. You need to tell me which one is repair and maintenance and which one should I add in the cost of that particular asset. So you have two options. One, capitalize the cost. Number two, Put it in repair maintenance and put it in PNL account. Now you need to tell me whether from A and B options, which one would you like to capitalize in the assets value? Which one do you want to write off in the profit and loss account? Please answer in the chat box. That's my question. Abhishek says he's been sick since morning. So Abhishek, this will happen now. Some roadblocks will come in your way. Some um, obstacles will come in your way now your health might suffer your you know anything might suffer but this is the test which government is giving you to ensure that you deserve those three alphabets which are called cma before your name this is the test this is the testing time if you qualify this test then the future is yours the degree is yours if you do not qualify the test then you are actually uh, at a loss yes all right answers are here B, Chenna Keshava says B, repair maintenance. Joshika says 10 lakhs to be capitalized. Neeti Patak says 50,000. Supreet says 10 lakhs to be capitalized. A is repair, Ankita says. Supreet says 50,000 right off. MN King says both. Both what? Both. Ashutosh says A, capitalize. B will be PNL account. Ajna says capitalize. What capitalize, Anaj? Ajna's? Sundareshan says 10 lakh capitalize as it is substantial. It depends upon usage of that part. B is the answer. Both capital. MN King says both capital. Ankita says B is repairs. Ankita says B is repairs. Huh. Any other answers, guys? Because as of now, all the answers are incorrect. All the answers are incorrect. The answers which I have received till now, all of them are incorrect. Any other answers which anyone else wants to give? My simple question is, which expenditure to be capitalized, which expenditure to be put in repair and maintenance? That is my question. Kushal Sahu says he is in CMA Foundation. Okay, Kushal Sahu, all the very best for your CMA Foundation examination. And yes, do come in intermediate and final. And yes, let's rock CMA intermediate and final together. Any other answer? Please repeat the question once again. The question is machinery which uh, I have in my factory is worth one crores. I spend some expenses on repairing that machinery or maintaining some machinery. 10 lakh rupees is spent on first occasion, which I call it as A. 50,000 rupees spent on second occasion, which I call as B. You need to tell me which one out of these is capital expenditure, which one is repair and maintenance and to be put in profit loss. Because we are going to start the cash on repair and maintenance. That's why this question I'm asking you. Any other answer? Okay. So guys, let me tell you, should I disclose the answer or is anyone else giving the answer again? Niti Patak says 10 lakh capital expenditure. Incorrect answer. Incorrect answer. Okay. So guys, 
Always while deciding whether an expenditure is repair and maintenance or not, or whether it should be capitalized or not, please remember amount is not relevant. Amount is not relevant. Even a 50,000 rupees worth of expenditure can be capital. Even 10 lakh rupees worth of expenditure can be repair and maintenance. So, principle number one amount is irrelevant. Amount is not relevant at all. Amount is not to be. Um, uh, to be the relevant criteria. So amount, if you see the amount and say 10 lakh is huge and that is why it should be capitalized. Wrong analysis. If you tell me 50,000 is very less as compared to the cost of the machinery, therefore repair and maintenance. Wrong analysis, guys. Wrong analysis. The correct analysis is if an expenditure increases the estimated useful life of the asset or or it increases the productivity or efficiency of the asset. It increases the productivity or efficiency of the pro, uh, asset. If either these two conditions, either one of these two conditions is satisfied, then that expenditure ter is termed as capital expenditure. So to term any expenditure as capital expenditure or property, plant and equipment, PPE, you need to fulfill any of these two conditions, which are the expenditure has resulted into increase of estimated useful life of that particular asset. Or the expenditure has resulted into increases increase in the productivity or efficiency of the asset or both of them. If these conditions are met only, then I will say that productive the uh, expenditure should be capital in nature. Amount is irrelevant. Only the amount is irrelevant. That is the first principle that I'm going to give you today. So I have not given you the inf enough information that can actually decide whether these expenditure are capital or revenue. I've not given you enough, uh, you know, uh, enough um, uh, material, enough facts in this particular case. And now I'm going to give you enough fact of the case. Okay. What are the facts of the case? Please listen to the fact of the case very, very carefully. After incurring this 50,000 expenditure, the machinery which used to produce 10,000 units, so the machinery um, uh, used to produce 10,000 units, it started manufacturing 12,000 units. The machinery was originally producing 10,000 units. After doing this 50,000 rupees of expenditure, it started producing 12,000 units of uh, finished goods. So tell me, is productivity increasing? Yes. Is efficiency increasing? Yes. So will 50,000 be capital or revenue? It will be capital expenditure and not repairs and maintenance. And not repairs and maintenance. Now, my next um, example. Rupees 10 lakh was spent on this machinery. Okay. This machinery was originally producing 10,000 units. But sub subsequently, due to passage of time and due to overuse of machinery, we were using machinery a lot. Its efficiency got reduced to 8,000. Okay. Its efficiency got reduced to 8,000. And after incurring this 10 lakh rupees, the efficiency was restored to 10,000. From 8,000, it was restored to the original efficiency, which is 10,000. Guys, in this case, Neither the efficiency is being increased nor the estimated useful life is being increased. Now you will say, sir, efficiency is being, being increased. No, 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 no. Efficiency is not being increased. Efficiency is just being restored to the previous level or restored to the original level. And therefore, this 10 lakh rupees is an expenditure of repair and maintenance. So what is repair and maintenance? Repair and maintenance is any expenditure. Any expenditure that will restore my machinery to the original position which it was there earlier when I purchased it. That is known as repairs and maintenance. So always guys, do not get confused by the amount. If the amount is huge, sir, then you know, the uh, it is capital expenditure. No, 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 nothing like that. If the amount is huge, then it is going to be capital expenditure. Nothing like that. Even if the amount is small, then also it can be a capital expenditure depending upon what purpose is this particular um, expenditure solving. So this is the fundamental of our 
cost accounting standard which is repairs and maintenance cost accounting standard and i have given it a mnemonic which is a mnemonic which says that you know it is a doctor nurse uh, cost accounting standards because doctors and nurses are responsible for uh, rectifying patients similarly repair and maintenance is uh, responsible for rectifying the machinery rectifying the machinery therefore repair and maintenance expenditure has been equated with doctor and nurse gas guys just a way to make you remember all the cost accounting standards okay if you just uh, learn the cost accounting standards using these names then you will be able to remember them with their numbers that is the only um uh, you know uh, benefit yash mungale okay yash great yash thank you for such beautiful comments efficiency here refers to original efficiency at the time of purchase of asset very good abhishek kumar sharma very good yes efficiency refers to the original efficiency so repair maintenance is an expenditure which is incurred uh, look at the definition the cost of all activities which have the objective of maintaining or restoring please underline this word restoring in the definition of repair maintenance very very important an asset or equipment to a state in which it can perform its required function at the intended capacity and efficiency to restore back the asset that is repair and maintenance that is the most important line over here okay okay sir perfect one diy let's see who's gonna do it okay please do it fast diy adarsh private limited manufactures steel billets through an imported machinery which was bought two years back the machinery was um uh, uh, reaping an output of 10000 units when it was purchased after two years of continuous use the output declined to 8000 units owing to normal wear and tear during usage hence during third year an expense of 1 lakh rupees was incurred on replacing an old part in the machinery which restored the machinery to its original output of 10000 units further during fourth year the company spent another 2 lakhs for repairing the machinery the time the time the engineer suggested replacement of critical parts which could enhance the capacity to 14000 units so in the second repairs the enhancement of efficiency happened suggest uh, which expenditure to be treated as repair and maintenance please tell me whether 1 lakh rupees is to be treated as repair and maintenance or whether 2 lakh rupees is to be uh, uh, treated as repair and maintenance you have two options 1 lakh rupees or 2 lakh rupees <clears throat> which one is repair and maintenance please read it carefully and answer the question which one should be treated as repairs and maintenance perfect perfect very good answer guys first is repair and maintenance very good 1 lakh is repair and maintenance absolutely you got it right yes this is what i was trying to explain you amount is irrelevant guys don't ever look at the amount 1 lakh 2 lakh 10 lakh 12 lakh don't look at the amount ever the important criteria is useful life perfect perfect guys let's move on okay so it also includes so repair maintenance also includes plant maintenance breakdown maintenance repair or overhaul of an asset which results in restoration of asset to its intended or original condition is known as repair maintenance activity a oh, major overhaul is a periodic generally more than one year repair work carried out to substantially restore the asset to its intended working condition so major overhaul means you spend huge expenditure once in a while to uh, restore the asset to its original condition again repair and maintenance and not uh, not capitalization okay classification of repair and maintenance cost preventive or routine or planned maintenance so how do we classify repair and maintenance what are the kind of repair and maintenance which are there okay number one routine preventive planned maintenance corrective maintenance total productive maintenance breakdown maintenance okay there are four types of maintenance preventive or routine or planned means before any adverse situation happens then if we maintain the plant then it is known as preventive second is corrective corrective means you know if if uh, some lacuna has happened in the machine some small problem has happened in the machinery after that if we maintain that's corrective maintenance total productive maintenance is that you know on an annual basis you completely overhaul all the machine all the equipment which are there in your um, uh, factory so that they work in the efficient manner that is total productive and breakdown means where there is a major um, uh, you know obstacle or there is a complete halt of plant machinery that is known as breakdown maintenance so these are kind of maintenance okay workshop types are not very very good okay now very very important point guys 
whatever is given in the table is important okay that is the principle which you are following for all the cost accounting standards especially uh, to those students who are studying it from my book if you are studying from my book wherever you see a table in the cost accounting standards after cost accounting standard 10 you should automatically understand that this is an important part okay and past examination questions will also um uh, uh, you know uh, suggest this so cost of in house repair maintenance if you are having a in house repair maintenance department which is an engineering department which does your uh, uh, repair maintenance in house so cost of in house repair maintenance activities cost of material spares manpower equipment utility any other resource which is utilized in such activity so obviously guys if you have in house repair maintenance department that means you have employed your own employees you are giving them salary material is also used spares is also used utility is also used so whatever expenditure attributable to, to such activity is there that should be accumulated to um uh, you know uh, find this particular cost cost of in house repair and maintenance activities now cost of repair maintenance activity carried out by outside contractors now what will happen if you know i don't have an in house repair and maintenance department i hire a contractor ask him to take the machinery at his premises rectify it and give it to back to me although i will always prefer that he comes to my premises rectify my machinery and goes back okay i always will prefer this but still if he insists then no 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 this machinery has to be taken to my premises so if he takes that machinery to his premises and then if repair maintenance happens then guys what kind of cost is to be ascertained okay outside contractors inside the entity so first option is when the outside contractor is coming inside the entity second uh, uh, option is when the outside uh, contractor is taking the machinery at his premises okay so once when uh, it is in our premises only then charges payable to the contractor then cost of material consumable spare manpower equipment all the things if it is in our premises then guys all these things will be um, uh, utilized as per our um, uh, you know uh, uh, our expenditure will be incurred additional to the charges which is payable to the contractor because whatever else is required in rectifying that particular machinery uh, the contractor will ask from us if the machinery is at our premises if the machinery is at the contractor's premises if the machinery is at the contractor's premises then guys invoice or agreed price whatever co contractor will take from us and even the travel cost of the contractor um a technician or anything that will be taken from us okay in this case no cost of material will be incurred by us because everything will be provided by the contractor because the machinery is at the contractor's premises so no additional cost like lock, like um, uh, you know cost of material or utility like it was there over here manpower utility no such additional cost is there only the invoice which is raised by the <coughs> by the contractor will be there for us okay so this is the uh, principle which we can say is there okay now an important point guys um now which we have just studied cost of spares replaced which do not enhance future economic benefit from the existing asset beyond its previously assessed standard of performance shall be included in repair and maintenance cost so guys there are certain spares uh, certain additional things which are there certain spares are there which do not enhance the cost of the asset if they do not enhance the cost of the asset then of course those spares cannot be um are treated as capital they have to be treated as repair and maintenance so any spare which do not enhance the performance of the asset beyond its uh, initial initial um, established standards then it will be not be treated as uh, capital expenditure it will be treated as repair and maintenance high value spares when replaced by a new spare now this is important guys there are certain high value spares um uh, you know high value spares means which are very expensive spares where even one spare uh, accounts for about 60% or 70% of the value of the entire asset okay so high value spares when replaced by a new spare and is reconditioned shall be recognized as ppe when they meet the definition of ppe and depreciated accordingly so the high value spares are to be treated as ppe which is property plant and equipment only when they meet the criteria of ppe and criteria of ppe is that this particular asset is going to um, uh, you know uh, uh, reap us benefit for a longer period of time So that is the principle okay okay sir this is easy and then guys comes the generic part okay generic part means all these are repetitive um uh, you know provisions which are repeated again and again any subsidy grants to be reduced abnormal cost should to, should be should be reviewed reduced credit recovery should be reduced cost of major overhaul shall be amortized finance cost should be reduced all these are generic parts 
now guys do remember that once you have studied these general general um, provisions in one cost accounting standard they will be same for all the cost accounting standards therefore it's very very easy to actually um now revise all the cost accounting standards in one go because especially from cost accounting standard 10 to 24 only few parts are different rest all the parts are the same and the different parts i have given in a tabular form in my book so you'll be able to really understand it okay Niti Patak is asking, what is F-Y-K-G-N in your notes? So Niti Patak, F-Y-K means for your knowledge. So always while, while teaching cost audit and BVM SPM, I follow this practice that I don't only teach from a, uh, a standpoint of um, uh, you know examination, qualifying the examination, but I also give students certain practical insights into every topic. Now, since for marathon purposes, those practical insights are not relevant. They are relevant for your practical future career. Since for marathon purposes, they are not relevant because they won't come in the examination. Therefore, I'm not discussing them over here. So FYK means for your knowledge only. For your knowledge means it is just for your knowledge that you should know it. And guide GN means guidance notes. So they are guidance notes which have been released by the institute. According to those guidance notes, these um, the concepts are displayed. Okay, next is cost of service cost center. What is cost of service cost center? Sir, can you explain high value spare ones? Yes, high value spare means a spare uh, which is uh, taken as a spare, which is kept as a spare and it is replaced when the original or old spare is worn off, is it torn off, is actually not working properly and is reconditioned. The old spare is reconditioned and the new spare is put in the machinery for the time being so that the work is not halted. Now, the question is that high value spare is treated as capital expenditure or is treated as part of fixed asset only when it meets the criteria of PPE, property, plant and equipment. So if it is giving you benefit for more than one year, then that high value spare is to be capitalized. Otherwise, it is to be treated as revenue in nature. That is the um, uh, concept. Okay. Now, next cost of service cost center. Guys, there are service cost centers which are there. Okay. These are support staff of any organization like uh, production is the production uh, center. Okay. These are, these are the main centers, production centers, revenue centers are there, production centers. Cost centers are uh, service cost centers are service co cost centers like um, uh, you know uh, HR department, finance department, tool engineering and tools department. All these are service cost centers who support the original manufacturing department, which support the original manufacturing department. They are not the manufacturing department. They just support the manufacturing department. That is known as service cost center. Okay, so service cost center, the cost of service cost center um, uh, is what we are going to study in this cost accounting standard 13. What mnemonic have we, um, uh, you know, placed on it? It is the essential services. During Corona, there were essential services which are permitted to travel from one place to another place like doctor, engine, uh, doctor, uh, medical staff, police staff, um, uh, blood donation camps, etc, etc. So, these service cost centers are also like those essential services which are required by every organization under any circumstance. No organization can survive without a finance department. No organization can survive without an HR department. Now the question is these are common departments. When these are common departments, then their cost is to be apportioned over the main manufacturing or the main uh, cost centers. And how is it done? That is enumerated in this particular cost accounting standard. Okay. So support service cost center. These are the centers which are auxiliary service center. Please underline this word auxiliary services. Auxiliary services means secondary services or supportive services that are known as auxiliary services. So these are cost centers which provide auxiliary services. Now principle of measurement. Again, the most important part is the part in the box. How do you measure your service cost center cost because first you have to measure then only can you apportion you cannot apportion before measuring so first you need to measure the uh, uh, you know cost of service cost center and then you will apportion it over the different cost centers which are the revenue cost centers okay so how do you calculate the cost of service cost center that is the question which you are going to delve in now okay <clears throat> so cost of in house service cost center if you have in-house service cost center, so guys, HR department, some people have in-house HR department and some outsource their work to outside agencies. Both is possible. So we are discussing about in-house services. When HR department is um, uh, our own department, which is there in our organization. In that case, material consumed, consumable stores and spares, manpower engaged, equipment usage, um, utility consumed, all the expenditure, which is directly 
allocable or directly related to the service cost center all those expenditure will be added to form the cost of in-house uh, services then cost cost of services rendered by the contractors within the facility of the entity so there's an outside contractor which is coming inside the entity which is coming inside the uh, in the inside the organization and giving us services of say hr or finance or anything okay then the charges payable to the contractor and whatever material consumable stores where he uses in the in our premises in our premises that is known as the cost of service okay next is cost of service rendered by contractors at their premises at their premises what if contractor doesn't come to our premises it um, uh, you know it provides services from their premises so guys there's a fashion which is going on right now in corporate world which is that you know the finance department is always outsourced so there's an external agency um, uh, which is there uh, with the finance department and that finance department is always um, uh, using that particular finance department is outsourced and some other party is doing finance for our company that happens a lot happens a lot okay so in case the contractor is giving services from their premises to us then the invoice which is chargeable by the contractor whatever contract has charged uh, from us then any other expenditure which is attributable to the expenditure and this cost shall also include cost of resources provided to the contractor so everything which we have incurred for purchasing these uh, services that will be added to form my cost of services then cost of services for the purpose of inter unit transfer if you are doing an inter unit transfer which means there's a company company a it has two units unit x and unit y okay company a has two units Com unit x company a has two units unit x and unit y now if x has a service cost center say hr department and uh, uh, you know that hr department is exclusively working for x now x can provide those services to y also saying that okay why why you need not have a different um, uh, hr department i will share my hr department with you sharing is possible within the unit similarly any other service cost center like finance okay like any other tools tools engineering tools there's a room which maintains tools which are required in the organization so any kind of service cost center if it is um, uh, you know services are transferred from one unit to another unit of the same company then there's only one additional thing which is to be added which is the distribution cost guys it is very similar to what we had seen yesterday okay so all the things which are there they are obviously their material labor equipment utilities other resources they are there one additional thing is distribution cost whatever is the distribution cost of that particular utility that will be added while computing the cost next is cost of services for the purpose of intercompany transfer intercompany transfer means within same group there are two companies company a and company b okay Company A has an HR department. Company A tells company B, oh, look, company B, I already have a HR department. Why do you want to have a different HR department and higher additional cost? Don't do it. You take services from my HR department only and it will serve you for company B also. So this kind of an arrangement is there that, you know, you are sharing your service cost centers. One company is sharing their service cost centers with other. Then two additional costs are added. One is distribution cost, which is already included above, plus administrative overheads. Two additional cost to be added then in case uh the services are rendered to any third party that is outside party in that case guys marketing overheads are also added apart from distribution and administrative overheads that is how the addition in cost happens in case of these three uh, uh areas okay okay guys this is a very very plus minus plus minus kind of question okay now we come on to the generic part generic part which is the same guys like finance cost is to be excluded while computing the cost imputed cost shall not be included uh, when the cost of service cost center is accounted at standard cost price and usage variance shall be as price of cost of services usage variance due to abnormal reason shall be as part of abnormal cost so if price variance is there price variance uh, whether it's uh, you know uh, abnormal or normal it is to be uh, treated as cost but usage variance where it is normal it is to be treated as cost where it is abnormal it is to be treated in costing pnl account okay subsidy and grant to be reduced okay uh cost of standby service uh, ut utilities committed cost easy easy penalty damages done credit recoveries any change in cost accounting standard done assignment and presentation okay so guys all these things are very very common and quite simple okay
so now you understand why i told you in the beginning of the lecture in the beginning of the lecture of cost accounting standard i told you that don't worry about the number of cost accounting standards don't worry about that just see 70% of all the cost accounting standards are absolutely the same only 30% is different so when this is the case then how do you say that cost accounting standards are too lengthy sir we get bored of doing cost accounting standards there are so many there are 24 what makes you think that what makes you think that it is not 24 it is much less than 24 because 70% of the provisions are the same okay next is pollution control cost accounting standard again this is one thing which corona has curtailed or corona has controlled that is pollution so pollution is cas 14 and corona has curtailed this pollution corona uh, you know during corona times pollution levels were extremely low and they were very very soothing they were very, very pleasant so pollution control cost is uh, the control the corona control one thing which came under control during corona is pollution now again guys in pollution control cost <clears throat> you know there are these definitions which you should read air pollutant air pollution it will remind you of you of your civics class during your ninth uh, standard okay civics class so pollution control cost um, definition soil control uh, definition and the important part is this yes box again guys box again what box very very important please uh, underline or highlight that it's very very important over here to learn all these types of pollution control cost and their treatment in uh, uh, cost sheet that is what we are going to analyze now what are these kind of pollution control costs and what are their treatment in the um, uh, in the cost sheet that is the question that we are now answering okay Interunit intercompany outsider same as cas 8 yes absolutely same as cas 8 ditto same utilities ditto same okay now please understand these costs guys these are very very important cost pollution control cost may be of different types okay uh, there are certain costs which are related to future as well what is the treatment of those costs this is what we are going to discuss now okay number one future remediation or disposal cost now there are certain pollution costs which have not been incurred during the current period it will be incurred during the future period okay and in the future period it is very very sure that is going to happen so for example if you are um, producing some hazardous waste and that hazardous waste is to be um, treated before it is thrown in the river or thrown in the garbage it is to be treated you tell your your people that you know um, uh, i will treat it once in five years why to treat it every year so you have scrap you are just having a scrap uh, dumping ground and you're dumping your sca scrap over there okay and you tell government of india look government of india yes i am going to treat it before flowing it in river but i'm going to treat it together um, for next five years i'm not going to treat it every year so i'll ac accumulate it pile it up during next five years and then i will treat it together this is known as future remediation cost today there is no pollution control cost there is no treatment which you are doing to this hazardous chemical today there is no cost that you are incurring but in future there is a guarantee there is a surety that you will incur this kind of an expenditure there's absolutely surety after five years whatever tons of wastage has been um, uh, has been accumulated you will definitely treat it you will definitely um, uh, uh, you know uh, incur expenses to make it clean and then you will uh, throw it in uh, the water or wherever okay this is known as future remediation means rectification or disposal cost now the question is in the cost is going to be incurred in future 5 lakh rupees is going to be incurred in future should i do anything about it today in my cost sheet that is the question please understand the question if you are with me just write yes in the chat box are you guys with me or have you slept because now i'm doing very very important part of our cost accounting standards guys very important parts these are very very important part see a question is going to come from these parts um now you know they have been repeated in past also they will be repeated in future also are you with me yes you are great awesome and jishka says yes keshava says yes good good guys good all right 
So this is future remediation cost. The question is, uh, the cost is going to incur be incurred after five years. Should I do anything about it today? Because today I have not incurred any cost. This is a future uh, pollution control cost. Should I do anything about it today? Answer is yes. You should recognize this um, uh, repair maintenance cost on a pro rata basis, on a proportional basis in your cost sheet today. So you know that you will be able to. You will be incurring five lakh rupees after five years, and it'll be accumulation of five years scrap. So you should recognize one lakh rupees as pollution control cost. You should make a provision for it. Undoubtedly, you have not paid it, but you will make a provision for it and put it in your books of accounts. So cost shall be estimated. The first step is you estimate the cost. What is the total cost? I've estimated five lakh rupees will be the cost, and accounted based on the quantum of pollution generated in each period. So whatever is the quantum of uh, pollution which is generated in the each period, according to that pro, pro rata basis, you will recognize this cost in the. Uh, you will recognize the future remediation cost or disposal cost. You will recognize in your cost sheet. Next, contingent future remediation cost. Again, next part is future remediation cost, but there is one more word added to it: contingent future remediation cost. Very, very interesting concept. Very, very important concept. Okay. Yes, this cost is also future cost. It has not been incurred today. It will be incurred in future, but. it will depend on some contingency on some event which is likely to happen in future the event has not taken place now event will take place in future it so this particular uh, cost will depend on the contingency or an event which will happen in future so although this is a future remediation cost but dependent on a event which will happen in future so as in this case we will not recognize even a single rupee today because it is not ascertained it is not certain whether that event will happen or not it is not certain so over here we do not we shall not treat it as cost unless the incidence of such cost is reasonably certain once incidents happen once contingency takes place once con once contingency happen then we will recognize this cost in our uh, cost sheet but before the contingency happen we will not treat it as cost in our cost sheet that is the guiding principle okay sir got it next is cost of in house pollution control uh, activity so some uh, organizations have in house pollution control um, departments who take care of this fact that you know any hazardous material which is produced as a waste it should not be drained in water without treatment this is known as in house pollution control activity so if you have in house pollution control activity then of course the cost will include material labor consumable spare utility any other expenditure and if this pollution control cost is carried out by outside contractors inside the entity if this pollution control cost is carried out by outside uh, contractors inside the entity so outside contractor is coming inside the entity and then this pollution control cost is being um, incurred then charges payable to the contractor and cost of material consumable manpower equipment utilities guys ditto same ditto same as repair maintenance cost and as utilities cost ditto same there's no difference in it and you tell me that cost accounting standards are very lengthy sir we are not able to remember them they are so lengthy you tell me this where is the length where is the length there is no length it's all repetitive it's all logical pollution control cost jobs carried out by contractor at his premises contractor is taking um, uh, our our waste at his premises he is treating them there okay then it shall be invoice or agreed price or other expenditure directly attributable there to whatever is attributable to those um uh, you know expenditure that will be added over here now some kind of uh, common points each type of pollution control cost shall be treated as distinct activity so if you have uh, air pollution if you have uh, air pollution control activity if you have water pollution control activity each activity should have each head each subset head okay then finance cost not included imputed cost not included price variances to be treated usage variance and uh, price variance subsidy grant not included abnormal if if pollution control cost resulting from abnormal situations not to be included in cost finance penalties uh, uh, damages not to be included credit recoveries to be reduced research and development uh, to be taken into account change accounting policy assignment and presentation perfect so guys this is how you need to revise your cost accounting standards this quickly this should be speed before your examination also this should be the speed of revising your cost accounting standards because speed is of paramount importance you need to really um uh, you know buck up with respect to your speed okay next one is 
selling and distribution overhead and this is one thing which again got controlled during corona second thing which is got controlled under corona was selling and distribution people were not selling anything distribution channels were blocked okay so selling and distribution cost okay these are general def definitions guys again the different part okay the different part the different part is selling and distribution incurred in house if you have in in house selling and distribution department in house then it is cost of resources which are con consumed to provide the selling and distribution activities post sale cost such as warranty cost product liability cost after sale services shall be estimated selling and distribution overhead procure from outside party if you have hired someone to do your selling and marketing then guys what will be the cost cost of resources procured from outside at the invoice or agreed price whatever invoice he has raised on you and you have made the payment out to the contractor for doing your sales that is the total amount of cost selling distribution overheads selling distribution overheads are the benefits of which are expected to be derived over a longer period of time shall be amortized on a rational basis so if there are overheads overheads means indirect expenses if there are indirect expenses which are uh, relating to um, uh, you know future distribution efforts then it has to be amortized over a rational basis then cost of after sales services after sales services provided in terms of sales agreement for a class of transaction shall be determined on rational and scientific basis net of recovery okay then again does not include imprudent cost subsidy to be reduced abnormal cost to be uh, excluded demurrage and detention charges to be excluded credit recoveries any change then again guys presentation disclosure etc yes 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 sir now let's come on to cost accounting standard 16 in house means so lavanya asks what is in house so in house means that i have some resources or a department which is inside my factory which is inside my company which is doing the repair and maintenance activity or which is doing the selling and distribution activity that is known as in house in house means i'm not asking anyone from outside a third party to do repair and maintenance of my machinery I have my own engineers who are there on my roles. They understand the machinery and they, they do repair and maintenance. <clears throat> that is known as in-house repair and maintenance department or in-house selling and distribution department. That is the meaning of word in-house. Okay, Lavanya. Okay. Next one is depreciation and amortization. Now, guys, um, yesterday we had discussed depreciation and we have also discussed when should the depreciation be eligible to be levied. Okay. Put to use is not the relevant factor. Relevant factor is ready to use or available for use as per the intention of the management. And I hope you remember the example given by me with respect to the uh, depreciation, which was the opinion which was given by us. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so these are normal definitions, guys. Definitions, I'm not going to do what is amortization, what is depreciation, what is useful life. All these definitions are very, very, very simple and you are well versed with these definitions for sure. Okay. Now, yes, the principles of measurement. Principles of measurement means uh, how to um, uh, value depreciation, how to compute the depreciation. To be measured on the basis of depreciable amount and the useful life. So two things are to be taken into consideration. The depreciable amount, which means the book value and the useful life for how long will this asset be there in our organization then in case of regulated industry regulated industry means uh, where government has got strict re regulations with respect to the length up to which this work can be carried out or this factory can be run okay so the amount of depreciation shall be the same as prescribed by concerned regulator concerned regulator will also tell the amount of depreciation now depreciation of an asset begins when it is available for use and it ends it ceases depreciation ceases at the earlier of the following, the date the asset is classified as held for disposal. The asset is no more usable. We are going to sell it in future. It is held for disposal. And the date when the asset is de-recognized, the date when this asset is actually uh, you know, sold and is removed from the fixed asset register or the books of accounts. That is the uh, period when the depreciation should be ended. Vivek Lambate says regulated sector insurance claim. Yes, insurance claim is a regulated sector for sure. So in case of regulated sector, the depreciation rates to be used by these companies, which are insurance companies, which are banking companies, is also de decided by the relevant act under, we under which these organizations are established. Yes, that is the regulated sector. Okay, sir.
then acid which is used only when need arises but always held ready for use like fire extinguishers standby generators safety equipment so guys how many times have you seen um fire extinguish extinguishers of your coaching institute being used or your school being used almost never but then what happens to the depreciation of these fire extinguisher when they are not uh, being used guys even when they are not being used then it is considered to be an asset in use we will consider that this asset is being used and assets will be considered to be put in use when commercial production of goods and services commences so yes the um, uh, the depreciation is allowed and depreciation is to be put even when the assets are non working assets depreciation of an addition or extension of an existing depreciable asset if addition becomes an integral part of the asset it is based on the remaining useful life of that asset if the addition or extension retains a separate identity capable of being used after expiry of the useful life of the asset shall be based on estimated useful life of that in addition or extension so addition expense extension will be capitalized and to be amortized over the period of the um, uh, you know original machinery or if they are to be used even after that then the uh, depreciation is to be uh, computed uh, accordingly okay intangible assets is not very very important amortization then here comes the simple um now repetitive principles which are there in this particular cost okay depreciation presentation and disclosures so guys i'm also um, you know considering in my mind while i'm teaching you these uh, cost accounting standards i'm also considering which cost accounting standards are more important than others because uh, i want all you to also know that you know the which accounting standards are Uh, coming regularly in the examination, which one are not coming regularly in the examination? I want you to know that also. So I'm making you mark in your register that you know write that this particular um, uh, chapter or this particular uh, cost accounting standard is very very important. Next is interest or finance charges. So guys, during Corona time, yes, interest rates suddenly dropped. Finance charges also dropped because the economy was under a downturn, so everything was uh, uh, was at halt. Okay, so interest and finance charges which are incurred. those are not to be included in any of the cost okay they are not included in employee cost they are not included in individual uh, material cost labor cost anywhere these costs are not to be included but yes when you are computing the cost of sales then this cost will be included um, uh, as an adjustment so let's read principles of measurement interest and finance charges shall be measured according to the accounting standards issued by the government of india and under the accounting standard rule with indian accounting standard notified under companies act uh, so whatever is government uh, saying about interest and finance charges those are to be followed religiously those are to be followed properly so first principle is that the the um, finance charges are to be uh, recognized in the um, uh, according to the accounting standards and also the indian accounting standard rules okay कॉस्ट शीट में इंटरेस्ट नहीं आता है क्या सर नहीं नहीं बिल्कुल आता है कॉस्ट शीट में इंटरेस्ट आता है लेकिन कहां आता है वो रेलेवेंट फैक्टर है क्या वो मटेरियल कॉस्ट के साथ आ जाता है नो no. क्या वो लेबर कॉस्ट के साथ आता है नो no. क्या कॉस्ट ऑफ प्रोडक्शन में आता है नो no. आता है कॉस्ट ऑफ सेल्स में बस ये तो बात है ना प्लेसमेंट की बात है आएगा तो है ही है ऐसा नहीं कि हम छोड़ देंगे आएगा तो है ही है खर्चा तो हुआ है भाई ठीक है सो Interest directly attributable to acquisition of any asset, then it should be added to the cost of asset. Shall not be included in imputed cost, subsidy grant, penalty. Everything should be added as a mandatory um, duty. Okay, cost accounting standard eighteen, research and development cost. Now, very very important cost accounting standard. Again, from a theoretical standpoint, um, now you know a question can come from a theory standpoint over here. What is the difference between research and development? What is the difference between research and development? Please, someone tell me on the computer screen because I want to know what is there in the computer. What is there in your mind? What is the difference between research and development? What is the dif difference? Or is it the same? You can also say, sir, both of them are same. There is no difference. You can say that also. I am fine with that answer also. So either you tell what is the difference or you tell me, sir, both are same. In the chat box, I am waiting for your answer.
what is the difference now wow neeti patak is absolutely right very good neeti patak neeti patak is absolutely right lavanya so guys research means when you are developing a new product you are developing something unique which is not there in the world you are developing something which is out of the league no one ha has ever imagined this kind of a technology that is research so research is to uh, find out a good technology which can serve the human kind second is you also sometimes attract negative um uh, you know the uh, negative feedback for your research and i'll tell you how so you know i was doing audit of a company long long back now this is a common trend in india but 20 years back it was not a common trend so i was doing some kind of a um, audit of a company it was a dubai based company and it introduced one very interesting concept in india which was temperature regulated toilet seats temperature regulated toilet seats and at that point in time 10 years 15 years back this seat was costing 1 lakh rupees so although the research was perfect the utility was there it was it was as as a result of a research or some continuous work that this has happened absolutely fine result research is there but guys it cannot be developed in india because india was not ready to pay 1 lakh rupees for a toilet seat at that point in time today india is uh, spending that kind of money on toilets it is but at that point in time 20 years back there was no a uh, scope that india could do it so research was perfect but development the feasibility study of the product and how feasible is the product this development is uh, uh, guys a different thing as compared to the research research means doing research for a new product and development means redesigning the old product okay ankita is close research means doing research for new product and development means redesigning the old product research means investigation and development finds new knowledge wrong Okay, I hope you understood understood the difference between research and development. This is the difference. Okay, sir. Now, uh, you know definitions. I'm ignoring, guys. Definitions I will definitely ignore because they are not very very difficult. Now comes the assignment of cost. When should the assignment of cost be done in case of research and development? So, research and development are attributable to a specific cost object. If we know that. you know the research and development is done for this particular product then we will entirely assign it to that particular cost object research and development costs that are not attributable to specific product shall not form part of product cost the research cost which is not attributable to specific product they do not form part of product cost they are to be treated as overheads research and development costs incurred for development and improvement of existing process which continues for a longer period of time but less than one year Included in cost of production, you included in cost of production even when it is not um, a short term. Even if it is long term, then also you increase in your uh, cost of production. Research development activity related to improvement of existing process or product continues for more than one year. Then again, guys, you will accumulate amortize your cost over a period of time because it is a accumulated amount of funds which are given to the employee for any exigency. Okay, then presentation and disclosure. Simple, guys. Simple. then comes the joint cost okay joint cost means that cost which is incurred for making two products so i'll tell you what this is oil what is this this is oil oil gets split into two parts this is oil suppose it gets split into petrol and diesel okay now the question is the common cost which has been incurred this is the common cost the neck you can see the neck of the inverted y the neck represents the common cost common cost means cost incurred on petrol as well as diesel diesel now the question is this common cost is to be loaded in diesel or is it to be loaded in uh, the petrol that is the question please answer my question where should this um, uh, you know uh, joint cost be apportioned should be apportioned in diesel or should be apportioned in petrol where should it be apportioned the answer is cost accounting standard has given you an answer guys for these common cost which have been incurred together for diesel and petrol you assign this particular cost using a very very innovative very very simple uh, allocation key 
and the allocation key is that the joint uh, uh, cost is to be added to respective products depending upon the price at split off point price selling price at split off point so whatever is the selling price of these two products at the split off point the moment they are separated what is the price that these two products will fetch in market according to that ratio we will um, uh, you know add the joint cost the common joint cost under petrol or diesel that is the reason we are doing this okay okay sir. so that's a brief background about the joint cost okay yes principles and methods for measuring joint uh, cost number one up to split of point if joint cost incurs up to split of, split of point then as stipulated as stipulated in the cost accounting standard which is on the basis of the sales price at the split of point cost incurred after split of point for the processing of joint product or byproduct so guys after we purchased the uh, uh, video then they come back to us that you know we need to um, uh, for the processing of joint cost, cost incurred after split of point for further processing of joint cost or byproduct. So whenever after the office hours, which is after five, these guys are made to work. Okay, then they are paid over time. Um, uh, over time, uh, they are uh, paid. What price at the split of point? Price means whatever is the selling price of those two goods at the split of point. Nita says, what is what short form written below? Joint cost. Joint cost short down. What kind of uh, joint cost? Where is the short form written, guys? There's no short form which is written. Where is the short form written? No, there's no short form. So next is cost incurred after the split of point for further processing so whatever cost is incurred after the split of point then guys cost shall be measured for resources consumed by each joint then there's no problem if cost is incurred after the uh, split of point then there's no problem we will allocate those cost according to the um, uh, according to the different accounting uh, treatments okay then cost of further processing carried out by outside party then whatever invoice he gives that will be the uh, cost of then common points guys common com points assignment and presentation same 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 okay perfect so next is royalty and technical know-how what do you mean by royalty when someone allows us to do something when someone allows us to um, uh, you know when someone allows us to uh, use his own manufacturing unit or his own manufacturing technique <clears throat> or his brand name logo that is known as royalty and what is technical know-how technical know-how means how to do these how to do um, uh, you know the the how to perform the activity so if i give you a license that okay you start uh, making videos of cma final but i don't know how to how to make them so how to make them is know how technical know-how and what is to be done for that i'm paying royalty so if i take a franchisee of mcdonald's and i say that i want to open a mcdonald's in india then guys i will pay royalty to that mcdonald's for attaining the franchisee but again i will tell them that sir you need to send your technicians to india to make me understand how to fry the um, uh, potato wedges that is know-how that is know-how technical know-how so these are two important words which are there okay So, royalty and technical know-how. Principles of measurement, very, very important. Royalty and technical know-how, fee paid or incurred in lump sum. If it is paid in lump sum, which is one time, if it is all paid in one time, if it is paid in lump sum, which is in one, one time, or which are in the nature of one-time payment shall be amortized on the basis of estimated output or benefit to be derived from the related asset. So it is to be split. Okay, royalty technical technical law is a deferred revenue expenditure. It is to be split over the period of time um, in which such royalty will benefit you. That is the um, uh, key point. Okay, 
then example is there amount of royalty technical know-how shall not include finance cost finance cost not included imputed cost not included subsidy grant incentive to be reduced okay penalty damages not to be included credit recovery is reduced any change in cost accounting plans principle possible only if three conditions are satisfied okay sir then presentation and disclosure simple thing presentation and disclosure next one is quality control cost again guys quality control cost is the cost which is um uh, very very important from an exam standpoint and from business standpoint also because if we do not produce quality then our products are not going to be um uh, very popular so quality control cost is the cost which is um uh, there for controlling the quality of a particular product so again two types of quality control cost are there which are incurred in house if you have a quality control department in house and they manage everything aggregate of cost of resources consumed which is the material labor overhead uh, utility anything which is related to uh, quality control department everything will be added over here and if cost of resources procured from outside if you are hiring another agency to do your quality control in that case the invoice price or the agreed price which is paid to the agency that will be the quality control cost okay sir then quality prevention cost and quality appraisal cost very very important we first prevent quality we uh, try to prevent any mishappenings due to quality control and then we try to appraise it whether we are doing everything fine or not in case of failure we need to ascertain what is the cost of the failure so three kinds of cost which we can incur uh, in case of quality control preventive cost appraisal cost appraisal means time to time looking whether the uh, whether the uh, quality is being maintained or not that is the appraisal cost and then the cost of failure what if failure happens what if uh, our products uh, does not meet the standard what cost will we incur then that is a cost cost failure okay sir got it again guys common points assignment presentation disclosure perfect cash 22 so is it more to learn all the definitions given in cost accounting not all not all it is not important to learn all the definitions which are given in cost accounting it's not important guys manufacturing cost what will be the manufacturing cost that is the um uh, uh, the subject matter of next cost accounting and by the way guys this cost accounting standard overlaps the cost accounting standard 4 cost accounting standard 4 was cost of production cost of services okay and what is this this is manufacturing cost so it overlaps somewhere it overlaps cost accounting standard 4 it is very similar to cost accounting standard 4 as well okay sir so over here we need to understand certain principles manufacturing goods of each good shall be measured separately manufacturing cost of each good shall be aggregate of direct and indirect cost relating to manufacturing activity material cost of normal scrap defective which are rejects shall be included in the material cost of excisable goods realized value of scrap is to be reduced from for determination of cost abnormal to be excluded interest finance finance charge not to be included subsidy grant reduced royalty pay to be added uh, penalties fines credits everything is given assignment presentation and disclosure okay then comes cost accounting standard 23 very very important please mark very very important in this cost accounting standard because it is very very important uh, from exam standpoint because this is an industry specific cost overburden removal cost is specifically incurred by the mining industry by the mining industry so this particular cost is a industry specific cost this is a industry specific cost and this cost has to be separately disclosed in the cost sheet this has to be separately disclosed in the cost sheet overburden removal cost now please understand what is overburden removal now whenever mining it's done then you know a lot of soil a lot of um, uh, mud is there on the uh, surface that is to be extracted okay then you go inside deep inside the earth towards its crust and you find precious material minerals metals diamonds any kind of precious stones semi precious stones but to make them good look you first need to remove the 
soil from that particular um, uh, you know resource and that removal of soil that removal of the unwanted elements which are pasted over that particular material or mineral this process is known as removal of overburden cost please understand the meaning of this particular overburden removal and then you will be able to understand the uh, uh, you know context of it okay sir so that is the removal overburden removal cost so please look at this diagram okay please look at this diagram we need to extract coal before extracting the coal we need to remove the top soil this is known as overburden and whatever cost is incurred to remove this top soil this is known as overburden removal cost okay sir overburden removal cost principle of measurement now very very important guys very very important overburden removal cost attributable to developed area of mine so whichever area is developed area of mine which means that we have already um, uh, you know uh, extracted we have already um, uh, dug holes in the mine and we are ready to good to go uh, inside the mine and extract minerals out of it now overburden removal cost attributable to developed area of mine charge to production of ore at the standard stripping ratio so standard stripping ratio what do you mean by stripping ratio stripping ratio means proportion of overburden removal versus the mineral which is extracted proportion of overburden uh, removal versus the mineral which is to be extracted that is known as the stripping ratio now overburden removal cost is to be attributable to the uh, you know the cost in the ratio of stripping ratio now guys i'll tell you what what happens is when you are at the top of the surface then overburden ratio is more mineral ratio is less as soon as you go to the bottom of the surface then overburden is less and mineral is more deeper you go higher highly profitable will it be so the stripping ratio changes from uh, you know um, length to length so at 10000 square feet the um, stripping ratio will be something else at 20000 50000 1 lakh it is to be uh, different at each level that is why it is to be treated like this overburden removal cost attributable to development phase of mine um when it is probable that future economic benefits will flow so whenever mine is being developed it is not sure that uh, you know future mineral profit will flow or not but it is estimated it is expected that future economic flow will happen okay capitalized as non current asset in other words the cost of advanced stripping activity whose economic benefit is likely to flow in future benefit will will drive in future then guys the overburden removal cost shall be capitalized and amortized over the future time period cost of overburden removal cost carried out by outsourcing so if you have uh, hired a mining uh, area and you have hired given it to some laborers contractors who will mine that area then agreed price as per the contract cost invoice that will be the um, uh, the price of the overburden removal okay so then guys the common point subsidy grant abnormal circumstances fine penalty interest all the common points are assignment disclosure presentation assignment disclosure presentation okay so guys it is not very lengthy you are thinking that cost accounting standards are so 24 cost accounting no not 24 only 10 rest 11 to 24 <clears throat> absolutely same except for the portion which i have given in box so for 11 to 24 if you just read the boxes you are done you are done. i've given you a shortcut okay i've given you a shortcut to study all the cost accounting standards within a very very short span of time <clears throat> okay guys before i come to the last cost accounting standards how's the josh in the room are you now less afraid of cost accounting standards because earlier you were very afraid of cost accounting stand so please comment in the comment section are you less afraid afraid now Uh, are you less tense now about the cost accounting standard? Because many students come to me and tell me, so there are twenty-four cost accounting standard. We are not able to revise them. We are not able to read them. I don't know how to retain them. But after this marathon lecture, are you little more comfortable uh, with cost accounting standards? Are you little more um, uh, uh, confident that yes, I'll be able to do cost accounting standards well? Are you little more confident and comfortable? Please write in the chat box what is your feelings about cost accounting standards. Yes, yes, yes. More comfortable. Perfect. Yes, it is 
much more comfortable very very good guys so now last cost accounting standard which is the revenue cost accounting standard treatment of revenue in the cost sheet although cost sheet as the name is, is itself suggest is related to cost okay but still guys we also give revenue in the cost sheet so that costing profit is required um the cost costing profit is to be computed so what are the principles to um uh, treat revenue in the cost statement that is what we are going to uh, you know understand now okay now this is important revenue from operations let let us start with the table itself because we'll cover the revenue from operations in the table also okay so revenue from sales of goods revenue from sales of goods or services whenever goods or services are being sold revenue which is derived from sale of goods or services how will that be recognized in the cost sheet that is the question okay you made it easy sir thank you sir it is so helpful marathon as you are every subject marathon too thank you more and more confident yes mn king as a self study student to a gem sir okay perfect great guys so guys after listening to your views i get confidence okay i also feel good and i get confidence that yes you, i am able to help you even a little bit if i am able to help you i'll be more than happy okay so from revenue of goods or services measured based on the net sales realization during the repeated reporting period so whatever is the net sales realization during the reported period and that is how we are going to uh, you know uh, calculate the revenue from sales of goods then revenue from joint products measured separately for each main product or service sold so whatever revenue is there from the joint product uh, each of the product revenue should be disclosed separately sales realization of defectives second grade products reject scrap spoilage waste product to be adjusted against cost of production of related goods so wherever there are scrap wherever there is reject whatever is realized it, it is to be sold no and it is and the amount is to be realized whatever is realized is to be reduced from the cost of production of related goods other income what happens to the other income shall not be considered in determining profit loss as per the cost <clears throat> so any other income is not guys uh, operating income so not to be recognized in the cost sheet revenue from sale of inputs utilities intermediate products shared or support services so whatever revenue is there from uh, inputs sale of inputs utility intermediate shall be adjusted against cost of purchase whatever is the cost of purchase of those inputs and utilities uh, they should be reduced okay not to be recognized as revenue separately it is to be reduced from the cost of utility so for example if i purchase say water for my business and i sell some part of the water to a third party because they needed it then i will reduce the cost i will not recognize the sale as revenue cost is reduced that is the principle it makes sense also guys revenue generated from utilization of assets created under csr program now very very important guys so sometimes what happens is um, corporate social responsibility is a mandatory um, uh, you know thing in india you need to according to corporate social responsibility you need to spend um, a certain amount of your profits for corporate um, uh, social responsibility which is charity okay now if i suppose have a company and i have funds and i have created a uh, created a school out of the those funds okay and the school fees which is accrued to me that is an income to me right so that is what we are going to talk about over here revenue generated from utilization of assets created under csr program they shall not be considered in determining the profits and loss of for the cost account because this is not the main business of the company this is not the main business of the company so this is by chance that i am earning uh, you know revenue from those assets it is, it is just by chance this is not the main source of earning for the company so it is not to be included as the in the profit and loss account rest guys common points any subsidy grant is to be reduced any change in cost accounting principle presentation disclosure remains the same and yes that is the end of your cost accounting standards that is the cost accounting standards cost accounting standard 24 for all of you cost accounting standard uh, for all of you <coughs> okay guys so yes See in three classes, merely in three classes, we have completed all the cost accounting standards. I have also in the class done some practical questions of the cost accounting standards, a few of them. And yes, theoretically we have discussed all the cost accounting standards very, very, very quickly. Again, the key is eleven to twenty-four cost accounting standards, repetitive in nature, not to be done in detail. 
first to 10th cost accounting standard to be done in detail whether practical or theory that is the fundamental to understand or to um uh, you know learn the cost accounting standards very very quickly and to revise them also to revise them also okay so yes guys this were cost accounting standards for all of you and that's all for today's session we'll be meeting in our subsequent sessions with more sections more provisions more uh, concepts of cost accounting and uh, of of cost audit cost and management audit so till we meet again all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you in the next session yes guys so today we are going to start the theoretical chapters of our syllabus now three theoretical chapters which are very very important internal controls internal audit management audit and management audit in different functions these three chapters are most important theoretical chapters of your syllabus and 20 marks are at least reserved from these three chapters these three chapters we are going to pick up tomorrow okay today we are going to pick up small 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 miscellaneous um, uh, chapters which hold very high importance from an exam standpoint so okay we'll be covering um, uh, theoretical chapters today hi sir hi 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 yes guys very high yogesh sharma she says brilliant brilliant okay so let's start the first theoretical chapter of our today's session which is documentation documentation so guys documentation is one of the most important element of any audit <clears throat> unless you are able to document your uh, um, uh, your work well you won't be able to prove to any authorities that you did the work so you need to maintain a file okay a proper pro proper file is required to be maintained and whatever steps you have done during the course of your audit under the different account heads under the different um, uh, heads of balance sheet and profit and loss account you should actually prepare the entire detailed documentation describing what have you done in those sections so suppose if you have reviewed say revenues okay so you need to document that yes in revenues i have seen these 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 things these are the steps which i have undertaken during the audit of my revenue section so you need to critically um uh, you know list down all the things that you have done in your audit and that is the relevance of documentation because guys if your audit is not well documented then we will assume that you have not done audit and trust me um uh, after 6 months or after 4 months you are going to forget whatever you steps you have taken uh, during the audit process so what is going to save you when you will be alleged that you have not done your work well that audit file will be able to save you because that audit file will be self explanatory it will tell the authorities that yes you did your cost audit well so documentation documenting entire audit procedure who all did the audit who reviewed the audit who what steps did everyone take to um, uh, perform audit all these documentation are very very important from um, a cost auditor standpoint if you don't do these documentation then you are bound to um, uh, really you are bound to you are bound to fail in your audit procedure so you need to prepare your documentation well if you prepare your documentation well then guys your audit is complete so documentation is an essential element of audit and if you do not do documentation then your cost audit is absolutely not complete so today's topic of discussion is cost audit documentation and audit process what is the process of audit and what are the documentation that are required to be um uh, you know prepared and kept in the file in the audit file there has to be an audit file and all the documentation should be kept in the audit file okay so what is audit documentation it means material such as documents supporting audit assertions of the management so documents which tell you what is management saying so management is saying that um, our debtors are completely recorded our revenues are completely recorded management is asserting that our cash is absolutely complete our cash balance is absolutely checked and complete okay these assertions which management has these assertions um uh, documents supporting these assertions should be there in the audit file evidence of checking of various heads of financial statements so guys once management asserts that everything is complete in our financial statement the auditor needs to check it okay so how did you check it what supporting uh, documents did you ask for from the management what evidences have you gathered all those things are to be kept in your file so evidence for checking of various heads of financial statements is the next thing that you need to actually put in your audit file prepared by and obtained by the cost auditor okay what is audit file audit file means folder or other storage media either in physical form or electronic form guys today uh, the concept is of e audit e audit means you don't prepare uh, uh, you know hard files you do not take print outs of each and every document you will just prepare your <clears throat> working in excel format uploaded in the audit software 
so special audit softwares are developed where file is not required to be made all the documents which you have prepared during audit all the workings which you have done during audit so for example if you have calculated one um, uh, depreciation number okay so how have you calculated how have you checked the supporting documentation how have you checked the income tax act or companies act every step is required to be written in that excel file and that excel file is uploaded in the uh, system in the audit system that is how documentation actually um, helps you e documentation is helpful okay so auditors might prepare physical files auditor might prepare e files but every document should be there in physical file or in the e file audit working papers audit working papers means documents the detailed trail of all the uh, working papers which are there which you have checked and all the documents which are relevant from an audit evidence standpoint uh, that you know this is the evidence that this particular transaction has happened so any document which is uh, which is evidencing any transaction that document is to be stored in the audit file <clears throat> just a second guys a technical problem is there okay done okay so that is audit working papers for you audit working papers document documents which record all audit evidence obtained during audit is known as audit working paper now what do you mean by engagement letter engagement letter means guys um, there has to be a contract between the auditor and the audit <clears throat> now there is nothing called trust in today's world okay trust or you know you say verbal commitment um, uh, these don't hold good in today's world we need written evidence of whatever has been agreed between the management and the auditor be it the fees be it the scope of audit work be it where the audit will be carried out and what documentation will be provided to us by the management anything and everything is to be written um, in the contract which is known as the engagement letter so engagement letter should be signed before starting of audit between the management and the auditor and this engagement letter must be um, uh, you know authenticated must be reviewed by both the auditors and the management in a proper way so the entire scope of uh, terms and conditions of uh, fees of audit is to be described in this engagement letter so engagement letter auditor agrees with the client's management in writing about the scope terms and conditions of the audit engagement in an engagement letter the purpose of such letter is to minimize any possible misunderstanding concerning the scope and terms of the audit engagement so any misunderstanding should not remain okay what is the scope of audit engagement uh, how far uh, did we had to go in the audit engagement all these things are to be written in the engagement letter so that tomorrow no one is able to say oh this was not in my scope auditor should not say this was not in my scope or management should not say to the auditor um, you should not check this because i told you in the earlier instance only that this is not your scope so scope work everything should be very very crystal clear in the audit engagement okay <clears throat> so engagement letter is required to be prepared and also one important thing guys uh, what is the form of report or communication uh, which is the result of the audit so what kind of audit report are you going to issue that is also forming part of audit engagement so whether you will issue a audit report according to the um, companies act or whether you will be issuing it in a ppt how will you issue the audit report that is also an important element of the engagement letter now audit stages guys there are this is stages of audit of cost statements number one planning you need to do planning then you will perform which means you actually do the task and the third is reporting you will report to the relevant authority so if uh, you know shareholders have appointed you then you report to the shareholders if central government has appointed you you will report to central government if management board of directors have appointed you then you will report to the uh, board of uh, directors or the management so planning performing uh, reporting <coughs> planning involves what is planning planning means you gain understanding of the client the first important element of planning is we need to obtain understanding of the client because guys many a times it happens that client is uh, belonging to a very different sector which means he is a banking company so to banking company not only companies act is applicable but also nbfc norms banking norms are also applicable similarly if you are auditing a nbfc non banking financial corporation then uh, apart from the the um, uh, normal companies act he will be exigible to the uh, rbi prudential norms for nbfc also so you need to be aware about those prudential norms of rbi so the first and most important thing is please understand your client who is your client what regulations are applicable on it so for example if it's an insurance company then irda is applicable irda regulations will be applicable on that particular client you should be aware about it aware about your client that is the first thing in planning 
Second, identify objectives of audit. What is the objective of audit? Whether it is statutory reporting that you need to report to say Companies Act or GST Act or Income Tax Act. It is statutory reporting or it is just that management as a routine process has asked you to audit. Okay, that understanding is very, very important. Identifying factors and account heads that may have risk of material misstatement. Now, then the next point is, guys, we will identify what account heads are um, uh, maybe materially misstated. What account heads are um, actually uh, stands a risk of misstatement, stand a risk of error. That is what you need to identify. So factors and account heads which stand a risk of error. That is what you need to identify. Performing a risk and materiality assessment and developing an audit strategy. So performing the uh, you know risk and materiality assessment, which means that you will uh, see what kind of risk uh, is there in this particular client okay and how do you see the risk test internal controls once you test internal controls of a particular client then you will be able to know what kind of risk does this client have and according to the risk which this client has um, uh, you know you will identify the accounting heads which are uh, at a very high risk and you will pay more attention to those accounting heads which have a very high risk so you identify the account heads and factors which have a very high risk of material misstatement performing risk and materiality assessment and developing an audit strategy um, identifying nature timing and extent of procedures to be performed please underline this nte the short form is nte n t e nature timing and extent of audit procedures to be performed three things are required to be perfect while performing the audit procedures number one nature of audit procedure number two timing of audit procedure and extent of audit procedure. Extent means to what detail will audit procedure be uh, applied. So NTE is to be ascertained in the planning phase. And of course, guys, who is going to perform these audit procedures? That is also relevant. So team, the staff, you need to prepare uh, what kind of staff is required. Uh, do we need CMA qualifieds or do we need only interns? Interns will be able to do or do we need a mix of CMA qualifieds and interns? This is what we need to identify. So. Um, this is the planning phase. Second is the performing phase. This, of course, is the actual activity which you do, actual action which you take place during the audit. And the first step is to test the internal controls. First step is to test the internal controls. If internal controls are working fine, then your audit procedures will be less lengthy, will be less detailed. So first step is to test the internal controls. If internal controls are working fine, then your audit procedures will be less lengthy. Next is substantive testing. Substantive testing means the detailed testing. So after your uh, control testing is done and you are reasonably sure that, you know, controls are working fine, so we can rely on the controls. Then you will identify those account heads where um, you need to uh, go in depth and you need to understand the nitty gritties and detail of those account heads. For example, revenues, even if controls are very, very strong in case of revenues, the auditors do not leave revenue like that. They would deep dive into revenues. They will in detail discuss revenue and audit revenue. So revenue is something where substantive testing is definitely required. So there are two things, control testing and substantive testing. Now I'll give you an example of control testing and substantive testing. Okay. So I'll give you an example of these two things. Okay. Okay. So guys, I have a student in my class. Okay. And that student has got a girlfriend. And that girlfriend is a little, little, um, you know, obsessive girl and she doesn't trust the boyfriend a lot. Okay. So boyfriend says that I'm going to Nikhil Gupta sir's class cost audit and early in the morning, nine o'clock class st starts nine to 12 is the class. So he comes to Lakshmi Nagar at our coaching institute and he takes the class uh, from nine to 12. Okay. Now his girlfriend is actually not trusting him and his girlfriend is inquisitive that where is um, uh, he going early in the morning. Okay. So now to audit this transaction, whether he is going to the right place or not, she can take two steps. Okay. Step number one, control testing. How will control testing be done? She will call up uh, the, the sister of the boyfriend and ask her, has he left? Sister will say, yes, he's left from home. Okay. Then he will, then she will call the receptionist at the coaching institute and will ask her, has he come to the coaching today? Receptionist will say, yes, he's come to the coaching and he's sitting in the class. Soon as the class is over at 12, she will again call the receptionist and ask her whether he is left. Receptionist will say, yes, he is left. So then she will call up back to her sister uh, at home and will inquire whether he has reached home. Yes, he has reached home. So this is how control testing is done. Control points are identified of a particular transaction. Control points are identified of a particular transaction. And only those control points are tested 
not the entire transaction not the entire transaction only the control points are tested this is known as control testing now i'll give you a uh, uh, you know real life example or a, a, a professional example of this control testing what is the real life example of professional uh, control testing material is being purchased by the company raw material is being purchased by the company when raw material is purchased by the company it will first of all be entered in the inwards register which is kept at the gate then it will go to quality control department and entry will be done there then it will come to warehouse and then to production so if you only test these four checkpoints regarding the movement of the raw material we can be very sure that raw material has been purchased and it is an actual transaction this is known as control testing now what is substantive procedures what is substantive procedures substantive procedure means that you know that that guy that guy is a very very shrewd guy whom i was talking about okay he ha is having another girlfriend inside my class so even when control testing was done it was ineffective or he bribed his sister and the receptionist at my coaching institute so control testing failed at that point in time where the management who uh, who's in this case is the guy has overridden the controls has cancelled the controls has bribed the controls so when this happens the order has to appoint substantive procedures has to do substantive procedure what will be the substantive procedure the substantive procedure is the substantive procedure is that now that girl will be having um a, a detective full time detective employed for by her and that detective will be tracing that boy from every angle from every point and will be giving a real time report to the girl this is substantive procedure where you are checking the entire transaction you are not only checking the control points you are not only checking the control points but you are checking the entire transaction because control testing can fail controls can fail those checkpoints can fail that is the whole problem management can itself override controls he can bribe the control points he can change the control points guys okay so in that case substantive procedures can be employed now one drawback uh, which is there in case of substantive procedure is that substantive procedure are very expensive hiring a detective is not uh, you know very very cheap it's very expensive secondly it's very time taking it's very time consuming because to hire a detective and then then um, uh, you know um, uh, then um, uh, tracking his his movement then tracking giving uh, taking update from him taking report from him and this entire process is very very time taking very very time consuming so substantive procedures cannot be done in 100% of the account heads you need to choose where you need to do substantive testing <clears throat> so wherever you feel that risk is high do substantive testing wherever you feel risk is low do control testing it's up to you it's upon the auditor now i'll come to a professional example in case of substantive testing so guys raw material is purchased i will not trust on the control points only i will uh, audit the entire transaction i will see the transporter's receipt which is there okay i will see material which has flown in i will see i obviously i will see the control points for sure but i will also see other things if i'm doing substantive testing so control testing is um uh, you know uh, a brief method of doing it a uh, very quick method of doing it and substantive testing is to test everything in detail but unfortunately substantive testing is very costly very time consuming so substantive procedure cannot be employed in each and every cases it can be employed only and only in cases where um uh, you know um, control testing uh, fails or case where risk is very high like revenue in revenue always substantive substantive test testing happens okay and the last stage is the third stage is concluding and reporting we need to conclude our audit and we need to report we need to issue an audit report evaluating the results of detailed testing and forming an opinion on fair presentation of ntd's cost statement you need to um, form your opinion and give it in by way of an audit report that is the reporting requirement you conclude your audit and your report in the relevant form that is the final third stage of uh, audit uh, uh, documentation okay and all these things guys all these things you need to prepare a document for it you need to write it down right from planning stage what did you plan uh, in what, what account heads did you plan control testing in what account heads did you plan uh, substantive procedure everything you need to write down on a document on a word document and to put it in audit file so that tomorrow if someone asks you what did you do in revenue 
what procedures did you employ in revenue you should be able to answer that particular question using the documentation which has been prepared for auditing revenue so everything needs to be really um documented that is the most important part of documentation okay then these are minute steps of auditing which are uh, you know details of planning um uh, and and uh, execution what have we have done so this can be easily done by you so this was guys audit documentation okay this was audit documentation for all of you okay now let me start the second theoretical chapter which is forensic audit now guys forensic audit is relevant only for um syllabus 2022 students not relevant for 2016 students forensic audit audit is only relevant for uh december uh, 2022 students forensic audit so sir should the students of uh, 2016 syllabus go no no don't go i will be uh, taking one more chapter which is cost audit program which is relevant to 2016 as well as 2022 Yes, this chapter is relevant only to 2022 syllabus students. Forensic audit. This is the new insertion which has been made in uh, syllabus 2022. So this chapter only relevant for syllabus 2022 students. Okay, forensic audit. Class में अपने दोस्त को भेज देगी लड़की ये देखो Twinkle Rustagi. Twinkle Rustagi भाई ये बहुत खतरनाक लड़की है. इसने जासूस की जो value थी जासूस का जो role था वो खत्म कर दिया. अपने किसी दोस्त को ही भाई वहां पर भेज दिया लड़के की जासूसी करने के लिए वेरी 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 गुड ट्रस्ट इश्यूज इतने ज्यादा क्रिएट हो जाते हैं ना चलो नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज फॉरेंसिक ऑडिट गाइस अ न्यूली इंसर्टेड चैप्टर इन सिलेबस 2022 एन इंपॉर्टेंट चैप्टर कंसिडरिंग टूडे सिनारियो टूडे सिनारियो अलॉट ऑफ फ्रॉड इज है इन मार्केट अलॉट ऑफ um uh, you know uh, bad elements are playing into play uh, coming into picture and uh, frauds are happening uh, financial frauds are at its peak uh, miss happenings are happening in financial statements miss reporting are happening in financial statements uh, wrong statement is given by the auditors wrong statement is given by the management sometimes we feel that management and auditors are um, uh, you know uh, are uh, conglomerating together to do financial frauds so a lot of hanky panky stuff is happening in financial statements today to address all these issues we need to have forensic auditors forensic auditors means investigation it means that it is not normal audit procedure it is an investigation which means in depth investigation will happen in this particular case forensic audit now first of all i want you to um uh, tell me what is the difference between investigation and audit is there any difference between investigation and audit then i'll tell you my practical um, uh, you know uh, example where i entered into investigative procedures while i was doing audit So, what is the difference between investigation and audit? Please write in the chat box, and I'll start my story. Okay. Now, please understand the difference between investigation and audit, and I'll tell you my personal experience when I was auditing a very big um, uh, firm. So, there was a company which I was auditing, and that company had five crore worth rupees of marketing expenditure in their PNL account. When I audited that PNL account, five crore rupees of marketing expenditure, then guys, I asked for vouchers, I asked for bills. Please give me bills of these expenditure which you have um, undertaken. Marketing expense of five crore rupees was not an easy expenditure. Was not a small expenditure. Therefore, I was skeptical. Skeptical already, and I asked for bills. Okay. Soon as I received the bills, guys, I observed some fishy things in the bill. For example, the bill. The name of the company was um, suppose A B C Motor. private limited motors private limited so it was supplying motor parts and the bill was made of um, uh, you know banners supplied which are to be put in the entire city banners okay banners on cloth they are supplied and it was put in the entire city why would a motor part company supply banners to this particular company that was incomprehensible i couldn't understand what is the logic behind it then there was another bill by name of an individual mr dalvinder singh he supplied canopies canopies means those um a temporary structures which are uh, inserted on foot paths of the roads people are sitting over there to give demo of the product to the general public canopies again sold by individual why why 5 lakh 10 lakh rupees big big huge um, expenses uh, were recorded by this name i was surprised to see all these things i was surprised to see all these things so difference between investigation investigation is a post mortem audit is like health checkup wrong answer by rata rata tolly vedaragu <coughs> ankita
ऑडिट इज सिस्टमेटिक एग्जामिनेशन ऑफ रिकॉर्ड एंड इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज टू इन्वेस्टिगेट वेन देर इज सम सस्पिशियस हैपनिंग गुड पूजा शिंदे ऑडिट इज प्रोसेस ऑफ वेरीफाइंग द बुक्स एंड अकाउंट बट इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज डन इन केस इफ एनी डाउट इन ट्रांजेक्शन ओके okay so let's continue my example okay Now, i was i was absolutely skeptical that there is something wrong going on in the um uh, in this head which is uh, marketing 5 crore worth of expenditure i thought it is absolutely fake what did i do i called up that mr dilwinder singh and i asked him sir i want canopies for my company do you supply canopies mr dilwinder singh said no i don't supply canopies and i don't know what are canopies what are you talking about my skeptical mind had a proof that a fraud is happening in the company i again call up the call up call up the motor company the motor company which abc motor company okay and ask them i want ma'am i want banners for my company and i want to put it in the entire city please tell me the price she said that this is a motor part company we don't supply banners what are you talking about what are you talking about i was absolutely sure that something fishy was going on in the company i called for more invoices i called for more evidences to uh, substantiate my um suspicion and yes in every expenditure in every invoice there was some hanky panky stuff some there was something wrong in every every invoice i got very excited you know naturally that that hat the detective hat came on my um a virtual hat came on my head a virtual cigar came on my lips a virtual coat came on my body the long coat okay and i felt that i am an investigator i am a i am a karamchand jasus i felt like that and i was so excited because uh, i had unearthed a 5 crore rupees uh, fraud in first year of my uh, professional journey i was so excited i was so happy but i told myself that nikhil let me gather some evidences some more evidences to prove that this fraud is happening in the company next day early morning i went to that motor part company and with that bill and i showed to them ma'am this is your bill you have supplied banners to one of the companies i want the banners too the receptionist was confused why because the bill was original but the items which are little written over there were not supplied by that particular company so the receptionist was also confused the receptionist said ma sir we do not sell motor parts we only sell um, we do not sell banners we only sell motor parts so sir i think you are mistaken i think you are mistaken so this evidence was enough evidence for me to you know feel proud on myself okay then i went back to my company i went back to my boss and i told my i told my boss oh boss i have today unearthed fraud worth rupees 5 crore rupees and i told them the entire sequence of events which i did the cold calling which i did the uh, visit to the site which i did i told them everything and i was scolded thoroughly i was scolded thoroughly job of the auditor is not to investigate not to do cold calling no you cannot do that you cannot go to the premises of the vendors you cannot go to the premises of the people who have um, uh, by whom the company has purchased any material yes you can take a confirmation from them in loop with the management management should be in loop management should be aware about what you are doing it is not investigation it is not secret investigation it is audit it is not a secretive process you should make management aware about whatever is happening so audit is not investigation you cannot do it in secrecy management should be aware whatever you are doing so audit is a compliance it's not a uh, you know uh, investigative procedure so guys while you are on audit do not you know control your investigation vibes control the investigator in you because you are not the investigator that's the difference between investigation and audit so forensic audit is sort of an investigation it's not normal audit it's not compliance it's where wherever, wherever any fraud has happened or sus susceptible uh, skeptical for fraud is uh, going to be uh, taken place fraud might happen over there forensic audit happens okay what is forensic audit forensic audit is investigative activity to find supporting evidence to fraud which may be used in court so you know even forensic auditors can be um, uh, asked to go to the courts okay so it can be used as a evidence in the courts so it is a investigative activity where supporting evidence are required to be um, produced in the courts expert witness during trial so forensic auditor can also be called as a witness okay so it's a investigative activity when does forensic audit uh, uh, you know when is forensic audit required it is required in case of fraud it is required in case of corruption 
closure of business extortion bribery bankruptcy conflict of interest so in case of fraud the forensic audit can be required asset misappropriation some employee has stolen the assets of the company be it cash be it bank balance or laptops or any other asset so in case of fraud forensic audit is required asset is misappropriated financial statement fraud fsf if sff sfs fsf is there financial statement fraud which means the revenue is worth 1 crore and you have shown it in your books of accounts as 10 crores you have inflated the revenue just to impress your shareholders then it's a fraud and it requires forensic audit second is the case of corruption corruption guys um, uh, wherever you think that this particular bridge has been constructed using um, a low grade material because the person who was uh, preparing this uh, bridge had given um, a certain amount of money to the authorities and therefore the material was uh, downgraded then guys corruption can also be unearthed during forensic audit so forensic audit is applicable in case of corruption also <laughs> yes abhishek abhishek says i heard this same example which you told in one of your videos lectures of initial chapter you named the term scolding as brutal verbal thrashing in that lecture <laughs> brutal verbal thrashing good so corruption is another case where forensic audit is required then extortion or cyber crime if any cyber crime happens if any extortion is happen if someone is uh, you know actually um, forcing you to give money uh, Ill illegitimate source then extortion and cyber crime also uh, is subject to forensic audit bribery of course forensic audit is required and bribery and corruption are similar things conflict of interest uh, wherever there is conflict of interest which means um, now you know the 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 uh, business is undertaken by the director and director's wife is actually the owner of that particular company where business is being given so you know a company requires uh, certain things for the company acs acs are required uh, now those acs are procured from the company which is owned by the wife of the director then obviously it will be purchased at a expensive rate this is known as conflict of interest so wherever there is conflict of interest forensic audit is required okay bankruptcy wherever there is bankruptcy wherever the company is declaring that i don't have enough money to repay my liabilities my net worth is less than my liabilities in those cases forensic audit is required to ascertain what is the level of um, the money that the company can actually accumulate and uh, pay to the creditors that is the case where forensic audit is required then why is forensic audit required what is the reason why forensic audit is required theft of business information wherever business information is stolen there a uh, forensic audit is required issues raised by whistle blower whistle blower is a person who gives insider information to the outside world about the company so if whistle blower has highlighted certain issues then forensic audit is required reconciliations are not matching properly bank reconciliation statement is not matching properly then uh, re uh, uh, forensic audit is required suspicion or illegal activities um, or negative profits despite of good sales sales is very high but profits are negative again calls for forensic audit so forensic audit can be used in various situations and not necessarily um, uh, you know only when law requires so there's no law which requires forensic audit forensic audit can be carried out by um, uh, you know normal uh, in uh, any other any circumstance whenever you think that there's need for forensic audit then forensic audit can be actually ordered okay what is the difference between normal audit and forensic audit we have already discussed it it is a investigation it is a specialized investigation and yes guys you can take a uh, screenshot of these screens and you can um, uh, you know write these diagrams and these um, uh, you know charts in your register so that you will be able to remember it well so i have summarized the entire chapter in few slides so that you can remember them well okay so audit is normal routine setup okay routine procedure however investigation of forensic audit happens only once in a while where there is a suspicion that suspicious activity has undertaken or suspicious transaction has undertaken only there the forensic audit happens so difference between audit and forensic audit okay then <clears throat> okay what are the functions of forensic audit what are the functions of forensic audit i mean what are the um, things what forensic audit does okay so first function is to plan what do you need to plan we need to plan what team members should be um, taken to the forensic auditors uh, what are the team members which are to be selected and what are the procedures which are to be uh, uh, employed nt nature timing extent of audit procedures they are to be decided okay so the first function of forensic audit is to plan what is to be done theek hai second function is to collect the evidence what evidence are required to be um, collected to substantiate our claim okay uh, substantiate our claim of 
uh, accuracy. Now the audit evidence should be sufficient and they should be appropriate. S A they should be sufficient and they should be appropriate. Sufficient means they should cover a whole gamut of population which we are testing. And appropriate means they should be suitable. They should be, um, you know, uh, uh, as per the requirement. So that is the second function of forensic audit. Third is reporting. Forensic audit should report on the crime which has been uh, taken place. Written report should be there on crime. Written report should be there. And if legal cases required to be filed, then legal case should also be filed. Finally, forensic auditors also can be um, co called to the court as an evidence. Forensic auditors can be called to the court as an evidence of wrongdoing of a particular company. So court in court proceedings, forensic auditors are uh, actually produced as an evidence. That is the uh, thing. Okay. Investigation method methodology of forensic audit. Forensic auditors employ uh, certain steps for doing forensic audit. What is the methodology which they adopt? First step is to accept the engagement. You need to accept the engagement, whatever engagement is there. You need to accept the engagement letter, which means you need to sign the engagement letter. That is the first step. Second, evaluate the allegation and suspicious engagement. Whatever um, uh, allegations are there on the company or whatever suspicions are there on the company, you need to evaluate that and test whether they are correct or not. Make a list of all the uh, suspicions or all the allegations which are there. Conduct due diligence, uh, you know, uh, before, uh, starting the actual audit or actual forensic audit, you should conduct the due diligence whether you know the um, the um, there's a, there are any pending cases uh, in in case of promoters of the company whether they are already involved in some fraud uh, in past whether there's any pending cases which are uh, filed uh, in case of promoters all the due diligence work you need to do then you need to do the preliminary investigation you start with the preliminary investigation you collect all the evidences you collect all the information you talk to employees who have been involved in fraud. You need to talk to the top management, the below management, everyone you need to talk and to conduct the preliminary investigation. Then you carry on, on the external investigation. So apart from talking to the management, to the promoters, you also talk to the vendors of the company. You also talk to the outsiders to ascertain, um, you know, what kind of fraud is taking place and what is the extent of the fraud. External investigation. Gathering proof and evidence, you gather all the proofs and evidence um, against the financial fraud. Reporting on the finding, you prepare a report, and if need be, then court proceedings you need to attend um, uh, as a part of um, uh, you know the forensic audit. When I talk about whistleblower, it reminds me of the Enron scandal, which you explained in the lectures. Yes, guys, absolutely. <laughs> yes, whistleblower. Okay. So these are the <coughs> elements of forensic audit. Now, what is fraud triangle? Okay, very, very important concept. What do you mean by fraud triangle? So guys, fraud happens when all these three things accumulate or join hands. Fraud happens when these three things accumulate. It is known as fraud triangle. Fraud happens when these three things come together. Then fraud happens. What are the three things which come together? for fraud to uh, you know uh, accumulate so three things are number one there has to be a there has to be an opportunity first thing which is required for any fraud to take place is opportunity which means that the employee should have the opportunity to do these fraud which means internal controls should be weak when internal controls are weak then employee get an opportunity to do the fraud and when employee get an opportunity to do, do the fraud then fraud happens so first thing is opportunity which is required when fraud happens second is uh, rationalization rationalization means the employee needs to uh, you know um, uh, be satisfied that you are he's doing the right thing okay so he uh, might say that okay i'll pay back to the company i'll give this money back to the company when my work is done or he might say that i deserve this because my pay rise was very less this time company did not pay me well so i deserve this that is the second rationalization which an employee can put to his mind third is um, uh, it's for a good purpose i'm using it for my own benefit so it's for a good purpose that I'm, uh, you know, doing this fraud. It will benefit me and my family. So it's for a good purpose. So it's okay to do it. So second thing is rationalization. You need to, uh, you need your employee to have some rationalization. Third thing is pressure. There should be some pressure on the employee uh, that he's doing this fraud, which means he should be addicted to some bad things. Therefore, he needs he needs money or his family is under a very bad situation. He's under immense loans. He's he's taken a lot of loans. Uh, his credit card bills are not uh, paid on time. Any of these factors can lead to uh, fraud. So fraud needs needs these three things. 
if you accumulate these three things then there's a high probability that fraud will happen rationalization opportunity and pressure if these thing three things are there then fraud might happen next what are the red flags what are the um, indications that the fraud might happen so there are certain indications yes the employees also give indication and there are certain management related indications also which highlight that you know some fraud might happen okay employee related indication which highlight that some fraud might happen suddenly there is a lifestyle change in the employee employee is able to afford iphone 14 pro max then we are under suspicion that you know something hanky panky is going on second is significant personal debt if employee has a lot of personal debt he has taken a lot of loan from various people then guys we um, take it as a red flag that employee can do fraud high employee turnover wherever the employees are leaving very quickly uh, that can be an indication that there's some fraud happening in the company because after doing fraud employee would want to leave the company and join another company and do same fraud in another company so high employee turnover is also indicative of that fact refusal to take a vacation or sick leave now if employees are too regular to the office and they do not take leave then that is also an indication that something bad is going on because the employee would not want anyone else to know about the fraud which he has done so he will not take an off he will not take a vacation that is an indication that uh, something hangy panky is going on then lack of segregation of duties in a vulnerable um, uh, in a vulnerable areas so wherever segregation of duties is not there wherever entire transaction is being handled by one employee only there there is a possibility that fraud can happen entire transaction happens uh, by one person itself there's a possibility that uh, you know fraud is happening over there so these are certain indication which will tell you that yes there might be a fraud situation there might be a fraud situation okay next uh, the indications from management side that management is doing some fraud this was the indications where employees doing fraud now we'll come to the situation where we think that management is doing uh, fraud so management overrides control wherever management um, uh, you know overrides control again and again they foul on their own controls they um, miss on their own controls wherever they are doing this thing again and again there's an indication that man management is trying to do some fraud significant disrespect for regulating bodies so regulatory bodies uh, the management is not taking care of regulatory bodies which means that they are not paying taxes on time they are not filing chalans on time they are not following the statutory compliances they are not following the statutory dates this also indicates that management has got something something wrong is going on in the company then weak internal controls wherever there are weak internal controls their management can be held responsible inexperienced and incapable employees wherever there are inexperienced employees which are um, uh, you know hired by the management there there's an indication that um, a fraud might be happening high employee turnover if turnover of the employee is very high then we can say that management might um, you know be involved in some kind of fraud photocopy or missing documents so if there are missing documents in the financial statements in the um, uh, audit file we can say that something is wrong then reference to provide information reluctance to provide information if management is saying no we will not provide you the necessary information then we can say that management is doing some fraud so guys uh, a small question of five to six marks can be asked from this particular um, uh, point that you know please tell us the indications of fraud indications where fraud is happening or where the forensic audit is required indication where it is um, uh, there okay sincere employees also there who work with commitment yes yes sincere employees also there but you know if uh, certain employees show certain kind of traits then we are uh, more uh, susceptible to fraud so those traits are to be identified and those traits are to be seen just like the traits which were given over here okay now financial forensics and forensic audit now we focus on financial forensic audit which means the uh, forensic audit which is related to financial statements only now forensic audit can also be related to um, a non-financial statement uh, kind of a thing um, but for, uh, we are now dealing with the financial statement forensic audit where forensic audit will be required for financial statements between balance sheet pnl account so what is it it is a combination of accounting and investigation so accounting and investigation both combined together we'll say that it is financial forensics so financial forensic is uh, forensics which are applicable for the um, financial statements okay as now they're saying it is applicable for 2016 no this chapter is not applicable for 2016 but the next chapter which i'll be doing cost audit program that will be applicable for 2016 so 2016 students please hold on for say half an hour more
what it is a combination of accounting and investigation then when is it done when when is forensic uh, audit required when there's a financial theft theft by employee customer or any other person if there's something which has been stolen then financial forensic happens securities fraud if some securities fraud has happened um, which has duped the investors of their money critical earned money then securities fraud financial forensic happens money laundering if any money laundering happens you know your money is um, uh, you know uh, you are, you have earned the money from illegal sources and now you are trying to hide that money then financial forensic happens corporate valuation disputes if there's valuation di dispute if um, uh, you know uh, a company is being sold the company is saying i am worth 200 crores and the purchaser says no you're not worth 200 crores you're less than 200 crores then financial forensic comes into play tax evasion wherever there is evasion of tax wherever tax is being evaded tax is not being paid on time there the forensic audit is required and why is forensic audit required why is forensic audit required forensic audit is required because of certain reasons okay why is forensic audit required in case of financial crimes wherever financial crimes are happening and financial frauds there uh, forensic audit is required new and innovative for fraudulent activities are um, uh, you know identified like uh, today these days you know the mobile phone fraud activities is at peak okay you will get a uh, link uh, through uh, your sms or whatsapp you will click on that link and then you will um, uh, you know uh, reach to a place where your bank statement will be emptied all these innovative fraud techniques have been innovatively um, designed so that is the need then prevention for prevention also the uh, forensic audit can be done where we want to be sure that uh, you know forensic fraud doesn't happen in our case qualities of a forensic auditor what are the qualities which we expect from a forensic auditor what should be there in the forensic auditor he should be knowledgeable first of all he should have knowledge of financial aspects internal financial controls and accounting aspects he should be knowledgeable person he should have appropriate knowledge of the financial aspects obviously guys if he is going to do audit of financial statements naturally he should be aware about how balance sheet is prepared how profit and loss account is prepared how cash flow is prepared everything should be on his tips second is he should have a logical mindset he should be logical in his thinking he should be able to comprehend where the logics are being defeated okay he should have relevant experience he should have experience in auditing he should have experience in uh, doing audit of forensic audit of uh, companies and firms attention to details he should be very vigil on the details um, uh, which are there in the uh, financial statements and he should be able to pick up the relevant details and draw an analogy from those details so he should have attention to details then he should be high on moral principles his principles should be very high his morals should be very high he should be ethical person okay it's not that the management would you know bribe him and he would give a wrong report that should not happen so morally he should be a very up upgrade person inquisitiveness he should have um, uh, you know the spree of asking questions and seek answers and explanation for everything that is known as inquisitiveness so he should have these traits then last is he should be spontaneous he should be able to understand um, uh, you know spontaneously what kind of um uh, things are required from this particular audit and he should be spontaneous he should be uh, able to ask questions spontaneous and instantly he should be spontaneous so qualities of a forensic auditor so as again four to five marks can be uh, uh, there from this particular theoretical portion so you need to really understand it well okay now what are the techniques of forensic accounting what are the techniques of forensic accounting so techniques of forensic accounting are number one re reviewing the public documents and conducting background check so first the first um, uh, step of doing forensic accounting is you need to review the public documents um, you know before going to the client just log on to website of mc and download the uh, financial statements of that particular company you will be able to see the documents which are publicly available so see uh, review the public documents which are available and conduct a background check of the company uh, see uh, what uh, frauds have the company be in, been involved in the past are the promoters involved in some frauds in the past are the promoters or directors <clears throat> have they went to jail for some fraud do proper background check okay second detailed interview of management he should understand the depth of the fraud through management so he should uh, have detailed um, uh, interview with the management where he'll understand all the facts and he'll 
um, uh, assess the depth of the fraud. So till what extent has the fraud crept in? He should understand that. Identify the culprit. Finally, he should be able to identify who has done the fraud by doing these steps. Next is gathering evidence. So guys, just identifying the culprit is not uh, sufficient. He should gather evidence so as to prove who are the uh, culprit, who has done this fraud. To identify who has done this fraud, he needs to gather evidence against that particular person. So evidence should be from a trustworthy and confidential source. Evidence should be from a trustworthy and a confidential source. Analysis, analyzing the evidence gathered, whatever evidence has been gathered, gathered you need to analyze those evidence and draw some fruitful um, uh, results from those evidences which you have collected. Okay. Then surveillance. He should physically monitor the entire factory, the entire space where the alleged fraud has happened. He should do the surveillance. Physically, he should go there. He should monitor the official emails and messages of the employees who have been involved in this fraud. Fraud. He should do this. Then going undercover. This is an extreme measure. Undercover means just like I did in um, uh, my case, guys. I uh, you know went to the shop without telling that I'm order of the company. I went to the shop and I asked for the evidences. Okay, that is going undercover. And this is an extreme case where you actually go undercover. So, you know, you um, um, uh, become the employee of the company and to understand what is the fraud being happening in the company. So you become an employee of the company. That is the undercover. <laughs> so these are the techniques in which forensic audit happens. Okay. <laughs> now, there are certain ethical considerations in forensic audit. What are ethical considerations in forensic audit? Ethical consideration means, um, uh, you know, while you are doing forensic audit, you need to take care of certain steps. You need to take care of certain things ethically. Okay, legally it might not be required. Legally you might be doing the right thing while doing while you are doing forensic audit, but ethically you should take care of certain things while you are doing uh, forensic audit. Number one, there should not be any harassment or discrimination. There should not be any harassment or discrimination. So if an organization is doing some harassment or discrimination, for example, they are preferring, um, uh, you know, male employees over female employees, or they are not giving appropriate, um, uh, you know, benefits to the uh, female employees in case of, say, uh, maternity or in case of uh, critical requirements, then guys, there's a harassment or discrimination which is going on in the company. And this discrimination calls for forensic audit and it um, uh, shall be subject to penal implications so physical abuse mental abuse and discrimination on the basis of age sex race religion is absolutely not permitted and in this case forensic audit might play a very important role health and safety uh, now appropriate suitable health and safety measures should be um, adopted by the company who's doing um, the work and if these measures are not um, uh, you know there in the company then it calls for forensic audit and it calls for um, auditing the entire um, system once. So fall protection, hazard protection, respiratory protection, ladder should be proper, electrical wiring, psychological um, hazard should be avoided. Then accounting practice. Now accounting practices are to be perfect. I mean accounting practices should not be um, uh, disgruntled which means that the audit software should be such that if anyone deletes an accounting entry its trail is available to the auditors so such accounting practices should be there if they are not there then forensic audit is required to be done so accounting practices accurate bookkeeping practices and no cooking in the books cooking the books cooking the books means um, uh, you are actually stating something which is not there in your accounting books non disclosure or spying uh, your current and uh, former employees might be stealing information like your current and formal employees might be stealing information. Um, in this case, forensic audit might be required. IP theft, intellectual property threat theft might be there. Okay, your critical data, which contains your critical, um, uh, you know, analysis and critical details, they might be under a risk. IP theft might be there. Non-disclosure agreement should be there. So the auditor should, um, you know, sign a non-disclosure agreement with the client that whatever information auditor will get during the course of forensic audit, it will not be disclosed to a third party. So non-disclosure uh, should be there. Then financial penalties in case of violation. If any disclosure happens by the auditor and outside world, then financial uh, penalties should be levied on the auditor. Then next is um, uh, technology or privacy practices. 
monitoring the employee activity may lead to privacy violation so sometimes when auditor or the forensic auditor when he evaluates the employees when he evaluates what employees are doing and evaluates when um, uh, what employees are emailing to each other uh, mobile phone tracking happens all these things may lead to privacy breach of employee so the auditor should take care that privacy laws should be taken care of while the audit is being done forensic audit is being done so that breach of privacy of the employees should not happen okay sir got it okay next is how to address ethical issues how to address ethical issues while doing forensic audit okay so how to address ethical issues in business so the uh, responsibility of ethics lies with the top management top management should be um, uh, proactive in giving training to the employees in monitoring what uh, unethical practices are going on and to take steps which will curb the ethical practices that is the responsibility of the top management second become, become aware about the harassment and anti discrimination laws in the country every employee should be made aware about the harassment laws which are there in the company country which anti discrimination laws which are there in the country and the penal provisions which follow thereon this is again responsibility of top management to make the um, uh, people aware about these laws then provide written policies and processes to the employees employees should be provided with written policies of um, uh, you know anti harassment and anti discrimination which is there in the company communication is the key guys communication is the key you should train your employees about the harassment laws or the unethical practices which are there you should train your employees training is very very important reevaluate and revise when needed wherever a revision is required in the training or in the uh, you know ethics uh, manual you should revise the training manual ethics manual next what are the challenges challenges in implementing ethics policy whenever you are implementing ethics policy uh, what are the challenges which you face as a management resistance from the employees employees generally do not uh, like change they then gen generally resist change so even when ethical policy will be implemented employees will resist it the way to deal with it is please communicate with the employees uh, properly tell them the importance of these ethics policies and tell them why these ethics policies are being floated in the organization and do communication properly then high cost of training so sometimes the cost of training is very high okay cost of implementation is also very high therefore implementing ethics policy becomes little difficult it's costly also then inability to determine the roi return of investment what is the return of investment uh, if we uh, employ these ethical policies in the company there's no return on investment there's no tangible return on investment there's intangible um, benefits which are there but tangible return might not be visible to the management so spending lakhs and lakhs of rupees without expecting any return is a difficult proposition for the management okay next is threats to auditor's independence threats to auditor's independence so guys auditor is generally independent the first feature the first definition that i had uh, taught you of audit was that audit is an independent examination of the um, books of accounts right that is the first definition which we had taught in our first lecture now what is this independent independence means that auditor should be free from any uh, force free from any uh, bias so what are the threat threats to independence of the auditor threat number 1 is self interest threat wherever auditor or is holding or his uh, uh, you know relatives are holding some financial interest in the company then there's a self interest threat auditor will not disclose the um, uh, the hanky panky stuff which is going on in the company because he will be afraid that his own money will be lost if he discloses all those things to the people so this is known as self interest threat his interest is there in the company therefore he is um, uh, you know uh, reluctant in disclosing the right information in the auditor's report second is self review threat self review threats means that if auditor is the internal auditor of the company and he is also the cost auditor of the company so guys we have studied in cost audit internal auditor cannot be the cost auditor of the company right we have studied in our uh, uh, you know uh, initial chapter internal auditor cannot be the cost auditor what is the risk self review threat he will review his own work not permissible under law next threat is advocacy threat advocacy threat so when uh, an auditor is uh, you know involved in promoting the company it is promoting the company then that particular auditor is uh, engaged in an advocacy threat so for example if the auditor is the commission agent of the company and he is promoting products of the company then he is actually running a risk of advocacy threat because he is himself promoting the company how can he say that the company is not good <clears throat> self advocacy threat familiarity threat 
the author and the client are so familiar to each other they are so known to each other that you know sometimes uh, it becomes challenging for challenge challenging for the order to do proper audit so familiarity thread means auditor and the client are very familiar to each other this is known as familiarity thread and last, last, last is intimidation thread what is intimidation thread that the client is so powerful that is going to pressurize the auditor <coughs> class the order is so the client is so powerful So I'll give you an example, guys. Suppose an order's fees is uh, not paid to the order for past five years. Order will always be under a uh, threat that if I report anything wrong about the client, then he will not give my fees. So this is known as the intimidation threat. Client is actually overpowering the order, and order is afraid of the client. This is known as intimidation threat. Afraid of the client. Okay. Standards of professional ethics. Um, so professional uh, conduct standards are there. Integrity and objectivity is one of the standard. Professional competence is one of the standard. Due professional care, understanding and communication with client. So these are guys professional standards, professional conduct standards, <clears throat> which means that uh, how professional behavior impacts the audit, and how professionally you should carry on the um, uh, you know audit. So what are the professional standards? These are the professional standards which are there in your syllabus. Okay. So yes. That's all for this particular chapter, guys. This was the chapter on forensics audit. Now let us start the next chapter. Next chapter is cyber security. Next chapter is cyber security. Then money laundering act and then cost audit program. Four important chapters of your syllabus we are going to cover today. Four important chapters and uh, the entire marathon will be dedicated to these theory chapters and you'll be able to revise everything very, very quickly in this short marathon session. Okay. <clears throat> now, what do you mean by security? IT security audit. Okay. IT security means information technology and guys, entire business is dependent on information technology. If information technology is not securitized, then our entire business is at risk. So in this particular session, we are going to study the IT security risk. What is the information technology um, uh, risk which is there? Information technology risk means our systems are not up to the mark. Our servers are not up to the mark. Our password protection are not up to the mark. This is known as um, uh, IT uh, risk and this leads to cyber security crimes. Cyber crimes are uh, very common in the country and what are the reasons for cyber crime they are uh, the risk which is posed by it security system so it system is weak therefore cyber crimes are at its peak so it security is to be maintained what do you mean by it security let us read that okay <clears throat> so objective of it security audit is to have a comprehensive examination of enterprise information security system what is information security system guys the software which you use the hardware which you use the password protection system which you use do you have an antivirus or not all these are um, information security system so information security system to safeguard the information security system we are doing it security audit what are the benefits it identifies the weak spot in it infrastructure whatever are the weaknesses in it infrastructure it identifies that then verifies the security um, status and control it complies with data security laws so it verifies uh, what are the security status controls controls are proper or not with respect to security of the data it identifies that and it complies with the data security law see the data security law which is there in the country <coughs> it actually adheres to those data security law okay then what are the steps in it security audit steps in it security audit are first of all you need to identify what are you going to do to define the objectives of the it security law the objectives of the IT security law, you should define that what you want to do. Then you plan. Plan means you need to ascertain uh, what steps do you need to do during the audit. You plan. You perform the audit work, report the results and take necessary action. So very simple IT security audit um, steps which are required to be performed in IT security audit. And guys, in most of the audit, same um, you know steps are required to be performed. Mostly same steps are required to be performed. <clears throat> okay. Now, what is cyber security and what are cyber forensics? So now we are going to study what is the cyber security or what is forensic audit in case of IT. IT system in case of banks specifically because guys today banks are entirely dependent on IT. Any kind of uh, fraud can happen in the bank if IT infrastructure is loose, if IT infrastructure is not strong enough, any fraud can happen in case of a bank. 
So it's very, very important to protect our IT infrastructure, information technology infrastructure of a bank. Be it the hardware, be it the ATMs, be it the debit cards, be it the swiping machines, everything needs to be absolutely perfect in case of a bank. So IT audit in case of banking sector, the objective is to safeguard the IT system of bank. We need our banks to be absolutely secure, the hardware, the software, the antiviruses, the people, the system, the documentation, everything should be absolutely secure. Data integrity is a very big issue with banks. You know, no data should be leaked from a bank to any unauthorized person. The um, uh, details, a list of the people who are holding accounts in the bank that should not be leaked at any cost. So data integrity is another issue. Maintenance of system effectiveness. You need to maintain the effectiveness of the system. Input output ratio must be optimum. Whatever input output is being, um, uh, you know, uh, fed in the system, that should be appropriate. Maintenance of system efficiency. Efficiency. The system should work according to fullest of its efficiency. Okay. <coughs> then, maintenance of system efficiency. These are the objectives. Okay. Scope of IT audit. Information technology audit. What is the scope? We need to plan for the IT systems audit. Then we need to monitor the activities of information system. And then we uh, examine the adequacy of the staff. Whatever staff is being employed, whether the staff is adequate or not, we need to actually ascertain that. <coughs> then, information system audit approach. What are the approaches which we uh, tend to uh, undertake in case of information system audit? What are the approaches? Okay. So, there are primarily three approaches. Audit around the computer. Audit around the computer. Audit through the computer and audit with the computer. These are three approaches which we undertake in case of information system audit. Okay. Audit around the computer means you check the output data, whatever output data is being produced from the computer, whether it is um, produced appropriately or not. So you check the data output data from the required input which are given. That is checking the correctness of output data. <clears throat> that is uh, audit around the computer. So we don't go, go inside the computer. We just see if the input and output are synchronized are similar to each other then we say that this is audit around the computer then what is audit through the computer we check the uh, system in detail hardware and software in detail we go inside the computer properly audit through the computer we go inside the computer properly then what is audit with the computer Audit with the computer means guys audit can be done uh, with the computer which means audit tools are there uh, inside the computer uh, there are certain softwares which are built for doing audits we use computer as a tool for auditing the uh, client or auditing the financial statement that is known as audit with the computer so audit around the computer audit through the computer and audit with the computer these three um, uh, approaches are there in case of systems audit approach <coughs> okay next is id audit methodology Guys, very simple. We have already discussed most part of it in our, um, uh, you know, earlier chapter. Planning needs to be done. Test of controls, test of balances, completion of audit. Four steps in I, uh, information system audit also. Planning, we need to plan the audit. Uh, what steps are required to be done? Who will perform those steps, etc., etc. Et test of controls, whether controls are operating fine or not. Then test of balances. Um, uh, what are the Competition of loss which would incur if information system fails altogether. What are the probability that information system fails and what is the probability of loss in that particular case? Finally, completion of audit. You complete the audit using this methodology. So, framework. Framework or concerns in IT infrastructure. So, what are the major concerns in case of IT audit? Safeguard of assets. First of all, we need to ensure that our audit assets are safeguarded. Hardware, software, data, everything is secured. That is the first uh, concern. <clears throat> data integrity is the second concern. Data should be secured. Business continuity planning. I mean, business should continue even when the uh, audit, uh, the, the IT is lapsed. IT system stops working even then business continuity plan should be there. System effectiveness. Should the system should be effective and efficient. And organization administration of the entire uh, IT uh, system should be there. Like who should be the personnel who do um, you know IT testing? Who are there? Who uh, whom we can help if IT fails, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the IT related audit needs to be done well. Okay, so this was the chapter on cyber security. Okay, second last chapter anti money laundering. This is a new act which has been introduced in your syllabus cost audit syllabus 2022 students only, which is prevention of money laundering act. Okay, I'll be discussing this in brief. 
in this particular lecture but yes in your syllabus guys it's in great detail it's in great detail okay so money laundering we'll be talking about money laundering in this particular part okay what do you mean by money laundering money laundering means hiding your money which is earned from illegal sources so whatever money you have earned from illegal sources if you try to hide that money so suppose if i do smuggling okay and after a smuggling i hide that money by uh, you know purchasing some land or purchasing from some property somewhere i try to hide that money okay that is known as money laundering money laundering means you earn money from illegal sources in cash obviously not in bank and then you hide it uh, under some <clears throat> some some source so i'll give you an example okay suppose i earn 2 crore rupees from an illegal activity now i don't know what to do with this 2 crore rupees because i cannot spend this 2 crore rupees because government will be asking me where do you get it from so i opened a fictitious dhaba at a highway a restaurant at the highway and i tell government of india that look i have earned cash income from this uh, highway dhaba i earned 1 lakh rupees per day from this dhaba and accumulated 2 crore rupees from the transaction so this is an activity which is uh, money laundering so you look for certain uh, avenues where you can tell to government of india that you know these are cash businesses and we get cash and therefore i earned cash from this particular business this is the uh, way in which money laundering is done so money laundering means you hide money you earn through criminal activities you earn this money through criminal activities and at places where they appear to be legitimate where they appear to be legal you hide this money at that place this is known as money laundering and it's a financial crime you look at this laundry this is a laundry you uh, enter dirty money in this and you get clean money so this is known as money laundering okay this is an offense in india okay harmful effects of course it is very harmful for the economy conversion of illegal money into legal money it uh, deteriorates the administrative order the country as a whole gets harmed terrorist financing <clears throat> terrorists are financed using this money then importance of anti money laundering act it saves the taxpayers money fights terrorist financing reports suspicious activities etc so, so these are benefits of money laundering any anti money laundering act okay these are typical anti money laundering um, uh, you know steps which are employed by any person who is doing money laundering okay steps are first you place the money then you layer it using different different um, transactions then you integrate the money first you place the money at a place where it seems to be legitimate then you cover it by using various layers you you uh, tend to rotate it as many times as possible then you integrate the entire money and use it for your purpose this these are the typical ways in which methods in which money laundering is done okay let us discuss these these ways in detail okay first is placement <clears throat> you inject the money into financial system you, whatever money you have earned through illegal sources you introduce it, it in the financial state system saying that it is cash money which i have earned this is the cash which i have earned and i have i have earned it using legitimate sources so you inject this money into the financial system second you layer this money layer this money means you spread this uh, this money into various different kind of alternative um, uh, 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 schemes and transactions and just to <clears throat> hide this money okay you layer this money you spread it into different transaction which appear to be legitimate but which are not legitimate and you spread this money that is layering third is integration then you um, uh, you know reintroduce this money back into the economy you invest this money in real estate you invest this money anywhere so i'll give you a practical example okay first of all i need to find a business where i can um, uh, you know place this money so i will find a cash rich business which is done in cash and i will place this money over there then what i'll do is i'll um, do some transaction within that business which can send which can place this money which can layer this money into different layers for example i will <clears throat> suppose purchase land from this particular land sell that land again buy a property sell that property buy a <clears throat> gold jewelry and etc etc et so i layer this um, uh, transaction in a way that the tax officer is not able to reach to the ultimate transaction okay i'll layer it and last is i will reintegrate it which means i will um, uh, sell off the uh, asset whichever whichever i purchased last and i will say that i got this money from that particular asset and i reinvested in my business no one is going to ask it so these are the three steps in which money laundering is done placement layering integration okay next is A requirement of financial institution now guys financial institutions are the hub where money laundering can be done and where money laundering can be controlled our banks our nbfcs are the hub where money laundering can be done and money laundering can be controlled both things can happen through the financial institutions so 
uh, guys, there's a, a organization which is Financial Action Task Force. Force. It is FATF, which has been set up by IMF, uh, International Monetary Fund. This FATF has instructed the financial institution of the entire world to take certain steps to stop money laundering. And in this particular chart, we are going to, um, uh, you know, uh, see those steps which FATF has told the government to do. <clears throat> General requirements. There should be a KYC of any customer who is um, uh, coming to you and opening the bank account. KYC is a must. Large currency transaction reporting, if there is um, a heavy currency which is being transacted within India or outside India, that should be reported to FATF. Suspicious activity should be monitored and reported to FATF. Then FATF says that you need to check the transaction parties against list of sanctioned individuals, companies and countries. So guys, there are certain a list of uh, you know countries and persons which has been uh, released by the FATF. If any transaction happens with those countries or with those individuals, then it is to be reported to FATF. So you need to check your transaction parties very carefully. So by you, I mean banks. While releasing account in any uh, in account, then banks should be uh, aware about this. Then ensure stability of international monetary system. That is the requirement of FATF. Technology artificial intelligence is used by FATF. Filing suspicion activity report. SAR is suspicious activity report. This is to be filed to FATF in a proper manner. Maintaining track of client risk rating. If client is highly risky, you need to maintain a uh, transaction wise list of your highly risky clients. So how do a client become highly risky? Guys, if in past he has shown some suspicious activities, he has done some suspicious um, transactions, then that particular client becomes a highly risky client. <clears throat> okay, so Prevention of Money Laundering Act. What is the um, objective of this act? To prevent the money laundering activity, which means to prevent any black money being converted into um, uh, white money. Confiscation of property derived. Now, this is a very, very important step of Money Laundering Act. Money Laundering Act authorizes the, um, the, the concerned officer to um, uh, confiscate the property which has been purchased from the black money. Attachment of property is prohibited. Possible in case of money laundering act, we will, uh, you know, attach your property. Attached property means we will um, secure the possession of that property and will not allow you to sell that property um, uh, anyhow. Provision of transfer, disposal, conversion of property will be there. Then arrest. Arresting powers are given in this uh, act. This act is a very, very powerful act. So a person who is involved in money laundering, even the chart accountants, cost accountants, and company secretaries who are assisting people in money laundering, they will also be arrested in this particular act. Summon, survey, search. Um, uh, this this um, uh, kind of repercussions are there in case of money laundering act cross border offenses directly they uh, go to the union Se union nation security council and those are discussed over there so this is a very very powerful act guys and this actually punishes the wrongdoers very very severely very very powerful act <clears throat> very powerful act okay international standards on conducting money laundering and financing terrorism profilation okay so there are certain international transactions international standards which um, uh, various countries government have introduced um, uh, you know to assess where any money laundering is happening okay so assessing risk and taking actions so first step is to assess the risk wherever there is a risk and to take immediate actions uh, for the money laundering uh, suspicion national cooperation and coordination guys it's very very important that all the countries must join hands against money laundering because what happens is that when countries are not uh, together, then a person who's earned money in India from illegal sources, he will dump that money in Dubai. He will dump that money in Pakistan. He will dump that money in Canada or Russia or wherever. So international coherence, international coordination is very, very important in case of um, uh, you know money laundering. So international standards say that every country should be related to each other, should be closely connected to each other with respect to the suspicious transactions. <clears throat> penalty prosecutions are very very high in case of such frauds and offenses financial institution secrecy laws should not constrain the fatf recommendation so there are secrecy laws which are there in financial institution um those secrecy laws should not be a uh, restraint to fatv tf consideration so guys um there's a live example that you know um uh, we ask government of switzerland to disclose the swiss bank account details of the indians which are there with them but swiss government denies it says that secrecy law is there in Switzerland and that secrecy law is not allowing the Swiss government to give us the details of the people who are having Swiss accounts in Switzerland. So secrecy laws of a country should not interfere with the FATF recommendation. Customer due diligence is required. 
reporting should be done in a proper manner nominee arrangement transparency beneficial ownership all these are small small steps which are <clears throat> internationally recognized by various um, uh, countries to fight against uh, money laundering and it's really important to fight against money laundering because money laundering is, has become a serious offense in any part of the world it has become a serious offense and if we actually don't stop money laundering then money laundering can actually kill an economy money laundering has the power to kill an economy <clears throat> kindly explain the notification on in including of all three professional and pml act okay so guys recently there has been introduction in a pml act there's been notification in the pml act what does that that notification says that notification says um if any chartered accountant cost accountant or company secretary is found to be assisting a client in doing money laundering then the provisions of the law which means penalty prosecution will be applicable to that chartered accountant company secretary and cost and account management accountant also so guys primarily who are the people who uh, uh, you know uh, guide any client on how to do money laundering who are the people they are the professionals so recent notification is uh, there in the uh, in 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 the public domain that if chartered accountants cost accountants and company secretaries are found involved in assisting the clients with respect to money laundering then definitely they will be sued they will be punished surprisingly i'll tell you a very interesting fact surprisingly lawyers have not been covered under this category sometimes lawyers are also involved in suggesting hanky panky stuff to their clients guys but lawyers are excluded from this notification so if lawyer is involved in um now uh, you know assisting the clients with respect to money laundering he will not be charged to the pml act but if chartered accountant company secretary and cost accountants are uh, you know uh, involved in money laundering then they will be charged to the money laundering act so that is the anomaly that is a i think this is a unfair treatment this injustice to chartered accountants cost accountants and company secretary um lawyers should have also have been included over here and why only lawyers any and every professional who is involved in assisting the client with respect to money laundering he should be involved in this particular law the definition should have been any professional so that is the recent amendment on this particular act sandeep Mish sandeep mishra had asked this question <clears throat> sir mera abhi salary khatam hua hai kya enough time hai december ke liye mohan is asking this question <laughs> guys december is a far fetched dream december is definitely very very फार सो इनफ टाइम क्या चार बार सिलेबस हो जाएगा डिसंबर तक तो नालायक ओके सो गाइज नाउ लेट स्टार्ट द लास्ट चैप्टर ऑफ आर थियोरिटिकल डिस्कशन ऑफ टूडे अगेन इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन सिलेबस एज वेल एज टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू सिलेबस बोथ द सिलेबस हैज दिस पर्टिकुलर कॉन्सेप्ट कॉल्ड कॉस्ट ऑडिट प्रोग्राम नाउ वॉट यू मीन बाई कॉस्ट ऑडिट प्रोग्राम गाइज इट इज अ प्लानिंग डॉक्यूमेंट जस्ट लाइक यू प्लान वेन एवर यू गो टू यू नो वेकेशन सपोज आई एम गोइंग टू मनाली फॉर अ वेकेशन आई विल प्लान वॉट एवर Uh, places i need to visit i need to plan uh, how do i need to go which bus do i need to board how many people will be there with me etc etc what budget is there everything needs to be planned similarly cost audit program also plans how each and every specific section of the financial statements is to be audited for example if revenue is to be audited then what are the steps which are to be taken uh, for auditing revenue if expenses are to be audited then what are the steps which are to be taken to audit the um, uh, those expenses so all the all the uh, planning all the um, uh, you know uh, planning needs to be done during cost audit program so cost audit program is a summary document which contains the plan of auditing each and every uh, financial statement head separately so there is a cost audit program for revenue for expenses for fixed assets for depreciation for um, debtors for creditors every head of the financial head will have a separate cost audit program this is known as cost audit program nothing but a plan so personnel who are the people who will be doing the audit first is personnel second is documentation what documents need to be prepared and how quality control is required to be done these are the three essential elements of any cost audit program then audit of products okay now these are you know certain examples whereby uh, you know uh, i'll be telling you how to audit a particular thing so if you are auditing finished goods if you are auditing finished goods then these are the four steps that you need to take you need to check the inventory balances you need to check the closing stock of previous year you need to check the capacity utilization you need to check reasons for abnormal capacity utilization so these are certain um uh, you know these are certain steps which you need to take while you are auditing finished goods audit of goods finished goods okay similarly guys in this entire chart i have given you steps which are required to be taken in auditing each and every account head like audit of raw material when you are auditing raw material what steps do you need to take okay 
these are orting to raw material orting of raw material similarly guys in this entire section i am discussing the way audit is required to be done audit of packing material how audit of packing material is required to be which is very similar okay like invoice is required to be taken payment is made on time this is to be ascertained then whether that good has been received in the company or not this has to be ascertained the very com common steps which if you read once then you will be, you will be able to understand them well okay so i need i need not go into each and every cost audit program separately so yes i'll be uploading these charts also in the google drive the google drive which you have i'll upload these charts and all the theoretical portion also pdf i'll upload it in the google drive so don't worry about that just read them once okay not a very uh, difficult or a very lengthy um, or a very uh, complex thing auditing steps are there what steps are required to be done while you are auditing salaries while you are auditing uh, expenses etc etc so only steps are there in this particular chapter which is cost audit program so let's not go deep dive into this particular chapter um uh, it is it is pretty uh, easy okay so yes guys that's all for today's live session yes we have covered four important theoretical chapters in this particular session <clears throat> tomorrow we'll be covering three important uh, uh, chapters which is management audit internal control and management audit in different functions and yes then we are through with our uh, uh, revision of all the important chapters of cost and management audit okay so that's all for this particular um uh, guys session and we'll be meeting in a subsequent session with um, more such intriguing conversations on audit cost audit and uh, other subjects as well so till we meet next all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you in the next session and yes today we are going to start our marathon of cost and management audit the theoretical portions are uh, is what we are going to touch base today all right so i would just like to highlight which all study notes are we going to cover in today's marathon and guys the total marks which will uh, be uh, in your hands after today's marathon will be approximately 30 marks approximately 30 marks will come uh, from this particular theoretical portion which i am going to cover today so this is your study material okay and we are going to cover the study notes theoretical study notes of your syllabus let me mark them for your ready reference all right study note number 9 we are going to cover today no not study note number 9 mm yes 10 study note number 10 we are going to cover today study note number 10 we are going to cover today study note number 11 we are going to cover today study note number 12 we are going to cover today study note number 13 we are going to cover today study note number 14 we are going to cover today that's it that's it so 10 11 12 13 14 5 five study notes we are going to cover today study note number 10 to study note number um 14 we are going to cover today 10 study notes and guys in all all these study notes are theoretical study notes and they will command about 30 marks in your examination about 30 marks will come from these five study notes which we are going to cover today if you are referring to my cost and management audit book if you are referring to my book then chapter number 8 chapter number 9 chapter number 10 these are the uh, three chapters which will summarize today's discussion for all of us so yes today is a theoretical um, uh, you know a marathon which we are taking uh, so obviously your question will be sir what about the practical portions you have not taken marathon of practical portions guys those who are not aware i know most of you must be aware marathon of basic and cost basic of cost and management audit is already saved on my uh, playlist in my youtube channel study note number 2 already saved marathon on my study note uh, on my playlist cost audit documentation already uh, there in my uh, study uh, in my uh, channel cost auditor professional ethics already marathon is there on the youtube channel overview of cost accounting standards till cost accounting standard 4 i have covered the portion in my marathon videos so all these marathon are already available on my youtube channel and if you are not aware where to look for these videos let me share my screen with you and let me sh share the um, uh, the place where marathons are already situated because many of you are telling me sir uh, when will you uh, give us marathon of cost and management audit guys cost and management audit marathon is already live on my youtube channel please go to the playlist this is the youtube channel which all of you love because you have love because of your love and affection we have been scale this youtube channel um, to a very high level 
so yes this is the youtube channel and if you go towards the end of this youtube channel uh, in the playlist you you will get a playlist of cma final cost and management audit please see this playlist you have to click on this playlist or you have to just uh, uh, click on view the full playlist okay view full playlist then you will be able to view full playlist okay this is the playlist of cost and management audit and guys if you scroll down scroll down these are the marathons of the practical portions of your syllabus whereby i have covered maximum of the practical portions of your syllabus in these marathons please look at this company rules 2014 okay these are again company rules 2014 again part 2 part 1 and part 2 okay then uh, one very important thing guys these two videos important amendments and cost audit the two videos the important amendments and cost audit videos these two videos are very very important from an exam standpoint please um, uh, you know go through these two videos uh, very well important amendments and cost audit this is relevant for june 2022 and december 2022 attempt so go through these two videos then we have cost accounting standard 4 which i have discussed in details and 7 which i have discussed in detail then rules rules part 2 cost audit program professional ethics cost accounting standards cost audit basic concepts then the strategy video most important video that you need today is the strategy video please go through this strategy video um, in detail because in this strategy video i have told you how to study in the last few days of your examination how to focus on the important points so do um, take note of this strategy video of cost and management audit please see this uh, strategy video along with all the marathon videos which are already saved on my youtube channel so yes marathon of cost and management audit um, uh, has been live for a long time now it's not today that i'm taking the first live session the live session um, uh, i've taken earlier also for these cost auditing um, uh, for the cost and management audit subject please share these videos with all your friends who are giving um, uh, you know examination in the forthcoming examination so that they also benefit from these marathon videos all right so now we are going to start the marathon of theoretical portion of cost and management audit mind it this theoretical portion is going to fetch you 30 marks full 30 marks uh, will be yours if you watch this marathon video completely if you just focus on this marathon video then 30 marks will be yours yes you will be able to score 30 marks so we'll be starting the first chapter for attaining these 30 marks all right let's start the marathon session yes sir so how's the josh in the house please tell me how's the josh in the chat box i want the answer how's the josh in the chat box are we all excited for this marathon videos and to score uh, uh, you know 30 plus marks in theoretical portion of cost and management audit are we excited are we excited enough please answer in the chat box are we excited to score good marks how's the josh in the room that's what i want to know how's the josh guys all right hi 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 everyone is saying hi okay all right all right everyone is excited about it piyush shrikant shreyansh manish jyoti vivek shushmita saurabh suresh ram mansi brilliant guys brilliant superb superb all right so let's start the marathon video of cost and management audit theoretical concepts and we are starting with the concepts all right before we start the concepts let me just send you the link whereby you can access these pdfs okay these pre pdfs you can access using a link i'm just sharing a link with all of you please use this link to access the pdfs which i'm going to share right now okay i'm just sending you the link in the chat box as well as i'll uh, save it in the description box also both the places i will save this link yes sir All right, here you go. I've uploaded the PDFs on the Google Drive, and I'm I'll be sharing the link with all of you. Yes, uploaded, done. All right. uh okay guys please check the uh, uh message box please check the check the message box 
I have typed the link of the Google Drive in the chat box. Please let me know if you have received that Google Drive link. That link will contain the PDFs which I am um, uh, discussing in the class. This PDFs will be available to you in that Google Drive link. You can download this PDF. You can even take a print out of this PDF to revise the entire theoretical portion of 30 marks of your syllabus. So these PDFs will be very, very, very useful to all of you. Also in the uh, uh, in the description box, I am saving the link of this PDF. That also I am doing right now. Right now I am doing it so that you don't face any problem in um, uh, accessing these PDF files because PDF files are really, really important. So I am saving the PDF files in the description box. Okay, in the description box, I'll be saving these PDF files for all of you. Just give me a second and I'll be saving it on the on the in the description box. Yes, so guys, I have saved the Google Drive link in the description box. You can access the video, uh, the, the PDF files from the Google Drive link. You can access it. You can print it. You can do whatever you want to do with these PDF files. You can share with your friends. So all of you have received the PDF also. PDF is available um, uh, on the chat box. I have sent the PDF. Then I have sent the PDF in the description box also. I have saved the PDF. So yes, PDF is now available with all of you. Now let us start the marathon lecture of cost and management audit, the theoretical portion. All right. So the first topic which you are going to start today in our marathon lecture is basics of management audit. Basics of management audit. So before coming on to the basics of management audit, I want you to understand what do you mean by management audit? What is the meaning of management audit? Guys, meaning of management audit is that, um, uh, you know, the management of the organization takes various decisions for welfare of the organization. These decisions which are taken for welfare of the organization organizations, <clears throat> it is to be made sure that these decisions are taken correctly. Obviously, there is a, a never a management which can take 100% decisions to the best of its ability. And um, there is no management in the world that can ensure that we will take 100% decisions absolutely correct. There is no uh, there is no um, uh, management in the world. You take management of Reliance Industries Limited. Do you think that the board of directors decision is always correct? No, guys. Their decisions are also only 80% times correct. 20% times their decisions are incorrect. So no management in the world can take 100% correct decisions. But now the catch is that the management should not also be such that their say 60% decisions are incorrect. That's an absolutely um, unacceptable norm. If a management's uh, out of 10, eight decisions are um, uh, incorrect, then there's a serious concern with that particular management. So what do you mean by management audit? Management audit means that we are going to appraise, we are going to audit the decision making capability of management and we are going to see where is the management going wrong? Why is the decision mat matrix of management of a particular company not going the way we want it to go? Why are they making wrong decisions? Why is company into losses? Why is company uh, categorized as a sick company? All these things we need to analyze using the simple, simple technique of management audit. Now, guys, one thing which uh, we should remember about management audit is that management audit is not a statutory audit. It's not an audit, audit which is, um, you know, required to be done by law. It is not a statutory audit. The management audit, um, uh, you know, the people who uh, are conducting management audit, they might or might not do management audit. Um, you know, management audit is absolutely voluntary. What, what triggers management audit? Guys, mostly the shareholders of the company, they want to get management audit done of their board of directors because shareholders are concerned that board of directors should make absolutely perfect decisions. Now, to make those perfect decisions, if the uh, uh, if the board of directors are not making perfect decisions, then shareholders sometimes force management audit on the board of directors. This is what is the usual phenomena. So owners of the company want to know why board of directors are taking wrong decisions. Why are things not going the right way? And that is the reason why um, uh, management audit emanates. So two important points which are uh, important to be noted over here is number one, management audit is non-statutory, which means it is not related to any statute. It is not governed by any law. 
any companies act any income tax act doesn't re mandatorily requires anyone to get management audit done so management audit is non statutory it is a voluntary audit if you want to do do if you don't want to do no one will force you to uh, uh, get your management audit done so that is the first point so first of all let's see what is the definition of management audit and it has recurred many times in the examination also management is the process of appraising the performance of the directors so the directors of the company their performance is to be appraised appraised means what appraised means assessed we need to assess the performance of the directors managers or in other words appraising the performance of the management of the company if we are going to assess the performance of the management of the company the top management or the middle level management of the company we are going to appraise the performance of the top level management or middle level management of the company that is known as management audit we are appraising we are analyzing we are scrutinizing we are assessing the um uh, management of the company we are assessing the um, decision making capabilities of management top level management of the company it attempts to look into all aspects of management performance so um, wherever management is performing whatever performance management is giving management audit tends to challenge or tends to audit that particular area for example management is uh, you know um, involved in production process management is involved in decision making with respect to um, uh, the the uh, um, distribution process and everything everything so all those areas are bound to get audited we want to know whether our management is taking right decisions or not that is the ultimate objective of management audit it does not concentrate on financial matters alone guys financial audit is only bothered about financial statements cost audit is only bothered bothered about cost statements secretarial audit is only bothered about secretarial records but management audit is not only focused on financial matters it is focused on non financial matters also so you know a very simple um, uh, example which comes to my mind management audit will also have a section which will describe whether management of the company treats the employee in a good way or not whether the employees are treated in a good way or whether the employees are not treated in a good way in the organization what is the behavior of the top management towards the employees of the company that is also an important aspect of management audit so effectiveness of management how effective is our management that is the point under consideration under management audit controlling the total activities of the organization in accomplishment of organizational objectives so whatever are the objectives of the organization those objectives should be fulfilled at the end of the day now 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 can you see a strange picture on your screen can you see a strange picture on your screen please tell me in the chat box what do you see on your screen what is this strange picture on your screen can you tell me what is this picture on your screen tell me what is this picture on your screen what do you see on your screen what is it please tell me what is this picture please tell me in the chat box in the chat box please tell me what picture is this in the chat box i want to know what is this picture oh good good honeycomb yes beehive yes beehive absolutely right swishmita is right beehive yes yes right beehive honeycomb okay beehive okay great 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 now please tell me now please tell me you are absolutely right you are absolutely right now please tell me if you touch this beehive if you touch this beehive or you throw a stone on this beehive can you see how many bees are there in this beehive yes lot of bees are there in this beehive now my question to you is if i pick up a stone and hit this beehive or not even pick up a stone and hit it even if i go near to this beehive and try to touch it i'm not trying to hit it i'm just trying to touch it what will happen to me in the chat box what will happen to me <laughs> what will happen to me damyanti vidya moshmi pramod jadav jyoti shrikant vivek lambate sangeeta shreyansh naga saurabh please tell me what will happen to me if i will try to touch this beehive or i will throw a stone on this beehive what will happen to me severely hurt become be, become a potato sir <laughs> ram is saying <laughs> sir you will become a potato <laughs> so shivita is saying severely hurt shamli is saying you will be hurt 
we don't want to imagine sir jyoti is saying we don't want to imagine don't even dare Sh sharan is saying inject it sarv is saying inject it <laughs> yes guys you are absolutely right if we even try to touch this beehive it will be harmful for us it will be very 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 harmful for us because beehive is not the thing where you should touch upon beehive is not a thing which you should even come closer to it is even unimaginable okay you are absolutely right similarly guys management audit is like touching a beehive top management of the company are typically the top notch people the top shots of the company and they are very very strong and powerful people who have been in the company for a very long time so if an external auditor comes to the company and he tries to do management audit and he tries to challenge the power and authority of the top management of the company th then <coughs> then this activity should be done um in a very very careful manner because it can also backfire it can also backfire they are very strong people management of the company are very strong people if you do not have adequate supportings to your observations if you are just making observations management decision making is bad if you are just making observations without any supporting examples or supporting documentation it might backfire it might backlash therefore one thing which you really need to understand while you are doing management audit is that please be very very careful in doing management audit please be very very careful because the top management might not like someone else challenging their authority someone else challenging their decision making capabilities so management audit is to be done in a very very um, a sound manner there should be adequate backup of everything which you speak whatever you are writing in your management audit report you should have backup of everything you should um, uh, you know there is no statutory guidelines for conduct of this audit so there is no methodology for conducting this audit but the riskiness is very very high on this particular kind of audits because it might backfire it might backfire you are almost trying to touch this beehive doing management audit is almost like touching this beehive so be very very careful in doing management audit in any organization that was the which i wanted to give using this pi okay sir got it now what is the coverage of management audit what all areas should management auditor see guys there is no limit to the areas which management auditor should see you know in case of financial audit they only see balance sheet profit and loss account statutory compliances um uh, they might see your vouchers they might see your fixed assets inventory etc etc that's it everything centered on, around the financials of the particular company is the focus of financial audit if you move to cost audit that they only only see your cost records like your cost sheet your cost statements your reconciliation between costing profits and financial profits that is all which a cost auditor would want to see in your um, uh, books of accounts if you move to secretarial audit they on only want to see your secretarial records if you move to tax audit they only want to see your tax records but in case of management audit there is no restriction on what a management audit can see he can look at anything and everything including whatever things i have just told you financials costing records uh, secretarial records they can see anything and everything so right from the organization the people of the organization administration of the organization manufacturing function marketing function finance function research function development function any function can be seen by the management auditor guys i was very privileged to uh, see one of the management audit reports of a particular company okay and there was a very peculiar observation in that particular management audit report what was that observation i'll tell you the observation in a very very uh, brief manner observation was that the guards of the company are saying that when in the morning the owners or the board of directors when they visit the company we give them a salute but they never salute us back they never acknowledge our salute so this was the acknowledgement this was a mention in one of the management audit reports which i had seen long long back and yes this um, uh, is a, is is a, is an evidence that management audit is not a restrictive audit it is a full blown audit which can have anything and everything in its purview <clears throat> nothing is away from management auditor's purview management audit has a very wide scope it can see anything and everything even the emotions and feelings of the guards of the company were also recorded in the management audit report so right from administration manufacturing marketing finance anything can be 
uh, uh, looked at by the management auditor. The audit is expected to cover every activity of the organization undertaken in pursuance of organizational objectives, policies decided by the board of directors from time to time. So whatever policies and practices are uh, decided by the board of directors, all those policies, whether they are being fulfilled on time or not and in principle or not this is the um, uh, sole uh, focus of the management auditors the various plans prepared by the management its policies programs procedures their audit is management audit so whatever policies programs procedures are prepared by the management entire thing will be audited by the management auditor so guys these are the functions which can be audited by the management auditor now guys i'll tell you a one very practical um, you know insight about management audit usually during one management audit the management auditor picks up certain parts of these functions it is not possible to cover all the functions in one management audit so they would in consultation with the shareholders would pick up certain parts and they would focus their audit on those parts in phase one then they will come back next year and next year they will focus on the rest of the parts so they split their work because the scope is so wide that it's not possible to cover entire organizations um, each of the departments are working together so they split their work so management audits um, purview is always restricted to whatever has been agreed with the management of the company that is why um, the uh, scope can be you know curtailed for, for the phase one it can happen in phases in various various phases so this is the concept of management audit now one very important theory theory of agency theory of agency that agency theory is applicable to management audit as well now sir what is this agency theory and why is it applicable to management audit i'll tell you the agency theory using a simple chart please see this chart which is there on your screen and yes this chart is there on the google drive the link is given in the description box please go to the description box please go to the google drive download these entire pdf notes i made them available to all of you for your quick reference all right this is the agency theory agency theory means what agency theory means if you have shareholders so there are shareholders of a company there are directors of the company and they are managing the company so this is the company okay so the shareholders have appointed the directors to perform management of the company so principal and the uh, the shareholders and the directors have got an agency relationship shareholders and directors have got an agency relationship which means what which means that the directors are the agents of the shareholders the directors are fulfilling the objectives which shareholders want to fulfill so directors are the agents of the shareholders this is the agency principle so shareholders would ask the directors to do some work what is that work managing the company so directors are accountable to the shareholders shareholders are the principal and director is the agent of that principal so director is um, not functioning independently director is functioning on the instructions of their principal which is the shareholder this is the known this is the uh, concept of agency theory now guys same theory is applicable on management audit it's also so the management auditors are the agent of the shareholders and the objective of management audit is to ensure that the directors are taking decisions appropriately and suitably so the management auditors are also nothing but the agents of the uh, shareholders and since this there's an agency relationship between shareholders and the directors this agency relationship is actually um, uh, you know uh, requiring the shareholders to vouch for the performance of the directors directors wants to um, uh, you know uh, the shareholders want to assess the performance of the directors and shareholders are appointing the management auditors to assess the performance of the directors of the company so this agency relationship which is there between the shareholders and the directors this agency relationship triggers the management audit so what is the basis of management audit this is this agency relationship between shareholders and the directors since shareholders are directing the directors to do certain things as their agents they want to appraise their performance also a management audit is a way to appraise performance of the directors of the company so it says an agency in broad terms is any relationship between two parties in which one is the agent and other is the principal and the agent represents the principals on a day-to-day -day transactions 
the principals or the principal have hired the agent to perform service on their behalf most commonly that relationship is one between shareholders or stakeholders as principals and company executives as agents <clears throat> so who are the principals shareholders are the principals who are the agents company executives company ex executives means board of directors are the agents of that particular um, uh, principal principal is the shareholders management audit extends the examination of accountability between management and others at a large audit mechanism ensures this accountability so the directors I've, I've told you in my earlier diagram please see this, this diagram again please see this diagram again directors are accountable to the shareholders directors are accountable to the shareholders now this accountability this accountability is to be tested whether directors are performing work to the best of their abilities or not and this testing will be done by management audit since shareholders want to know whether directors are performing their work to the best of ability or not therefore they hire management auditors since directors are accountable to principal who are the shareholders shareholder cannot analyze all the um, decisions of the directors very well so they hire management auditors who are the experts in this particular area so this is the backbone of management audit agency theory agency principle is the backbone of management audit now what are what are the objectives of management audit what are the broad um, uh, you know um, uh, targets or broad aims that we are uh, wanting to see in the management audit that is what we are going to see now all right screen is not clearly visible is my screen clearly visible someone is saying screen is not clearly visible i can see the screen clearly visible guys i don't see any problem please let me know if there's any problem in the screen okay now what are the objectives of management audit um, uh, what is management audit uh, uh, focuses on what are the aims which management audit tries to accomplish obviously the first aim is to appraise the performance of the management the words that i am um, highlighting those words are very very important from an exam standpoint also guys so appraise the performance of the management what do you mean by appraise appraise means assess appraise means assess or to analyze so the first objective of management audit is to analyze the performance of the management of the company and who gets this analysis done the shareholders gets this analysis done that is the first objective of management audit we want to know whether the performance of the management is appropriate or not second it highlights the decisions and activities that are not in conformity with the organization objectives so we want to know what are the decisions which board of directors have taken which goes against the um, objectives overall objectives of the organization what are the decisions which uh, management has taken which goes against the objectives of the organization and we want to know the reasons for those decisions so if any decision is made against the company why is this that decision made by the board of directors that is what we want to know so we want to highlight what are the decisions that are against the goals of the company because the ultimate objective is to uh, attain or obtain the goals of the company why are board of directors making such decisions which are going against the company we want to know that ascertain that objectives are properly understood at all levels so we want to know whether the objectives of the company which have been uh, clearly stated by the shareholders whether those objectives are being fulfilled or not whether those objectives are being understood by the management or not because you know shareholders do not want profit maximization shareholders want long term growth and board of directors are working towards profit maximization although both of them are working uh, for betterment of the company but the goals are not aligned the goals are not aligned so the um, uh, management should be aware the management should know um, uh, what are the goals which they need to pursue if management are not aware about the goals which they need to pursue then guys there is a problem so the management should understand the goals number 3 ascertain the controls provided at different levels are adequate effective in accomplishing management objectives or plans of operations so uh, guys yesterday in um, the yesterday's um, uh, you know live session i discussed in details about internal controls you had studied internal controls in your uh, intermediate as well control means how do we make sure how do we make sure that our objectives management ob objectives are fulfilled we need to have some checks and balances in the organization because organization is so big that management cannot itself come um, to check each and every transaction so all the transaction should be auto checked 
it should be an auto check check model so controls should be such that they ensure that management objectives are fulfilled for example you know management wants to ensure that there is no leakage of inventory inventory when it moves out of the uh, company it should be properly recorded no one should steal sometimes employee steals the inventory they sell it outside sometimes this happens in many companies so management wants to ensure that this doesn't happen so what are the controls which we will put we will ensure that whatever material goes out of the company's gate there should be a cctv camera which captures each and every material who is uh, taking that material out whether he has taken authority to take take that material out or not whether he has entered in the gate outward register about these material or not everything should be controlled so control should be very much in place evaluate plans which are projected to meet objectives so the management auditor should see what are the plans which the board of directors have made to uh, achieve the uh, objectives and if those plans are not good enough then management auditor can tell the shareholders to change the plans so what are the plans which uh, the management has to obtain the objectives they are also analyzed by the uh, management auditor review the company's organization structure that is assignment of duties and responsibility and delegation of authority very 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 important point guys usually when a company has a very heavy organization structure then management becomes difficult so you know there are various various verticals md sitting on the top and there are then there are several uh, uh, juniors to md then there are several, several other juniors to md then there are uh, hierarchy which is very very uh, lengthy hierarchy guys uh, the hierarchy which is very very lengthy hierarchy or if there are multiple companies subsidiaries and step subsidiaries and um, uh, uh, you know uh, further subsidiaries if there are hierarchy which is uh, very lengthy hierarchy then guys that will definitely affect that will negatively affect the organization so the uh, management auditor should review the company's organization structure or organization structure should be perfect organization structure should be absolutely correct in respect of the uh the company organization structure can be reviewed by the management auditor then optimum utilization of resources this should be um, uh, you know uh, analyzed by the management auditor man machine methods money material everything should be optimally utilized nothing should be wasted this should be analyzed by the management auditor uh then to highlight the efficiencies and objectives policies procedures and planning so whatever efficiencies can be gathered in objectives policies procedures planning whatever uh, we can do efficiently whatever work we can do efficiently in the objectives whatever changes uh, we can make to make our objectives policies procedure more efficient management auditor, auditor should highlight to suggest improvement in methods of operations so if there's any um, uh, operation which is carrying carried on and there can be some improvement in the that particular operation which can reduce the cost or increase the revenue this should be highlighted by the management auditor to highlight weak links in the organization structure whatever is the weak link in organization structure whatever is weakness in the organization structure or internal control system any weakness in the internal control system that should be highlighted by the management auditor now i'll give you a very very interesting um an uh, in example about internal control system which i usually give in the examination also to make you understand what is internal control system okay so i want to volunteers uh first volunteer is saurabh mukherjee okay and second volunteer is sushmita roy okay saurabh mukherjee and sushmita roy okay i have two students saurabh and sushmita okay now saurabh and sushmita are hypothetically in relationship with each other okay and sushmita is um, uh, no has has is aware that saurabh is taking coaching classes of cma in particular institute now saurabh uh, uh goes away from home at 7 30 in the morning reaches the institute at eight o'clock in the morning and then he stays in the institute till four o'clock in the evening reaches back at five o'clock at his home this is the usual um uh, uh you know uh, uh the tenure or the usual uh life uh, of of saurabh now sushmita is a little skeptical sushmita is a little um uh, you know a uh, uh, little bothered about uh you know why such a long period of coaching is there for saurabh okay so what does sushmita do sushmita would call up 
sister of saurabh early in the morning 7:30 and ensure that uh, yes saurabh has moved out of the home so yes sister confirms to sushmita that yes saurabh has moved out of the home then sushmita will call up the reception of the coaching institute and um, uh, uh, will make sure that saurabh has reached the institute the coaching institute yes saurabh has reached the coaching institute um, after a point in time okay then when saurabh moves out of the coaching institute then uh, you know sushmita will again call up the coaching institute will ask the coaching institute people whether saurabh has moved out the coaching institute people will say yes saurabh has moved out then after half an hour or 45 minutes she will call sister of saurabh to ensure that saurabh has reached home okay so guys this is an audit which is done by sushmita of the activities of saurabh but sushmita has not done complete checking she has only done control testing so whatever are the major controls she has tested those major controls that's it she has not done complete checking what if saurabh has bribed her sister saurabh has bribed the receptionist and saurabh has bribed both of them and saurabh has committed that uh, he will give dairy milk silk to both of them if they lie to sushmita this can very much happen the controls can go for a toss control can be lost so what should sushmita do to attain absolute assurance what should should sushmita do sushmita should hire a private detective who can follow saurabh in each of the classes who can sit inside the classes and observe the activities of saurabh that is not control testing that is complete checking of the transaction so there's two there are two ways primarily um, where audit is done number one is uh, control testing we test that controls are working fine and if controls are working fine then we are reasonably sure that the entire transaction is working fine that is method number one and method number two is um, a detailed um, uh, uh, you know uh, anal analysis or scrutiny of a particular transaction method number two is much more expensive method number two is much more time taking therefore that method is um, uh, taken only for key or important areas it is not taken for all the areas so control testing internal control testing is one of the major thing that is being um, checked by the management or that all the controls are working fine management should not bribe those control keepers to uh, his favor management should not do that okay so these are known as internal controls and internal control system should work perfectly because we can test internal controls more um uh, for more number of transactions as compared to checking the entire transaction we cannot do that so management auditor will ensure that internal control system is working fine and management is not uh, lapsing the internal controls management is not um uh, you know removing the internal controls this will be ensured by the management auditor so internal control should be working fine to suggest management by providing health indicators and help prevent sickness or help curve um uh, cure in case of sickness so if company is moving towards sickness sickness means situation where the net worth of the company is less and the accumulated losses of the company is more this is the situation where the company is uh, said to be sick company sick company means where net worth is less net worth of the company is less and the losses of the company is more in those situations the company is said to be a sick company okay so management auditor can suggest ways of treating this sickness management auditor auditor is like a doctor he is a doctor of management okay he can tell you that for this particular sickness you can um, take certain step to remove sickness so this sickness can be um, uh, you know uh, treated by the management auditor so it helps prevent sickness helps cure in case of sickness to anticipate problems and suggest remedies to solve them whatever problems uh, can arise in a particular uh, management that can be analyzed by the management auditor and management auditor can suggest the ways to improve those problems also so these are the objectives of management audit management audit wants to pursue these objectives now what are the needs or benefits of management audit what benefits can be expected out of management audit guys not a different concept the objectives can turn into benefits okay please be a little smart in uh, studying theory okay the objectives can only need lead to needs or benefits these are not two separate topics okay okay number 1 it helps management in framing basic policies of the organization and to define objectives two simple things management order will tell you that you have this problem your objectives are faulty please redefine your objectives you will redefine your objectives you will redefine your basic policies management order will help you in doing that number 2 management audit helps in 
preparing a viable and achievable plan so if your plan is faulty if your plan is faulty if your plan is not directed towards the objectives of the organization management order will help you to recreate that plan or to realign that plan according to your organizational objectives third it helps in setting organizational framework to implement the plans so the management order can also help you to implement the plan how to successfully uh, channelize the plan or implement the plan that will also be taken care of by the management order a management order can help you in designing the systems and procedures so that your work is not affected so to design the um, uh, procedures and systems what system should be followed in production process what system should be followed in distribution process or what sh system should be followed in collection process of um uh, uh, the money money collection process what should be the money collection process all these things will be um uh, taken care of by the management auditor so management auditor is a multifaceted person guys he will help you in many things in your plans in your execution everything will be taken care of by the management auditor it helps in designing and reviewing the management information system so management information system is the digital system guys which gives appropriate information to the management so if suppose management wants to know what are the sales for the period of june 2022 management information system will give the sales so management information system uh, is designed in such a way that it helps management in taking relevant decisions and it gives information to the management of the company it helps in coordination motivation and control of the operations it assist in swot analysis so management audit also helps in swot analysis strength weakness opportunities and threats these will be analyzed by the management of the company if um, uh, if if uh, management audit is required to be done it helps government in identifying improper or wasteful use of funds so improper or wasteful use of funds will be treated if you know the funds are being wasted if the funds are being um, uh, misused by the company then those funds will be um uh, that check will be done by the management order so management order can also be hired by the government of the india okay so government uh, can have some mismanagement within itself government uh, sub uh, government companies like psus psus can hire management order to ensure that the funds are not wasted to check extravagant uh, organization practices if organization practices are too extravagant they are spending huge amounts in unnecessary things all these things can be checked by the government of uh, india through management auditors okay because guys in government organization you must have heard that you know spending is lavish they don't uh, bother about spending money they don't feel pain in spending money because it's people's money right so management order can help in uh, curb the wasteful use of funds curbing inefficient use of physical resor resources so the management order can also curb inefficient um, uh, use of physical resources especially especially in public accounts then indian financial institutions banks board of industrial financial reconstruction bifr have found management order useful in monitoring sick industrial units and to help units in their rehabilitation so now what is the use of indian financial institution or banks or board of industrial financial reconstruction uh, organizations these organizations are targeting the sick companies in india and they help them in terms of monetary uh, benefits in terms of management related guidance they help them to achieve their desired targets so there are sick companies which are loss making companies um, uh, the management order can help them it reviving their sickness and making them profitable again and who will uh, uh, you know uh, uh, make them revive the bif b board of industrial financial reconstruction bifr will help um, them to reconstruct through management order management order will visit those sick companies and he will analyze why these sick companies are sick and he will um, uh, give you the suggestions to uh, revive these companies railways of india have used management audit in their finances to open discussion by public to improve the resource mobilization reduce cost of operations and conserve their scarce resources so railways of india have found management audit very very useful they have employed management auditors to um, uh, you know manage their operations reduce the cost of operations reduce the um, uh, cost at various places and mobilize the resources my railways have used it it can help in analyzing social uh, social cost benefit analysis for public projects like dams powerhouses national highways etc so guys all these projects like dams powerhouses when you construct them there is a social cost to it you have to cut down many trees you have to disturb the ecology of that particular area then the river flow you will stop that river flow if you make a dam over that river that river flow will stop 
all these problems will arise if you um uh, you know if you uh, don't do social cost benefit analysis of these things now these problems can be curtailed if management order comes into picture and he would analyze before the project starts whether this particular project will um, uh, have any social ramifications or not he will analyze it it is essential whenever a unit is planned to be taken over or amalgamation or merger with another unit is proposed so whenever amalgamation happens wherever whenever um, two companies are joining hands in that scenario the uh, take over plan or amalgamation plan is not successful unless rental management auditor comes and um, uh, you know uh, analyze the organizations scope of management audit what all areas can management audit touch guys i have already told you unlimited scope is there unrestricted scope is scope is there management audit can be very very vast it can be very very vast okay since management audit is very very vast therefore uh, the scope is unlimited so management will uh, management audit does not have any predefined specific area of conducting audit it is much wider in scope so it is the decision of the um, person who is hiring the management auditor and the management auditor what all to what to what extent will this um, uh, management audit be done now the suitability of plans activities decision of the organization with the desired objectives and aims now um, the management and board of directors uh, all all of them are following the policies to pursue management goals okay so now the scope will be defined according to the uh plans and activities and decisions which are directed towards the desired goals all the uh, scope will be directed to those activities current image of organization among customers general public within its own particular industrial or commercial field so um uh, what is the image of the organization amongst its members amongst amongst its customers that image whether it needs to change or not whether it needs to change or not this will also define the scope of management audit so while determining the scope of management audit we need to first consider the plans objectives of an organization where does organization want to go secondly what is the image that uh, which this particular organization carries in the market at large whatever image this particular organization carries whether that requires a change that is also a consideration while calculating while um, ascertaining whether uh, management audit is required or not then efficient utilization of resources of the organization that will be definitely a scope of uh, management audit rate of return will definitely be a scope of management audit management audit will definitely check what is the return which shareholders are getting on their invested capital then management audit will check the relationship of the business with its own shareholders investing public in general employee relationship will also be seen by the management order what is the relationship between employer and employees and i've already given you an example guys in my live experience um there was an observation of the employees of the company although very very small observation but a grave observation which came in the management audit report the aims and effectiveness of management at its various levels such as top level middle level and operational level so what is the effectiveness of management at various levels this will be scope of management audit financial policies definitely finances will be one of the areas of management audit for sure controls production sales distribution any other function of organization will all be part of management audit then what will be the qualities of management order what should management order possess um should he be very very expert in companies act should he be super expert in companies act should he be super expert in um income tax act uh, 1961 what should be the um uh, you know expertise of the management order what should management order do what uh, should be the what should be his expertise no guys management order uh, should not be a companies act expert management order should not be a auditing expert he should not be a taxation expert no 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 guys see the qualities of management order see the qualities of management order he should be able to understand the business problems first of all he should be aware about what are the problems that a business face then he should have general understanding on motive purpose and objectives of the organization what is the thing that organization is changing chasing is it chasing profitability or is it chasing long term growth that is the objective <clears throat> then he should be able to assess the program of the management so management order is nothing but um, a programmer of the management so he should be able to chase or align himself with the management's objective then he should have knowledge about principles of delegation of authority because management is all about delegation management is all about delegation of authority so he should be aware about the principles of delegation of authority then he should be able to understand the internal control devices flow charts flow of work etc 
he should be able to understand then of course guys basic knowledge of company law custom law labor law should be there with the management order and um, if that is not there then he will not be able to analyze the financial aspect of a particular transaction so these understandings are definitely required by the management auditor ability to prepare reports to various levels of management um, uh, so the management auditor should have the ability to prepare reports to the various levels of management report writing is one of the very important um, you know uh, skills which a management auditor should have in brief he should be able to write many things okay report writing skills are very much required by management auditors capacity to adjust personnel of different types with tact so he should be very adjusting in nature which means he should be able to extract the necessary information from various people of the organization so he should have the capacity to adjust the personnel of different types of tax etc now what are the functions of management auditor the functions of management auditor will include marketing manufacturing human resource personnel finance research development anything and everything anything and everything should be the functions of management auditor he should venture into anything and everything of course for once he cannot uh, analyze everything so he should in phases analyze things so in first phase he can analyze marketing human resource and research and development department in the second phase he can analyze manufacturing personnel and finance department this is this is how he can divide his work but his work is wide wide in scope okay then i'll quickly come to sources of information to management auditor now this is an important um, point guys uh, from where will the management auditor obtain the necessary information where will he get to know whether uh, a management um, uh, is is doing production function properly or not where, what is the source of information which management auditor will um, uh, you know uh, see to uh, have knowledge about the information so the sources of information of management auditor are number one management survey management auditor can prepare a questionnaire can prepare a survey whereby management will answer certain questions and based on that questions management auditor will further uh, analyze the situation so for example you know survey questions can contain um, questions to the production managers and the production uh, team uh, you know uh, whether the input output ratio is as per the industry norms what is the input output ratio of the industry and what is the input output ratio which is attained by the company this quick comparison if it is given by the production team then management auditor will be able to know about the inefficiencies and wastages very very easily simple guys if uh, the management auditor uh, you know takes care about the um, uh, the input output ratio if it uh, asks the input output ratio from the management then definitely he will be able to understand whether production is doing fine or not so this is the best way to identify possible control weakness through this technique practical working information is obtained on functions and how it is actually functioned so the management um, uh, will be able to uh, understand the management order will be able to understand what are the difficulties in a particular area using management survey guys uh, you must have also seen you know um, you know when you go to a particular facility like a hotel a restaurant they ask you to fill up a feedback form whether the ambience of that particular restaurant was okay or not whether the food was okay or not whether the staff was courteous enough or not all these things are in a check box manner in a checklist all these things are tick or not tick by you that is management survey that precisely is management survey that is management survey okay sir got it so this is a form which you will get in your management survey then management reports so guys uh, you know there are various management reports which management auditor does not prepare it is prepared by the management or it is prepared by any other third party um, uh, expert for example statutory audit report guys even statutory audit report will give many hints to the um, uh, to the management auditor with respect to the expenses and income of a particular uh, organization and then management auditor can, can tell that yes your expenses are shooting up at a very high level why are they shooting at a very high level why is a uh, personnel expense at such a high level management can then question it management auditor can question it so there are various management reports which if given to the management auditor he can take hints from those management reports and the management auditor can actually um, start his working or start his uh, analysis using the information which is given in management reports the auditor's review of management and internal reports may be used to obtain information on progress status or accomplishment of work and also on information of possible problem it is a management auditor can obtain the management reports from the management management auditor can say okay give me last year's financial statements on audited report give me last year's physical verification report 
give me last year's internal report and then after reading that internal report or statutory report management auditor can take a hint on how is the organization functioning so yes, this is the second source of information of management auditor which is management um, uh, report then internal audit or inspection reports guys uh, these are also management reports internal audit report or inspection report will give an insight on how the uh, how the um, uh, the things which are there in the uh, organizations like the inventory like the fixed assets whether they are actually um, uh, inspected and they are there or not or there is there any uh, leakage in the uh, uh, in the uh, system physical inspection of course the management order can physically visit the plant it can physically visit the floor to ascertain what are the wastages which are there sometimes seeing is believing okay seeing is believing means uh, when you visit a particular office then you are unable to understand what are the wastages which are there in this particular office so physical inspection is also another technique of gathering information discussion with officials and employees this is a very famous and a very simple way to start your management audit you discuss your uh, problems with the uh, management or the employees discuss their problems with you uh, so that you can um, put those <clears throat> problems into perspective and you can analyze what are the reasons of these problems so discussions with officials and employees is a very very important tool to analyze the uh, requirement of management report <clears throat> then testing and procedure testing procedure and uh, practices test checking of practices and procedures in the problematic area on a sample basis can be um, uh, you know one of the areas of uh, gathering information about the management so we test the procedures whether they are working fine or not we test the practices whether they are working fine or not and these tests will be then evaluated for a uh, management report so this these are the these are the ways in which management order can gather the information Okay, guys, just give me one minute. I will just put charger on my laptop and I'll be just back. Give me just one minute. okay so the next is technique of management audit what are the techniques in which management audit can be done what are the uh, you know analysis the point of analysis which can be done by the management auditor that is what we are going to study now so management auditor can have accounting and economic techniques guys these techniques are used by you also for analyzing the financial statements of a particular company like break even analysis these are very basic accounting and economic techniques okay these are not related to people these are not related to uh, non monetary things these are only related to monetary things like you know break even analysis can be done budgetary control system can be analyzed cost management techniques you must have studied in your scm strategic cost management you must have studied the cost management techniques discounted cash flow technique net present value method technique cost benefit analysis so these are very basic accounting techniques which are used by management auditors to ascertain the financial health of the company please note that this only highlights the financial health of the company yes sir then there are certain scientific techniques like computer models to take decisions on a material mix product mix make or buy decision so guys uh, board of directors would have taken decision on material mix um, x and y both are to be uh, mixed in which ratio to get the optimum output this is known as the material mix now management would have taken the decision but the decision is wrong so management auditor should take this decision again using the computer models or using using the scientific te techniques to ascertain whether the material mix is appropriate or not to ascertain whether the product mix is appropriate or not so these are certain scientific techniques the network analysis then mathematical programming linear programming 
all these are scientific techniques whereby the management order can analyze whether the um, decisions which are taken by management with respect to production with respect to um, selling are correct or not then there are statistical techniques statistical techniques means um, uh, guys uh, we had studied statistics in our um, uh, uh, you know in our foundation level and some bit of statistics we had studied in our intermediate level in form of om organization management okay so those techniques can be used by the management to a certain uh, to uh, by the management order to a certain whether management is taking right decisions or not like monte carlo simulation right exponential smoothing interform comparison activity sampling so these are certain statistical tools which are uh, which may be used by the management order to know whether the decisions which are taken by management are correct or not then personal technique um, which means people related technique what is the attitude and aptitude of people you can do a survey within the people what is uh, attitude of people with respect to the management of the company whether people are very um, uh, angry with the management of the company or whether people are very um, happy with the management of the company this is personal techniques aptitude test attitude test ergonomics man machine relationship training methods profitability productivity measurement then there are certain general techniques like statistical theory of management is an attempt to emphasize what should be the practical approach to a problem brainstorming you can simply do a brainstorming brainstorming means you can sit with various people of management you can sit with various people of management and discuss discuss what are the issues which they face discuss what is the resolution of those issues so brainstorming is a very normal general technique transfer pricing management by objectives management by exception what is management by obje objectives management by, by exception this is whether management only focuses on the key areas which are relevant for the organization or whether management waste its time on taking uh, very minuscule small 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 decisions if management focuses on very small 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 decisions then management's time is getting wasted guys if their time is getting wasted then that is not a good indication for the organization then management evidence what are the evidences um, which can be gathered by uh, the management auditor uh, so you know in case of financial audit the evidence are very uh, same very very uh, you know simple like you get vouchers you get invoices but what evidence will you get as a management auditor for the decision making capacity of the management what evidence will you get it is difficult to collect evidence in case of management auditor um, uh, in in case of management or it is difficult to gather evidence so so what evidences will we gather for uh, proving that this management is bad or this management is good what are the evidence which we collect the discussions with the people will be the first evidence guys there are no tangible uh, evidences discussion with the people whatever people have said about management that will be the first um, uh, evidence which we have against the management of a particular company and guys this should be recorded well this should be in recording with you this should be recorded by you properly because you should not be in air saying that management is bad because we have discussed with the people second ev evidence is survey and review of various reports of the organization when we had asked for various reports like financial audit report then you know we are able to understand that current ratio is very bad of a particular company then guys survey and review of various reports is again a very important tool to analyze the management of the company physical inspection we can actually physically um, wherever we have visited physically so if we have visited the godown physically then we are aware that in the godown there is no system of inventory in and out in and out bins are not there uh, proper recording is not being done in the um, uh, in the warehouse all these things we will get to know when we physically visit the warehouse okay so physical inspection is again a management evidence then test examination of various transactions whatever tr transactions have happened the examination of those transactions important files is an evidence monthly performance review statement minutes notes to above all uh, personal observations so minutes notes per uh, monthly uh, uh, performance statements all these are management evidence which management will give you so what is the constituents of management audit team who all should be in the management audit team should all the cmas be in the management audit team or should all the chart accountants be in the management audit team because guys in cost audit obviously there will be all all will be cmas or cma interns or cma articles all will be cmas right in financial audit team all will be chartered accountants or articles of chartered accountants but in management audit same profession people are not required we need people from multi disciplines for example we need chartered accountants we need engineers we need mbas we need financial consultants financial experts 
so the team of management audit cannot be restricted to only cmas it has to be wide in scope so marketing finance manufacture expert of all these areas should be there in our team production material every every area expert should be there in our team now what do you mean by management audit program first of all what do you mean by program guys program means plan program means plan so whenever you go for a picnic you plan out things plan out means where should you go who all from a family member should go what food do you need in the picnic what to drink do you need in the picnic uh, what do you need are uh, you do you need a mat to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, sit in the picnic in the garden all these things are required to be planned and this plan is known as program so management audit is also required to be planned how many people are required what will be their qualification what will be their responsibility what will be their um, area of accountability all these things should be predetermined this is known as the management audit program now first of all we need to know the organization's objectives and plan what are the objectives which the management is pursuing that we need to know then we need to study the policies and practices of the management what is management actually practicing what is management actually doing on ground to attain the objectives critical review of organization structure we need to know the structure study of systems and procedures evaluation of operations study of efficiency of use of physical resources maintain suitable monitoring system through management information system check the adherence to statutory obligation above all review efficiency of manpower handling which ultimately results in organization structure so as all these things are required in the management audit program first is the organization plan second is the policies which management is following in that organization plan third is the structure of the organization what is the structure of the organization whether the structure is um, a suitable structure which is yielding profit or not what are the systems and procedures in the organization uh, we need to evaluate the operations then what are the operations which are inefficient what are the operations which are efficient that we need to analyze then we need to exercise proper management control maintain suitable monitoring system through management information system management inf information system should be uh, uh, properly monitored statutory obligations should be adhered to then efficiency of manpower handling should also be done then what are the characteristics of a good management audit report now how will you say that management audit report is perfect in all respects okay it should be relevant first of all the management audit report should be relevant it should not contain unnecessary information so for example um, now you know uh, if there's an information that at a very very junior level um, uh, the salary of one of the employees was not disbursed it was it was disbursed two months late guys this information is not relevant for the top management what would top management do of this information that some um, uh, you know junior level staff's uh, salary was uh, disbursed two months delayed what would management do of this information so this information is not relevant to the management so the first thing that is to be there in the cost audit report cost, uh, management audit report is that it should be relevant it should pertain to the purpose pertinence it should pertain to the purpose for which it is serving second is it should be comprehensive which means it should cover all the aspects of the organization all the aspects of the organization or all the aspects of the a chosen area should be there in the management audit report it should be comprehensive so for example uh, you know if you have chosen production function as your subject matter of management audit then all the departments of production function be it uh, a quality check be it the people who are infusing raw material to the uh, uh, to the uh, um, machine line be it the people who are packaging the final product be it the people who are transferring the final product to the uh, trolleys and trucks the entire each and every entire aspect of production function should be analyzed so the uh, audit report should be comprehensive brevity the audit report should be brief guys i'll tell you very very important thing okay as you move up the ladder up the ladder means as you move uh, to the different level of management hierarchy your attention span reduces 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 so a ceo's attention span is very very less or a cfo's attention span is very very less he cannot listen to your lengthy lengthy story 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 you have to be to the point you have to tell the exact point you have to be to the point they cannot uh, uh, you know go on and on and on with your story story stories they cannot go on and on and on so your audit report should be brief your audit report should be concise that is the point your audit report should be very very brief the audit report should be issued in a timely manner which means audit report is to be um, uh, issued within a few weeks of the conduct of audit it should not so happen that audit report is being issued so you know two years 
uh, down the line um, when all the problems which existed in the management have been resolved automatically. So, guys, in case of statutory audit, cost audit, and any other audit, there is a fixed timeline which is given. There is no fixed timeline in management audit, but it should be released in a reasonable time. It should be released in a timely manner. Motivating. So, management audit report should not be demotivating. It should be motivating. So you should not highlight all the negative points in the management. You know, you should not say that the management of the company is uh, very bad. It is not taking good decisions. It should be changed completely. No, it should not be uh, written in a negative language. It should be written in a positive language. Example is given to you. The production planning was done inadequately. It may be written that the production planning may be improved by taking the following steps. So negative language should not be used. Positive language should be used in your audit report. Formatting and presentation is very, very important, guys. Font size, spacing, font type, this should be adequate, okay? Um, uh, because this enhances the quality of the audit report. Although the content of the audit report is most important, but its presentation is also equally important. So the font size, the font type, all these things are relevant in case of a management report. So all these things are taken into consideration. Now, contents of management audit report, what all things uh, should be there in management audit report? So four important things which are uh, required in management audit report is facts person who are responsible for the uh, the areas which are being audited person who is responsible for these facts then deviations if any in the actual performance standards and effect of result of the financial and physical status of the organization so these are four important things that a management audit report should contain it should contain the facts it should contain the people who are responsible it should contain the deviations if any uh, from the performance so report must allow the management to what is the objective which management uh, uh, wants to pursue it wants to study the comparison what was the cost earlier year what is the cost current year comparison should be there, there in the management audit report Review of organization to appraise the effectiveness of executives. Um, uh, what are the executives doing? What are the uh, directors doing? What are the efficiency of the executives? Departmental weakness should be there. Then prudent management practices. Uh, how can Im we improve the management of the organization? That should also form part of management audit report. Help in change of management mindset. Indicate suggestions that come from people themselves and get solutions to the problems. So all the problems, problems, problems should not be written. The solutions to the problems should also be written in the management audit report. So these are the essential elements of the management audit report. Now, guys, in certain cases, in certain sector, there are certain special reports which are um, expected from the management auditor. There are certain specific things which, they are, which are to be introduced in the management audit report in certain sector. For example, if you are doing special audit of a bank, <clears throat> if you are doing management audit of a bank, then guys, they will definitely expect that <clears throat> the debt servicing bit of bank should be clearly disclosed. What do you mean by debt servicing? Debt servicing means um, uh, how well is bank um, uh, servicing its debts? Whatever debts bank has, how well is it servicing its debt? So for example, if bank has given loan to someone or has taken loan from someone else, then is the interest component which is being paid or which, in be, which is being received is adequately done by the bank. Similarly, creditors want to know whether uh, the statements which are made in the report are accurate and reliable. The statement of financials are accurate or reliable. Creditors want to know the credit worthiness of the company. So creditors also want to know um, uh, all the statements by the order should be clear and positive. Explained notes should also be there. So guys, bankers and creditors want to additionally know the want to additionally know the security due of debt servicing. What is the debt servicing capacity of a particular organization? So banks want to know if a loan has been given to the company. Then banks want to know that whether that loan can be uh, uh, repaid by the company or not. So if you are doing management audit of uh, on behalf of a bank. If you are doing management audit on behalf of a bank for a company, then you should necessarily include whether the company will be able to uh, repay the loan or not. This aspect should necessarily be included in the management audit report. Naturally, guys, if bank has hired you as the management auditor, it will definitely want to know whether the loan which it has given to the company will be repaid or not. Then what would shareholders want to know from the management auditors? What would shareholders want to know from the management auditors? That is the next question. Guys, shareholders want to know uh, about the organization's business, first of all, okay? 
full facts about the organization business whether the organization business has been carried on properly or not they want to know right and correct message they want to know right facts and correct facts okay they want to know in the prospectus whether right information is given or not in the prospectus because shareholders are bothered about prospectus while taking the shares so they want to know whether pro prospectus is showing the right information or not then uh, shareholders also want to know between the line implications of auditors report so ultimately you know the auditors the financial auditors uh, sometimes try to mince with words in the financial audit report so the shareholders want to know the unknown facts what is the between the line uh, which is written in the auditors report so whenever you are hired by the shareholders as a management auditor you should additionally keep uh, in mind these important points okay what would employees want to know what would employees want to know from the management auditors guys employees would uh, want to know uh, the obviously the business the business employees want to know what is the business being done is it done efficiently or not then the unions of the employees want to know if there is any misconception uh, with respect to the management of the company that you know management of the company does not give bonuses even when they have profits sometimes union feels that so the management order would ensure that it sees the financials and sees that um, you know bonuses where if they are not being given then there's a reason why they are not being given okay so management order will ensure that the report must gain confidence of the employee and on respect of the statement report should be considered the needs of the employee so whatever employee needs from the management audit report that should be included in the management auditor um, report auditor's view will be expected to be totally unbiased small businesses if some small businesses have hired you as the management auditor of some big big business okay so if um, uh, you know sometimes um, all the small small vendors of reliance industries limited want to know whether reliance industries limited is um, uh, treating the management properly or not so small businesses want to know whether the um, uh, big business is treating everything right or not so they can hire management auditor with respect to reliance industries limited report to be designed <clears throat> designed in a very simple way if it is specifically directly to to any person or small group of person suggestions in the report must be based on proper appraisal of the problem <clears throat> okay sir and yes we are moving towards the last topic of our um, uh, chapter which is management audit and operational audit now guys there are two words management audit and operational audit there are two words management audit and operational audit now operational audit means we want to ensure that all the operations are being done in appropriate manner efficiently without any inefficiency the operations are being carried out so operational audit is focused towards operations like manufacture like production like distribution like finance everything should be done in a proper manner that is the objective of operational audit now what is the objective of management audit management audit focuses on operations as well as all other parts of the organization like finance like customer care like creditors care like shareholders care everything is included in management audit so management audit although has got a very important cons uh, 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 constituent as operational audit operational audit is definitely an important aspect of management audit but management audit is wider in scope management audit is wider in scope operational audit is a part of management audit but yes operational audit is the major part of management audit so if i were to uh, uh, tell you some number 70% of management audit is operational audit 60 to 70% of management audit is operational audit so management audit and operational audit are two sides of the same coin however management audit is a little wider term because it includes um, a financial audit cost audit company secretary audit along with the operational audit so operational audit is just a part of management audit but operational audit is a very big part of management audit so management audit is wider in scope as compared to operational audit management audit auditor is concerned with management quality of management whereas operational audit is concerned with quality of operations of an organization okay so i'll show you a coin okay this will tell you what is the relationship between acha just underline one very important line guys very important line it is not that he just verifies the operations of control procedure fulfillment of plans in conformity with the prescribed policies so the management auditor is not only uh, uh, you know uh, analyzing the operations of a company he is doing much wider role so we can say that we can say that the two audits are complementary and supplementary to each other this is the statement which i am going to highlight so management audit and operation audit are two faces of the same coin 
this is the same this is a coin right 10 rupee coin is there heads tails management audit and operational audit are two faces of the same coin they are complementary and supplementary to each other management audit is incomplete without operational audit <clears throat> and operational audit will be a uh, little less if management audit is not there operational audit is not sufficient enough management audit will be incomplete without operational audit so they both are um, you know they both are uh, congruent to each other they are both aligned with each other all right and we move on to the last aspect of our uh, uh, topic guys management audit internal audit and financial audit the difference between these three kind of audits okay now management audit appraises the management internal audit assists the management in identifying problems with re res respect to operations internal audit is typically focused towards operations okay so it uh, helps the management in ident identifying problems with respect to operations management audit identify problems in the management internal audit identifies the management uh, identifies the problem with the management let me repeat management audit identifies the problem in the management internal audit identifies the problems with the management so that is the difference financial audit cost audit these are specific audit which are done in specific areas okay like financial audit only focuses on financial statements cost audit only focuses on cost statements secretarial audit only focuses on secretarial assessment so these are specific areas audit so management auditor is a friend philosopher and a guide internal audit is a policeman or a judge who will judge your performance he is a friend philosopher and a guide management auditor and uh, a normal audit is a watchdog or a judge okay outside team or management conducts uh, management audit similarly internal or external person does uh, internal audit so both of these are same both of these are same specifically designated person for these statutory audits because these are held by law <clears throat> force voluntary this is statutory in some cases voluntary in some cases this is mostly statutory guys this is mostly statutory area complete management is the area main mainly these are procedural aspects which are area of internal audit and statutory audit has specific uh, objectives similarly guys uh, effectiveness and quality of management is the evaluation which is being done quality of procedures is the main area of internal audit in case of statutory audit specific information is required like financials are prepared according to ifrs or not that is a specific information which is required period covered past present future past and present is covered in uh, internal audit mainly past is covered in statutory audit procedure flexible structured procedure highly structured procedure flexible means you can adopt different different procedure for different different areas there is no set pattern there is a set pattern in internal audit it has been guided by the institute of chartered accountants of india there is a set pattern according to which internal audit is done and of course statutory audit is highly structured companies act 19 uh, 2013 gives a highly structured way of how to conduct statutory audit like uh, cost audit like um, uh, company secretary audit etc etc reporting is done to higher people um, uh, high level people operational people are the people who are uh, given the reporting and reporting is done to designated people like in statutory audit um, uh, shareholders are the reportees in uh, cost audit board of directors are the reportees time span is futuristic we focus on future because we need to improve the organization management audit current and immediate internal audit focuses on current period and current and immediate past is the focus of statutory audit period regular we do regular management audit can be done regularly internal audit can be done regularly uh, the statutory audit should be done annually and yes we come to end of first section management audit of our syllabus guys so we'll be starting chapter number 2 before we start chapter number 2 please tell me how's the josh with all of you are you all tired are you all tired or should we um, uh, you know uh, uh, continue with our uh, marathon are, are we tired are we tired please give your answers in the chat box are we tired or how's the josh oh almost 80 people are live currently and yes 80 people with one objective one goal in our mind the goal is very very clear the goal is to qualify cma in june 2022 attempt to qualify cma in june 2022 attempt that is the goal which all of us are pursuing as of now yes sir that is the goal which are pursuing and sir we are not tired at all are we tired no not tired pramod is saying not tired rishita saying no not tired jayashree saying no fantastic lecture ashwin is saying no continue sir very high sir 
not tired all right that's the spirit guys so we are not taking any lengthy break we'll just um, uh, take a break for 2 3 minutes guys a water break okay a water break for 2 3 minutes we'll take we'll come back after the water break 2 3 minutes maximum 2 3 minutes not more than that we'll take a water break and we'll be starting our chapter number 2 which is management audit and different functions so yes a break of 2 3 minutes that's it
All right. So yes, we are back with a bang for continuing the marathon lectures. And Saurabh Mukherjee is saying full josh, sir. Yes, I am also having full josh. Yes, we all are in full josh, and we all are wanting to score well in cost and management audit. And guys, I have not told you, but cost and management audit is the dark horse. You know, uh, cost and management audit will help you score very good marks because cost and management audit is. Very very scoring subject. Both BVM SPM and cost and management audit are very very scoring subjects. So both of these subjects should be uh, done very well uh, by you because these are the dark horses. And trust me, Group Four will be qualified only because of these two subjects. Because these two subjects will make your aggregate. These two subjects will um, be helpful in making the aggregate because these are very very easy subject. Is this enough to score sixty plus? This is enough to score eighty plus, not sixty plus, eighty plus. All right. So let's continue, guys. Management audit and different functions. Okay. Now we need to understand certain uh, um, elements of management audit. Certain terminologies which are used in management audit. We need to analyze those terminologies, um, and only then we'll be able to understand the entire concept of management audit. Number one, corporate objectives. So you know, management works towards corporate objectives. Whatever are the objectives of the management, management would work towards them. So it's really important to understand what are the corporate objectives which the company is going to uh, pursue. So I'll give you an example. McDonald's corporate objective is to achieve 100% total customer satisfaction every day in every restaurant for every customer. So the objective which McDonald's is uh, 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 is pursuing is customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction is the objective which um, uh, uh, McDonald's pursue. Guys, some companies pursue uh, the objective of piercing through market. Market standing should be more. They should have more market standing. Some of the customer, some of the companies follow this corporate objective. Some of the companies follow the objective of profit maximization. Come what may, we need to increase the profit maximization. Some companies pursue the objective of increasing sales, increasing turnover. So there are different different objectives which are pursued by different different companies. So the first thing that management orders needs to understand is what are the objectives of the organization that influences the direction of the corporate strategy, because strategy or the plan will follow the objective. Whatever will be the objective, accordingly will make the strategy. So if your objective is to qualify CMA final examination in first attempt, you have to work very very hard. <clears throat> you have to study. You have to study for ten hours or eight hours or twelve uh, hours a day. That is your strategy. So the objective, so the objective, will be followed by strategy. You should have a clear objective. Then that will be chased by strategy. That is corporate objective and strategy. Now, what is a corporate image? A very very important word, guys. Corporate image and an important uh, concept from an exam standpoint also. Okay, image. Okay, image. So <clears throat> when you see this sign, what image comes to your mind? When you see this sign, McDonald's, what image comes to your mind? To my uh, mind, the image of a burger or a pizza mac puff, okay, or that toy which uh, we used to get in, uh, you know, that uh, Happy Meal, that toy. All these things come to my mind instantly when I see this image, McDonald's. So, what image do you want your people to carry about you? That is known as a corporate image. So, for example, Tata's, Tata's have a corporate image of being very philanthropic. They do a lot of charity. They do a lot of uh, public service. They do a lot of lot of uh, social uh, things. As compared to that, Reliance Industries Limited is more targeted towards profit maximization. They are more no known for their business skills. They are more known for their um, uh, profits. That is the difference between these two uh, corporate world. Okay. So, what image do you want people to see you as? That is known as a corporate image. So, as a teacher, what image uh, uh, do I want to be seen as? Do I want to be seen as a person who um, uh, just for money will uh, sell the classes um, and will not uh, solve the queries of the students, will not take phone calls of the students? Will I want to be seen myself like that, or should I be seen myself as a person who believes in a fact that selling classes is a uh, uh, first step, and after that, our role starts. We need to take calls of the students on a regular basis. We need to take test series. We need to take live sessions for the benefit of the students. What image do I want for myself in the market? Clear as that, and that reminds me, guys. 
thank you so much for all the cma final students thank you so much for past four months we were having a test series of cost audit and bvm spm for past three months actually and that test series has covered all the chapters of cost audit and bvm spm the details were given on my community tab and many of you have participated in that test series and that was a ultimate successful test series yes that test series will um you know be pivotal in your results you will see effect in your results if you have given that test series thank you so much for participating in the test series so what is an image image is idea or procure formed in the mind of a person about an individual or an or an institution so what do other people think about you what do other people think about you that is your image that is known as image what do other people think about you as a company what do people think about you that is your corporate image corporations like individuals consci consciously build up images in minds of people with whom they can they come into contact this is known as corporate image so yes you need to actually um uh, you know develop your corporate image to a very very positive um, area sir how do we know what is our corporate image just call your customers you will know what is your corporate image just call your debtors so if an individual is asking me sir how do i know my image i will call up that individual's friends i will call up that individual's teachers i will call up that individual's parents to know what is that person's image in case of a company you can call up your customers to know your image in case of a company you can call up your shareholders to know your image in case of a company you can call your suppliers to know your image you can call your bank to know your image you can call government of india to know your image they will all tell about your image so customers will tell you about product quality prompt um, uh, after sale services regularity in maintaining supplies shareholders will um, uh, uh, you know tell your financial performance and prospect of growth they will tell your image about both these things suppliers will tell you about company's liquidity ability to honor commitments of the suppliers they will tell you how fast are you in repaying their debts banks will tell you how fast are you in um, uh, in you know servicing debt how fast are you in paying the emis of the bank government will tell you how fast are you in um, uh, paying tax uh, are you an honest tax payer or not employees will tell you whether a career growth has been given by you to them or not so <laughs> so image is measured by all these people a corporate image is measured by all these people all these people will tell you what is your image in market that is known as a corporate image a very very important point evaluation of corporate image how will you evaluate your corporate image which means how will you um, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 how will you know whether your corporate image is up to the mark or not first of all prepare a list of desirable attributes see what you want to achieve as per your image so as a teacher i want to be known as a teacher who is very um you know approachable to the students that is one desirable trait i want to be approachable to the student i want to directly um, take calls and speak to the students i want to be very approachable to the students so first of all list down all the desirable attributes which you want in your image step number 2 group them functionally and specify the qualifications i will group them together on the basis of um, uh, the functions for example you know uh, teaching i want my students to know me for my charts for my easy language explanations for my live sessions for my test this is one category i want my students to know me for my uh, communication skills for my approachability for my uh, uh, resolution of their uh, problems in a quick manner this is another function so all the attributes should be functioned in a, uh, a similar way in a different different segment assign weights to each attribute based on their relative importance so whatever is the importance in your mind assign weights so the most important thing for me is to teach well okay that is the most important thing so i will assign two weight to that particular attribute involve experts in respective fields in rating qualification attributes based on facts judgments and interpretations so uh, you know involve experts so i should hire some experts some experienced teachers to uh, show them my videos and uh, check with them whether i am i teaching well or not so i should contact experts summarize the ratings under the selected groups present the composite evaluation to the management of the company ultimately you will summarize all your um, uh, all your uh, understanding about the corporate image of a particular company attributes and its testing and give it to the company and tell the company that this is your corporate image um, evaluation
So evaluation is to be done on a very, very um, uh, stepwise basis on a methodical basis. First, we will define the attribute. Then we will club the attribute on the basis of their functions. Then we will give ratings to the attribute. Uh, we will uh, rate the attribute, which is more important, which is less important. Then we will uh, judge the attributes. Okay, we will judge what is going good, what is going bad. We will contact your customer of the company and see whether he is satisfied with your after sales services or not. We will do that, and then we'll, then we'll summarize it to the management of the company. Next is what do you mean by corporate image? What is a corporate image? Oh, next is corporate culture. So, guys, corporate culture means the culture which is there in the uh, in the organization. So, what is the uh, experience and behavior of the people in the organization? That is known as corporate culture. So, what are the values, beliefs, and behaviors on the basis of which people interpret experiences and behave? That is known as a corporate culture. What is the culture which you have in your organization? Is the culture of um, uh, of honesty? of integrity of um, you know uh, servicing the customer to its best ability or the culture is of um, uh, you know just chasing the profits that's it we don't want anything else we just want profits what is the culture so culture is very very important in any organization what is the behavior of people in, in a particular organization so guys you know i'll give you a simple example um, if you go to a local grocery shop <clears throat> then in the local grocery shop uh, uh, you know sometimes uh, people are rude sometimes people will not uh, give you uh, importance will not give you attention uh, you will ask for a product they will say that this is for so much rupees you pay the money and then take the product they will not uh, allow you to um, see the product and analyze it as compared to this if you go to a supermarket then you will be able to see the product take it in your hands see its ingredients price everything else and keep it back in the shelf that is the difference in their culture that is the difference in their culture Culture of a supermarket is very different from culture of a local grocery shop or a local um, a shop where all these things are there. So corporate culture, how are you um, defining culture, experience, behavior, values, beliefs of your organization, of your corporate, of your company that is known as a corporate culture. Now, corporate culture comprises of following things, commitment to honesty, okay, planned performance and growth. You will plan your performance. You will plan your growth. It has to be informative, informing and informed organization. The corporate culture should be of gathering information. Be informative. Gather a lot of information about your competitors, about what is the best culture which is being um, uh, there in the market. Be very, very informed. Consideration for partnership with the organization. Um, uh, for others in the partnership with the organization. So any other person who is linked with the organization, how do you treat them? How do you treat your customer? How do you treat your employees? How do you treat your vendors? That is an important part of your culture. Participative management. Management should be participative, which means management should take views of the employees also in making decisions. Management should not just take decisions and give it to the employees. It should be participative management. Good employee relationship should be there. Good decisions and timely action should be taken. Quality should be of utmost importance. Cleanliness should be of utmost, utmost importance. Mutual trust should be there future future looking should be there in the management helpful nature interinstitutional towards neighborhoods neighborhoods should be uh, uh, happy with you cleanliness is something which is uh, very much required in a corporate culture so corporate culture means corporate culture means is an accumulation of um, uh, various factors various values beliefs and assumptions that an employee has about the organization this is known as corporate culture so our culture should be very very conducive to work it should be very very conducive to growth it should be conducive to um, uh, uh, profitability that is known as corporate culture now what do you mean by corporate services guys corporate services means support services which are provided by a company support in for infrastructure which is provided by a company so after the sales is done is there any after sales services if the employee if the uh, customer wants to know about the details of the product or how to use it is there after sales services so for shareholders, if there's an if if there's an op ombudsman scheme or not, for the creditor, is there any contact person whom the creditor can contact about recoverability of their debt? For banks and financial uh, institution, is there a person who can uh, uh, you know uh, 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 resolve the queries of the banks and financial institutions about their loans which they have given to the company? All these things are defined by corporate services. So corporate services are the support infrastructure of the company. Whatever is supporting the main activities of the business, that is known as a support infrastructure. So corporate services are the support infrastructure of the company. The activities in such areas include 
enterprise wide uh, support services which are required based on specialized knowledge best practices technology there are various services which are related to technology like it services are required we should have a it department who if um, you know if laptops are not working fine then they should quickly come and rectify the laptops then serve internal customers and business partners so internal customers are also required to be served internal customers means um, you know employees of the organization should be should have no problems in working in the organization they should have proper infrastructure to work right coordinate diverse organization units and help them focus on organizational goals so uh, the the role of corporate services is that it should uh, uh, coordinate with the diverse organization units it should give services to all the organization units what are organization units organization units means hr department finance department production department distribution department all these should be knit together for example you know uh, water services water services are required by production department they are required by manufacturing department they are product required by finance department quality control department um, uh, uh, shareholders everyone requires water so water services should be provided to all the organization uh, units irrespective of uh, what functions are they uh, 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 considering exploit resources and develop core competencies that enable the organization to keep its edge over the industry competitors so core competent can competency should be developed by using these corporate services combining operations with another competitor in same industry to increase competitive strength we can also combine operations right with another competitor in the same industry to increase competitive strengths so you know certain support services can be combined so for example um, you know i am selling laptops and uh, the the shop which is next to me is also selling lap laptops we can together have a call center to address all the queries which comes from the customers after the sales are made we can have it combined right after sales services can be combined by both of us so these kind of combinations can happen in corporate services then what are corporate services audit so guys again management auditor will see whether your after sale services are absolutely perfect or not it will see whether the employees are satisfied by your um, uh, salary disbursement um, uh, employee uh, welfare or not all these things will be seen by the uh, management auditor so corporate services audit will cover the areas like for cons consumers quality of the good is right right quantity and right price right place is given to the customers for employee payment is given on time training is given on time safety is there welfare is there for shareholders safety of investment is there satisfactory returns are there appreciation of investment is there and yes ombudsman scheme is also there for the shareholders for the community social cost benefit analysis should be made fellow businessmen for fellow businessmen you should have ethics and fair trade dealings with fellow businessmen even if you have competitors you cannot say bad words about your competitors right so fellow businessmen should also be treated well okay corporate services government should uh, um, you know be satisfied with you you should be compliant with law fair trade practices should be there and timely payment of taxes should be there so this is the concept of corporate services so corporate services audit is the appraisal that should consider the level of contribution a business entity is making to the society and its environment towards raising the quality of life through better product quality services rather than profit maximization so the aim of corporate services audit is not to make sure that profits are being earned fine or not the aim of corporate services audit is to make sure that the betterment with the company is providing to the society is um uh, is there or not is there something benefit is there something beneficial which the company is providing to the society that's the aim of corporate services audit okay okay next word is very very important corporate development okay now i'll before telling uh, details about this particular um uh, concept i will like to tell you the difference between development and growth there are two words which are there development and growth what do you mean by growth what do you mean by development okay there's a fine line of distinction between growth and development what is that difference i'll let you know okay what do you mean by growth growth means you are achieving your targets in a very very streamlined manner okay so i'll tell you a very simple example so if you are a cma student and if you have qualified your foundation inter and final on time that is growth but what is development development means along with doing cma you are improving your communication skills you are improving your excel skills you are improving your word skills you are improving your sap knowledge you are improving your tally non tally knowledge because you know that apart from clearing the examinations you would need knowledge of all these spheres in future you know about that that is development that is development
So if a business organization only focuses about profit and growth in terms of profit maximization, then it is targeting growth as its objective. However, if the management or an, or an organization wants to target um, development, overall development, that it, then it will always focus on things which are not related to profits as well, like customer satisfaction, like market share should be increased. Even if prices are low, market share should be increased. More people should um, uh, be able to buy my product. So all these things are targeted by the um, uh, people. Um, by the companies, this is known as corporate development. So corporate development is the process of taking strategic decisions towards to grow and restructure one's business. Strategic decisions are to be taken to grow the business and restructure the business. For example, you know, mergers and acquisition can be an important way of developing. You are into manufacturing of laptops. You venture into manufacturing of mobile phones as well. That is development. You're not only focusing on one thing, you are growing your market size. So growth of market size, this initially will lead to reduction in profit. But in the long run, it will lead to increase in profit also. So this is development. Now, the management auditor will focus on corporate development audit as well. Whether the management is focusing on developing its um, a business or is it uh, stagnant? Management should not be stagnant. Whatever it is doing, it is definitely doing, but the management should not be stagnant. It should focus on uh, developing the business also. Otherwise, management will become obsolete. The management will become stagnant if it does not develop in terms of business. So it is an independent and objective study of organization's capabilities. So what is organization capable of doing? That is the important aspect of um, uh, uh, corporate development audit. It gives a comprehensive picture of status of corporate development effectiveness and highlights the developmental needs so wherever corporate needs to develop wherever corporate needs to uh, grow their corporate development audit is very very important and yes management auditor is in a very favorable situation to do this corporate development audit management auditor can actually um, recommend that you are already into cloth business why don't you come into cotton business also management auditor can recommend development scope development area so what are the objectives which are pursued by corporate development audit the various fa <clears throat> factors and forces constituting a corporate enterprise are right kind and quality so first of all management order will ensure that the factors and forces constituting corporate enterprise are right quality and right kind all the infrastructure which is there in the organization is suitable for developing further this is the first assurance second communication is the key management is able to communicate well with the employees because if you know you open a new wing then the existing employees will be a little jittery they will uh, be a little um, uh, you know awkward because they'll be uh, required to do more work this can be a situation pattern of departmentalization is very very important uh, when you are considering corporate uh, development audit what are the departments that you have made okay personal problems are handled appropriately that is an important aspect of development. Development cannot happen if personal problems persist. If your union is not supporting you, if your manpower is not supporting you, how will you develop? How will you enter into different spheres in your um, organization? Responsibility for planning, coordination, motivation at functional levels are discharged in proper spirit. So the planning, coordination, motivation, all these functions should be discharged properly if you want to develop. Then there are certain checklists in the areas of corporate development audit, if you want to develop um, your corporate development uh, areas, then you have a checklist. You can check on certain things. You check on planning. Okay. So first of all, you do SWOT analysis that uh, will uh, make you privy to the fact that what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Okay. Uh, what are your um, uh, opportunities in your business? Only then will you be able to develop more. Okay. Once you know about your SWOT, then only will you be able to develop. So first is SWOT analysis. Then you need to know your corporate strengths and weaknesses in relation to price, quality. So guys, this SWOT analysis should be done uh, in respect of price. This should be done in respect of quality. This should be done in respect of market share. So SWOT analysis should be a detailed analysis. Then what are the opportunities and threats? You need to know what are the opportunities and threats. Again, opportunities and threats uh, with respect to rivalry, threats of um, new entrants in market, opportunities which are there you need to analyze so SWOT analysis is spread into these three points how are the threats overcome opportunities avoided in past 
what is your corporate image whether corporate image will improve in future or not whether you want to improve in future or not so guys these are certain checklist okay i'm not going through each and every point because you need not remember each and every point if you just remember four points out of each of the uh, category it will be more than enough okay but the ultimate aim is that we need to de develop as we need to um, uh, uh, develop further growth okay we need to venture into more things we need to expand our market share what steps do we need to take to expand our market share that is the ultimate objective of corporate development audit so this is the checklist you can just go through them it's very very um, uh, simple it's very very straightforward all right now we come on to a very very important aspect of a uh, management audit and corporate development audit as well it is personnel growth it is personnel growth guys people are the core of any organization unless and until you focus on people your organization will not grow if you want your organization to grow you have to focus on your people and people development is the core of any management audit fulfilling the uh, needs of the people the present and needs of the people is to be fulfilled only then the uh, uh, the organization will grow so if personal management is concerned with management pe managing people at work the personal management is a very very important aspect of your um, uh, management audit personnel should be happy from you they should be absolutely happy and they should be absolutely satisfied so what are the components of personal management first of all organization should review and analysis what should be the appropriate work structure what should be the roles and responsibilities of uh, any organization intra and inter department relationship all these things should be uh, reviewed and analyzed by them by the uh, management first of all or the management order first of all to know where are the lacunas unless until we know what is the existing organization we will not be able to know the lacunas uh, the drawbacks okay then manpower planning recruitment selection then the second aspect of uh, personal management is then we will um uh, plan how to recruit new employees or whether to move existing employees to new new roles okay once the roles are defined then we will plan for manpower acquisition and putting them at the right places okay right man at the right places third is manpower training and development we will develop our manpower we will train our manpower that is the third aspect then we will appraise their performance we will um, you know assess their performance we will tell them where were they right where were they wrong performance appraisal is the next part then remuneration should be uh, fixed as per the job evaluation as per the um, uh, you know market standards what will be the incentive payments all these things should be determined employee remuneration is definitely the most important aspect of any personnel management employee services are we providing employee services or not for example you know whether employee is getting provident fund or esi benefit if it's it's working in your organization whether employee is giving that or not so social security plans community development programs his health his welfare should be taken care of administration and records so administration of um, the employees and um, documentation for all the employees everything should be in place everything should be fine the documentation should be strong then industrial relations what are the uh, relationship that an employee has with the industry uh, uh, you know uh, people and institutional differences it includes establishing appropriate procedure for resolution of personnel and institutional differences by means of appropriate measures and machinery for example standing orders grievance procedures conciliation collective bargain joint consultation so wherever wherever employee is having a dispute with the company like unions and company have certain disputes then guys how to resolve those risk disputes how to resolve those disputes that is an important aspect there are many mechanisms to resolve that dispute there are reconciliation um, mediation centers there are courts which are uh, dealing with employee grievances so all this should be in place auditing and research in manpower management then we will audit and research whether our manpower um, the management is appropriate or not next aspect of management audit again uh, an important aspect consumer services audit guys consumer doesn't only want product from you it also wants quality after sale services right price from you and as you were aware customer is the king customer is the king that is a very old saying so customer services audit is very very important we should understand whether company is providing adequate services to the consumer or not so as i still remember i bought this lenovo laptop and this lenovo lenovo laptop came with a two year warranty so within two years guys if any small and small or any big damage occurred in this lenovo laptop it was rectified by the company the person would come to my home and give me on shore services 
on site services these are known as on site services the company gave me on site services and i was very very happy with the after sale services of lenovo laptop but yes i had to purchase the additional um, uh, warranty period card so these are certain experiences which remain with us forever again whenever i'll be uh, buying a new laptop i'll consider lenovo um, as a preferred choice this is the consumer services audit so we need to be very very sensitive towards the benefits towards the needs of the customer and what are the needs of the customer right quality right time right quantity right place right price these are the needs of the customers please highlight the needs of the customers right quality right time right quantity right place right price these are the needs of the customers the consumer services audit critically examines and apprises management on these aspects of services so the consumer services audit will analyze whether you are giving these um, these um, benefits to the consumer or not this, this is known as consumer uh, services audit and customer satisfaction is the key customer satisfaction is the key in any business okay now let us read what are the essential ingredients important aspects of consumer services audit okay need of the customers are to be taken care of product price reasonable and it should be consistent in quality product price should be reasonable and the quality should be consistent okay if there is any added value then it will be beneficial what is added values guys sometimes you know we get free gifts account uh, along with the products we buy a product and we get free gifts okay that is known as added value so added value can be given to the customers so guys um, as if you have purchased my um uh, you know my books or my video lectures ever you would always have observed that i always send a motivational quote to all of you in form of magnets how many of you have those magnets uh, in your home please write yes in the chat box do you have any magnet which i sent to you along with your course material do you have those magnets of motivational quote along with your uh, course material do you have it uh, placed somewhere um, uh, around you in your room please write a yes or a no in the uh, comment section do you have those magnets sunny kaushik says i do have who else have it naga says yes shubha says yes saurabh says yes yes who who else have it sushmita says yes sunny says i have it on my almira absolutely guys so guys these are value added things that can be combined with your product you know motivation or uh, um, vigor is something which is um, uh, very much required by every student so that was a thoughtful thing which i deliberately keep along with my books along with my course um, which will motivate you towards your goals and trust me according to law of attraction if you have something written in front of you the probability of you getting it is much 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 more than any other person so you know if 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 i have uh, some quote written in front of me like dreams don't let your dreams be dreams then whatever dream i have i will be able to achieve it after a point in time so yes these are known as uh, value added services yes suryavanshi i have my classes both in hindi and in english i have my classes both in hindi and english guys in youtube channel i deliberately speak only english why because i have a lot of um, uh, south indian subscribers on my youtube channel i only speak in english because i have a lot of um, south indian subscribers but my classes are available both in hindi and english language all right so let's continue yes after sale services are required by the customers that is the important thing then you should constantly consistently improve the product quality product value should be uh, improved consistently guys i still remember you know earlier kisan ketchup used to uh, come in a glass bottle then came the plastic bottle and now we see kisan ketchup in a pichku pichku small sachets pichku sachet where we squeeze it it comes back to its original shape and it's it is not wasted so these are the improvements in product and uh, product quality that is desired over a period of time <clears throat> complaints are handled properly responses should be quick to the uh, uh, consumers then safety norms are followed like isa F fssa bss etc then all the warranties are explicitly set, stated and the provision of invocation of warranties are stated unambiguously so these are certain benefits which are um, these are certain aspects which are covered under consumers audit so consumers audit is a very very important aspect guys consumer services audit and these aspects are covered in consumer services audit now what do you mean by corporate social responsibility csr guys we all know we are there in an environment 
right we are there in an environment and we have air water around us it is our responsibility to conserve it it is our responsibility to preserve it that preservation of um, uh, our society our environment is an essential element of corporate social responsibility and yes as a management order i would definitely want to see whether you have fulfilled your csr properly or not i will definitely want to see that as a management auditor i would want to see whether your um, uh, uh, whether your uh, you are fulfilling the corporate social responsibility or not i want to see that as a management auditor i will check it okay okay sir so whatever are the environmental uh, 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 things and whatever are the things which are required to conserve the environment that is the key focus of csr then waste management is something which is to be very much um, uh, you know be in the purview whether you are uh, uh, you know uh, just uh, floating your weight uh, waste um, on land or in rivers or you are treating it so hazardous waste management rule may be practiced by practicing cost accountant it can be audited conservation of environment needs no emphasis guys you we need to conserve the environment this is an important element of social corporate social responsibility then marketing is an area which management auditor will definitely see whether you are doing right marketing efforts or not okay maybe your product is very good maybe your pricing is very good maybe your distribution channel is superb you have good distribution channel across the country maybe your everything is perfect but unless and until your marketing efforts are good your advertisement is good people are in a knowledge of your product unless and until that happens all your efforts are waste that's why advertisements are given such expensive advertisements are given because there's a very old saying out of sight out of mind if you become out of sight you become out of mind therefore advertisements are very very important so the management auditor will see your marketing efforts also he will see whether you are uh, targeting the right audience or not whether you are marketing your products to the right audience or not he will see that the cost or the uh, management auditor will see that so management audit is a marketing audit is an independent examination of entire marketing effort of the company what is the marketing program what are the objectives which are covered implementation organization for purpose of determining what is being done appraising uh, uh, which is being done and recommending what should be done in future about the marketing efforts so what are the features of marketing audit it is to be carried out at regular intervals it is not once in a lifetime exercise every year every 6 months every 2 years marketing audit is required because marketing changes over a period of time so it is to be um, done every year regular intervals entire system and process of marketing should be taken into consideration while doing the audit you should not leave any aspect so selling is an aspect of marketing distribution is an aspect of market marketing advertisement is an aspect of marketing sometimes promotional offers are an aspect of marketing everything is marketing you should take care of everything then total efforts total appraisal of marketing efforts should be done it is similar to point number 2 then formal lines of authority and responsibility should be reviewed in marketing staff the staff which is there marketing head and marketing staff the formal authority and responsibility who's uh, responsible to whom that should be reviewed in marketing activity marketing audit covers the following broad areas what are the objectives of marketing what are the programs of marketing its implementation and organization so what are the objectives uh, objective should be clearly established of marketing whether you are wanting to increase your market size or whether you are wanting to increase profitability these are the two different objectives of marketing which one are you pursuing you need to clearly establish it then program what are the steps that you are taking what are the plans that you have made for marketing plans programs marketing program implementation you will then implement the marketing program organization then you will um, uh, you know organize your marketing plan in a way execute it in a way that it reaps benefit for the organization oh next is very very important topic guys and it has been recurring since ages since ages it has been recurring one of the favorite topics of the examiner energy audit energy audit okay so guys i'll explain energy audit using this particular chart okay suppose you are an organization who is using various energy um, equipments which is consuming energy okay now these various energy equipments if you do some minor changes in this equipment their energy consumption will reduce just do minor changes for example use a solar panel to uh, generate electricity if you have 
if you are located in a state where electricity is in abundance like gujarat you can have loft insulation on your on your um, uh, ceiling so that your energy is conserved your uh, temperature effect is minimized in your organization you can use thermostat to set low temperature inside your um, organization then you can switch off the appliances when not in use so these are certain simple steps which you can take to conserve in energy but guys more often than not we are so careless forget about office when we are in our home we are so careless that we don't bother to close the lights and uh, fans and all the um, electronic equipments when we do brushing in the morning then our tap is running water uh, one two three liter water runs for just brushing because our tap is open when we are brushing our teeth we are so careless energy audit aims to check this carelessness of the company and to infuse some energy efficient techniques like guys for example uh, you know um, the the old kind of bulbs which we used to use in our house those yellow light bulbs you remember those yellow light bulbs which had a wire connecting other wires inside the bulb those are very very energy inefficient please use led bulbs in your homes to be energy efficient so this is one area which statutory or which um, the uh, management order will definitely see in your organization so the entire aim the objective of this particular audit is to institute energy efficient programs in the organization conservation opportunities are to be identified conservation of energy should be done by the organization that is the objective of this energy audit and yes management auditor will definitely check this particular aspect of your organization this is known as energy audit wherever energy saving is possible wherever there is an opportunity to save energy or reducing wastage of energy it will be adopted by the management auditor this is energy audit okay sir got it what are the functions of energy audit quantification of energy cost and quantity how much energy is being consumed you will quantify that then we will uh qualify which product is consuming maximum energy which department is consuming maximum energy which consumer is consuming max maximum energy we will correlate the trends of production and activity to energy cost we'll focus on possible sources of conserving energy then we will institute those energies like these are the sources of um you know reducing energy consumption so as these are the elements of energy audit next is productivity audit or efficiency audit guys this is very closely uh, related to operational audit okay we are doing operations okay we need to ensure that our operations are do done in a perfectly optimized manner in an efficient manner so productivity should be high in our um, audit uh, in our uh, uh, working that is to be ensured by us so productivity audit or efficiency audit aims at increasing the productivity and efficiency of our organization for example uh, you know raw material is being bought two times a day once in the morning once in the evening okay raw material we are purchasing half of the truck goes uh, uh, is 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 bought in the first half half of the truck is bought in the second half there's no rocket science in suggesting to that company why are you sending the truck twice send the truck once and load it fully why are you loading it half in the morning half in the evening load the truck fully once in a day maybe in the afternoon you will save your cost no rocket science in suggesting this this is known as productivity or efficiency audit we need to increase our productivity we need to increase our efficiency consistently consistently we need to increase the productivity and efficiency of our operations and that is why that is why productivity audit forms core of management audit this is the core of management audit the ultimate area where management audit focuses on is productivity and efficiency and yes it is closely linked to operational audit okay so this is productivity audit it is basically the analysis of productivity of resources please underline these lines analysis of productivity of resources how efficiently are the resources reaping benefits that is the productivity audit okay so what this is the difference between economy efficiency and effectiveness you can read it it's it's very very simple so what are the two and twin objective of productivity audit to obtain optimum results and to improve on benchmarks whatever targets we have set for ourselves what are benchmarks benchmarks are targets whatever targets we have set for ourselves we need to um, achieve those targets and whatever results we want to attain that should be attained audit would generally come uh, comprise of comparing comparing the performances guys 
okay actual return versus um, uh, expected return optimum utilization of resources benchmarks should be um, uh, you know achieved now what are the areas where productivity uh, audit uh, functions or what are the ratios which productivity audit uses to analyze guys very simple uh, ratios which we have done in our costing and you know cost audit also chapter numbers um, uh, management reporting chapter there also we have done ratio analysis capacity utilization productivity analysis material consumption analysis capital employed analysis gross profit net profit debt equity ratio net worth all these are ratios which will tell whether we are productive or not productivity is a definitely a function of um, uh, you know production versus profits so these ratios will be very useful in our productivity analysis so productivity audit is nothing but analyzing the productivity of an organization now we come on to a very very important aspect of our uh, syllabus which is propriety audit propriety audit okay now i'll give you an example to explain propriety audit and then it will sound really really easy to you because it is actually very very easy okay propriety audit is very very easy and straightforward okay now i go to a, a audit i go to an audit and that audit is of reliance industries limited i go to an audit of reliance industries limited and that audit is um carried out by me and you know i have learned that reliance industries limited have bought glasses for their board of directors meeting one glass is for 50000 rupees each one glass is for 50000 rupees each they are showing me the bill they are showing me where they have purchased from their purchase is it from soroski crystal which is very very expensive they want to drink water in a glass which is worth 50000 rupees each board of directors have taken this, this decision and they have brought bought glasses which is worth 50000 rupees each now as an auditor as an auditor can i ask them that you know why have you done such a big blunder by purchasing such expensive glasses in my home the glasses are worth rupees 5 each you know we get glass uh, glasses worth rupees 5 each or 10 rupees each why have you spent 50000 rupees for one glass can i ask this question from a person who's owning a private company answer is no it's his company you are no one to challenge the the aspects which are dealing with rationale of any expenditure of that particular company you are no one to challenge it who are you to ask the rationale of a particular expenditure management wants to spend in that particular area he is spending in that area you are no one to challenge the rationale or prudence of an expenditure in a private concern however in a government concern guys if you are doing audit of a government company like if you are doing audit of um uh, say psu some maharatna some navratna company then definitely you can ask the prudence of a particular expenditure because that is public money that money is public money and a government company cannot spend their money as it is you know without considering what is right what is wrong government company cannot do that because that is public money so what is propriety audit propriety audit is nothing but prudence audit and prudence audit is, audit is typically relevant for government audit now my question to you is if you are the management auditor and not the statutory auditor let me repeat let me repeat please hear the question very very carefully if you are the management auditor and not the statutory auditor of a particular company then can you ask the prudence of an expenditure from a private company also answer in the chat box answer in the chat box let me repeat my question if you are a management auditor and not a statutory auditor i have already told you statutory auditor cannot raise question on prudence of an expenditure it is businessman's perspective what has he spent on what okay you cannot challenge uh, why have you spent so much of money this thing is available in cheap no you cannot do that if that is a valid expenditure you have to approve it okay uh, as a statutory auditor but if i am a management auditor can i raise question on prudence of a particular expenditure even when uh, i am auditing a private company can i do that yes or no in the chat box i want yes or no in the chat box so propriety audit is typically relevant for government audit but if i am a management auditor then can i apply propriety audit in private concern also for a private person for reliance uh, can i ask this question answer is a clear yes sushmita sharan sushmita sharan very good answer very good answer so guys management auditor is under no bound is under no bound to not to talk about propriety it can challenge your prudence management auditor can challenge your prudence statutory auditor cannot challenge your prudence management auditor can challenge your prudence so the meaning of the word propriety means 
whether it take the the expenditure which uh, meets the test of public interest commonly accepted customs and standard of conduct particularly as applied to professional performance requirement of government regulations and professional codes so only in government organization there is a concept of prudence there's a concept of um, uh, you know a conduct which is um, as per the authorization metrics or which is as per the norms which are given uh, by the management okay i've got many more answers wow everyone saying a yes superb very good everyone saying is yes absolutely absolutely correct you are all right so uh, uh, guys propriety audit is a very very important element of management audit because management is in no management auditor is in no bound to not to challenge your prudence management auditor is there to challenge your prudence management auditor is there to challenge your prudence that is the role of management auditor whether planned expenditure is designed to give optimum results whether the expenditure is uh, uh, directed towards results whether the size and channel of expenditure were designed to produce best results whether return from expenditure is appropriate whether you are getting appropriate benefit of the expenditure or not all these things can be um, uh, you know asked by the uh, management auditor management auditor can question your uh, prudence okay now what are the three important uh, or rather four important elements of this um, uh, prudence concept of propriety audit first of all whether the expenditure the expenditure should not be more than what occasion demands it should not be excessive expenditure should not be excessive then expenditure should be sanctioned it should be approved by the relevant authority that is the second point which you need to consider as a management auditor in huge expenses in the expenses which are um, heavy expenses uh, so the expenditure should not be utilized for benefit of a particular person the expenditure should not be utilized for particular benefit of a particular person so in a private company you know a board of directors is buying a car it is using company's funds to buy a car not allowed not allowed then amount of allowances should be regulated amount of allowances whatever allowances whatever benefits are being received by the top management they should be regulated so as management audit is direct challenge to management simple management audit is a question mark to the management in any possible way in any possible way so propriety audit forms part of management audit also propriety audit is not a part of financial audit financial auditor cost auditor cannot challenge propriety but management order can challenge propriety can challenge prudence csr audit yes in this particular audit guys we need to see whether the csr program um, uh, is is appro appropriate or not so what are the csr programs let us read it in brief human rights business behavior human resources these are certain elements of uh, you know your um, uh, csr program so just read through these Uh, areas of csr program and you'll be able to understand them nothing nothing really um, difficult about it yes very very important guys in 2013 um, csr has been become has become mandatory so earlier uh, csr was optional okay so a company wants to contribute to society or not its companies will but now after advent of companies act 2013 csr is mandatory you have to mandatorily uh, spend out on your uh, society if you want to continue business okay it's like forceful donation it's like forceful donation you are forced to donate okay that is corporate social responsibility in case of companies act section 135 is the section which deals with csr in case of a uh, company and yes 2% of average profit of the company is to be spent mandatorily on csr so guys ministry of corporate affairs have given certain areas where csr expenditure can be done like eradicating poverty promoting education promoting gender equality ensuring environmental sustainability all these things are the uh, uh, the the as per the committee of of ministry of corporate affairs all these things are very very um, uh, directed towards society so expenditure should be done in these respect only so guys you can remember any six of these okay don't remember all but remember any six of these all right and the last checklist which is, which is a uh, last topic which is a very very important uh, topic of our um uh, syllabus guys sample checklist for various functions of audit guys uh, checklist can come in your examination it has been uh, repeatedly coming in your examination um uh, from past uh, what do you mean by checklist what do you mean by checklist guys um, you know uh, when you are studying a particular Uh, chapter uh, a subject like cost and management audit whenever you uh, study a particular uh, subject like cost and management audit then guys uh, you have an index in front of you you tick mark on that index 
that yes, I have covered the rules. I have covered the basics of management audit. I have covered the chapter on uh, cost accounting standards. I have covered the chapter on uh, 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 the professional ethics. That is a checklist. Similarly, while auditing different functions or while auditing different um, uh, elements of your financial statements or your uh, management audit functions, you prepare a checklist that yes, I've checked this, 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 this point in my uh, management audit uh, purview. This is known as checklist. What all things you have to check and you will put a tick before whatever things you have uh, checked. Okay, that is known as a checklist. So it is not a very difficult thing. It is a very simple thing. What steps uh, can you think of um, doing a particular audit and whether you have done those steps or not, that is the simple checklist of audit. Let's take an example. Sample checklist for management audit. While you are doing management audit, what steps would you um, uh, consider doing? Okay, now you will take a production plan. First of all, how is the production plan prepared? You will see whether the production plan which is prepared is adequately prepared or not. Okay. Then uh, what should be the product mix? What should be the mix of two products which you should uh, uh, consume? What is the product mix? What is the optimum profitability which you want to attain? Whether you have checked that or not. Okay. What is the uh, uh, mix of standard product or the tailor-made products? What is the mix in your sales? Whether the infrastructure like machinery material is adequate or not so that your production is inter uninterpreted. So you need to check each of these points as a management auditor. You need to check each and every point in the organization. Then are there constraints to achieve maximum capacity utilization? Why are you not able to achieve the maximum capacity utilization? Why are you underutilized? Okay. What is the percentage of scrap waste in your um, uh, production? Is it reasonable? Is it unreasonable? So guys, these are certain points that you will check while you are conducting management out of a particular organization and yes need not remember all of them remember any 10 and guys let me tell you don't worry if you read these thrice you will automatically be able to remember it is nothing very complicated students say sir checklist kaise yaad hogi checklist yaad hoi nahi sakti itne sare point hai itne alag alag point hai sir checklist kaise yaad karne it is very difficult to remember checklist it is not difficult to remember checklist it is common sense it is common sense Please understand this fact. Checklist is only common sense. You have studied management audit chapter. Now, whatever you have studied management audit chapter, summary of that is given in this checklist. That is the point. Okay, sir. Got it. Similarly, guys, there is a checklist for purchase management. So purchase function, whether what is the purchase function? What is the purchase policy you need to see? What, uh, how the purchase requirements are told in the uh, purchase schedules and the department? how the suppliers are selected how uh, the purchase authorization happens how the suppliers are um, uh, you know whether suppliers are dependable or not what are the price trends all these things are there in this particular checklist similarly when you are uh, dealing with personal management when you are auditing personal management um, what is the organization of personal department how is personal department hr department um, uh, you know hierarchy is there what is the hierarchy uh, is it adequately staffed uh, what is the organization hierarchy for your uh, um, entire organization? What is the promotion policy? What is the remuneration policy? Okay, all these things are required to be seen. So just read them thrice and you will be able to understand and remember the major points. The only ask is to read them thrice. Okay. These are the uh, uh, checklist of individual um, uh, areas of audit, like inventory control function. Okay. What are the checks? What are the checklist? So these are the invent uh, the control points. Okay, now let me tell you this time which you are uh, having right now, the one week which you have now, this is an opportune time to read these checklists because these checklists, if you revise again and again, whatever you have revised in past, that will be out of your mind. Okay, if you read them again and again, then you will be definitely be able to um, uh, uh, remember these checklists in the examination and you will be able to perform well in the examination. So don't worry about this checklist. One such checklist I will also teach you in the next chapter, internal controls, okay? They are also not difficult. Please remove this notion from your mind that checklists are very, very difficult. Checklists are not difficult. Please remove this notion from your mind. It is a false notion that is there in your mind. And yes, from checklist, at least one question will definitely come in the examination. Whether from chapter number 9 or whether from chapter number 10. Okay, guys. So that's all for this particular chapter. And yes, are we energetic enough? How's the Josh? How's the Josh, guys? How's the Josh? Are we energetic enough? We have covered almost almost 60% of our theory 
um, portion, guys, and we are equipped for examination to cover the 60% of our portion. And yes, now we'll be moving towards the internal control, internal check chapter. And that chapter is by far even more important than management audit. Internal control, internal check. That chapter is even more important than management audit. It is a very, very important chapter of your syllabus, which we are going to start now. How's the Josh? Are you feeling? Are you feeling uh, tired? Are you feeling energetic? Okay, Samir Kundra is there. Samir Kundra, have you started um, uh, doing CMA? Huh? Samir Kundra, I'm a fan of you. You are not you are a big fan. I'm a fan of you. Okay, guys, let me tell you Samir Kundra is my colleague when I used to work in KPMG. Samir Kundra is my colleague and a regular follower of my YouTube channel. All right, how's the Josh, guys? How's the Josh? Should we continue with our marathon lecture of the next chapter next chapter is internal controls internal um, weaknesses and internal audit and yes slightly low sir to be honest <laughs> obviously ram it is tiring undoubtedly um you know reading theory back to back reading theory back to back is definitely tiring but we have to make our spirits um uh, strong because this will fetch us 30 marks this will fetch us 30 marks 30 marks will be ours if we do this th theory portion okay so important to do this theory portion very very important okay so before we start our next chapter let's take a small break we'll be meeting after the break and then we'll be starting our next chapter which is internal controls internal checks internal audit etc etc so we'll be meeting after five minutes maximum five minutes break
हेलो 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 कैन यू हेयर मी प्रॉपरली एंड कैन वी स्टार्ट द सेशन बैक आर वी ऑल एनर्जेटिक प्लीज रिस्पॉन्ड ऑन द चैट बॉक्स कैन वी स्टार्ट द सेशन कैन वी कंटिन्यू and are we energetic enough are we are we superbly charged to clear our uh, uh, cma final examination please message on the chat box yes i am able to hear you properly sorry i am able to see your chat messages so please message on the chat box whether we are energetic and whether we should start the session back are we ready to continue with our next topic Yes, everyone saying yes, yes. Recharge, sir. Yes, guys. Even a two-three minutes break, um, you know, recharges you. Two-three minutes break. Yes, it's like a power nap. Power nap, you know, recharges you completely. So this two-three minutes of break is a power nap, even for you and for me also. You know, continuously speaking for two hours, three hours, uh, make a toll on your um, throat, and just taking a power nap really helps. It has helped me. Now, can I? I can teach you further. till the time we complete our entire course we can teach you further we can start our conversations yes let's rock it ram narayan says let's rock it yes let's rock it absolutely guys let's rock it all right let's start internal control internal audit and operational audit the the most important topic of our theoretical part guys and from this particular part uh, in your in your uh, december 21 attempt almost almost 15 marks question was asked from this particular part this particular portion was 15 marks 15 marks in your examination so very very important portion of your examination internal controls internal audit and operational audit before i start this chapter please understand the meaning of internal controls what do you mean by internal controls and i had just now taken an example i'm taking that example again to start your uh to start the chapter okay what do you mean by internal controls okay guys internal controls i have taken an example uh, today only in the morning i have taken this example i am repeating that example so if um now uh, you know um uh, saurabh and sushmita are in relationship with each other sushmita wants to make sure that saurabh goes to uh, coaching class daily in the morning he is in the coaching class for long period of time she wants to ensure that um uh, you know uh, the, the the there's no hanky panky stuff uh, going on between saurabh and someone else and she wants to audit this entire transaction she has two ways number one checking the internal controls what are the internal controls what time did saurabh leave uh, uh, home what time did he reach office what time did he uh, uh, sorry reach the coaching institute what time did he uh, leave the coaching institute and what time did he reach back to um, home these are the checkpoints these are the control points which sushmita can check to to audit this particular transaction and to be sure that yes saurabh is going outside um, only for coaching these are internal controls similarly management of an organization establishes such internal controls for example whenever raw material is coming inside the factory there is a register in the entry gate that register will be filled with the amount of raw material which has come in when the raw material reaches to the production floor there is a register on the production floor which will tell that this much raw material has reached the production floor whenever that is uh, converted into finished goods it is uh, sent to go down there is a entry which is done in the go down that this much has been uh, received as the finished good when the finished good goes out of the factory then factory gate has a record of how many finished goods have been uh, sent outside the factory so if i want to make sure that the raw material accounting is perfect then i can just see these checkpoints that yes 100 kg has been uh, written in entry register 100 kg is on the production floor uh, finished goods were product um, were made uh, suppose 50 products were made 50 products reached the go down 50 products were sold if i uh, tally these controls then i'm fairly reasonably sure that the transaction has flown in well the the transaction is right i need not go into details of that particular transaction if the controls are working fine then i need not go into the details of that particular transaction i just need to figure out whether controls are working fine or not these are the internal controls and management make sure that these internal controls are instituted in the organization so that the um, organization is working fine so that organization is um, uh, you know uh, uh, accounting well their systems and procedures are doing everything is doing well the management institutes these controls at a relevant point in time 
these are known as internal control i'll give you another example there's a person i have a big store okay i sell clothes there's a person who collects the cash at the end of the day and deposits it to bank now i have a fear that you know that person collects uh, cash worth rupees 1 lakh and he is depositing only 90000 in my bank and the next day he would say that oh i had collected cash of 90000 rupees only so now guys to check or to have an internal control with this transaction i will employ someone else and this particular person will only collect cash count it put it in that cash book hand it over to the person who is going to the bank and that person will deposit the cash to the bank so if i segregate the duties if i split the duties between two people chances of fraud reduces <laughs> chances of error reduces now two people are involved so one person cannot do that fraud that fraud cannot be committed by one person i have split the transaction into two people so guys such activities are also known as such activities are also known as internal controls so we have certain internal checks which we employ in our business to ensure that all the accounting entries all the business transactions are recorded properly and there is no fraud which is happening in the company these are known as internal controls all right sir so let's start internal controls are certain checks and procedures installed by the management very very important who installs these checks management installs these checks installed by the management to prevent financial fraud or misappropriation of assets i have installed these internal controls in my business so that my entries and transactions are checked by some other person also and that transaction is not done by one person it is done by two people so that they are checked properly in other words internal control system can be defined to be the policies practices procedures tools designed with the following objectives what are the objectives that everything is done with proper authorization everything is recorded promptly in the correct amount and uh, correct account correct accounting period assets are safeguarded no one is uh, stealing my assets like my cash is not being stolen by my staff compliances are made adequate compliances are made compliances uh, regulations are followed uh, you know tds has been filed on time uh, my returns are being filed on time every compliance is made on time any negative event event crime fraud can be um, controlled and can be managed if i have proper internal controls in place so these are the internal controls definition a process designed implemented and maintained by those charged with uh, the governance who is the management of the company those charged with governance is the management of the company so management of the company um, uh, infuses or implements certain processes what is the objective of that process financial reporting should be done properly accounting entries should be done properly all the accounts should disclose the true amount and uh, uh, account compliances of law and regulation should be done uh, properly effective and efficiency of operations is done and assets are being safeguarded scope of internal control what is the scope of internal control which means um, uh, you know uh, what are the areas of internal control what are the gambit of internal control what all will internal control uh, cover in its purview so scope of internal alter area of operation of internal alter are as under what will internal alter c what all things will internal alter c so guys internal alter will see your internal control on everything starting from financial and operational information the first thing which internal auditor will see will be your internal controls regarding financial operations so what are the internal controls internal controls will be that you know all the accounting entries should be put in the system all the accounting entries should be put in the system that is the first internal control and how will you ensure that all the accounting entries is put in the system reconciliation after every month your bank should be reconciled with your bank as per books some companies do it on a daily basis after the end of the day your bank uh, balance in your bank account should match with your book uh, bank account the bank balance which is there in your books of accounts it should match with your um, uh, you know bank balance in your bank this is a reconciliation which happens every day in many companies this is one of the example of internal controls and that to financial internal control internal control which is related to finance so operational and um, uh, 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 financial internal control is the first aspect of internal control so internal control will cover number one financial aspects your profit and loss account should be perfect your balance sheet should be perfect your assets value should be perfect we need to control your assets we need to control your bank balance we need to control your balance sheet that should be absolutely perfect so that is the first internal control
What is the second internal control? Compliance with law, policies, procedures, everything should be um, uh, uh, adequately done. So, you know, uh, to deposit TDS on 7th of the next month, this is an internal control with respect to the uh, 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 compliance of law. So, guys, I will design a system whereby my CFO will get a prompt on 5th of the next month that TDS has not been deposited. Uh, uh, alarm will, uh, alarm will uh, buzz off. That TDS has not been deposited. This is an internal control on compliance of law, policies, plans, procedures. Your return of income should be filed up to the stipulated date. Again, buzzer will be triggered. This is another way of controlling your compliances with law. So the second aspect with inter which internal controls will see is your law compliance. First aspect is your financial and operating compliance. Second will be your compliance relating to law. Third is safeguarding of asset. Internal control should be such that your assets are safeguarded. They should not be stolen by your employees. Suppose you have 100 shares in your organizations, okay? You have 100 shares, okay? Now, the 100 shares are, the, there's only one person who buys the shares and maintains the shares, okay? He takes 10 shares out of the company. He takes it to your home, to, to his home, sells it. That person uh, is, is responsible for buying and maintaining shares all through, okay? He will buy another 10. He will put in the uh, uh, put in the factory. No one is there to check. But if we have another person who checks, counts the number of chairs on a regular basis, he will be able to identify that 10 chairs are missing. So we need two people in every transaction. We need two people in every transaction. That is the bottom line of safeguarding of asset. And internal control should be there to ensure that all the assets are uh, adequately there in our organization. Nothing is stolen by the employee sometimes, okay? It is stolen. Internal auditor should verify existence of assets, should review the means of safeguarding assets. Economic and efficient use of resources. This is one important aspect of internal control. Uh, you know, um, we should be able to uh, maintain our input-output ratio to a specific level. If input-output ratio goes below a specific level, it should automatically give information to the production in charge. This is an internal control to ensure that we are efficient and effective. We should not waste our resources. Then accomplishment of established objectives and goals for operations. Whatever objectives we have, um, uh, you know, uh, designed for our operations, those should be effectively achieved by us. That is another important aspect. That is another important um, thing that we need to uh, ascertain, that we need to see in our achieving of goals. Then types of internal controls, uh, you know, internal controls are necessary checks and balances uh, to keep a check on what we have done, what, what, what all we need to do and whether it is done properly or not. Okay. Internal controls are of following four types. We can control our four things using internal controls. What are those four things? First of all, we can control our administration. Guys, the, um, now, you know, the managerial administration that we are doing, the decision making which we are doing are around our administration. Administration means, um, now, you know, whether everything is uh, being done fine or not, whether maintenance of books of accounts is being done uh, uh, suitably or not, whether the production manager is doing his work uh, rightly or not. All these things are administrative stuff. First internal control should be administrative control. We need to ensure that our internal controls are so strong that if there's any problem in the administration of a particular um, a particular thing, it should directly reach the top management immediately. For example, we produce 100 units daily. One day we produce only 80. Now there should be a mechanism whereby we need to analyze and see why did we produce 80 units that day? Why? There should be a control to this 80 units of production because it's a loss for the company. On the next day, we should be able to produce optimally. So administration is first area where internal controls are very, very important. Next is operational area. Whatever operations we are doing, um, you know, their internal controls are very, very important. Uh, like, you know, you must have studied EOQ. Do you remember EOQ? Economic order quantity that we have studied in our costing. So guys, EOQ will ensure that we never run out of uh, supplies. EOQ will ensure that. There should be a, a, a you know adequate amount of inventory always there in our inventory that will ensure that we never go out of supply. So that is an operational control. Financial and accounting control, I've already discussed this particular aspect with you. When we reconcile our bank and our books daily, we will be able to know that yes, this accounting entry has not been put by our finance in charge in uh, the books of accounts. We'll be able to know it. So things like reconciliation, 
things like um, giving one responsibility to two people will ensure financial and accounting control safeguarding of asset prevention detection of fraud etc compliance uh, control compliance means the laws and regulations whatever laws and regulations are there in the organization those laws and regulations are complied with or not this is the compliance control for example tds is being deposited on time then uh, the laws are being uh, followed on time all these are compliance control so these are four areas where internal audit can work internal controls can work these are the four areas which are very very important and these four areas are um, uh, important for our internal controls all right then uh, to ensure internal control following factors must be considered so guys how internal controls are done okay i have given you examples of internal controls like um, i've given an example of uh, segregating the duties i've given an example of um, using eoq as the method i've given an example of using input output ratio if it falls below a certain point it directly triggers an alarm without top management i've given you certain examples of how internal controls are done these are certain additional examples of how internal controls are done number 1 segregation and rotation of duties very very important very very important one person should not handle the entire transaction himself should be shared one person should not handle the entire transaction himself so if uh, amount is deposited to be deposited to bank collection of amount should be done by person a deposit should be done by person b so that there is two times checking of the same transaction segregation of duties second is rotation of duties rotation of duties means that you know if one person is handling cash in first six months of the year then another person should handle cash in next six months of the year rotation of duties because if a person remains on one duty for a longer period of time he will be in knowledge of various sources of avoiding um, uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, compliances he would have more uh, uh, knowledge and experience of how to do fraud yes so rotation of duties is required and segregation of duties is required one person should not be allowed to carry out carry on uh, ca carry on a particular duty for a longer period of time because if he is allowed to carry on a duty for a longer period of time chances of fraud increases if he knows that yeah, after, yes after 6 months someone else will come in his place he will not do fraud this is the first aspect of internal control segregation of duties and rotation of duties competence and integrity of people now this is very very important guys for your important functions like cash collection your banks your debtors collection okay for these important elements of your business hire competent people people with integrity people who are educated people who are highly educated like chartered accountants cost accountants company secretaries because guys those people will fear will be afraid of doing frauds they will not do fraud very easily they will be afraid of doing frauds because they know that if they do fraud then they will be um, uh, you know um, uh, they will be fired from job and their degree will also be snatched away from them so hire people who are competent hire people who have integrity hire people who have um uh, 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 you know appropriate degree and appropriate experience hire people who are integral okay so competence and integrity is the key point in hiring people for um uh, for certain uh, key areas so you should have people who are competent who people who are have, who have integrity who are honest enough they should be hired for special things appropriate level of authority so um, now you know to ensure that the internal controls are working fine authority responsibility matrix should be determined in a fair manner authority responsibility matrix means um, everyone should know uh, whom he is reporting to and that person should exercise authority on the other person and that person is um, uh, you know always if he is exercising authority and supervising the other person other person will not uh, incur fraud so adequate level of authority should be there everyone should be accountable to someone else so each one should be accountable to someone else and everyone should know that he has someone to supervise so accountability is very very important just give me give me one minute guys
ओके accountability is another important aspect of internal control um everyone should be accountable to some other person so that he knows that someone is uh, supervising me someone is watching my activities if this watching is not there then people tend to commit fraud so accountability is one important element of internal controls internal controls should have properly accountable so everyone should be accountable to someone else so that no one thinks that i am the king in the company and i can do anything no no one can do anything in the company no one is king in the company okay then adequate resources should be there uh, now if you want to have internal controls adequate internal controls you should have adequate resources guys because each and every transaction if you uh, pass it through two people then you should have manpower you should have finance you should have equipments materials to have internal controls so yes internal controls necessitate adequate resources if you have adequate resources then internal controls is uh, possible supervision and periodical updation it is very very necessary that you know controls should be um, uh, updated after a point in time controls also become redundant control also become uh, uh, you know uh, uh, outdated for example you have a banking channel you have a cash deposit mechanism and you have a very good control in that cash deposit mechanism now after a point in time you stop taking cash from your customers and you turn entirely on an online mode then will that old control be relevant here no so you have to update your controls on a regular basis depending upon your businesses and your market's demand so controls will be updated on a regular basis now there are certain limitations of internal controls yes internal controls are very very important in fact pivotal internal controls are non compromisable they have to be um, uh, done in a proper manner in internal controls are very very important undoubtedly but there are certain limitations of internal controls also certain drawbacks of internal controls what are the drawbacks of internal controls drawbacks are cost internal controls come with a huge cost so to design internal control and implement internal control it is a costly affair so cost benefit analysis should be done uh, for the internal controls so that is an important drawback of uh, internal control that it includes additional cost no control for unusual transaction so generally internal controls are designed for the usual transaction like banking transaction cash transaction purchase transaction sales transaction generally these uh, transactions have internal controls now suppose if you know you want to sell your machinery internal controls around selling around selling machinery will not be there because selling machinery is a once in a lifetime kind of a um, event it's not a regular event so there will not be internal controls for exceptional uh, items or exceptional transactions so they will go undetected they will go without internal controls human error is any time possible in internal controls as well human judgment and decision making uh, is definitely possible in internal controls also guys internal controls can lapse because of human error collusion among employees this is a very very important aspect collusion means collusion means combination combination so i'd given you an example that you know uh, if you want to deposit your cash in bank then employ two people first person will collect the cash second one will deposit the cash this way you will be able to uh, check it the amount twice right but guys what if both of them shake hand both of them say that yes okay we'll uh, do this fraud in a combined manner so if they decide to do this fraud in a combined manner then segregation of duty internal control fails if both of them say yes we want to do this fraud and we will uh, cooperate with each other in doing this fraud and they combine hands then there's there's a big problem so yes collusion among employees is a drawback of internal control abuse of authority guys the problem with internal control is that it is installed by management and management can any time lapse a control so if time is less then management can say that you know one person will only collect the cash and he will deposit the cash in bank if time is less so sometimes internal controls are lapsed by the management itself due to lack of time or due to lack of patience management uh, colludes the um, uh, the internal controls and this is abuse of authority which management shows this will result in risk coming in in your financial statements it will be a risky affair your financial statements might be in a risky proposition then inadequate procedure if um, the internal controls are uh, are inadequately designed then compliance will result result into a bad uh, drawback manipulations by management management might, might manipulate the transactions estimate judgments required for preparation of financial statements um, internal controls might be again might be tweaked by the management of the company internal controls and statutory alter now very very important point guys internal controls are seen by the statutory auditors very very carefully why because 
caro reporting is there caro is company's audit report order so statutory auditor is required to um report in the audit report whether internal controls are appropriate or not okay so that necessitates the statutory auditor to test the internal controls whether they are working fine or not okay then companies act also requires the auditors to comment on the uh, uh, on the weaknesses if there's any weakness in internal internal control then uh, the auditor also identifies operation weakness if there is any internal control weakness then the uh, the auditor spots weakness in the systems and procedure also if there is any weakness in internal control then statutory auditor will say this your your operation is weak that is also a then auditor shall include a written communication to the management the statutory auditor about the internal control definition deficiencies this is also role of the statutory auditor so guys statutory auditor relies on the internal controls also let me tell you statutory auditor if internal controls are strong then statutory auditor will work less auditor will do less audit procedures if the internal controls are strong if internal controls are weak statutory auditor will do more work on um, uh, the audit so that is the important aspect of internal controls yes guys all right internal controls and audit committee yes guys the main uh, the main objective of audit committee is to study the internal controls okay that is the main objective of audit committee is to um, see the internal controls whether they are working fine or not and whether the auditor is satisfied that internal controls are fine or not now what do you mean by audit committee guys audit committee is a specialized committee which is created on only a specific type of company so this is the definition which is there for the companies who are required to create their audit committee audit committee is required to be created only by this uh, sector of uh, people so uh, you know a company should have a separate department as audit committee which will include the independent directors which will include the finance director etc etc so what is the role of audit committee audit committee is not finance department please understand audit committee is not finance department audit committee's role is to overview the audit whether audit is being done fine or not whether the auditors grievances auditors qualifications are being resolved or not that is the role of audit committee it's a separate committee uh, uh, you know apart from finance finance is a different committee audit committee is a different committee okay so internal control and its relationship with the audit committee so audit committee has to evaluate the internal and financial controls and the risk management system this is the responsibility of the audit committee then audit committee will review performance of statutory and internal auditors and see whether the internal uh, auditors comments and statutory comments statutory auditor comments are resolved or not third it will review adequacy of internal audit function uh, whether internal audit function is doing fine or not that is the responsibility of audit committee discussion with internal auditors for significant findings and follow up thereon what are the observations of internal auditor and how can they be rectified this is role of audit committee reviewing finding of internal investigations by the internal auditors statutory auditors discussions are also responsibility of audit committee so audit committee is only focused on auditing audit should be done in an appropriate manner audit should be completed perfectly and audit should be done in an unbiased environment that is the whole objective of the audit committee therefore audit committee is um, very very useful next features of a good internal control system so what are the features of a good internal control system when will i say that internal control system is appropriate internal control is system is absolutely fine when will, when will i say that um, what are the features of a good internal control system that is what we are going to study there should be a proper organization structure if the structure is well it is well defined automatically it's a control that everything will go fine if everyone knows the responsibility uh, and accountability matrix if everyone knows who's my senior who's my junior okay this hierarchy is very well defined automatically send internal control automatically automatically things will go fine so first quality of a good internal control system is that there should be a proper organization structure second authorization procedures should be well defined everyone should know that you know which transaction should be authorized by whom the structure of authorization and the entire procedure should be well defined everyone should know what is to be done how is it to be done internal checks should be perfect so uh, the accounting procedure should be designed in such a manner that no single person is authorized to carry all the operations involved in a transaction so any uh, one transaction should not be done by um, a single person so the responsibility should be divided between two people of a particular transaction that is important
सो अकाउंटिंग प्रोसीजर शुड बी देयर दैट नो सिंगल पर्सन शुड कैरी ऑन वन ट्रांजेक्शन ओके देन सुटेबल पीपल शुड बी देयर इन योर सिस्टम लाइक कॉम्पिटेंट पीपल ऑनेस्ट पीपल शुड बी देयर इन द सिस्टम देयर क्वालिफिकेशन देयर एक्सपीरियंस देयर पर्सनल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स शुड बी जज वाइल कीपिंग दैम इन द ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इंटरनल ऑडिट सिस्टम internal audit system um, uh, should be there where an independent person is coming in the organization and seeing whether the internal controls are working fine or not internal audit system should be very much um, uh, in place and internal audit is definitely something which looks at the internal controls okay and now we are going to start internal audit only okay so guys let me tell you internal control comprises of two things internal checks and internal audit if your internal checks are strong internal checks means everyone is checking transactions of each other if your internal checks are strong and if your internal audit is strong cumulatively it will make your internal control system strong so internal control is a accumulation of two things internal checks and internal audit and now we start with internal audit and guys as you are aware um, now again first of all please mark please mark this topic as very very important from an exam standpoint it's very very important now internal audit is not mandatory for all the organizations only specified organizations are required to get their internal audit done rest it is mandatory for other organization whether they want to get their internal audit done or not now what do you mean by internal audit internal audit is the review of operations of an organization including review of the internal control system including review of the internal control system it improves managerial control by measuring evaluating effectiveness of other controls by maintaining vigilant watch over risk so what is internal audit internal audit is review of law and regulations governance should be proper operating activities are working fine or not risk management financial operation information all these are aspects of internal audit now person eligible to be an internal auditor who can be an internal auditor guys internal auditor uh, can be a chartered accountant or a cost accountant so yes cost accountants can also be an internal auditor then for which companies is internal audit mandatory very very important guys there was a practical question which came practical in the sense uh, analytical question which came from this particular aspect every listed company has to mandatorily get its internal audit done see statutory audit is done by all the companies irrespective of their turnover in irrespective of whether they are listed or not statutory audit is to be done by all the companies internal audit is to be done only by listed companies or every unlisted public company whose paid up capital is 50 crores or more whose turnover is 200 crores or more any one of the criteria needs to be fulfilled okay or who has taken a loan of uh, uh, 100 crores or more or who has outstanding deposit of 25 crores or more all the unlisted public companies having these traits are required to get their internal audit done in case of private company turnover should be of 200 crores or there's loan outstanding borrowing of 100 crores in case of a private company then they are required to get their internal audit done so internal audit is not compulsory for all the companies it is optional some companies are required to get their internal audit done and some companies are not required to get it done that is internal audit then what are the audit techniques which we use which the auditors use to audit first one is vouching vouching means we inspect the documents we inspect the invoices we inspect the inward register suppose if raw material has been purchased we'll 